violent crime. The American Broadcasting Company presents I, Deal and Crime, starring William Gargan as Ross Dolan. This is Ross Dolan speaking about a woman named Abigail Murray. And if you can draw a picture from the name Abigail, your mental photography is probably correct. She's tall, skinny, with a prim mouth and a primmer figure. She and Forty became acquainted quite some time back, and she dresses in solid black. I met Abigail Murray in quite the conventional manner. Uh, how do you do? All right, young man, if you're ready to take your feet off your desk and sit up like a gentleman, I'm ready to discuss a business matter with you. Oh, I'm so sorry, madam. Uh, I was so interested in your entrance that I forgot my manners. Hmm, well, I can see that. you mind if I sit down? No, no, not at all. Uh, please do. Hmm. Thank you, Mr. Dolan. You are Mr. Dolan? Yep. I'm Abigail Murray. I live in Norwalk, and I'm here in the city on a visit. I see. Also, I happen to be a school teacher. I thought so, uh, Miss Murray. Please, call me Miss Abigail. I'm used to that. Been used to it for 30 years. Okay, Miss Abigail it is. Now, I want to employ you, Mr. Dolan. You're to be my escort. Are you willing to be that? Well, <laughs> that depends. Well, we're not going out to nightclubs and places of that nature. If that's what bothers you, I'm not the type. No, no, I'm afraid you're not. Uh, I merely want you to drive me across the city this evening. I'm visiting an old pupil of mine, and I dislike driving in the dark. Uh, that's all, huh? Just uh, drive you around tonight? Certainly. Miss Abigail, uh, there must be more than that. If, if you just wanted to go across town, you could have taken a taxi cab or the uh, streetcar. Oh, no, I couldn't do that. All on account of the letter. Letter? Of course, the letter. The one I have in my purse. Oh, oh, Miss Abigail, you didn't tell me about the letter. Well, naturally not. I haven't come to it yet. Well, this letter, uh, what does it say? It merely says that I'm going to be murdered tonight. I took a long look at Abigail Murray, and believe me, she wasn't kidding. Also, in her prim New England manner, she wasn't particularly worried about the threatening letter either. She handed it to me, and uh, I read it. Abigail Murray, you should have stayed in Norwalk. Now it's too late, because tonight you are going to die. How did you get this letter, Miss Abigail? It came to the hotel where I'm residing, by special delivery. But uh, uh, who could have sent this letter? Uh, do you have any enemies? Well, I've been a school teacher for 25 years. What do you think? Well, I, I think the police station is a good spot for you. Come on. Mr. Dolan, I wish you would dispel the notion that you can order me around like a simpleton. I've never gone to the police, and I'm not going to go now. But, Miss Abigail, Now, do you I... wish to escort me across town tonight, or shall I find someone else? Okay, you win. I'll be your escort. Fine. I'm staying at the plaza. Pick me up at seven. Oh, no. If you want me to guard you, I'm starting in right now. But I'm going to the beauty parlor. <laughs> Having my hair waved. Well, I'll be glad to come along uh, to make sure the curl isn't too permanent. <laughs> Abigail Murray picked up her bag, stuffed the threatening letter in it, and left my office with me right behind. She really did have a date with a hairdresser, and uh, I spent an interesting three hours in the outer room uh, playing handies with a manicurist. Then we had dinner. I had a steak fried while Miss Abigail stayed in New England and had hers boiled. At eight that evening, we were driving along in her car. You know, Mr. Dolan, this is the first time I've driven my car in the city at night. I know, I just... Hey, look out! <laughs> hey, didn't you see that truck? Of course I saw it, but I had the right of way. Oh, fine. After all, it was his duty to get out of my way. Uh -huh. They always get out of my way in Norwalk. Yeah, yeah, I don't blame them. Uh, oh, by the way, uh, just where are we going? To visit an old pupil of mine at 327 Kendall. His name is Richard Way. He's been seriously ill. When he heard I was going to visit the city, he invited me to come and see him. Would uh, he be the person who sent you that letter? Richard? Oh, hardly. He has the general courage of a field mouse. Hmm. Well, we'll turn here and take a shortcut to the park. I enjoy parks at night. I would never have believed it. Oh, uh, Miss Abigail, uh, slow down a little. Hmm, why? Slow down, that's all. Well, but why? There's a car in back of us. You think there's something wrong? Uh, motion him to go around it. He's been trailing us the last few blocks. Very well. The 
guy had fired three shots at us. Abigail let go of the steering wheel, and our car made a sharp right turn into a convenient tree. By the time I untangled myself and got out, the would-be killer had disappeared in a cloud of blue smoke. Those shots. They came right through the back window. He was shooting at us. Uh, not us, Miss Abigail. He was shooting at you. Now, let me see if the car is all right, and then you and I are going to the police. We should have done that in the first place. I want to visit Richard Ray. Later. Now, let's see. Banged up the front of the car. Is everything all right, Mr. Dolan? Yeah, yeah, you didn't do any damage. Just uh, dented one fender of the... Uh-oh. Now, what's wrong? The tire is flat. Is the repair in back? Oh, yes, yes, of course. Well, hand me the keys, will you? Uh, we'll have to change that tire before we go any further. Here they are. Now, you just take it easy, and I'll have this beauty switched in a hurry. Perhaps I could help, Mr. Dolan. Okay, come along. Now, we'll just take this wrench... Find the jacket. Get back, Miss Abigail. Why? What's wrong, Mr. Dolan? Uh, what's that bundle in there? That's no bundle. That's the body of a man. A man? Well, tell him to come out immediately. I don't believe it would do any good. He's dead. Dead man was tucked into the back of the car like a sack of potatoes. We got a flashlight out of the glove compartment of Abigail Murray's car and looked him over. He'd been shot once. I could see that right away. Then Miss Abigail gave out with a startled exclamation. Mr. Dolan, that's Richard. Richard? Richard Way, the man I was going to visit this evening. We've got to get to a telephone right away, Miss Abigail. The police will have to be notified. They'll ask a lot of questions. Oh, murder always brings out the bump of curiosity on a policeman's head. Huh. Of course, he could have committed suicide. Oh, sure, sure. This would look like suicide to anyone. The man shoots himself through the heart, then he climbs into the back of your car, pulls down the door, and locks it from the outside. Try again, Miss Abigail. I've got it. That's how I was going to be murdered. You mean they mistook Richard Way for you? No, no, no. Don't you see? The person who wrote me that letter killed Richard Way. They put his body in my car. They knew it'd be found back there. I'd be accused of murder. I don't know. That sounds like a long way around to arrange a murder frame. Well, let's lock this back and get out of here. Quite a ways into the park, Mr. Dolan. You think it's safe to walk? It is, if we walk where there isn't a road. I don't think our friend would leave his car. Uh-oh. A car. He's come back. Out of sight, quick. Is it the same man? I don't know. I can't see good enough. Oh, come on, Miss Abigail. We've got nothing to worry about now. But the man in that car... He'll see it. I want him to see it. That car happens to be a prowl car. All right, you two. What are you doing back there? Is this your car? That happens to be my car, officer. Oh, it happens to be your car, eh? Don't you know it's against the law to park off this road? Uh, we had a flat tire, officer. Flat tire, eh? And you were looking for your spare back there, huh? In the bushes. Officer, uh, I'm Ross Dolan, the private investigator. So what? Somebody fired a gun at us while we were driving through here. You can see the bullet holes in the back window. Go on. I got out and opened the back to get at the spare tire. There's a dead man in there. So you looked inside and found a... Did you say dead man? Yeah. I'll never look in the back of your car. Come on, both of you. But, Mr. Officer... Come on, I said. Now unlock that turtle bag. Okay. Mm -hmm. You didn't touch him, take anything out of his pocket. Naturally not. Do I look like the sort of person who would touch a dead man? You look like the sort of person who's coming down to headquarters and have a little chat. Headquarters? Why, this is a Miss Abigail, if you only let me... One might think that Mr. Dolan and I were murderers. Yeah, one might think you were. Carter was one of those coldly efficient cops. He had me drive his police car to headquarters while Abigail Murray fumed, fussed, sputtered, and threatened but it was like knocking down stone fences with a handful of sponges because Carter just sat back with no further comment. When we got to HQ, he herded us into a room for questioning. I shall certainly telegraph the mayor of Norwalk. I've never before been treated in such degrading fashion. Now, don't take it so hard, Miss Abby. All we've got to do is prove that we didn't kill Richard Way and they'll let us go. But why do we have to prove it? I always thought a person, uh, well, was presumed innocent. 
until they were proved guilty. And so far, no one has proved anything. I know, I know. And that officer, that carter person. Did I hear somebody mention my you name? You certainly did. And it was I. I thought so. Now then, I want to ask you both some questions. After that, we'll decide what should be done. To you, Dolan, I looked over your identification. Yeah? What's your story? Well, uh, Miss Murray employed me to drive her across town. I took the job. We were driving through the park. Somebody took a shot at us and blew out a tire. And that's when we found Richard. I mean the body. Miss Murray, I was talking to Mr. Dolan. When I finish with him, there are some matters you and I should discuss. I was just trying to help. You'll get your chance. Oh. Now, uh, you found the body, eh? Yeah, when I opened the turtle back on the car to get at the spare tire. Then what? Then I started looking around for cops. In the bushes, off the road. What kind of a cop were you looking for? All right, Carter, you're having your little fun, but you forget. Some guy with a gun had just fired three shots at it. Did you expect me to parade around like a big, fat target? Go on. Well, when we heard your car approaching, we ducked. When I saw the PD label on the door, we came out, period. Okay. Now, Miss Murray, you employed Dolan because you were afraid you'd received a threatening letter. I substantiated that statement with proof, Mr. Carter. I gave you the letter I received. So you did, and that's why I'm asking all these questions. You see, the dead man, Richard Way, had some notes in his own handwriting in his pocket. Is there something unusual about that? There is in this case, Miss Murray. Comparing the handwriting on the notes with the letter you received, we came to the conclusion that they were both the same. What? The man who threatened you by mail was the man you found dead in your car. There was a lot of similar chit-chat which took place at police headquarters, but Carter finally let us go. He warned us not to leave town, which was a little ridiculous because I have an office here. And Miss Abigail told Carter she wouldn't miss the fun at this point for a carton of eggs. I took her back to the plaza and went home to my apartment, wondering what would happen next. An hour later, it turned out to be a blonde. I'm Faye Murray. You're off Dolan. And this is pretty late at night. What's on your mind, little lady? Don't little lady me, Dolan. Where's my aunt, Abby? Abby? Oh, you mean Miss Abigail. Yes, I mean Miss Abigail. Where is she? Well, the last I saw of her, she was digging a flannel nightgown out of her telescope bag down at the Plaza Hotel. Get out of the way. I'm going to search your apartment. You're going to what? Move, I said. Now, just a second. You can't come Shut up. Where her. is she? Try my refrigerator. She's probably hiding behind an ice cube. I'm not going to waste time on you, Dolan. I came here to find my aunt. Uh, and if you don't turn her up in 30 seconds, I'll phone the police. I wish you would. And while you're calling, enter a complaint for me, too. I know all about you. You're one of those ruthless private detectives. You're one degree removed from a crook. You, you take money under tables and under false pretenses. And I'm going to turn you over my knee and spank you if you don't stop that. Now, what's this all about? You mm, don't know where Aunt Abby is? The last time I saw her, she was ready to hit the sheets for a full complement of slumber. What gave you the idea she was here? But I called her at the hotel. She didn't answer. How'd you get up here? A man answered Auntie's room. He said that she'd come up here, that you'd force her to come with you. Me? Force Miss Abigail to do anything she didn't want to? Why, that little old gal has a mind all of her own. But then, who was the man in the hotel room? That's what we're going to find out. He's at the plaza. Uh, I just told you that. Oh. Dolan, are you sure you took her home? I certainly am. I wonder what could have happened to her. Carter Hotel. Miss Abigail Murray, please. One moment. Did she answer? Give her a chance, will you? Well? Well? No answer yet. I'm sorry, sir, but Miss Murray is not in her room. You wish to leave a message? Yeah, yeah. Have her call Ross Dolan when she comes in. Yes, sir. Oh, and one more thing. Uh, did you see Miss Murray a little earlier this evening with a man? A man? Uh, let me think. Oh, yes. I saw her earlier. She came in with a big, beefy character wearing a wrinkled gray suit and a brown hat. Would you know him, sir? I would. It happens to be me. Oh, no, sir. You mean it was I? It was me, and don't you forget it. Not there, is she? No. And the clerk doesn't seem to remember her going out. Hmm. Well, in that case, Mr. Dolan, I'm sorry I bothered you. Good night. Boy, she certainly was in a hurry. I wonder. Hey, Miss Murray, Miss Murray, I want to ask you if... I never did find out what hit me, but from the size of the bump on my noggin when I woke up, I figured it was at least the Santa Fe Chief or a constellation full speed ahead. The first thing that greeted my sight when I opened my eyes was a pair of black shoes. I let my eyes travel upwards. All right, Dolan, what did you do with her? 
do at home. Abigail Murray, she's disappeared. That's what I like about you, Carter. You always bring out the news when it's a day old. Get on your feet. I want to ask you some questions. You've just got no mercy at all. Hey, let me shake the ache out of my gray matter. What happened up here? Somebody slug you? No, 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 no. I, I just butted my head against the wall. I, I do it all the time. Now then, what happened to Abigail Murray? You know as much as I do, Carter. You know about the car disappearing? Her car? Well, you took care of that. I sent the wagon out to pick up the body. They brought in the body, and the garage man sent a truck out after the car. When he got there, it was gone. Well, you got me. This is the first I've heard about that. I called Miss Murray at her hotel. She had gone. No one had seen her leave. Now, Dolan, just what goes on around here? What's the gag? I told you, I don't know. I called her, too. Her niece was up here looking for her. Her what? Her niece, uh, Faye Murray. Niece, huh? What's wrong with that? We checked on Abigail Murray at Norwalk, and she hasn't got a father, a mother, no brothers, and no sisters. So obviously, she couldn't have a niece. Mm. So what are you trying to give me? A little information on what happened after I took Abigail Murray to the Plaza Hotel. I came home, was here an hour when her niece showed up. I'm trying to tell you Abigail Murray doesn't have a niece. So the girl just said she was her niece. Give me a description on the way downtown. I'll get out a call on it. On the way downtown? Where am I going now? I'm going to the morgue. I want you to take another look at Richard Way. It uh, couldn't wait for morning. Huh? I want you to see that body before it disappears, too. I began to think about a number of things regarding Abigail Murray. Also, Faye Murray, the niece who wasn't a niece. Who was she? And why was she looking for Miss Abigail? Then we pulled up in front of the morgue, got out of the car, and went in. Did you take anything out of the dead man's pocket, Dolan? The first thing I learned as a private detective was to leave that strictly alone. Why? I just wondered. In here. Hey, uh, who's the guy over there? You'll find out in due time. Okay, take a look. Is this the man you found in the back of your car? Yep. Sure. You can make a positive identification? Yep. I remember where the bullet struck. Also his face. Uh-huh. Mr. Way, would you mind stepping this way, please? Uh, yes. I must be seeing double. This can't be. Well, Dolan, what do you say now? This guy must be the dead man's twin brother. I've never seen such a resemblance before. That's right. This is John Way, Richard Way's twin brother, Ross Dolan. Dolan? Now then, Mr. Way, uh, mind telling me again, when did you see your brother last? About 7 o'clock. He said he had an errand and left the apartment. Did he mention his appointment with Miss Murray? No, he didn't. You have no idea how your brother's body got in the back of Miss Murray's car? None whatsoever. Okay, thanks, Mr. Way. We'll call you if we need you. Yep. Say, you want any more from me, Carter? No, just be around where I can find you. Well, I'll be home. Hey, by the way, uh, have you checked the bullet holes in Miss Murray's car to see if they match with the bullet in the dead man? I'd love to, but we haven't found the car yet. Say, uh, when you do, Carter, I've got a little bet for you. Yes? I'll give you two to one, they match. I walked out of the morgue onto the street, leaving a very puzzled Carter standing there, but no more puzzled than a private eye named Dolan. The street was dark and forbidding. The lights in that district were black with age, and the buildings were dark and gloomy. I wondered how one twin felt when the other one died, because I'd read stories about the invisible threads which bound such people together. Then I felt a hand on my arm. Dolan, wait. Well, Miss Fay Murray, or uh, have you switched to another name by this time? Dolan, I've come to ask a favor. A big one. And I'm going to ask one of you. Just turn around and walk back into that morgue. There's a cop there named Carter who just loves to meet you. Please, please, Dolan, listen to me. Forget all about Miss Abigail. You mean your aunt? Or uh, aren't you the niece who isn't the niece? I can't explain anything to you right now, but if you'll promise me something, I'll tell you the whole story in a few days. Well, that's so kind of you. I get shot at, hit over the head, dragged around by the police, lose sight of my client, and you want me to wait. What for? This is a matter of life and death, Dolan. I'm asking you to forget about everything that's happened. So? Because if you don't, somebody else will die, too. Faye Murray, if she was Faye Murray, had one great trick. She could disappear like nothing I've ever seen before. 
By the time I opened my mouth to ask another question, she'd melted away like a bonbon on a hot rock. I went down towards the lighted corner and ten minutes later was in a taxi cab. I retraced the same route I'd taken earlier with Miss Abigail. When the cab got to the spot where the shooting had occurred, I got out and looked around. But there was nothing to look at, so I got going again. I remembered Miss Abigail mentioning the address to Richard Way. It was 327 Kendall on the other side of the park. I got out a block away. I stood there until the blinking red tail light had disappeared around the corner. I wanted to be sure no one had followed me. Then I made my way inside the apartment building and got the apartment number off the mailbox. I didn't care to announce my presence, so I took it very easy going up the stairs. The apartment building was as quiet as a grave, and the word grave reminded me of the dead man lying down in the morgue. When I got to the door of the apartment I was looking for, I could hear voices. John Way and Faye Murray, but they were too low to make out. So I looked for another method of getting in on the know. The apartment was one of those two bedroom and staff affairs with a separate door for the kitchen. I moved inside through the kitchen. The two voices grew in intensity as I moved towards the living room door. John, John, you promised. Of course I did, my dear. Of course I did. Get you back here. But you told me if I got rid of Dolan, you'd take care of everything. You'd let Miss Abigail go. Oh, so I am, my dear. I am going to take care of everything. You know, I could go to the police. I could tell them the whole story. In your present condition, I hardly think so. In that case, I'll scream. I'll yell as loud as you want. Oh, you make one sound or I'll kill you right now. <laughs> surprised me because the girl was tied in her chair hand and foot while John Way held his hand over her mouth. I started inside but he was quicker than I was. Put up your hand. One move and I shoot. Dolan, I told you. You, come here. Sure. So, you just couldn't take Faye's advice. You had to come around here snooping. Huh? I'm beginning to figure a lot of things, Way. You killed your brother. Well, you're very observing. Where's Abigail Murray? What'd you do with her? Oh? Oh. You want to know where Abigail Murray is, dear? Yeah. You know, I think I'll arrange for you to find out. I'll go a step further. I'll arrange for you to go with her. Well, she's still alive then, huh? Where is she? In the settled back of a car. I put her there. Say, what's the matter with this guy, Say, Is the office crunk? He's... He's... Say, if you say I'm insane, I'll kill you right here. So, that's the way it is. You think I'm insane, too, don't you? That's I am. All my life, it's Richard this, Richard that, Richard the other thing. Right. Now, you're in pretty deep, mister. Better hand me that gun. Oh, you think it's sly, don't you? You think I'm going to just hand it over like that? But I'm not. No? No. No, I've got it all set up. You, Faye, and Abigail are taking a little drive with me. Only I'm coming back alone. You stole the car, huh? Before the cops came back. Of course. That was very clever of me. You uh, answered the phone in Abigail Murray's room when Faye called her, didn't you? Of course. I dropped in to see my old teacher. We were such pals, you know. She always gave me such good marks. <laughs> You're quite a clever guy. Uh, how'd you get her out of the hotel? Down the back way, servant center. Quite deserted. I arranged that, too. Then you came over and conked me on the head, huh? Yes, yes, after I locked up Miss Abigail in the car. Well, you get around, Mr. Way. You see, I followed, say, I thought she might do something silly like employing you. But I prevailed upon her to forget it, didn't I, my dear? You lied to me. You told me that if I got rid of Dolan, you'd let Miss Abigail go free. Oh, no. No. What I said was that I'd see that Miss Abigail was free. And she shall be. Because one is free when one is dead. What are you going to do? Drive the car in the river. They'll never find it buried in the mud. They won't find us either. Naturally not. You'll be in the car from now on. You. 
say that again. And uh, what happens when you try to get me out of here? I could start a rocket. Uh, I have that plan, too. Turn around. What for? I said turn. Okay. Now what happens? I'm going to hit you over the head. Not too hard, but just hard enough to keep you quiet for a while like this. You can make me. I think I can. I was lucky enough to catch John Way with a fast chop to the chin. Then I phoned Carter, who came out with a squad and took John Way down to the clink. At his trial, a group of doctors testified that he was violently and incurably insane. Later, I had a meeting with Miss Abigail and, of course, Faye at the Flamingo. My, my, Mr. Dolan. When I asked you to drive with me that night, I never dreamed that we would become involved in such an adventure. Well, neither did I. What puzzles me is, how did John get hold of my car long enough to put Richard's body in it? Well, he told the doctors at the trial that he saw you take it into a filling station to have it grieved. He represented himself as your brother, took the car, put his brother's body in it, and returned it to your hotel. Oh, think of that. Uh, why did he hate you so much, Miss Abney? And, and why uh, hate his brother? You know, I can't understand that. Richard was gay, a good student, well-liked. John was exactly the opposite. Moody, a bad student with violent dislike. It uh, probably gnawed away at his mind until he made it up to get rid of the two people he hated. Uh, I think you're right. Well, now, let's talk about Faye here. Why the pose is Miss Abigail's niece? Faye, you're merely an old friend. Why did you say you were my niece? Only because I thought it might carry weight with Mr. Dolan. Only I was weighed and found wanting. Oh, purely in a business sense. Uh, try me on the uh, social time sometime. Tonight? Uh, the sooner, the better. And of course, I'm coming along, too. You know, I've never been to a nightclub. <laughs> I've never even done the, uh, the rubber. Now, 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 take it easy, Miss Abby. Uh, how do you know you like it? Oh, I shall. After all, a girl my age can get into trouble, too. Yeah, you can say that again. Good night, folks. Don't forget to listen again next week, same time, over most of these ABC stations, when you will hear William Gargan say, I deal in crime. I deal in crime, starring William Gargan as Ross Dolan, is a special presentation of the American Broadcasting Company. It is written and directed by Ted Hediger. Special music is arranged and conducted by Rudy Schrager. Now, here's a special program note. International intrigue. That's what David Harding finds himself involved in on tomorrow's thrilling counter-spy case. Don't miss David Harding counter-spy tomorrow afternoon over the same ABC station. William Gargan stars as Barry Craig, confidential investigator. The fellow in the driver's seat is always much better off, folks. Especially if it's the mog wagon. The National Broadcasting Company presents William Gargan in another transcribed drama of mystery and adventure with America's number one detective, Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Barry Craig speaking. A thing that defeats a confidential operator is his heart. I don't mean the wear and tear that comes of chasing creeps around the landscape. Heart. Meaning the way you get involved emotionally with a case or a client. Like a doctor gets involved with a patient or fights not to. The human angle. You go for it with a tear in your eye and a throb in your throat. And you're no longer working for a fee. No, sir, you're a dedicated sucker, like I was in the case of Boxer Doyle, a ring champ of his day. My first introduction to the strange Boxer Doyle story began in the Times Square Penny Arcade. I'd stopped in for two bits worth of practice on the rifle range, and so I could check on whether a punchy-looking guy in an Eisenhower jacket had been dogging it after me, as I suspected he was. 
The Eisenhower jacket was watching my marksmanship, all eyes. I can shoot okay, huh, friend? Yeah, both eye every time. There's a fly squatting on your ear. Watch how I do. I said you were good. You don't have to prove anything. 46th and Park, then west to Broadway, then south to here. Why so attached to me, friend? I was making up my mind. About? Whether you were the guy for the job, Craig. And? I'm throwing my business your way. Lay down the rifle, I'll tell you. I can't wait to hear. It's only an hour's work. Nothing complicated. Everything on the up and up. So much for the preamble. You represent me confidentially in an auction sale at the Phoenix Galleries tonight. What am I bidding on? A diamond belt that once belonged to Boxer Doyle when he was welterweight champ. Mrs. Doyle's put it up for sale. I want it. Why? Sentiment. Boxer Doyle's been one of my heroes. You can still bid on it yourself. You don't want the job? How much can I be losing? 500. I pay for an hour's work. Get me the diamond belt. What's the ceiling, Mr. Uh... Bid up to 5,000 if you have to. And if I'm outbid? I don't think so. It's been appraised at only 1,500. Hmm. Sentiment is expensive. Come to a side. I'll count you out the dome. Sentiment wearing a fancy price tag. I sat in at the Phoenix Galleries. There wasn't too much bidding competition. I am bid $2,000, ladies and gentlemen, for the diamond belt. $2,000. Going once, going twice. 2500 2500 I am bid 2500 Bid lively, please. 2500 Going once, going twice. Are there any more bids? Fair warning. Sold to... Craig. Barry Craig. I turned the belt over to Mr. Mooney, collected my five bills, and wrote them off as a sentimental screwball. A weird deal, kind of, but legitimate on the face of it. So why push my imagination? Another day, another dollar, I figured it. That is, until Lieutenant Trav Rogers popped into Ranzini's pizzeria to drop a poison pellet in my minestrone soup. How's the uh, soup, Craig? Nine parts water, one part can, as usual. A bowl of minestrone, Tony. Mine company, Craig? The eats are public. Just don't jostle my elbow. I never do when a man's eating soup. Police protocol? Emily Post. No. Oh. I uh, came across an interesting item in the morning paper. There are Iranians in Iran. Back page. Where they put the fellas not at ease. I'm reading. Diamond Belt, once presented to Boxer Doyle by the Sports Writers Award Committee, was sold by the Phoenix Auction Galleries by order of Mrs. Boxer Doyle. The belt was purchased by Barry Craig, whose successful bid was $2,500. You spend money, Craig. What's money for? Same morning paper. An inside page now. A muckraking column titled Sports Topics. I'm reading. Memo to the police. The auctioning of Boxer Doyle's diamond belt at the Phoenix Galleries last night prompts an old question. What did happen to Doyle? And who's covering up why? Who'd you buy that belt for, Craig? Why such a guess? You're not rich enough. Or sentimental enough. It's confidential, sorry. Think again. And eat soup? Boxer Doyle disappeared years ago. Dropped out of sight, dropped out of the world. The police handled it as a missing persons case. We got nowhere. Now, this business of the belt might be the first significant development in the sticker we've long given up on. You can hope. I want to ask your client about his expensive interest in the box of Doyle Diamond Belt, just on the chance. I'll ask him. Now, Craig. I owe him that much discretion, Trav. I'll ask him, then you ask him. I went to ask Mooney. A flea-bitten hotel in the East Twenties, where the desk clerk looked like he was dying to frisk you before letting you climb the stairs. Room 4A. I'd been there before, delivering the belt. Craig, you forgot something? Yeah, a footprint. I must have left it somewhere on the rug. Pick it up and go. Go where you're going? You use your eyes a lot. 
I'd be blind not to see your suitcases packed and ready. I'm moving downstairs. Fourth floor is too high up. I get nosebleeds and altitude. You're going to turn out to be a pest. I am? Look, you've been paid. Generously. No quarrel. Then ring off. Go look for your next job. This thing keeps building, and I've got my next job. Mysteries fascinate me. I made a mistake throwing work your way. Craig, what do you want? Answers. What's your real interest in the missing box of Doyle? I'm only interested in this belt. Standing pat on your story, huh? People collect General Grant's platoons and John L. Sullivan's gloves. You've got a personal hero. And you're crazy sentimental. Okay, then. Let's go. That sounds like police headquarters. I promised you to a lieutenant if I got nowhere. You object? You tell me. You object? How'd you do it? Sleight of hand? I ought to kill you. Good you're fighting the impulse. You park here while I move downstairs. When you come to, Craig, change your thinking. I'll make a sincere effort. I won't turn the gun around the next time. Ooh. There was no use trying to change my thinking. When I came to, the only thought in my head was how to get out of a locked closet. Get out before I died of suffocation. At headquarters, Trav Rogers was overjoyed at the lump on my head. Craig, the violence means something. My aching head. It means there's life in a case that's been in the doldrums for years. Again, I say you hope. Go to it, Craig. What does that mean? Find out what happened to Boxer Doyle and who did it to him. Come again? Now, Craig, don't be coy. You want me to work up a case the police gave up on? That's right. On whose behalf? What class? Me. You're representing me very confidentially. The department has a stake in it. Nothing less say than, than its honor. We've been pilloried by the press, sniped at by columnists, abused by a thousand sports fans who love Boxer Doyle and who idolize his memory. Let's see the file on Boxer Doyle. No. Our files merely tell the story of a failure. Then where do I start? There are two important principles after Boxer Doyle himself. Mrs. Doyle and Sam Spiro. Spiro was Doyle's manager and close friend. Larry, I won't forget this favor. Don't forget one other thing. What's that? My fee, client. Want to commit yourself now? Why not? It's the best dinner in town at 21. Steak, caviar, champagne. Corona, Corona cigars bigger than chimney stacks. All on me if you come through. And if I flop? Hot dogs and an orange drink. On you. I'll take the proposition up with my ulcer. Mrs. Boxer Doyle, Wilma Doyle, had a henna bleach and the telltale look of an ex-showgirl a little too old and frayed around the edges for the chorus line. What's this visit about, Mr... Craig, uh... Barry Craig. Hmm. I explained over the phone. I'm a police operative wondering about the whereabouts of Boxer Doyle. Isn't it a little late to be wondering? Maybe. I'll concede that when I say hello to his corpse. But you talk to me. I've done nothing but talk to the police for years. But never to me. I'm fed up talking. He's gone. He went out for a comic book one night and never came back. Did he leave you comfortably fixed? All the gold I could carry in my teeth. Doyle was a fast man with a buck. He even tried handing me cigar coupons for table money. <laughs> Look around you, copper, and tell me this dump reminds you of Buckingham Palace. Almost. I missed the crystal chandeliers. An ex-world champ, Doyle made barrels of dough. And salted it away where I couldn't touch it. Who could and can? Sam Spiro, his manager. Sam's got the power of attorney over everything Doyle owned. Except me. And that diamond belt you auctioned off the other night. <laughs> Doyle gave it to me in a weak moment. All in all, there was no love loss between you and Boxer Doyle. We fought all the time. Doyle scored tales that don't appear in the records. Why would he pick up and disappear? Whams in his head. Toward the end of our happy marriage, Doyle was 90% off his rocker. I slept with a gun under my pillow in case he went to search. What had him down? 
His career was behind him. He hung up his gloves. Sour, disappointed, and depressed. Hey, you ought to be all out of questions. One more. Who's in the bedroom? What, what kind of a stupid... The door's open a little. It wasn't when I came in. Who's getting an earful? My boyfriend. Boyfriend? Is it a crime? Doyle walked out here nearly eight years ago. Steve, come out and be introduced. This is Steve Marcy. Steve Barry Craig. A pleasure. It isn't mutual. Steve! Shut up, Wilma. He's not here for your good. I got an earful, Craig, and a line on your angle. Which is to weasel and browbeat Wilma out of her rights as Doyle's widow. Said rights being? An accounting of every penny Sam Spiro holds of Doyle's and Wilma's right to cash in Doyle's insurance. If Doyle's dead. He's dead. Legally, anyhow. Enough time has elapsed. You're petitioning the court to have Doyle declared legally dead? Wilma is. Oh. I don't like that wise guy, oh. You're so full of dislikes, Buster. And ready to demonstrate. Oh. Ooh. Nice right cross. Was it just knuckles or brass knuckles? My bare fists. You're a boxer? I'm a boxer. <laughs> the lady's preferences run on a single track. Get out, Craig. Sure. But not the way I am. I don't mind nursing my jaw, but not my back. <laughs> when the contender comes to, tell him he's a sucker for an uppercut. I'm sorry, Mr. Craig. Skip it. I'm out to weasel you, he said. That's both true and false, Wilma, depending on how the facts develop. The guy drops out of the world, and his deserted wife turns out to have a profit motive and an eager boyfriend with an itching palm. A situation like this pops an ugly word into my head. Murder. On the street a few doors down from Wilma's tenement palace, somebody blew over to me with the evening mists. Mind company, Craig? No, provided you don't say goodbye to me in locked closets. Keep walking. I sense a gun, but I don't see it. You've seen me draw? Yeah, regular sleight of hand. Jumping me would be a mistake. I never want that spelled on my tombstone. How much, Craig? How much for what? For you to hop a plane to Tijuana. What's there? High lie. Never played it. You're bright, you'll learn. Is it expensive? Only if you lose. What's the maximum I can lose? Five grand. When I go, I go. Eight. You blow me to an eight grand vacation? You got rings under your eyes. Keep getting hit on the head, you'll lose your mind. That's no joke. You need to knock off. Rest up. Stick your hand out for the dough. You really want me to forget about boxer door? No changing the subject. We were talking about eight grand. And what if I'm busting with curiosity about Boxer Doyle? Craig, don't be funny. No fooling. I'm still kid enough to be glory struck over famous sports figures. Enough to be sentimental, like you're sentimental. You don't want the dough? What good's my sitting in Tijuana with my mind on something else? I want to know what happened to Doyle. Where did he go? And if murdered, who killed him? And where is the corpus electi? Walk ahead of me. Keep walking. I'm going to get shot in the back? Maybe. Or maybe not. Maybe today. Maybe tomorrow. Walk. Walk away from a gun. You don't have to feel the lead to feel shot. You imagine it. The sudden burning heat in your spine. So hot it's ice cold. But Mooney didn't shoot. I just walked away from him into the fog. I finally located Sam Spiro in Kelleher's gymnasium. Collodion and Arnica. The place That's smelled the like a man. surgeon's Come office. Watch that left. Spiro left. was watching That's one it. of his pugs work out. Uh, Sam Spiro! Uh, whatever it is, saving. I'm busy. Your boy will keep while we talk. Look, look, I told you. Hey, who are you? Barry Craig. Process server? Confidential investigator. Is that the same as a cop? It is. I say what you mean. If you'll transfer your interest from your meal ticket a minute, I will. Hey, I'm not under arrest. 
Depends on what's on your conscience. Come on. Watching the kid will only aggravate you. You think he's that bad? His arms are too short. Come over where we can talk. Make it snappy. Okay. Where's the body buried? Whose body? Boxer Doyle. What makes you think Doyle's dead? I think you killed him so you could keep the dough he let you hold for him. <laughs> or you blew the dough in. The stock market, the horses. <laughs> So you knocked off Doyle to avoid an accounting and prosecution. <laughs> when you stop hiding behind a counterfeit lab... <laughs> Doyle's as alive as you. Flattery won't help you. What makes you so sure he's dead? Eight years. Where does a celebrity keep himself eight years? On an island. What island? Samoa. Doing what? Painting. He got fed up with people. He bought a paint box and a roll of canvas and swam to an island. Where else does he keep himself? On a mountaintop. He grew a beard and he's writing the story of his life. He's in touch with you? All the time. We're like Corsican brothers, Doyle and me. We communicate all the time. Uh, uh, give me the word I can't think of. Telepathy. That's it, telepathy. Every night, promptly 11 p.m., there's a message on my wavelength. What does it say? It says, Sam, why can't people mind their own business? Signed, Boxer. How much loot of Doyle's are you holding? I'll remember to count it sometime. When's Doyle reappearing from wherever he is? That message I ain't received yet. Now I gotta get back to my boy. Yeah. Better go wipe his nose or he'll begin bawling for his mama. Over steak burgers and curlicue potatoes, I ran over what I had with Trav Rogers. So Doyle's both alive and dead. Depending on whose angle you see it from. Doyle alive, but... On the world, incognito somewhere. Keeps Spyro in charge of Doyle's assets. And keeps Mrs. Doyle out in the cold. In a crisis, what do you bet Spyro even produces phony picture postcards from Doyle? And Mrs. Doyle's calling Doyle dead for her own practical reasons. Insurance and forcing a widow's legal accounting from Spyro. Either one could have murdered Doyle and disposed of the body. Either one, or their boyfriend Steve. Or the mysterious Mooney. Mooney puzzles. He was the gunman who originally did the dirty work? For Wilma or Spyro? Either one. And now Mooney's busy seeing that the case doesn't get off the ground. Blow hot. I could buy it if one thing didn't stick out. What thing? The diamond belt. Mooney's reason for the purchase. Uh, there I'm stumped. Where do you go from here? For uh, a ride, I think. A ride, sure. Parked on the street side of the plate glass, eyeing me and waiting for me. But don't look now. Who? Oh. My shadow. The Eisenhower jacket. Mooney. I'm going out. To nab him? No. To give him all the rainy ones. I've got a feeling he's finally provoked enough to tell me something. But the risk is... He could have killed me twice, but didn't. I'll leave the tip. The check's all yours, Lieutenant. <laughs> I didn't wait to be coaxed to take a ride. I guessed you were waiting to show for me, Mooney. You've got nerve, Craig. You've noticed, huh? And gall. You sure made a study of me. Ah, uh, I won't even bother asking our destination. I'll trust you. <laughs> Our destination turned out to be the home of a man whose shingle outside a big rambling estate read, Dr. Otto Steiner. A round little nervous man, Steiner, with fluttering hands. It was plain to see that Steiner didn't relish the upcoming session. Tell Craig about Boxer Doyle, Doc. Tell Craig, yes. I, I treated Boxer Doyle. Get to it, Doc. Tell Craig the condition Doyle was in. Uh, depressed to a manic state. His vitality, the splendid energies and physique that had carried him so far in his Spell career... Spell it out in a word, Doc. Well, Doyle had a wish to self-destruction. He, he told me he had attempted his own life on two occasions. That, that is about all, I suppose. That wraps it up. Not so fast, Mooney. Doc, Doyle was in treatment when he disappeared? Yes. How long had you known Boxer Doyle? Oh, a very long time, Mr. Craig. I was his personal physician and friend for a long time. 
before his breakdown. Let's get out of here, Craig. Kind of a fast shuffle, Mooney. Is it deliberate? I said, let's get out of here. Mooney typed on a postscript to the doc's testimony over drinks in the nearest roadside tavern. A small beer for me and lots of drinks for Mooney, like a guy drowning a painful memory. You heard the doc, Craig? What were you to Doyle? My name isn't Mooney. Barley. Trainer Barley. Trainer Barley? <laughs> Fame rubs off. I was a ranking contender once until Doyle flattened me. Sorry, I can quote you baseball batting averages and pitches. When records. Doyle stopped me, I joined up with him. As Doyle's trainer. As Doyle's friend. You were really close to Doyle, huh? I worshipped the guy. When Doyle went, the book closed for me, too. Now you know why I bought in that belt. Yeah. Now I know. Now you know why I didn't fit it in myself. You didn't want to be identified as Trainer Barley. I didn't want any publicity on it. Sob stuff in the papers. The $64 question, mister. My advice still is, don't ask it, Craig. Do like I've been coaxing you all along. Cancel out, take a vacation. Forget Doyle. The $64 question, mister. You'll be stuck keeping a secret. Maybe. You blab what I tell you. Make like a cop disgrace, Doyle, and I'll kill you. Doyle tried twice, the doc said. It was a third try. You're saying that Boxer Doyle committed suicide? Right in front of me. On a cabin cruiser fishing off the Florida Keys. Doyle was better, I thought. Laughing... Cracking jokes, working on a suntan. I... I took my eyes off them. He went over the side. Period. Six hours later, I found him washed against the rocks. I buried him at sea in the middle of the night. Your reason? What do you think? Disgrace. Your word, disgrace. Suicide was a disgrace. Doyle was a heroic legend. You didn't want any tarnish on it. Not then or now. So close your file on Doyle, Craig, and live. Come on, I'll drive you back to town. No, thanks. I'll stick around here for a while. Way out here? What for? Tie on a bun, maybe. Like you did. What are you up to, Craig? I could be sad and sentimental... Like you're sad and sentimental. Good night, mister. When Trainer Barley tore himself away, I got on the phone. Headquarters? Relay this message to Lieutenant Trav Rogers and quick. He's to meet Barry Craig at Dr. Otto Steiner's in Wentmore, out in Nassau County, as fast as he can make it. <laughs> Leaving the tavern to hitch a ride to Doc Steiner's, Trainer Barley tried to make good on a threat. Barley shooting from the concealment of roadside bushes. I'd need surgery and electric therapy to recover the use of my left hand. I found my own bush. I warned you the secret would be hard to keep, Craig. Call a lie by its right name, mister. I saw you go to the phone. Now come and get the rest of my gun. I order you to surrender, Barley. You're not in the penny arcade now, Craig. No shooting at sitting ducks. Barley, it's a lost cause. The legend's not half the size of your crazy sentimental fanaticism. Give up, Barley. I'm finding the range, Craig. I've found the range. Your voice was the range, Barley. Crawl into the open on your hands and knees or I'll shoot to kill. Oh. 
Later, after patching up Barley's leg wounds in a private hospital behind Otto Steiner's residence, Trav Rogers and I got to meet Boxer Doyle in the flesh. Gentlemen, this is Boxer Doyle. A shrunken man, half as big as the sports world remembered him. He sat in a chair facing a window, vacant to his surroundings, deaf to our voices. Around his waist was a diamond belt held in place by pins. This was the secret kind of body risked his life to keep? And Sam Sparrow. Only his wife knew nothing. A rare disease of the spine. Malignant. Doyle fell away bit by bit to what you see. How long, Doctor? Not long. He has nothing left. Only his magnificent fighting heart. Trav. Yes, Craig. When the story gets out, I'm taking over. As crazy fanatic as trainer Barley. Any tarnish on the legend of a great champ, I'll break heads. Good night, folks. See you next week. been listening to William Gargan in another exciting transcribed mystery drama from the adventures of Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Tonight's story, The Deadly Fight, was written by John Robert. Next week, it's the strange story titled The Very Odd Job, about which Barry Craig has this to say. Next week, I'm hired to deliver a puppet, watch a girl faint, discover a vintage murder, and realize that the only thing that's black as it's painted is a coffin. See you next week, folks. Featured in the role of Mrs. Doyle was Fran Carlin. Barry Craig, starring William Gargan, was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is Don Pardo speaking. A famous composer sips his brandy and dies. The lovely lady vanishes. On the French Riviera, a childish tune is played again and again behind the locked door. Jagged pieces of a horrible puzzle fitted together into a pattern of murder by Christopher London. <laughs> The National Broadcasting Company presents Christopher London, created especially for radio by the world's most widely read mystery writer, Earl Stanley Gardner, transcribed, produced, and directed by William N. Robeson, and starring Mr. Glenn Ford. <laughs> Christopher London, who can't even take a little walk in the moonlight with a beautiful woman without finding a dead body in his path. Everyone else seems to be able to do the average sort of thing, go to a show or a concert without the man in the next seat winding up with a stiletto on his back, but not me, no. no. Like that night I went to Carnegie Hall to hear the new piano concerto by my old friend Louis Deshaies. Louis was the kind of man you seldom come across anymore. Vital despite 60-odd years with an eye for the ladies, 20 cigars a day, evenings of brandy, roulette, and romance. Well, after the concert, he slipped away with me to a small bar around the corner from Carnegie Hall where we could chat quietly. Oh, Christopher, how I detest to listen to my own music. Oh, nerve-wracking. Ah, it will be good to get away, to relax. No music, no work. Where are you going? Wendelka. 
she has written me to spend a holiday at her chateau in Monte Carlo. Juan Delca, the pianist? Yes. Oh, that's a great artist. I've heard her play. Oh, one of the most remarkable women of our time. Even now, at 60, she can captivate the heart of men half her age. The vitality, the allure. I, I fell in love with her twice in my life. Once at 16 and again at 40. I even wanted to marry her. Me, Louis Dauchet, willing to marry. But I couldn't afford her. Uh, extravagant? Oh, that is another statement. Why, Delka, she lives to the hilt. Compared to her, I'm middle class. Oh, how that woman lives. The fortune she's lost at roulette. The racing car she has bought. The chateau she's lived in. Ah, she sounds wonderful. At 60, she is not only a great pianist, Linguist, mathematician, poet... You know, you sound as though you're still in love with her. It's too bad you couldn't afford her. Oh, need I tell you how little a composer like me earns? Few concerts, the sale of records. That is all. Oh, for a man with my taste, it has been hard. But now, all will be changed. Christopher, when I return, I should be a wealthy man. Oh. How are you going to manage that? Uh, <laughs> I cannot tell you, Christopher. I beg your pardon. Huh? Is this seat taken? Oh, no. Uh, do sit down, mademoiselle. I was at the concert. Oh, it was a beautiful concerto, Mr. Duchesne. Oh, oh, you know who I am. Oh. oh, how nice. And you are? Oh, just a girl called Anne. And uh, this is Mr. London. Hello. Hello. Another round, gents. How about you, young lady? Uh, yes, the young lady may have whatever she wishes. Oh, oh no, I only intend. Oh, but I insist. Oh, thank you. A vermouth cassis, please. Another cognac for me. Uh, Christopher? Uh, no, no, thanks. Anne? May I tell you that you are the most beautiful young lady that I've met in many a dull year? Christopher, isn't she exquisite? Very. Yes, I'm partial to lavender eyes and red hair. Thank you. Perhaps you are musician. Oh, no. I'm I'm nobody. Oh. It's strange, my, my sitting here with two men who lead such exciting lives. I, too. Heavens, I know the name Christopher London. Oh. Here's your drinks. Oh, thank you very much, yes. To your concerto, Mr. Duchesne. To your beauty, Mademoiselle Anne. Thank you. Oh, look. Isn't that a turby over there? Where? Over there, in the corner. Turn around and tell me. Mm, no oh, resemblance, but it is not a turby. Mm, no, I, I see now it isn't. Oh, dear, what time is it? Mm. Oh, let's see. It's, uh, oh, 11.40. Oh, I must make a phone call. Do excuse me for a second. I'll be right back. Oh, la, 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 la. Oh, such beauty. Oh, that soft skin. That red hair. That red hair is one of the finest wigs I've ever seen. Oh, Christopher, ridiculous. Oh, somewhere I've met her before. But where? You cynical young man. Oh, no, my friend. You are so wrong. You are... Honey, I... I... I, I, I'm dis dizzy. What's the matter? My eyes, I... What? Huh? Christopher! Uh, oh, wait, 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 wait. What's wrong with him, mister? He's dead. She? How? Uh, you better not wash that cognac glass. I have a hunch the police will find poison in it. Getting us to turn our backs. That's the oldest trick in the world. We fell for it. That, that redhead? Yeah, yeah, the beautiful, phony redhead. You were right, Mr. London. Poison. Uh, how about the girl, Inspector? Not a trace. What gets me is the motive. Why bump off an old guy who writes music? <laughs> Maybe the music was real, lousy, huh? No, no. Somebody didn't want him to go abroad. Uh, that's tough luck. Europe must be swell this time of year. Yes, I, I think it will be. Well, what do you mean? I'll see you when I get back. Where are you going? To the south of France. There's a woman I ought to meet. Uh, <laughs> that's different. I thought you were going on business. I am, Inspector. Grim business. It's always hard to lose a friend, especially when his music has brought joy to a world which needs all the joy it can get. I was angry, cold angry. Poor Louis de Chaise. Never again to see his old love, the great, the famous Juan Delca. And to come back a wealthy man. What did it all mean? Why should he die at the hands of a girl with lavender eyes and a lilting voice? So I boarded a plane for France. Hello, Mr. London. Hello, Mr. Duchesne. 
And the next night, I walk into the fabulous casino at Monte Carlo. I went from table to table, looking for the artist and woman known as one Delka. When suddenly... Hello, London. Huh? Well, Phil Zeruccio, huh? <laughs> well, how time flies. Last time I saw you, a, a grand jury was indicting you for murder. Yeah, but I got a good mouthpiece. How's Broadway? Yeah, a lot safer since you were deported, Phil. I got news for you, London. I ain't particularly delighted to see you here. Yeah. Afraid I'll spoil some little project you're working on? Listen, I'm a respectable businessman here. Yeah. Bought myself a chain of restaurants. Pure as the driven snow, you might say, speaking of me. I'll bet. Probably every politician from Marseille to Rome is bribed up to their beards. Oh, sweet, London. Better yet, don't talk. Just beat it. Get out of Monaco. Try Bulgaria or Iceland. You know, I've often wondered, Zeruccio, did you really have 40 guys killed off like the DA said? Or was it all of us? I'm warning you, London, stop needling. I got full in Europe. I can have you out of here in a day. Keep your nose clean and stay out of my hair. I knew Phil Zeruccio. Compared to him, Lucky Luciano and Lepke were sissies. Or was he on the level about turning over a new leaf? And what was he doing here in a plaid dinner jacket, wandering about the casino of Monte Carlo? Did he know the girl of the lavender eyes? Had he ever heard of one Delta? I strolled out into the gardens, thinking, thinking. Penny for your thoughts, Kit. What? Oh, well, Professor Sullivan. Oh, bless you, kid. It's good to see you. I've missed you dreadfully. And how did you know I'd be here? Intuition, my now, friend. Now, wait a don't kid me, Professor. Every time I'm working on a case, you pop up. Havana, Paris, everywhere I go. Ah, but you pay me so well, kid. Uh, can I do any favors now for you? I'm your humble servant. You can trust me. Uh, oh, yes, always for a price. <laughs> You've been in jail since I last saw you? Oh, only a fortnight. In Algiers. Oh, kid, Algerian prisons are gloomy places. <laughs> Well, I suppose I've got to let you help me. Yes, that's right. You're my conscience, kid. Mm. You always pay me to do something legal and save me from evil association. I have a proposition. Oh, those words are like rose petals. How much? Oh, fifty. What do I steal? Do you know a woman called Juan Delka? Oh, yes, a great woman. Great pianist. A beautiful... Take me to her chateau. Oh, now I'd be cheating you if I did that. See, the poor lady was... Did you say was? Yes. May the saints cherish her. Wondelka died yesterday. Tomorrow morning is her funeral. Behind this tombstone. I dislike graveyards intensely, yes, but this funeral fascinates me. I wonder who are those two mourners? Hmm? Oh, they are her only relatives, her sister and her niece. I came from Poland only recently. Uh -huh. I wonder what they look like. I wish they'd raise up their veils. Oh, that's better. Oh, thank you. Well, the mother must have been a beauty in her day. Wondelka was even more beautiful, at 60. Her uh, only relatives, huh? Oh, yes, yes, that's right. She never married, did she? Oh, the niece is exquisite. Now, there now. Isn't she the most beautiful brunette you've ever seen? So she just came from Poland, did she? Yes. Hmm. Well, the day before yesterday, I saw her sitting at a bar on 56th Street in New York in a red wig. Oh, that's impossible. Now, she came from Poland. Oh, Professor, it grieves me to tell you this, but you're a liar. Oh, Kit, if you didn't pay me so well, I'd be hurt to the quick. Now, how well do you really know these two women? Come on, now, tell the truth. I've never spoken a word to her. For $50 more, would you tell me the real truth? Oh, well, in that case, I thought so. Cash. Ah, oh, Professor, Professor, oh, you're a rascal. All right, here you are. Good, good. Now, the truth is this. Those charming women pay me to stay in this town so that I can notify them should anyone try and get near one Delka's chateau. Why are they so eager to keep people away from that house? Who knows? Perhaps, I'll merely say, perhaps, von Delka is not in that coffin at all. Well, uh, 
I've got another task here. I might do it. it. It will get into trouble entering without permission. You're a stickler for ethics at the wrong time, Professor. There now. That does it. Well, this is quite a place. Yes, it dates back to Marie Antoinette. Mm, I wonder where the servants are. You know, that's a strange thing, Kit. A few days after the two women arrived here, not a servant could be located. Oh, naturally. Uh, where could one Delka be? Oh, I don't know. Not that, I swear, is true. Uh, oh, I wonder where that staircase leads over there. Hmm? Oh, that's to the bedrooms. All right, let's try it. Look, the uh, women will be coming back from the funeral soon. Courage, Professor. This, uh, this staircase was built too steep, Kit. Behind that door. Perhaps that's Wandelka. Undoubtedly. Let's see here. And that's locked. Uh, Wandelka. <clears throat> Wandelka, is that you? Ah, it gives me goose temples to hear that. A great pianist playing like a child, feeble minded, insane, maybe? Yes. And why is she being kept a prisoner in her own house? Now, look, I'll give you another 50. No, if you were to offer me a million, I couldn't tell you, Kit. Now, those women tell me very little. Wandelka. Wandelka. Look, I know you're being held a prisoner. I've come to help you. Can you hear me? Uh, it's like a lunatic asylum. Come on, let's get out of here. Yes, yes, sir. They'll be back soon, and I want to meet those lovely ladies on a different basis. Oh, Kit. What does one Delco mean to you? A friend of mine loved her. Yes, monsieur? I have uh, come to offer my condolences at your loss. I'm from America. I I played many times in the Philharmonic Orchestra when Wandelka was the soloist. Won't you come in? Mama, this is an American gentleman who knew poor auntie. He has come to pay his respect. You come at unhappy time. Won't you sit down? Thank you, madame. Your sister was one of the great musicians, one of the great women of the century. She inspired me to love music and to love life. She will be remembered as was Bernhardt and Duse and Madame Curie. Oh, I am glad to know someone young and a foreigner still holds her memory, dear. What was the cause of her death, madame? Pneumonia. She insists on going to casino. She loved to play roulette. And that night it rained, it rained. And, and she caught cold. She was so weak and... I oh, don't cry, Mama. The past is over. Why are there no servants here to attend to your needs, madame? We wish to sit here alone with our grief. Oh, but we are being ungracious, Anna. The wine... Ah, your name is Anna? Yes, my sister had always a great wine cellar. You stay here, Anna, and entertain the gentlemen. I will get the wine. Why you look at me like that, monsieur? I came to find death. And I found beauty. Thank you. It is so seldom one sees a Polish girl with hair so black. My father was part Italian. Oh, I see. You know, were Renoir alive today, he would wish to paint you. Your coloring is exquisite. The black, black hair and the lavender eyes... Make love to me, monsieur. You choose the most unhappy time. Oh, but when a man is swept off his feet, love does not wait on birth or death. I had heard how impetuous Americans were. Oh, no, no. What would my mother say? Oh, she's still in the wine cellar. You are wicked. Oh? Well, then, one key. Yes. Christopher. 
the name of the saint put you on your feet. Yet you are charming. Anna. Anna. Oh, Anna, I could compose a tone poem to that name. Please, Mother is coming back. Oh, Mother has no sense of timing. Oh, the steps of hard and old women. Oh, yeah. dear Anna, pour the gentleman his wine. Taste it, and tell me if you have ever had a finer amoroso. Yes, drink, monsieur. Aren't you joining me? Not just now. Oh, but I insist your daughter at least take part in an old American custom. Huh? Uh, yes, it's called the loving cup. Now, when a man meets a girl as lovely as your daughter, he asks her, he asks her to drink first from his glass. Anna is too young to drink. Oh, but surely an exception can be made here. I accept your flattery, monsieur. However... It is not flattering. No, to look at you is to have some of the chill taken from the memory of your dead aunt. Now, oh, wait... Don't I hear a piano being played somewhere? Oh, no, young man. Imagination plays tricks, you know. My poor sister. Oh, yes, yes, of course. I must have imagined it. Come, Anna. You shall have the first sip from my glass. I cannot allow my daughter... I insist. It is difficult, young man, to know where flattery ends and rudeness begins with you. Surely you can't object to drinking your own wine, Anna. Or can you? Oh, uh, of course not. No. No. Certainly not. Well, then. Anna, no. That's a pretty phony accent you girls are wearing. All right, wise guy. Now, just stand quite uh, still. What a smart little revolver. It'll do the work, Professor. Yes, yes. I'm coming. Tie this fool up in the cellar. Oh. Poor kid. You shouldn't have come here. Oh, Professor, sometimes you shake my faith in the human race. <laughs> Listening to Christopher London, starring Glenn Ford. You know, Professor, that gun pointing at me is superfluous. Ha <laughs> ha, bless you, kid. I'll take no chances with you. Oh, where's your shame? I'm taking my money and then telling those women about me. Well, it's difficult to have both a conscience and a bank book at the same time. Uh, what wouldn't you do for money? Offhand, I can't really imagine. <laughs> Uh, tell me, how much did they pay you to double-cross me? 50,000 francs. Well, that's hardly worth the effort, the way francs are these days. Now, don't undermine my confidence in international finance, kid. You know, I pity you. Here you'll sit and starve while they go on trying to get a secret from her. What secret? I wish I knew. I asked Lottie, that's the girl who calls herself Anna. Lottie's from Newark, New Jersey. Worked in a burlesque for a while. Uh, I'll bet you did. I asked her what secret would one doker have. She only snarled at me. It's amazing how beautiful women can snarl. Uh, Louis de Chaise was poisoned at the bar by Lottie. Why? He was coming to visit one Delka. He was sure he'd strike it rich. Now, what had one Delka written him? I mean, why should she, of all people, be kept a prisoner? Why the fake funeral? Too bad you will never know the answers. Yeah, think they're asleep by now? Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I'll think of that wonderful woman, Professor. Haven't you any sentiment? Well, for five hundred dollars in American money, I could weep buckets, and at the same time cut your cords. Two hundred. Five. Either my price, or I sit here and I starve. Now, which is it going to be? Oh well, naturally, I can't let you die. Oh, that's a deal. Uh, there's no use unless I get to that room upstairs. Oh, by the merest chance, I picked the old lady's pocket. What? Yes, I have the key. And for another 50... No, 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 no. Oh, right. well, what can I do? My heart can't allow you to be eaten by rats. Oh. Wait, here. Yeah. I'll cut you free. Uh, 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 that's it. Uh, well, uh, you're a noble soul, Professor. Yes. Now, here's the key. Now, we go upstairs to find one Delka. Oh, not me. No, I've had enough for one day. I'll go back and have sweet dreams in your hotel room. Now then, give me the money. Oh, I haven't it on me. How about tomorrow? Fortunately, in the past, your credit has been good. Well, Kit, we come to the parting of the ways. I back to town, and you too. Yes, yes. Who knows where? Madame 
Madame Mondelka? Madame Mondelka. Who are you? I don't know you. Go away. I don't know you. Please try to understand what I'm saying. It's very important. I've come to get you away from these women. I don't know you. Yes, yes, I know. I I, all right, I know. I know about that. Now, we're going to get you out of here. I'll take you to a hospital. I'll take care of you. You'll be well again. Please, please will, you, will you stop playing and listen to me? My name is Christopher London. I'm a friend of Louis de Chais. Ah, good. I had to make sure. Thank heaven you have come. Uh, the fools. The arrogant fools. Who did they think they were browbeating some poor little old lady? How easy it was to pretend I was out of my mind. You say you know my friend, Louis. Yes. He was all set to sail for France when he was murdered. Murdered? Oh, no. Poor, poor man. How horrible. Yes, well, I hated to tell you. But... Well, at my age, one's friends die one by one. Who killed him? That girl. It was that girl, wasn't it? Yes. Oh, poor Louis. Yes. He was always a boy at heart about a pretty face. Like I am about a handsome face. I must say, young man, I could not ask for a finer-looking rescuer than you. How romantic of you to bother about an old lady like me. Well, not really an old lady. Don't be too optimistic. We've got to get out of here. This is a dangerous gang. Yes, I see them all hanged yet. Oh, the guillotine. Her pretty head chopped off. Oh, my poor Louis. Tell me, why did they kill him? He was the only one to whom I confided my secret. Secret? Young man, I have three passions. Attractive men, the playing of the piano, and the roulette wheel. The first two... I mastered. But the third, now, at last, I have, after years, I have discovered the perfect mathematical system to break the bank at Monte Carlo. Oh? This gang found out about my system. Little or they take over my chateau one day, pretend to be my relatives, get rid of my friends, get rid of my servants, and I am their captive. But I do not tell them this system. I destroy all papers, all calculations. Oh, but you must have one copy hidden. Ah, I have. Now, look, this is no time to play. This is it. This is the system. Well, what do you mean? Play the tune in the key of E. Use B, C flat as the code for number one. What's the old musical code? Naturally. Played and varied five times. When it's decoded, the entire numerical system is spelled out. I've kept it in my mind all this time. Played it so I would not forget. Okay, wise guy, I told you to keep your hands off. Hello, Zeruccio. You're at the bottom of all this, huh? Oh, what are you going to do? Don't beat me again. Shut up, you idiotic fool. Stop playing and come across with that system. What system? I'm just an old lady who has my arm on my arm. Mark, work one second. Uh, oh, no, you don't, Zeruchio. Out of my way, London. Not so fast. Get his gun. I have it. Shall I shoot them both? It would be a pleasure. You're not insane. No. And my fingers are exceptionally strong, thanks to Mozart. You silly girl. I'll stand guard, Monsieur London. You get the police. What about the other woman? Where is she? It does not matter. If she shows up, I'll take care of her. If she does not show up, the police, they will find her. Well, you're everything that Louis said, madame. Brave, wise, and beautiful. Oh, I think soon I shall play a concert dedicated to you, monsieur. Oh, if I were 20 years younger. You are eternally young, madame. What? Hold up your hands. Oh, you caught them. <laughs> yes, I'm afraid your heroics have come a little late, Professor. Oh, Wondelka, give him your gun. He will stand guard until I come back with the police. You must be weary. Weary? Nonsense. After you are done with the police, come to the casino. I will be there playing my system. I'll treat you to champagne and introduce you to all the pretty girls. Oh, so that was it. A system to break the bank, eh? But, uh... 
What is the system? You'd like to know, Professor? Oh, yes. Very much, huh? Very much, yes. Yes, I see. Well, give him your system, Wandelka. Allegro con moto. <laughs> was Christopher London, starring Glenn Ford, transcribed, produced, and directed by William N. Robeson, and created especially for radio by the world's most widely read mystery writer, Earl Stanley Gardner. Tonight's play was written by Bernard Schoenfeld, with a musical score composed and conducted by Van Cleave. Included in Mr. Ford's company were Ben Wright, Eleanor Audley, Ramsey Hill, Jeanette Nolan, Ted DeCorsia, Georgia Ellis, and Rick Vallon. <laughs> Hello, Yukon 28209. Yes, this is Candy Matson. Come on, Mellard. Stop pouting. Enjoy yourself. It's earlier than you think. Monterey at Christmas time is delightful. Carmel is most enchanting. Salinas, I enjoy. But to haul us way over to some unexplored cannibal country is too much. <laughs> Did you hear that, Rembrandt? Cannibal country, he calls it. Mallard, me boy. This may come as a shock, but San Juan Batista was founded by the Franciscan Fathers in 1797. I remember it as though it were yesterday. Don't let him bother you, Ducky. Mallard can't stand this wonderful air. He misses the gas fumes of the big city. That's not that candy, but I do want to get back. Relax, Max. You had a chance to take two days off, so make the most of them. Uh, what's the name of this town again? San Juan Batista. You'll love it, Mallard, dear, really. The mission, all the old buildings still standing. Oh, you'll adore it. Honestly, you will. Look, Rembrandt, old friend, I may like a thing, but I'll be hanged if I'll adore it. As you will, minion. Oh. How much farther, Candy? We're just entering the town now. I thought we'd take a look at the mission first. Okay. Hey, this is a cute little town at that. That's my boy. I knew you'd warm up once I got you over here. You know, strictly from a police angle, you might be interested in knowing that Joaquin Murrieta visited here more than once. So did Three-Fingered Jack. Where's my shooting iron? I'll get the varmints. <laughs> Take it easy, hop along. We're approaching the mission. Oh, for golly's sakes. It's a big one. Isn't it beautiful, Mally? And don't you get a whole flood of thoughts going through your head when you look at it? Yeah. With a little imagination, one could almost see the native Indians walking back and forth, coming into town for the evening vespers. I only hope the mission's open. Well, let's find out. Good idea. I think I see one of the fathers around the front, Candy. You can ask him. Thank you, Ducky. Yes, let's go. Good afternoon, Father. Mm hmm. Oh. oh, good afternoon, young lady. Can you tell me if the mission is open this afternoon? Oh, yes, most certainly. <laughs> Do forgive me if I appear somewhat startled. I was picking these red berries and I failed to hear you drive. I'm sorry, Father. Oh, that's quite all right. I fear my thoughts were wandering. Uh, pardon me, may I introduce Mr. Watson? How do you do, Father? And this Watson? gentleman is Lieutenant Mellard. Oh, are you, sir? Uh, Lieutenant? No, what? not the military, Father. I'm with the San Francisco police. The police? <laughs> no, Father, we're not here on business. Uh, I was wondering. I thought for a moment that Father Philip might have reported me. Reported you? For what, Father? At lunchtime, I made a frightful mistake. By, uh, <clears throat> error, I ate his apple. <laughs> right under his very nose, too. <laughs> oh, pardon me. I'm Father Paulino. I'm very happy to know you, Father. My name is Candy Matson. I have some free time I would be pleased to show you about. May I? We'd be delighted, Father Paulino. <sighs> I think uh, we can start with the yard. It gets dark so early this time of year. Father Paulino. Father Paulino. 
Why, it's uh, Miguel Torres. What could be wrong? Oh, Father Paulino, it is there. Miguel, my son, what is it? What has happened? Oh, the most awful thing you ever hear of. Vicente, he just shoot himself. Merciful in heaven. Is he badly hurt, Miguel? Oh, I think... I think he is dying, Father. No, 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 no. The poor boy. Where is he? At his house. Excuse me, Miss Matson. I must leave immediately. Would my car be of any help, Father? Uh, the car. Yes, thank you. From Studio A in San Francisco's Radio City, the National Broadcasting Company presents Candy Matson, Yukon 2, 8209. Tragedy in the sleepy little California mission town of San Juan Bautista. But it wasn't the first time. If you look around the side of the mission, you'll see that the place marks the mass grave of 12,000 Indians who died in a smallpox epidemic years ago. San Juan has seen knifings, too, and other shootings. It had lived a rowdy life in the dim years gone by, and obviously the rowdiness was still alive in a minor sort of fashion. We got in the car, and with Miguel directing us in broken English and Latin gestures, we made our way out on a dirt road about three miles outside of town near the granite quarry. We finally pulled up in front of a one-story wooden house that must have been built before the turn of the century. We went inside and... There was the prone form of a Mexican boy of about 21 or 2. There he is, Father. Is, is he all right? I don't know, Miguel. I'll have to see. He's gone, isn't he, Father? Yes. May his soul dwell eternally in peace. He, he, he is dead. Miguel, listen to me. His flesh is cold, yes, but his soul still lives. Do you understand what I'm saying, my son? Yes, Father Paulino. Wait a moment. Mallard, hmm? look. Here, where he was shot. Well, well. If Vicente knocked himself off, he certainly did it the hard way. You're not kidding. Miss Matson, would you mind very much if we brought the body back in with us to the mission? I'm afraid we can't, Father. Would you step over here? I have something to tell you. Certainly, Miss Matson. You wear a look of concern. Is there something wrong? I'm afraid there is, Father Paulino. Well, what do you mean? But it looks very much as though this wasn't self-inflicted. What? You don't mean that... Oh, Miss Matson, are you sure of what you're saying? Reasonably so, Father. You see, a, a gun held at close range leaves powder marks. Vicente's wound is as clean as a whistle. Well, I... I don't know what to say. I'm sorry, Father, but that's why we can't remove the body. We'll have to call the sheriff's office in Hollister. Can you tell me where I can find a phone? Yes, there's one at the mission... If you don't mind, I'll stay here. I have work to do. Father Paulino was right. He had work to do. The ecclesiastical kind. And he did it in a simple and impressive way. San Juan Batista, with a population of a little over 600, and we run plop into a murder. Mallard said he'd go back to the mission and make the call, and left. Forty-five minutes later, the undersheriff of San Benito County drove up with Mallard. He asked the standard questions, but learned nothing. We went over the house with a fine-tooth comb, but we came up with a blank. There being nothing else to do at the moment, the men put the body in the sheriff's car, and he drove back to Hollister, and we returned to the mission. Would you uh, care to take a stroll about the gardens, Miss Matson? It's most peaceful. Makes a wonderful place for clear thinking. Well, yes, Father. I, I'd love to. Mallard? Well, you go ahead, Candy. I promised the sheriff I'd take a look around town for him. Oh, sure. Want to come along with me, Rembrandt? Yes, I believe I will. If you don't mind, Candy. No, no, not at all. One thing before you go. You will be my guests for dinner, won't you? 
That's most gracious of you, Father. What do you think, Candy? I think it would be charming. Okay. We'll see you back in a little while, then. <sighs> this is a tragic thing, Miss Matson. The Santi was a splendid lad and a good Christian. I know how you must feel, Father. I never could understand why there must be things of this sort in the world. Not only between individuals, but countries and nations as well. It is hard to comprehend. The more I try to reason, the more confused I become. About Vicente, Father, who do you suppose could have done it? I don't know. I I really don't. How about Miguel? What? Oh, no, Miss Matson. Why, he and Vicente were like brothers. Brothers sometimes quarrel, you know. Uh, not in this case. Miguel is a good boy. Why, he works here at the mission. You'll pardon me, Father, but in my business, I find I have to be doubtful at times. What is your business, Miss Matson? I'm a private investigator, Father. How very curious. Yes, I, I suppose he is, but in a sense, you're a policeman too, Father. I? Yes. You police the soul, don't you? Ride herd on the, on the thoughts and actions of men? Why, yes. I'd never thought of it that way before. Yes, in a sense, I suppose I do wear a badge. I wear the badge of righteousness. The star of God. Father Paulino was a wonderful man. As we walked about the mission gardens, he spoke of many things, but in parallels, all connected in some way with the killing of poor Vicente. The time passed swiftly. I was so engrossed in listening to the kindly voice of the man, and before I knew it, Mallard and Rembrandt had returned, and it was time for dinner. Miguel did the cooking and waited on the table. Dinner was a masterpiece of simplicity, and if it hadn't been for the tragedy of the afternoon, I would have been enjoying a serenity I'd never known before. Did Vicente live out there all by himself, Father? Yes, the house belonged to him. He's a descendant of one of the original families of San Juan. His great, great, great grandfather owned one of the largest ranchos in California. It stretched from here to the Pacific Ocean. That's a lot of property. Indeed. Uh, you see, it was given to him by the King of Spain under one of the original Spanish land grants. I understand there still are some in existence. Yes, I believe there are. But they've all been chopped up and sold in much smaller parcels. Did Vicente work, Father? Oh, yes, he was a good worker. Seasonally, in the artichoke fields and the lettuce fields, in the off-seasons, he did odd jobs about the town. Uh, speaking of town, Father, do you know a woman named Rose Taylor? Why do you ask that? Do you? Yes. Why do you mention the name? There's a little bar down the street. Yes, I know. The frailties of mankind. The fellow who runs the place says there's been talk about Vicente being kind of loco over the Taylor girl. I'd heard something of the sort, too. I was going to speak to him about it on Sunday. How long has she been here, Father? She arrived about two months ago. I'm afraid she's been a disturbing influence on our little village ever since. Did you talk to her, Mallard? No. Where does she live, Father? In a small cottage over on 2nd and Polk Street. I think we ought to take a little walk over there, don't you, Mallard? Right as rain, Cupcake. I dropped by her place before dinner, but she wasn't in. Oh, you know where it is, then? Mm hmm Good. Please don't think it's rude, Father, but it's something we have to follow through on. I understand, Miss Matson. <laughs> We got up from the table and went outside the mission. We pulled our coats closely about us and little jets of steam came from our mouths as we breathed the crisp evening air. We'd only gone about a dozen steps or so and we were stopped by a voice from behind. Please, senorita Matson, senor. Huh? Why, it's Miguel. What is it, Miguel? Something wrong? Uh, I hear you talking inside. You are going over to see senorita Taylor? That's right. Oh, please, no. The senorita Taylor, she is a good girl. She would not to hurt anyone. That's not what Father Paulino seems to think. Oh, the good father, he does not know much about the outside. 
All his life, he lived in the mission. He is, uh, how would you say, is secluded? The good father may be secluded, Miguel. But I have a strong hunch he knows more about what's going on around here than anyone in town. Oh, but please, you believe me? Senorita Taylor, she is a good person. Look, Miguel, you want to find out who killed Vicente, don't you? Oh, she, she? Well, that's what we're trying to do. Now, you be a good boy, Miguel, and don't get yourself all in the stew. We left Miguel and walked over a couple of blocks to 2nd and Polk Street. We found the cottage and saw a light in the front window. Mallard knocked. And what opened the door would have been a delight on any movie screen, if you like your beauty the hard way. Rose Taylor, it was obvious, could raise an awful lot of havoc with the local swains. Something you wanted? Yes, we'd like to talk to you for a moment, if you don't mind. Yes, I do mind. I'm kind of busy. I'm sorry, Miss Taylor, but you'll have to unbusy yourself. This is the police. Police. Always the police. Why can't you let me alone? You've uh, been in trouble before? Mm, Nothing serious. Might be this time. You know a kid named Vicente? Yeah, I heard what happened. These crazy kids. They have a yen for knifings and shootings. Don't they just? This is Lieutenant Mallard. He tells me he was by here this afternoon, and you weren't in. That's right. I went into Salinas to do some shopping. We can prove that, can we? Absolutely. Well, well, what have we here? A very cozy little thirty-two revolver. And also nicely cleaned and oiled. You always keep it this immaculate, Miss Taylor? Certainly. When some character gets too much tequila under the belt, you don't know what's going to happen. And the suitcase on the bed. You getting ready to go somewhere? Wait. If you're trying to make out that I knocked off this center, you're just whistling Dixie in four flats. Look, a telegram. If you'll take the time and the courtesy to read it, you'll find that my sister in Los Angeles is a very sick girl. I was going down to spend a week or so with her. What is this, a convention hall? Come in. Buenas noches, senorita. Miguel, beat it. I'm busy. I am sorry. I I am sorry. I have a message for senorita Matson and for you, senor. Father Paulino sent me. A message? What is it, Miguel? The sheriff in Hollister just called on the telephone. He said to tell senor Mallard that the bullet that killed Vicente was from a thirty-two caliber gun. <laughs> From San Francisco, the National Broadcasting Company is presenting Candy Matson, Yukon 2, 8209. Well, now, a 32 slug had killed Vicente, and Miss Taylor owned a 32 gun. It looked practically Taylor made. However, I've seen coincidences like this before that have gone up in thin smoke. Mallard plucked the rose and asked her to return to the mission. And right there, I got me a king-sized idea. I excused myself, went to the little bar, and from the owner, I found out where the local banker lived. Five minutes later, I was in his living room talking to him, a gentleman named Banta. Yes, it's terrible. I only heard about it a half hour ago. Vicente was a splendid lad. That's what I've heard. Well, the reason I'm here, Mr. Banta, is to inquire about his financial status. Did he do any banking at all? Oh, yes. Up to about five or six weeks ago. Uh Uh-oh. Can you tell me more? Well, he had a savings account of approximately $2,800. Suddenly, he began making withdrawals. Two hundred, three hundred at a time. Yesterday, he made another withdrawal. He left a total of $400 in his account. Well, what do you know about that? Well, he said he was having trouble with his props this year. The rain and all that. Mm Mm-hmm. What about Miguel Torres? Now, that's a very strange thing. He had an account of $900. That's practically gone, too. I assumed he was helping his friend Vicente. I smell a very well-shaped rodent. Name of Taylor. Thanks, Mr. Banta. You've been a great help. Things seem to be taking shape. It looked like the old story of a no-good playing both ends against the middle. Both ends being Vicente and Miguel. The no good? 
Rose Taylor. Scattered pieces of the puzzle were beginning to fall in place. Father Paulino. At first I couldn't believe it. And I wondered what his reaction would be. Next step, the bartender at the village pub. I walked in and caught him at a good time. The place was empty. Good evening. What can I do for you? A package of cigarettes, please. Sure. How are these? No, no, the, the others, if you will. All right. Thank there you. you are. Mm-hmm. Anything else? Mm-hmm. Information. Yeah, what do you want to know? Miguel Torres and a kid named Vicente. Do they come in here often? Who are you? Private investigator. Here. My merit badge. Yeah, that's a new one. The lady cop. Ah, the world is ever-changing, Buster. Uh, now the answer. Yeah, they used to come in about once a week. Usually on Saturday nights. Drink much? Nah, good kids, both of them. When were they in here last? Well, let's see. Yeah, night before last. Any arguments? Ah, they're so soft-spoken, those kind of guys, it's hard to tell. But now that you mention it, I think there was a bit of a rhubarb going on. Who was taking the lead? Tories. I gather he was sort of griped about something. Not too loud, not much fire. Mm, That's when it gets dangerous. And they weren't drunk? Nope. And I can spot a lush at 40 paces. They each had a beer and left. Thanks, mister. Here, buy yourself a cup of Christmas cheer. Well, thank you. Click. Another piece of the puzzle in place. And all roads led right back to the mission. With the exception of the late Vicente, we had the full cast of characters front stage center. And a neat little bit of intrigue it was, too. As I drew near, the warm lights of the mission were streaking through the windows, contrasting greatly to the thoughts that were going around in my head. I walked in. Father Paulino was sitting over his desk, his head buried on his arms. Mallard was leaning back in a chair, watching Rose Taylor, who in turn was smoking a cigarette and pacing the room. Rembrandt was reading a copy of the National Geographic. All heads snapped to me as I entered. Why a cupcake? Have fun? Of sorts. What's new here? Oh, waiting for the sheriff from Hollister. He's going to book the Taylor lady on suspicion of murder. That way he can hold her. I think I have somebody else for him to hold. Father Paulino? Yes, Miss Matson. I think you know what I'm about to say. Yes. Yes, I think I do. Where is he? In the next room. I'll call him. Miguel, my son. See, si, Father. Come in here, please. Si. Miss Matson wants to talk to you. You're here in the mission now, Miguel. You're standing right under the cross. You can't lie. You killed Vicente, didn't you? Yes. Why? I love her. I give her everything I have. My love, my heart, my money, everything. She tell me that she is mine, all mine. That we will be married. Right here in the mission by the good father Paulino. Then last week... I find she is also making the pretend love to Vicente. I almost went crazy. You told Vicente to stay away. See, si, that is right. But last night, I stand across the street from Senorita Rose's house. Vicente was there. And as they say goodnight on the front porch, she kissed him and pat his cheek, just as she did to me. And so you shot him this afternoon. With a thirty-eight. And when the sheriff called, you told us it was a thirty-two, knowing that Rose also had a thirty-two. See. Si. That is right. But you would never get me for it. Mallard, Father, come on, don't let him get away. There he goes, up on that wall. Miguel, stop. You can't run away for the rest of your life. I have no life, Father. Miguel, watch out. You're going to... He's done for. Broken back. Is... Is the pain bad, my son? No, Father. Am am I dying? Yes, Miguel. You see, I told you I had no life left. The bells, you hear them, Father? Yes. 
bell ringing, Miguel. Time for the company. You will pray for me, Father Paulino? Of course. Merciful Jesus, all-knowing, all-seeing, look down upon us this night so close upon thine own natal day. This boy I'm holding in my arms, Miguel Torres, <laughs> he has trespassed upon thy commandments. In thine infinite mercy, I seek his forgiveness. Thank you, Father. Thank you. He's gone, Father Polino. Yes. Requi has gone in Bunchy. May his soul rest in peace. Amen. Where is she, the tailor woman? I'm right here, Father. Look upon this boy I'm holding here. The second death in a matter of hours, and all because of you. I know. In the eyes of the law, you are guiltless. You pulled no trigger to cause the death of Ascenti. Miguel fell off a wall to his death. But it was because of you. I... I, I realize that now. Do you? Really? Yes, Father. And perhaps in this hour of dark tragedy, something has been salvaged after all. This is the Yule time, the anniversary of the birth of Christ. In his infinite wisdom, the Almighty is charitable. Rose Taylor, seek his forgiveness. <laughs> Leave San Juan Batista. I'm sure Miguel and Vicente would want it that way. Start anew. Lead a penitent life. It is not too late. Tell me, child, do you recall Mary Magdalene? I do, Father. Need I say more? No. Someone help me with Miguel. We will... Carry him back to the chapel and finish the compliment there. I will, Father. Thank you. Yes. There's a remarkable man, Candy. More than you know, Mallard, dear. Peace on earth, goodwill toward men and woman. In these troublesome times, there is a brilliant, shining example of what we have to hold on to. You know, I wish there was a Father Paulino in every country of the world. We'd have more time for raising kids than for killing them. My point exactly. Come on, Mellor, dear. Let's get back to San Francisco. I have a special star to put on my Christmas tree tonight. For all the Father Polinos that ever lived. Listen again next week at this same time. Just dial... Candy Matson, Yukon 28209. And a very Merry Christmas to you all. Featured in the story were Hal Burdick as Father Polino, Lou Tobin as Miguel Torres, and Jane Bennett Carnell as Rose Taylor. Henry Leff is Lieutenant Ray Mallard, and Jack Thomas plays Rembrandt Watson. The program stars Natalie Masters as Candy, 
and is written and directed by Monty Masters. Sound effects are created by Bill Brownell, and Eloise Rowan is heard at the organ. Our engineer was Clarence Stevens. The characters in this story were entirely fictitious. Any resemblance to actual people is purely coincidental. The program comes to you from San Francisco. This is Dudley Manlove speaking. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. This one's about Pete Kelly. George Lupo. His brother gave it to him after the funeral. The kind of music we play started out as a backroom exercise in a little swamp stop called Myrtle Grove. La Rocca took his Dixieland band to Risenweber's in New York. We got as far as Kansas City. It's no place to get off a train unless you're a sack of mail. Because around here, everybody works at the same job. Staying alive. Half a buck buys a pair of socks, a spaghetti dinner, or a down payment on murder. Well, last night, everything turned sour about midnight. The town was down on its hands and knees trying to crawl through one of those Kansas City hot spells that blast by every third day. It was heat and headaches all the way. Our drummer, Nick, was dragging the beat, and I went bad 12 bars in on the Memphis Blues. So I figured we'd better cut the set short, so we started to fight our way through one chorus of Roses of Pickardy. That's when the kid came in and stood to the bandstand. He was tall enough to see over a quart of milk with a face the size of a minute and just about as young. All right, let's get off for a while. Who's your friend, Pete? I don't know, but he must be tone deaf. Mr. Kelly, Mr. Kelly. Yeah, son. I heard you play. You sound good. We've been better. What's on your mind? Father Cronin sent me to see you. Are you doing a little missionary work? Oh, no, sir, nothing like that. I'm an older boy over there. Father calls me Little Jake. I sure got you working the late shift. Well, I've been trying to get a hold of you all day. Father wants a favor. I'll make it a small one. I'm all out of the big one. And he just wanted to know if you could come by St. Timothy's and see him. He said tomorrow morning right after the 9 o'clock. Okay. Tell him he keeps terrible hours. I'll be there. Thanks, Mr. Kelly. Hey, Kelly. Yeah, that's right. Tell the kid goodbye. He knows his way out. Should I go, Mr. Kelly? Be the kid. Yes, sir. Goodbye, Mr. Kelly. Yeah. Goodbye, Jake. You got someplace private we'd like to talk. This is my office. <laughs> now listen hard, bright eyes. There's enough gun in this coat to blow you right through the wall. I'll take your word for it. We come in here nice and you get funny, Mom. Now you got someplace we can talk. I can't leave. I gotta do a number. Do it. We'll be right here about ten feet from your stomach. Yeah. All right. Let's go. Well, you look sick, Pete. What's the matter? I feel fine. I'm sorry now. Everybody ready? Let's go.
Once you've proved it, now let's go. Yeah. Keep them going, Red. How many shall we do, Pete? If this works out, about ten minutes worth. Let's go. The alley will do. We need a favor, Kelly. Yeah, there's a run on them tonight. Give me the envelope, Dix. Yeah. You got an inside coat pocket, Kelly? Come on, come on. Either throw up half the dice. Hold him, Dix. <laughs> Pull him up, Dex. Come on. Up. Yeah. Now, this is how. Here's an envelope. It goes in your inside coat pocket, and it stays there until 6 o'clock tomorrow night. You don't open it. You don't mess with it. What happens at 6 o'clock? You'll be the first to know. Well, I stood there in the alley and watched them walk away. Inside, Lupo was blowing up a storm. Something about paying for a seven-piece band and only having six. Well, it wasn't worth trying to get back on the stand. I got a cab and went up to my room. I tried to get to sleep. It was no good. I got up. I was sick to my stomach. After that, I went to sleep. The next morning, I made a pass at some breakfast and tried to look through the sports page. Harry Heilman got four for five against the Red Sox, but that's all I read. That envelope had me. People have been taken out in alleys before, and they've been worked over. Usually, they get something away from them, not to give it to them. No matter how I tried to put it together, it wouldn't come out. Thin or fat, it wouldn't slice. I had the envelope, and I had to wait till 6 o'clock. Well, I gave up on the coffee, and I started over to see Father Cronin. It was a little after 9.30 when I started up the step to St. Timothy's. I figured mass was almost over, so I hung around in the vestibule for a couple of minutes, trying to look like a part-time bell ringer. Hi, Mr. Kelly. Hello, Jake. Father's back in the sacristy, Mr. Kelly. He said for me to show you the way. They move it? No, sir. All right, Jake, show me the way. This way, Mr. Kelly. Down this aisle. Well, I guess I was too busy trying to act like I knew my way around to pay much attention to a fat, chunky little guy wearing a brown Borsalino hat. He stood up in a back pew a couple of aisles over. The church was empty except for the three of us. Little Jake found out about it just before I did. Mr. Kelly, that man back there. All right, mister. I'll take that envelope. Jake, get out. Mr. Kelly, look out. Look out. <laughs> Kansas City, you learn early to look for trouble, any place, any time, but this is the first time it caught up with me in the middle of a church. The last three shots were a waste of money. Jake went down like young wheat in a hailstorm. When I grabbed for him, I hit my head in the base of a marble pillar. I lost the edge right there. By the time I hit the street, he was gone. I guess I covered every alley and street in the neighborhood, but it was like trying to wash a pail of dirty water. I don't know how much later it was when I stopped for a minute in an empty doorway and tried to remember what I was chasing. Well, a siren was crying off somewhere in the distance and I started back for the church. The coroner's wagon was just pulling away as I got there. I didn't see Father Cronin around, so I went back to the rectory and rang the bell. He came to the door in his shirt sleeve. He stood there for a minute just looking at me. And then he motioned me inside. In here. Sit down. The kid, Father? Little Jake. He's dead. You want to blow by blow? Yeah, I know, Father. I was there. Sure you were there. You're always there. I should have known better than to call you. I should have known it meant trouble. Oh, wait a minute, Father. This wasn't my party. I called you here today to ask you a favor, Pete. Yeah, I know. You don't know. It's too late now. We we're going to have an altar boys picnic tomorrow at Washington Park. I wanted you to play a little music for us. We won't be going now, Pete. We got a funeral instead. Yeah. What do you want me to say? Don't say anything, Pete. If you've got any private fights, that's your business. But don't bring your beef into the church. I never saw the guy before, Father. Don't kid me. He didn't come in here to shoot little Jake. Now, look, I know this is hard to understand. You bet it's hard to understand. We've been over it before, but you ran with the same pack. You hung on to the same friends. You had it all figured out. Well, you figured this one, Pete. There's a nine-year-old boy on his way to the morgue. He took a gangster's bullet that you earned. Now you go ahead. Figure it. I, I got this envelope. I don't want an explanation. Take your excuses and peddle them where you need them. To the bootleggers and the gunmen. Take them to your crowd. This envelope, Father. They shoved it in my pocket. I was out in the alley behind the club. Two guys. They worked me over. I didn't think they'd try anything like this. Neither did little Jake. All right, Father. I told you I was sorry. Go on home. Why don't you stop cutting at me and say a prayer for that kid? I would, but I'm too busy praying for people like you. Well, you couldn't blame him. How do you explain away a dead kid lying in front of an altar rail? All I could offer was a two-cent envelope in my coat pocket in a wild night in an alley. I started to walk back to my room. I tried to paste up some kind of an answer, but I got nothing. 
I was halfway home when the last breeze left town and went someplace to cool off. My clothes were soaking wet, and I decided to take a cab the rest of the way. I reached in my pocket, and all I had was 23 cents, so I kept walking. Sunday morning's the same in any town. Empty streets and everybody home trading the comic section and living off of Saturday night. You could live here all your life, and on Sunday morning you just got in town. It was about noon when I got to my hotel. I went up to the second floor and unlocked my door. They were sitting on the bed. Their coats were off and they'd hung them on the back of a chair. The same two boys who'd given me the envelope last night. Got a real hot room here, Kelly. You want to move off this cord? Yeah, next time I'll get twin beds. Is everything all right with that envelope? It made a murder, mister. You take it. Put it back in your pocket. Now get this, both of you. There's a lot of something wrong here. I've had my turn. You find yourself another fall guy. There's a lot of inside coat pockets in this town. Look for a new one. We like yours, and that's where it's going to stay. Now, you don't listen good. Me and Dex put it out last night, and you didn't pick up on it. We got you on board, and we'll tell you when to get off. Six o'clock, boy. How long do you think this jag will last? Look, I'm cashing in. I've had enough. What were you doing this morning? Trying to pray your way out? The priest wanted a favor. I got it, Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, he's busy. From two five. Sure, come on up. Benny. He went for it, huh? On his way up. We're going to stay a while, Kelly. Well, there's only three chairs. I'll make it easy for you. Stay put, mister. No, he's your friend. I'm checking out. <laughs> First time you've been right. Well, it happened so fast I didn't even see his arm move. My knees buckled and I pitched forward. I don't know how long I laid there, but when I opened my eyes, the afternoon sun was almost gone. What was left of it was bleeding through a rip in the blind. Well, I could hear somebody breathing hard like a fat man on a hot day, and when I rolled over, I saw him. A tough prohibition agent by the name of Cage. The weather didn't make any difference to Cage. He always looked that way. His collar was wilted and it looked like Arrow's first try. His necktie was pulled down and the knot was twisted. The heat had worked him over so that the front of his shirt was splotchy and damp. Reminded you of a first grader's map of the world. He was sitting in a chair with his arms draped over the back and his head resting on his hands. He was smoking a Milo Violet, but it didn't help that much. His mouth was wound around a toothy grin, and he looked like a mountain lion who'd just eaten her young. You can get up now, Keller. You made your point. Yeah, sure. How long you been here? Long enough to fill out your book and slip. You're going to jail, mister. What for? Sleeping on the floor? For the dead guy on the bed. Who is he? I don't know. How'd he get there? You put him there after you shot him. I get your hat. Look, prohibition's your racket. Dead bodies are out of your line. Not when I find him in your room. Now let's go downtown. We'll both tell homicide. We'll find the details later. Gage, you couldn't find yourself in a mirror. I didn't have anything to do with this, and you know it. I've been out for the last three hours. This happened after they slugged Save you. it for the jury. All I know is I got a phone tip to check room 205. I come up here and I find you in a dead guy. That's all I need. You can dress it up fancy and make it look cute, but it still comes out. Murder. There's enough liquor in this town to float it away, and you're wasting your time with a killing that's none of your business. You're my business, big shot. Somebody put two pounds of lead in Benny's chest, and you're my pick. Benny who? Benny Davis. He worked for Mike Quinlan. You look pale. Yeah, I'm just beginning to feel the squeeze. Mike Quinlan on one side, and those two trigger men that you let walk out of here on the other. You got it, and I'll be turning the handle. Now, before you start worrying about your picture in the paper, you better turn up the two guys that were here with me. That part of the same dream? They gave me an envelope to hold for him. The price on it's going up for the minute. A nine-year-old kid died for it, and this guy here on the bed. That's a good story. Do you write him down, or just make him up? Look, you got nothing on me, and I haven't got much time. I'm leaving you. That's all right. I called downtown. The minute you hit the street, they'll pick you up. In the meantime, you better come up with more than you got. They don't hang you in this state on a hunch. I'm gonna check this room over. I'll find all we need. You couldn't find your head with both hands. Goodbye, Cage. All right, you got till midnight, big shot, and then I'll be around. Yeah. I'll have it all set up. All we'll need is time to run the extra. Well, I could have used a cold shower, but with Cage there, I didn't have the room to dry off. I went down the hall and headed down the back stairs. I figured even if Cage was right about calling downtown, I might have an edge if I moved fast enough. The sun was on the downgrade, but it didn't make any difference. Had done a good job all day, and the heat was boiling up out of the ground. So if I was going to come out at all, I had to have some help. So I started to look for the only honest guy I know, an ex-bootlegger by the name of Barney Ricketts. The only bootlegger in the country that went broke in 1922. He drank himself out of business. I phoned eight different places and tried four. Nobody'd seen him. I was about ready to give up when I finally found him sitting in the middle of a bourbon fog in a little Spanish joint somewhere on the edge of the East Bottom. He was sitting at a back table trying his best to make time with a plaster bust of Queen Isabella. Ah, 
Petey, my boy, you're just in time. I'm not quite certain, but I think the young lady here has a friend. I gotta talk to you, Bottle. If you're any good at all with Spanish, now is the time. I was positive she'd loosen up on this second bottle of wine, but no, she's utterly uncharitable, and I think she's a picture of a perfect boy. Yeah, all right, Bottle. Since you're a member of the old Castilian school, there can be no excuse for the conduct she's exhibiting. Yeah. Why, do you know I was even good enough to buy her three rounds of Portuguese brandy? Imported, mind you. But what do I get for my pains? Not even a civil thank you. Oh, listen to me, will you, Bonnie? I'm sitting here in the most gentlemanly fashion, sipping this delicate nectar and trying vainly to keep the party going. But does she help? No! I've talked to her about politics, medicine, literature, Keith Byron, Shelley, Faith Baldwin. I've even talked about the weather. Bonnie, she's a statue. Oh, a simple oversight, Pete. It could happen to anyone. Now, look, I'm in trouble. Of course you're in trouble. You'll always be in trouble because you're a child of adversity, a son of scorn. The fate spit in your eye and you try to retaliate, but the wind's always blowing in the wrong direction. You're a lost leaf in the mortal storm, Petey. You're a pebble shaking a tiny fist at the mountain. You'd like to fight for some strange, fantastic cause, wouldn't you? But you can't find anybody your size. Men are too small and the gods are too big. Petey, you're lost. Are you all through now? Yes, what kind of trouble? A pair of bum murder wraps. Somebody slugged me in my room and I woke up with a dead guy. Oh, dubious honor. You mentioned two murders. One of them was an altar boy over at St. Timothy's. The other guy worked for Mike Quinlan. The same Quinlan that controls most of the Canadian import here in town? Yeah, that's him. Oh, time short. Let's finish the brandy. Two guys started all this at the club last night. Names are Ludd and Dex. Mean anything to you? This will all sound better with more brandy. Uh, you picked two of Quinlan's first string. Ludd Sandell and Dex Porter, both killers. Look, they gave me an envelope to hang on to. Now, nose around. See if you can find out what it all means. The dead guy up in my room, his name's Benny Davis. See if you can find out where he fits in, will you? It'd be a lot simpler if you just joined Quinlan's gang. Benny Davis holds a card in the same organization. Well, how about Ludd and Dex? Any bad blood between them and if Davis? If there is, it doesn't show. They're closer than unborn peas. You sure about that, Barney? Police blotter can't be that wrong. Benny's sister will tell you the same thing. Where do I find her? Chelsea Apartments. Beautiful girl, Petey. When you're my age, she'll disturb your memories. All right, now get going, will you? See how close you can get to Quinlan's headquarters. Find out what you can about Ludd and Dex and Benny Davis. Maybe Quinlan's got him on a special job or something. Find out what it is, will you? You find me in a temporary economic slump, Petey. I'll need car fare. Yeah, well, that makes two of us. I'm broke. You'll have to do it on foot. Oh, well, I have friends here, and my credit's unlimited. Well, hurry up, will you, Barney? One moment. Alfonso, would you loan me a dollar and a half? Come on, let's go. He's only bluffing. He won't shoot. <laughs> Well, Barney headed down toward Bale Street for Mike Quinlan's place, and I started cross town for the north end in the Chelsea apartment. I couldn't begin to work it out. If Dex and Ludd were such good friends with Benny Davis, why did they kill him? And if they didn't do it, who planted his body in my room and why? Well, I was running way late, and there wasn't much time to catch up. I finally found the Chelsea apartments on the corner of Stocker and Bale. It was an old three-story wooden frame. I checked the mailbox, and Louise Davis was down for apartment 17. Well, inside, the hallway was dark, and a couple of gas jets were smoking up the ceiling. There was a potted palm by the foot of the stairs, and it looked like it was growing out of old gum wrappers and cigar butts. Apartment 17 was at the rear of the first floor. She answered the door, and you could tell right away Barney was right. She was pretty, and she had enough smile to last you for years. Yes? You're Louise Davis? That's right. I can do better for you. You're Pete Kelly. I've heard you play. Yeah, well, so far you're batting a thousand. Can I come in? Yeah, sure. You didn't bring your band, so it must be a social call. I'll make this short. It's about Benny. What about him? That's what I want to know. He's got a couple of friends. I got to know about him. Benny isn't that popular. You mean Ludd and Dex? They'll do. They got trouble and they're cutting me in. What kind of trouble? No, I'm not sure. That's why I came to you. I can't help you. They never tell me what they're doing. Well, they gave me an envelope. They told me to hold it till six o'clock tonight. You haven't got any problem. You'll know in an hour. Yeah, well, maybe I'm tired. I want to know now. I'll take any leads you got. They found out I told you this. They might not like it. They got some kind of a beef with Quinlan. Does Mike know about it? I wouldn't know. I just heard him talking one night. They're not happy with the money Quinlan gives them. They got any plans? I don't think we've got to talk about this. Let me get you a drink, huh? Now, look, this is the last trip around for me, lady. i got to have everything you know. You said something about an envelope, didn't you? That's right. You got it? Right here. If you open it, you'll understand everything. Well, they gave it to me sealed. They want it back the same way. If you want to be around to give it back, you'd better open it. you got a guarantee, Andy. All I know is the three of them are working on something big. I don't know what it is, but I heard some talk about an envelope. It's your choice. You asked for a lead and you got it. Yeah. Well, hold hands when they cut me down. You got a letter open? Pete, look out! Well, it all happened faster than a Mexican divorce. 
Louise Davis was dead before the echo left the room. So I got to the window, but whoever did the shooting was gone. I grabbed the envelope, and on my way out, I took another look at her. There wasn't anything left but the smile. I cut through a couple of back lots and down an alley. I stopped in the doorway and opened the envelope. Inside was a handful of typewritten sheets. Looked like a lot of headache for five pieces of paper. And then the bell rang. Two of them were consignment slips for 8,000 gallons of high-grade Canadian whiskey. The other three slips were detailed breakdowns for a convoy of trucks. They showed special truck routes over the Canadian border into the States to miss the hijackers and the prohibition agents. They showed a day-by-day schedule for each truck on its trip down from the border. Well, it's not too tough to hijack a load of booze, but when you got it laid out right down to the time, the place and how many bottles, it's like money in the bank. Well, I knew right then why the envelope meant so much to Ludden and Dex. What I couldn't understand was where they got it. Why they gave it to me to hang on to. Well, maybe they were working for Quinlan, but why didn't he have the papers, and why weren't they any as safe? Mike had a big one. Well, the questions were still piling up. It was an outside chance, but I couldn't stand still, so I crossed over to the Kansas side and headed down Boulder Road to Fat Annie's place. Maggie Jackson did two things good. She sang the blues better than the guy who wrote them, and she could pick up an idle rumor at three miles. Hi, Pete. Maggie, what do you know? I knew you'd be here tonight. You always come in together. Trouble and Pete Kelly. Yeah, I know. I never come around except when I need something. As long as I have it to give, you got it. It's Mike Quinlan that's tying in. Well, that's part of it. I'm in it up to my ears. You got an envelope I heard. Yeah. Mike Quinlan and some of his boys have been here about an hour ago. They tore the paper off the walls looking for you and Dex and Ludd. Dex and Ludd? Mike wants all three of you. Yeah? Anything else? No. Barney Ricketts called for you. Did he leave a number? He's still waiting on the phone. I took the call. He said you'd end up here, so he just hung on. Well, I'll get it right now. Yeah, the boss is kind of mad. The phone's been tied up for two hours. All right, thanks, Maggie. Sure, and good luck, Pete. Hello, Barney. Ah, there you are, Petey. That'll be a dollar twenty-five for another three minutes. Yes, all right, operator. Alfonso, five more quarters, please. He don't know the quarters. Just a minute, Petey. Alfonso doesn't know the quarters from the house. Yeah, well, hurry up. What's going on, Barney? Where are you? Fort Madison, Iowa. I'm troubleshooting for you, Pete. What'd you find out? It's a double cross. Mike Quinlan's involved in one of the biggest deals of his career, and Benny Davis, along with Dex and Lutz, stole the consignment papers. Yeah, I know. That's what's in the envelope. You better get them back to Quinlan. I understand he's been tearing up the town for them. Well, what do I do about Dex and Lud? Yeah, she might easily end up like Benny Davis. Uh, it seems Lud and Dex didn't want to split it three ways, so they killed him. You sure about all this? That's why I'm up here in Iowa. I suggest that you join us. No, I'll see you when you get back. It's been a gay, mad world, Petey. We drove 60 miles an hour all the way up here. Yeah? Alfonso's drunk. He thinks the phone's a slot machine. He's waiting for the payoff. Well, as soon as I hung up the phone, everything fell into place. I had one big worry, to get back to the club and unload those papers before Quinlan caught up with me. Well, almost everything made sense now, except the killing of Louise Davis, Benny's sister. It was easy to see why they dropped Benny along the way, but why his sister? How did she tie in? Well, on the way back to town, I mulled over a couple of possibilities, and I figured maybe I came up with the answer. I started back for town, and it was rough all the way. I kept thinking any minute I'd bump into Mike Quillen, and I couldn't be sure that I'd lost Dex and Ludd. It was almost dark by the time I got back to the club. The band was waiting around for the Sunday rehearsal. We ran through one number, and then things got cloudy. Now, Kelly. You're early, Dex. Close enough. No, not for me. You said six o'clock. Your horn's no match for this gun. Give me the envelope. Six o'clock, Dex. All right. Let's try someday, sweetheart. Hand me that plunger, will you, Red? I'll give you the pickup.
see it, Ken. You gonna give me that envelope or do I blow it out of your pocket? The same way you handled Louise Davis? I don't know what you're talking about. I think you do. You killed her and you killed her brother. You got it all figured out, haven't you, Ken? Warren Blair's right, Dex. Don't turn around. You got it wrong, Lord. I don't think so. I never should have let you kill Benny. That should have been the tip-off and that kid in the church and Benny's sister. You had to make the big try. It was for me and you, Lud. It won't wash. You're gonna die, Dex. Pick a spot to lay down. Not in the back, Lud. You'd give me a better chance than that. Would I? Look out, Lud. Like I said, Dex, pick a spot. Well, that wraps it up, Kelly. You better sit down, Lud. No, this'll do. It won't be a long wait. I don't mind standing. Suit yourself. Six o'clock, Lud. Here's your envelope. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Hello, Pete. Hi, Father. Just gonna stop by. I heard the gunshots and knew you'd be around. Well, let me tell you again, Father. I'm sorry about Jake. I don't know what else to say. I'm just sorry. I believe you. We'll have the funeral for little Jake tomorrow. Maybe you want to stop by. Yeah. Some things never figure. A nine-year-old kid shot down. No reason for it. None in the world. Nine-year-old kid. It's done, Pete. Don't waste your pity on little Jake. He's got a big lead on both of us. I don't get your father. You and I should die as good as a nine-year-old. Music by Dick Cathcart. Scoring by Matty Matlock. The music of Pete Kelly's Big Seven consists of Dick Cathcart on cornet, Matty Matlock on clarinet, Nick Patrul on drums, Ray Sherman on piano, George Van Epps on guitar, Judd Donat on bass, Mo Schneider on trombone. The songs of Maggie Jackson were written by Arthur Hamilton. Pete Kelly's Blues is a presentation of the United States Armed Forces Radio Service. The makers of those increasingly popular cigarettes. Sano, the cigarette with far less nicotine. Encore cigarettes that filter the smoke but not the taste. Present... Martin Kane, starring Mark Stevens. I said, what's your name? Uh, Thompson. Albert Thompson. Why, something wrong, officer? You sure this is the man? He's the one I saw, all right. He did it. Did what? I don't know what you're talking about. Who are you? I saw you running out of that store after the shooting. You killed that storekeeper. I don't know what you're talking about. What store? I haven't done anything. He's the one. I'll swear to it. 
Come along, mister. Oh, look, officer. Behave you making... yourself. Officer, please. I'll need you to. But you're on. making a terrible mistake. I never saw this man in my life. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We're all set on our end. Oh, no. Nothing's going to happen to that witness. He's in a real safe place. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Anytime you want him for the grand jury, he'll be there. Well, thank you. Yeah, I'll be checking with you right along. Right. Well, the DA's a very happy man. He's got a cinch case against Albert Thompson. Oh, uh, what did you drop in for, Kane? Congratulations. Yeah? What'd you do? Not me, it's you that rates the medals, Lieutenant. You and your department, the way you solved that murder, that's pretty good. Well, the whole case just kind of walked in here. Fred Wallace, the guy who spotted Thompson at that bus stop, he's the one who gets all the credit. You got anything new on Thompson? Well, the identification looks pretty solid, Kane. <clears throat> got a smart lawyer, Ed Randall. He could beat you in court. I should come up with more evidence, including the murder weapon. Yeah, we're working on it. You know, Kane, the take in that robbery was about 200 bucks. When we examined Thompson, he had 207 bucks on him. Yeah, maybe he saved it up. <laughs> yeah, how? His wife didn't know anything about it. Look, Lieutenant, when a fellow's planning on buying his wife a new coat for her birthday, he doesn't tell her what he's saving up for. Uh, tell me, how do you know so much about Thompson? He's Ed Randall's client. So? Ed Randall's a client oh. of mine. Oh, he thinks Thompson's innocent. Thinks that your witness made a mistake. He's a good lawyer. He's smart, too. Mm -hmm. So, you, uh, you think the witness made a mistake, too? I don't know. That's why I'm hired to find out. Well, you sure picked a tough way to make a living. Some guys climb mountains. You won't even get off the ground. Fred Wallace made a positive identification. By the way, I called his house. You've taken him somewhere. Why? For his health gate. Oh, come on, Lieutenant. Thompson couldn't hurt anybody. He hasn't got any mob connections. He's just a little guy that fell in a great big hole. I want to see Wallace. You're wasting your time, Kane, and that's straight. You're convinced that Thompson's guilty. I can't be, not yet. Well, I'm only about 90% convinced because we still haven't found the gun. However, Fred Wallace kind of makes up for it. I still want to see him. Well, you'll see him all right, but not alone. I'll be there, too. Everything all right, Mr. Wallace? Fine, fine. Yeah? Yes, sir. Hi, thanks. What did the commissioner say to this guy's food bill? Hello, Kane. Hello, Hello, Lieutenant. Hello, Mr. Wallace. Uh, this is, uh, Martin Kane. How do you do, Mr. Kane? Hello, Mr. Wallace. Kane's a private detective. Right now, he's working for Thompson's lawyer. I see. He'd, uh, he'd like to ask you a few questions. Uh huh. Mr. Wallace, you're sure you couldn't have been mistaken in your identification? No, sir. What makes you so positive it was Thompson you saw running out of the shop after you heard the shots? Why, just was, that's all. Tell me, was he wearing a hat? A hat? Yeah. Hat. Yes, yes, he was. Thompson doesn't wear a hat, Mr. Wallace. Never does, never has. Well, he could have on this job, Kane. Do I have to talk to him? Why not, Mr. Wallace? We're both after the same thing, aren't we? The truth? That's just why I went after that policeman the moment I saw him. Thompson. Why, it's my duty as a citizen. You think I like hanging around this hotel room, not being able to go about my normal business? Or seeing my name spread all over the newspapers? I have to testify at that trial. It's the right thing to do. You know, Kane, most people would be afraid to stick out their necks. We could use more men like Mr. Wallace. Yeah. Civic virtue is a great thing, Lieutenant. As long as it doesn't convict the wrong man. Why would I do a thing like that? Just a mistake, Mr. Wallace. Simple, ordinary human mistake. It happens all the time. Every day. Just like it happened here. You couldn't possibly have seen Thompson run out of that store. He was clear across town at the time. That's what he says. I saw it. Tell me, Mr. Wallace, what was the weather that day? What kind of a question is that? Would you answer it, please? I don't see what difference it makes. I, I think it was a nice day. Yes, it was a nice warm day. The man who ran out of the store, was he wearing a top coat? He could have. Was he? No, I just told you it was a warm day. He wouldn't be wearing a top coat. Your logic's good, Mr. Wallace, but your memory is bad. It was a warm day, and Thompson was wearing a top coat. The people at his office will swear to that. He's just trying to trick me. Now, I just want you to think and think hard, Mr. Wallace. Isn't it possible that you made a mistake in your identification? Mr. Kane, I'm not a fool. 
If I listened to you and changed my story, I'd be a fool. Some people would say I was scared off. Others that I was bought off. No, sir. I said it was Albert Thompson. And Albert Thompson, it stays. Well, convinced? Nope. But I got a better chance of talking back the tide. <laughs> Albert's in here, Mrs. Thompson. Thank you, Mr. Randall. Why don't you go right on in? I'll wait out here for Mr. Kent. tried to get him to lower the bail. He's still working very hard. Yeah, I know. They won't do it. A guard told me that $25,000 is the lowest bail he ever heard of. For a murder. Mr. Barnes came to see me from the office. Wanted to know if he needed any money. What'd you tell him? Thanked him very much. I, I told him we'd manage. Oh, Albert. He said. He said all your friends believe in you. Helen. Uh, Mr. Randall's very optimistic. He. He thinks this Mr. Kane is sure to find some new evidence. Yeah. I may not even have to go to trial, Helen. I. Helen, I. Oh, Albert, what's going to do? Oh, Helen, I want you to meet Martin Kane. Hello, Mr. Thompson. Mr. Kane, can you help? I don't know yet. Have you talked to Wallace? Yeah, I talked to him. He'll make an excellent witness for the state. How do you see it, Ed? Well, it's not good. It's not bad. District Attorney's Office has been working just as hard as we have. Has he got enough for an indictment? Brady has. See, Albert, our main problem is your alibi. If we could only prove that you were nowhere near that store when it happened... No, but I wasn't. I wasn't. I was on my way home. A dozen people must have seen me. Two dozen. A hundred people could have seen you, Mr. Thompson. Nobody ever sees you on a subway or a bus. I'm afraid you have no alibi. Ed, I'll keep right on working, mainly on finding the gun. The big job will be yours in court. I know. I'll need everything you can get me to shake Wallace in cross-examination. Oh, now, look. Let's not give up the ship. Never can tell about juries. <laughs> Sometimes they go for the strangest stories. What's strange about Albert's story? That's the truth. Well, he never hurt a soul in his life. He... Well, he's an honest, decent, hard-working man. What jury would believe he's a murderer? Yes. Yes, I know, Inspector. Yes, sir, I know this isn't that big, but the... Well, the district attorney's been on my neck all week. Yeah. He says he's got to have the gun that killed Thompson or else. That's right. So I put all the men I could spare on it, sir. No, sir. No, sir, nothing so far. What? Well, Inspector, I think my men know their jobs. I picked most of them myself. Yes, sir. Yes, sir, I, I understand you. Yes, I certainly do. Uh, thank you, Inspector. Uh, good night. Want some, Kane? 
warm out tonight. Not for a private detective. What do you want? I want some help. Still working for Ed Randall? That's right. Well, come around and see me when you quit. Maybe that'll be too late. For Albert Thompson? No, for you, Lieutenant. You want to find the gun, don't you? What do you think? I get it or I get fired. I don't know whether it'll be the inspector first or the DA. Maybe neither. You huh? want to help me? Hey, Kane. Are you holding out on me? Hey, do you know where that gun is? I know where that gun isn't. And I know a little fellow that doesn't know anything at all about it. Albert Thompson. Now, Kane, say what you've got to say. All right, you won't find the gun until you find the man who used it, and it wasn't Albert Thompson. You've already proved that. Yeah, how? You've had your best men out looking for the gun, and they can't find it. They've questioned any, every enemy, every friend that Thompson ever had. They've looked every place where he could have bought or rented a gun. Yeah, they're going to keep right on looking. Well, they can keep on looking from now until next year, but they're going to come up with nothing. Yeah, maybe and maybe not. We'll see. Look, Lieutenant, stop wasting time. Now, look, you ain't me what you want or, or take off. Get me a rundown, a description of, of every every pickup artist that looks like Thompson. Oh, for crying out loud. How many can there be? Fifty, a hundred, five hundred, I don't know, and I can't spare a crew on the files to find out. That yeah, keeper. well, then you find him, and while you're at it, try and find a witness who saw him do it. Meantime, I'll go along with Thompson. I got a witness for him. Mi Lieutenant Gray. Yes, sir? Oh, she did, huh? Yeah, that's too bad. No, no, I didn't think of that. Well, all I can do is keep right after it. Yes, sir, of course, as soon as I get in, eh? District Attorney. They just took Mrs. Thompson to Bellevue. A complete nervous collapse. How much you can do about that, is there? Kane, everything we've got so far says that Thompson did it. You show the D.A. one solid fact on the other side of the ledger, and Thompson's practically a free man. Look, will you give me the rundown? I'll try to get that fact, and you show it to the D.A. Did you ever meet Mrs. Thompson? Yeah. Real nice woman. That's right. Sergeant, meet me in the photo gallery in five minutes. This better be good, Kane. For everybody's sake. Especially for my clients. If we miss, we get another chance. He doesn't get another chance, Lieutenant. This is his last time at bat. Pay your taxes. I had three men working on that list all night. Thanks, Lieutenant. Only nine names, huh? That's right, out of about 400. We eliminated everyone who didn't correspond at least roughly to Thompson's physical description. Only two possibilities. Uh, three are in prison, two are on the West Coast, two were in the hospital at the time, and the other two are right here in New York. Charles Shaw, Larry Spencer. Uh, with a complete rundown on each. Okay. This isn't a lending library. If I tag one of these guys, I'll buy you a set of cast iron bookends for your birthday. You'll be hearing from me. My first possibility, Carl Shaw, was working in the garage. He told me a straight-sounding story about not being crooked anymore. He had a wife and kids now. His past was really behind him. And so on and so on. I thought he'd never stop telling me how he'd become a new man. But all I wanted to hear from him was his alibi for the time of the killing. And he had one. He was working here. The fellow at the next bench could prove it. Carl Shaw was in the clear. What'll it be, Mr. Kane? A little information, Charlie, on a guy named Larry Spencer. Well? He comes around. Regular customer? He was till a couple of weeks ago. And last night he showed up again. Uh -huh. How come? Says he was away. Vacation. He wouldn't have gone away around the uh, day after Columbus Day, would he? Maybe. What? On October 13th, the druggist was killed in a heist. Yesterday, they indicted a man named Albert Thompson for the murder. The 28th. Between those two dates, Larry Spencer decides he needs a vacation. That's quite a coincidence, isn't it? Oh, excuse me, Mr. Charlie. 
got customers, Mr. Yeah, I know you got customers. You got customers because you still got a license. Remember when I proved that those high school kids didn't pick up their booze here? I remember. What Spencer been up to lately? I don't know. Honest. You got any money? Oh, I let him run a tab once in a while. The last one had me worried. Oh, why? Well, when he didn't show up those couple of weeks, I figured he was gone for good. And yesterday he came in and settled up. Okay, Charlie. Thanks a lot. Lieutenant Gray phoned me. Come on in. Hello, Mr. Wallace. Well, Mr. Kane. How are you? What do you want? I want you to look at a picture, Mr. Wallace. What picture? Well? Who's this? Where'd you get this? A guy named Larry Spencer. He's got a police record. He's got a hobby also, holding up storekeepers. Are you sure, Mr. Wallace, this isn't the man you saw run out of that store? What are you trying to do to me, Mr. Kane? Never mind what I'm trying to do to you. Think of Albert Thompson. Are you sure this isn't the man you saw run out of the store after the shooting? No. I told you once before you're not going to make a fool of me. Not now or not on the witness stand. I'm not changing my story. Kane, say I'm glad you got my message. Listen, uh, some of the boys down the hall brought in a quite a gang crap shooters. One of them was Larry Spencer. You want me to hold him? I don't know. Did you get anything on him? Nope. I was hoping to. Well, there's no point in holding him. He won't do me any good in the tank. Uh -huh. You think he'll lead you to the gun, huh? I don't know. I think he's got his stashed away in some nice quiet place ready for another job. Yeah, I'll buy that. Yeah, how's it look? I made a contact with a friend of his. Oh, uh it? -huh. No, his girlfriend. She works in the dime of dance place. I'm going over there now. Hey, you don't care how you spend your money, do you? Let me know if it was worth it, will you? Sandy sure forgot about Spencer fast. She's been dancing with that new guy all evening. He wouldn't need to give me any ticket. I dance with him for free. Well, I hope Spencer doesn't come in, that's all. Sandy'd be awful sorry. So would that dreamboat. Spencer'd kill him. Larry Spencer'd kill him? Why, you kid. You know, I don't get it. What's a guy like you doing in this place? Maybe I like to dance. Uh-oh, there we go. Yeah. Hey, you must own an oil well. Anyway, the next set's on you. No, you keep them. Well, I could use them. <laughs> You're getting tired? A little. Want to sit down? No. I like dancing with you too much. It's not a job. I like it. Oh, that last one was sure living it up. One ticket. Hey, Sandy's still dancing with that guy. Can you blame her? Maybe somebody ought to tell Larry Spencer about it. Don't mind your own business. Hey, hey, hey. Say they look nice together. Eh. Make yourself at home. Thanks. I'll get some coffee. You're awfully nice. I'm glad you're here. I was glad to be here, too. But all I had in mind was finding out if Larry Spencer used this flat for a gun drop. Who's the guy? His name's Larry Spencer. The girls told me about him. The guy you're going to marry, huh? I don't know. 
You haven't helped much. Oh, come on, Sandy. No, please, let me say something. You know, things... Things happen quick. Too quick. If you want something, you have to put out your hand and grab it. Or else it goes right by. Larry thinks fast. He gets things. I never wanted to know how, but... You get what you want, too, don't you? I try, Sandy. Only maybe with you it'd be different. It'd be a chance to stop being scared. Scared? I try to tell him every time I see him, but... I don't know. Time rushes by and there's never enough left. What are you scared of, Sandy? What Larry done? I don't want to talk about him. What's You're he here. done, Sandy? Why? Tell me. Well, why? Why do you have to know? A long story, Sandy. Hello. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there is someone here. Well, who told you? He Hello. You can ask Larry yourself. He's coming over right now. around here again, I'll break your face in. You hear me? I hear you. Who is this guy? <laughs> Let me go! I said it with it! Ah, what do you want? I want you to change places with a nice little guy that's being framed for murder. Did you commit it? You're nuts. Pretend I went out and came back. Go on, beat my face in. Let me alone. I'm gonna start paying you off now. Sandy, for not helping him. I couldn't. Not after what you said. I always thought Larry was small time. He killed somebody and hit the gun here. Kane, I told you, didn't I? If you want something, you have to reach out and get it. Will I, will I ever see you again? Did you ever need me, Sandy? If you're ever in trouble. Right now, I want to start the wheels rolling for somebody who is. Lieutenant Gray, please. Yes, Markham. Well, the district attorney is behind a locked door. Most interesting, Markham. How do I get in? This way, Vance. Am I unlocking the door? Good evening, Vance. Hello, Markham. All this secrecy indicates an occasion I should enjoy. Am I correct? It's quite possible, Vance. Please sit down. Thank you. Well, you sent for me, Markham. I'm here. Shall we ask your other visitor to come in here from the next room so we can get started? You knew I had someone waiting next door? Certainly. You wouldn't lock yourself in, Markham. As long as I've known you, I've never seen you display a single evidence of fear. You locked your door, therefore you are trying to protect someone. Whom? <laughs> My only surprise is that you didn't know that, too. It's an informer, Vance, a stool pigeon. Come in, Ricker. Yeah, D.A., here I am. 
Bricker, this is Philo Vance. I want you to tell him what you told me a while ago. Ah, oh, gee, D.A., what I told you was personal, just between friends. Please include me among your friends, then, Ricker. Do I have to tell this guy what I told you, D.A.? I wish you would. Okay, then. Okay. Listen, Vance, the D.A. and I has got a deal. When I hear something he ought to know, only nobody will tell him, I tell him, see? Nobody will tell him, so you tell him. Sure, sure. Listen, Vance... There's a dame due to hit this town this week, and she's going to start running things here the same as she ran them in the Midwest. And where she goes, trouble goes too. Big trouble. Killings, bank holdups, kidnappings, the works. Yeah, that's what I was telling the DA. A woman is coming to town, and that means trouble, eh? Well, that's not too strange an association. Well, I don't know about that. All I know is this town's going to break wide open when she shows up. And that's going to be soon. Really? Ricker, tell me, who is this woman? You mean, what's her name? Well, search me, I don't know. All I know is she's tall and dark and terrific looking. And she always wears dresses of one color only. Nobody knows her name. Everybody calls her the Lady in Blue. <laughs> It would be my suggestion, Danny, not to let the lady in blue into this office. <clears throat> Legal advice or a friendly tip? A friendly tip, Danny, actuated by the fact that I wish to be retained by you as your lawyer for quite some time yet. Meaning I may not be around long running things if I let the lady in blue in here. Now we'll see. Ah, uh, Davy, let her come in. Out, mouthpiece, that door there. Call me later. I hope you'll be able to answer the phone when I do. <clears throat> Bye. Davy, I said to send that... D Hello, Danny. Well, aren't you going to ask me to sit down, Danny? Um, uh, I am as soon as I can breathe normal again. You're the lady in blue? That's what I've been called. You knew I was coming to town? Everybody knew it. What do you want with me? I'd like to do business with you, Danny. Things are a little slow where I came from. I need activity. I can find things to do here. Things you're already doing. All right, all right, I get that. But the way you look, the way you're dressed, the way you talk, what do you want with rackets? Rackets, Danny? I'm not associated with any rackets. I do things more legitimately. My methods may be a little illegal, but my uh, enterprises aren't. For instance, you're in a racket. I've suddenly decided to uh, be your partner. Nice deciding. What if I don't like? I know you brought a couple of your boys along, so don't think I'm being tough. No, you're too smart to play that way, Danny. You have a bodyguard in the next room. I have one of my boys watching him. I don't know about yours, but mine shoots straight. And often. Do we talk business? Take that hood of yours out of here, lady, and you go with him. We don't have nothing to talk about. No. Tony! Don't let him come in, Davy. You call me, lady? Davy here is giving me some trouble. Davy! He shot Davy! Only in his arm. I don't like guys that pull guns. You call me, lady? Yes, Tony. Just as a protective measure. Danny, we'll drop our business discussion for the day, but uh, we'll meet again. We'll meet again, lady. I promise you that. I'll find out what your game is. I'm sure you will. Only, as a glance in the next room will tell you, we're both playing the same game. But the score is one to nothing. In my favor. <laughs> How do you do, madame? May I help you with your selection? It's quite possible. You own the shop? Yes, I am Madame Marie. Madame, you have a beautiful figure. And I have the creation that will set off the blue of your eyes. Please come with me. We can do business here, Madame Marie. I'm not interested in gowns. I'm interested in working for you. Working? A woman like you is... is Looking for a position? Uh, 
Not exactly. Madam Marie, effective today, everything which you purchase from manufacturers here and abroad must go through me, a service for which I charge 10%. Do you understand? No. No, I do not. <laughs> you will. Oh, now there's a beautiful gown, that blue evening model. An import, of course. How much is it? Four hundred dollars. But I still do not know what you're trying to do. I need no one to buy for me. You'll change your mind. I'll take that gown. Send it to me at the Ritzmore Suite. No, i Oh, four hundred, you said? Very well, here you are. Good day, Madame Marie. Oh, uh, you'll be hearing from me. Oh, dear, what does this mean? Evelyn, I'm not to be disturbed. I'm going into my office. A thing like this cannot happen. Yes? Monsieur Danny? Never mind the monsieur business. I got trouble enough. Danny, this is Marie from the dress shop. Six months ago, I joined your... your association. You promised me I'd never be disturbed by anyone. Just now, I was disturbed. By a tall, good-looking doll dressed in blue? Yes. She didn't know I was already a member of your association, did she? I mean, that must be it. She just didn't know. She knew all right. Only she told me she's moving in and she's doing it. I'm going to see her. Something tells me she's going to be moving right out again. Sit down, Danny. We're quite alone, and there's nothing for you to be afraid of. Do you like my new gown? I bought it today. I like the gown, lady. It's your ideas on doing business I don't like. You're cutting in on Madame Marie, I understand. Well, as long as you understand, I see no need to discuss it further. Do you like the gown really, Danny? Listen, lady, I don't like what's going on here. I was doing all right. I was doing fine. You cut yourself in. I'm not taking it, lady. I'm telling you now, I'm not taking it. But, Danny, there isn't really anything you can do. Look, would you care to take me to the theater tonight? I'll wear this new blue gown. I've some wonderful blue eyeshadow that matches and luminous stardust for my hair. You'll be very proud of me, Danny. You, uh, you want me to take you to the theater? Hey, lady, you go for me a little? Why? Why? On account of you're only the most terrific dame I've ever seen, that's why. So you want me to take you to the theater? Is it a date, Danny? Oh, could be, lady, could be. So you like me a little, huh? Well, I like you a lot, lady. You got what I ain't got. Class. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, lady, come here a minute. I always wanted to know what it would feel like to have a swell dame like you on my arms. Come here, lady, come on. You want me closer? Real close? Like this? Oh, lady. Oh, lady, this is living. Hey! What did you clip me for? I step on ants when they start to crawl, Danny. You affect me the same way. Oh, I do, huh? You don't want to play, then, do you? Except rough. Okay, if that's the way you want it, that's the way you're going to get it. Lady, you're going to be sorry you slapped me in a kisser. Take my word for it. Really? What are you going to do? Plenty. I'll fix you for this, lady, beginning now. You know that date we had for the theater? Well, it's off. Fool around with that. Well, Mr. Markham, we got another murder. So I see, Sergeant Heath. Danny Claxton, isn't it? It was. That's the way we found him, lying face up here in his apartment, knife in his heart. Hmm. Vance will be interested in that when he gets here, Heath. Oh, incidentally, I had to wake him up. After all, only homicide detectives and district attorneys stay awake all night. Call him back and tell him to stay away, D.A. We can solve this murder without him. I'll have the guy who knocked off Claxton within a week. You know, Heath, I was living in hopes that you'd bring Claxton in one of these days so we could send him up the river where he belongs. Apparently, well, someone sent him down the river. Hello, Markham. Well, hello, Vance. Sorry to get you out of bed. I'm sorry you got out of bed, too. Good evening, Sergeant Heath. Hmm. 
So this is a big-time racketeer's apartment. And that a big-time racketeer's corpse. We're waiting for some men from the morgue to remove the body, Vance. Mm. Sergeant Heath has had the knife that killed Claxon taken to headquarters. Sure did. It's being checked for fingerprints right now. I hope you find some. A knife killed Claxton, eh, Markham? Yes, Vance, a knife. And now we have a corpse, and so far, three suspects. Really? Who are they? Well, there's the lady in blue whom we were warned about last night, remember, by my personal informer? Yes, of course. Then there's a cold-blooded killer named Tony who works with the lady. We got him right away, but he's out on bail. Wonderful device, that business of bail. Who's the third? A former attorney who was Danny's business advisor, a man named Smythe. Also out on bail, I suppose? Mm Mm-hmm. Oh, Heath. Yeah, Vance? What can't I do for you? Find anything in the room that might be a clue? Not a thing. But maybe you will. You generally do. But look, don't bother me, Vance. I'm busy. Vance, you want to look around or shall we go? We might just as well go. Apparently, there are no clues to be uncovered. Coming, Sergeant Heath? Sure, I'm coming. I'll leave a man outside the door to wait for those guys from the morgue. Turn off the light, will you, D.A.? Certainly. Holy mackerel, it's dark in here. (laughs) Open the door, will you, D.A.? It's right next to the switch. Certainly, I've got it right here. Don't open that door, Markham. Don't do it for a second, anyhow. Hey, Vance, what are you staring into a dark room for? You can't see anything. Hey, where, where'd you go? I'm over here by the body, Heath. And I did see something. Something very interesting. In the dark? Yes. You can open that door now if you like, Markham. Hey, Vance, what could you possibly see on that corpse in a dark room? I'll tell you about it sometime, Sergeant Heath. At about the same time that I tell it to the murderer. <laughs> This is District Attorney Markham. The Blue Lady murder case developed as a result of the knifing of Danny Claxton, whose reign as Racket King has been challenged by a glamorous woman known as the Lady in Blue. As Vance had anticipated, there were no fingerprints on the knife. Suspects include the Lady, her favorite gunman, Tony, and a disbarred lawyer named Smythe who might well inherit Claxton's racket empire with him dead. Vance found some sort of clue in Claxton's darkened apartment after I'd asked him there, and since all suspects are out on bail, he phoned to tell me he was going to the Ritzmore Hotel to see the lady in blue. He should be there about... Please sit down, Mr. Vance. I've been waiting to meet you. And, uh, it's been worth waiting for Thank you. You know, if there should be a mental contest between us, one of us must lose. In view of that and my self-confidence, I appreciate your hospitality. You mean if there is a contest, I won't win? (laughs) If you knew as much about me as I about you, you might not be so certain. We're very much alike. I'd hate to believe that. You and Danny Claxton didn't like each other, did you? Oh, I wouldn't say that exactly. He was quite fond of me. That's not difficult to understand. You know, Vance, I'd like you to tell me something. Something about me. Yes? What do you think of me? Are you quite sure you want me to tell you? Quite. Well, as a woman, you're perfectly gowned, beautiful, and exciting. Exciting, Vance? Very much so. Many men must have fallen in love with you. Many men? Yes. The one man? No. Is there uh, something else I might tell you about yourself? You've told me what I wanted to hear. There's no question about that. Of course, I could go further. Let's take the surface, you. The gown you're wearing is startling, but it's right for you. Your jewelry is exquisite, your hair becoming fashionable, but too perfectly groomed. Nothing is wrong with you, lady. Therefore, something is wrong with you. Oh, please don't stop, Vance. If I were you, I don't think I'd strive so for effect. That hairdo of yours, for instance. 
What are those little things that glisten on top of it? Oh, that's stardust. When lights hit it, it has the effect of sparkling. You couldn't possibly be content to not stand out when there are no lights. A theater, for example. No, you're quite right. For occasions like that, there's a luminous stardust I use. Mm, sounds wonderful. Oh, Vance. Vance, I like you. You're the man I never met in my life. Do you understand what I mean? I think so. And under other circumstances, something might be done about that. Not under these? I'm afraid not. I'm engaged in a murder investigation. Though I must admit that for the last few moments I've neglected it a bit. Will you tell me something? Anything. Uh, within reason. Danny Claxton was murdered in his apartment last night. Were you ever in that apartment? No. So the contest commences. The gauntlet has been hurled. And the challenge accepted. Oh, expecting company. Not that I know of. I was just leaving. I'll answer the door. Lady, may I say that this has been one of the most pleasant interviews I've ever had? Just a moment. I'm glad you said that, Vance. No matter what happens from here in, I'll remember that. You did something to me. I shouldn't like what you did. But I do. Goodbye. Goodbye. Oh, Mr. Sly. Go right in. Yes. Lady, I've got to talk to you. Uh, what, uh, what did Vance want here? What is it you want here? Well, lady, I worked for Danny Claxton. I know everything he did. How he operated, who paid him, and whom he paid. I, uh, I imagine you're taking over here. <laughs> I could be valuable to you. My intention in coming here was to take over. No, I'm not so sure. I beg your pardon? Nothing. So you want to transfer your allegiance from the dead to the living, Mr. Smythe? You want to serve me? <laughs> With Danny out of the way, why not? Was it you who saw to it that Danny was out of the way? Uh, did I kill him? Why, lady, what difference does that make? <laughs> the king is dead. Long live the queen. <laughs> Wait a minute, Mr. Markham. Let me go to work on this Tony here. I talk a language you can understand. Tony, sit up in that chair. Don't bother me. He's all yours, Sergeant Heath. I hope you get something out of him. You have my best wishes, but also my gravest doubts. He'll talk to you. Tony, listen. You bore me, copper. I'll bore you. I'll do something to you when you leave me. Look, you work for the lady in blue. She told you to knock off Danny Claxton, so you knocked him off. With a knife? Sure, with a knife. Oh, I know all about how you're a gun toter. I know your reputation, but you pulled a switch to toss us off. You hoped. You killed Claxton, didn't you? Well, did you or didn't you? Didn't I? Go away, Heath. Go far away. I guarantee nobody will look for you. You start talking or nobody will ever find you. Tony, get this. Hold it, you... Heath. Who is it? It's I, Markham. Vance. Wait a second, Vance. I'll be right out. Tony... You killed Danny Claxton, and I'm gonna prove it. Hello, Vance. Glad I found you, Markham. That sounds like you've got news on the Claxton killing, Vance. Oh, that. I suspected last night who killed Claxton. You did? Certainly. This afternoon, I visited the lady in blue. Just as I was leaving, Claxton's former employee, Mr. Spive, came in. My appearance there was very fortunate. You see, I thought I'd known who killed Claxton. But now I have proof. Well, man, don't just stand there as if you told me it looked like it might rain tomorrow. Who killed Claxton? I know, Markham, but I have no evidence that would satisfy a jury. Ask the lady in blue, her friend Tony, and Mr. Smythe up to my apartment at nine tonight. You and Heath be there, too. I think I'll supply the proof we need at that time. May I take the liberty of using a moment or two to describe this knife I'm holding? Come on, Vance. I've wasted enough time getting these three people up to your apartment. A moment more won't hurt, Heath. Now, please, everyone, look at this knife. It's Arabian. The handle is of ivory, and the blade solid steel. I've selected this knife because it closely resembles the one used to kill Danny Claxton. Now, for the purpose of this experiment, 
I need an assistant, someone to pose as the murderer. May I ask the lady in blue? Why, certainly, Vance. What is it you'd like me to do? Well, for one thing, I'd like you to look slightly less glamorous. It's completely demoralizing, distracting, and downright inconsiderate. Really? I was hoping you'd like this gown. That's why I wore it. Mm -hmm. uh, will you take this knife, please, lady, and hold it in your right hand? Like this? That's fine. Thank you. Markham. Yes? Please stand over by the door, next to the light switch, will you? Of course. I'll be right over here. Now, Tony, please don't fall asleep. This might be interesting to you. Yeah, I know. And Mr. Smythe, <coughs> I'd like you in particular to watch and see how close I come to showing exactly how Danny Claxton was killed. First, let me ask all three of you, were any of you ever in Mr. Claxton's apartment? I never was. Not me. <coughs> well, uh, I'd been there, but not in the past week. <coughs> very well. Now, my very intriguing lady in blue, you have the knife. I'm going to show everyone what happened the other night. You lady will pretend to be the murderer. I'll be Claxton. Now, you slip up behind me. Please get behind me. Throw your left arm around my neck. As you do that, I try to reach back with my hand to seize the knife like this. Vance, be careful. You're ruining my hairdo with your hands. I'm sorry. Markham, will you turn out the lights, please, all of them? Turn out the lights? I don't know why either, Heath, but maybe I'd better turn them off. Okay. Only I don't see a thing. Neither does anybody. I think you will now. Everybody, please look at my right hand. The hand that just touched the hair of the lady in blue. Vance, your hand is glowing. Hey, what have you got on your hand, Vance? Radium? Not exactly. It's just proof that the lady in blue stabbed Claxton. You were too clever, Vance. But you'll never live to prove what you think. I'll see to it. Vance, she's got that knife. Look out. <laughs> Heath, the oh, lights. Turn on those lights. Right, oh, yes, yeah, yeah. She stabbed Vance. Heath. Do something. Do something. I'll do something, all right, D.A. I'll open that door let my cops in. We'll drag her downtown. That isn't necessary. You want me at headquarters, I'll go. Mr. Markham. Yes? You saw me stab Vance. I killed Claxton the same way. I don't know how Vance figured it, and we'll never know now. But he was right. I'm ready, Mr. Markham. Nothing's very important anymore. I've just killed the only man that ever interested me. Come in, Markham, come in. Hi, Vance. Sleep well? Wonderfully. Sorry I had to put on that act last night. Did it scare you? Definitely. Let's see that trick knife of yours, Vance. Nothing much to it, Markham. Here it is. The blade disappears into the handle when you touch the point. See? Why, yes, of course. <laughs> had me worried for a while last night, though. Well, Vance, I know now that she killed Claxton, but you knew before. Was it whatever you found when we turned out the lights in Claxton's apartment that told you the lady in blue had killed him? Yes, it was. It was Claxton's right hand, Markham. It glowed in the dark. Because it had touched the hair of the lady in blue, and on her hair was a glamour accessory, a phosphorescent preparation known as stardust. Oh, I see. As soon as I found the lady in blue wore stardust, I knew it was she who'd been at Claxton's apartment. Ah, the lady in blue was a lovely woman, Vance. Lovely to look at. But hardly delightful to know. Though for a moment at her apartment yesterday afternoon, I was beginning to find it hard to believe that. Well, Vance, you did it again. Yes, Markham, I guess this is the end of the Blue Lady murder case. But I wish the lady in blue had had a different beginning. <laughs> After all, if a girl wears a dazzling necklace worth a fortune, should it make a man want to kiss her or kill her?
The National Broadcasting Company presents The Adventures of the Abbots, starring Claudia Morgan and Les Damon as Pat and Jean Abbott, those popular characters of detective fiction created by Francis Crane. NBC invites you to join Pat and Jean each week at this time for an exciting adventure in romance and crime. In our story tonight will be Miss Sherry Britton making her dramatic debut in radio. Now here is Claudia Morgan as Jean Abbott to set the stage for tonight's puzzle in murder. A story entitled, The Fabulous Emerald Necklace. The necklace was a breathtaking collection of precious stones. It belonged to Mrs. Dexter Blake, a curious young woman without any social background who'd somehow managed to marry the heir to the Blake fortune. Late one night, she and her husband had left the Stardust Club and were strolling to their Park Avenue townhouse, which was just around the corner from the club. Really, Kathy, I don't think you behave very well at the club. Oh, will you stop picking on me, Dexter? Don't be so prissy. You've been doing it all evening. I just had a little fun at the club. After all, how square can you get? Really, sometimes I... Now, look, I've had more than enough trouble because of you. The snobbery deal again? Now, it isn't snobbery, Kathy. It's just that I do have a rather well-known family. We're sensitive to publicity. The columnists were very cruel when you married me, and every time you misbehave publicly, you're just proving their point. You believe their point, too, don't you? I mean that there's something very wrong about your having married a divorcee, especially one whose family wasn't descended from the original settlers, pilgrims, or whatever it was. Oh, let's drop it. It's come up too often. Now, let's settle it. You'd like to get out of our marriage, wouldn't you? Well, I... No, darling, I, I've never said that, never thought well, Don't it. try thinking of it, Dexter. You'd never make it. If you don't like bad publicity, just imagine what I'd do if you ever threatened to get rid of me. I'd give Shut those... Up, Mrs. Blake, come back into that doorway. What? Uh, who are you? What's the idea? Get away from her. I said for you two to get off the straight end of that doorway. I've got a 38 here, and I'll empty it into both of you. Why, of all that... Go on. Into the doorway. That's it. Now I'll take that necklace of yours, Mrs. Blake. Cheap hoodlum. You think you can get away with this just because you're waving that gun? Why, I... That's it, Mrs. Blake. I'll take the necklace. Thank you. You give me that necklace? Take your hands off me. Police! Police! I told you not to do that. I told you. Oh, he... Come back here, you. Oh, Dexter. Dexter, he's dead. He's dead. Ah! The jewel thief disappeared into the night, leaving Mrs. Dexter Blake hysterical beside the dead body of her husband. Pat and I had been home that night. All we knew about Kathy Blake was what we'd read in the gossip column. But the next morning, Pat had been invited to the Sterling Insurance Company. He was in the office of a company executive, Frank Tracy. I uh, sent for you, Mr. Abbott, because this case calls for a man of your caliber. We'd be glad to pay any reasonable fee, of course. Is this a reasonable case, Mr. Tracy? Well, frankly, it's rather difficult. That's why I'd rather you handle this case than any one of our routine investigators. Uh, Our company uh, insured Mrs. Blake's necklace, uh, Mr. Abbott. Mm -hmm. For how much? $200,000. Can Mrs. Blake describe the man who attacked him? Well, she's uh, quite vague about it, but uh, something very fascinating came to me in the mail this morning. Oh, what is it? A note from the killer. May I see it? Mm-hmm. You'll uh, notice, of course, that it's been written very much like a ransom note in a kidnapping. No use of pens, pencils, or typewriter. The letters uh, look as though they've been cut out of uh, newspapers and pasted together. Yes, they do. He uh, makes what he believes is a business offer. As you see, he wants $50,000. For that sum, he'll leave the necklace where our company can find it. We return it to Mrs. Blake and uh, save $150,000. Yes, very wise, too. The thief knows he'd have a difficult time disposing of the pieces through a fence. To identify it too easily. Exactly. 
I see he doesn't mention how he proposes to have you give him the cash. I suppose he'll get in touch with you later. Exactly. Now, couldn't we trap him by promising to pay off at a certain place and uh, at a certain time? I doubt it. Nobody would try a swindle like this without planning it very carefully. Well, then what do we do? I'd like to talk to the dead man's wife. All right. I'll arrange for you to meet uh, Mrs. Blake. Oh, uh, and you'd better have your guard up. She's very beautiful. And very clever. I think of her as a kind of uh, Lucrezia Borgia. Oh, really? Yes, especially for one reason. And what's that? Lucrezia murdered her husband. <laughs> I was gallivanting around San Francisco buying play suits for the summer. A very innocent cherub indeed. And that husband of mine was closeted in a private office with Mrs. Dexter Blake. Mrs. Blake, you say you hardly saw this man who shot your husband? Well, it was very dark, Mr. Abbott. He pushed us away from the lamppost into the doorway. I could just see his shadow. How tall was the shadow? Mm, average height. It's, well, it's very difficult for me to be accurate. I was terribly excited. I didn't notice details. Well, if you couldn't see very well, you could uh, hear. How about his voice? Mm, rather odd, come to think of it. He didn't sound like the usual gangster. Seemed rather cultured. Mm -hmm. Is that all the information you can give me? Mm, I'm afraid so. Sorry I'm not being very helpful. Well, unfortunately, Mrs. Blake, these cases often lead to our having to ask embarrassing questions, probing into the darker corners of people's lives. Go right ahead. Are you getting along well with your husband? Oh, I suppose so. How well do people get along after they've been married quite a while? I'm not a philosopher, Mrs. Blake, just a detective. Did you have reason to believe your husband was, uh, well, mixed up in any activity he'd rather you didn't know about? Is that your diplomatic way of saying, was there another woman? I don't think so. I don't follow you, Mr. Abbott. I wear a necklace, a very expensive one. Some thief holds us up, becomes excited, shoots my husband. And you're making a whole French novel out of it. That's yes, because Mrs. Blake, very often what looks like a simple hold-up or assault or what have you, is actually more complicated than it appears. It's often a cover-up for something more deeply motivated. I am not a woman of very deep motivations. My interests and desires are normal and obvious. As for my late husband... Yes? Dexter was not a man of many dimensions either. Just folks, huh? With a few million dollars. You're a detective, Mr. Abbott. Not a humorist. Who collects on your husband's life insurance? I do. All of it? All of it. How much is that? Oh, about half a million. Do you also inherit all his property? Mm-hmm. It's worth another million and a half. Mm -hmm. Well, we were speaking of motives a while ago. You'll need an awfully good attorney to get you out of this. Why? I'm perfectly innocent. Well, I have an intuitive feeling about you, Mrs. Blake. Nothing too definite to support it. I think you didn't care very much for Dexter, but you uh, had quite a passion for his checkbook. What of it? Well, for instance, you find yourself a mug. You make a deal with him. He holds you up, gets your $200,000 necklace as payment, and takes a pot shot at Dexter. You're the helpless wife. Dexter's a very dead pigeon. You come into Dexter's money, the mug disappears with his two hundred grand. Very nice. I could have had anything I wanted from Dexter. Do you think I'd trade in a comfortable spot like that for the electric chair? Maybe. Lots of people try it. You're wasting your time, Mr. Abbott. Oh, really? Oh, not that I mind. Being questioned by a very handsome detective is so pleasant. You've changed the subject. Certainly. You're much more interesting. Married, Mr. Abbott? Mm-hmm. Oh, good. That makes it more fun. Well, haven't you had enough entertainment these past few days? Mm, not of the right kind. You wrote my phone number in your notebook. Will you call me? What for? Why, you amaze me, Mr. Abbott. 
Some men have to be told everything. That night at home, Pat told me about the case. Only because he had to, as I found out soon enough. How dare you know my policy about keeping you out of my cases? Yes, teacher. Now, for once in your life, you're going to come in very handy. Oh, now you're getting sensible. You have such a brilliant wife, I never could see why you didn't use her talent. Yes, well, look, brilliant wife. There's a way to get at this guy who likes emeralds and target practice with millionaires. Well, how do you do it? With a decoy duck. <laughs> that me? Mm-hmm. Well, what do I do? We buy you a necklace. Oh, this gets better all the time. We buy you a cheap necklace. Are you and Jack Benny, huh? We get our friend Nick Scudder to put a line in this column about the gal who's always at the Stardust Club wearing a sensational necklace. That ought to start our boyfriend, who likes sparklers, chasing around after you. Now, he'd try to pick you up at the club. But I'm hard to get, huh? No, easy, very easy. Uh, this wouldn't be typecasting, would it? <laughs> now, to get the jewels you'll be wearing, he'll have to get you alone. We'll probably ask you to his place. You'll both go outside and get a cab. Pat Abbott, do you mean to say you're actually suggesting that I go to a nightclub, make a pitch at a killer, and then take a taxi ride alone with him? Well, it'll be a special kind of cab. What's special about it? I'll be driving it. Hmm, sounds like quite a Halloween party. Well, it might not turn out to be so jolly, dear. It's what I don't like about my little scheme. You see, somebody in this deal might, uh... Might, uh, what? I decide that your throat is a good place to put old razor blades. We bought a flashy-looking necklace. Nick Scudder plugged away in his column about, quote, the mysterious gal seen every night at the Stardust Club with a rock-studded horse collar that could pay the national debt, unquote. Outside the club a few nights later, Pat was at the wheel of a taxi. I was inside the club sitting alone at the bar. A very oily-looking Joe came over to me, smiled, and... Well, I knew this was our man. I fluttered my eyelids in the best Hollywood manner, and we were off to the races. Don't tell me you're one of those awful people who like to drink alone. No, no, no. I'm just new in town, and I haven't made friends yet. Well, you've made one now. My name's Al. Al Francis. Oh, mine's Jean. Why, do I join you for a drink? Not at all. Do you always play the big bad wolf with all the red riding hoods who come here? Just the beautiful ones. Uh -huh. They fascinate me for more reasons than one. Oh, what do you mean? I'm, uh, psychic about them. I'll take you, for instance. I'll make a guess. I'd say you were married to a very wealthy man. Much older than you are. You're sick of him. You're bored. You've come here for some excitement. Uh, go on. That much was a guess. Now I'll tell you something I'm very sure of. You're looking for excitement, lovely. You're shopping at the right counter. I wasn't quite sure if Al Francis was just being amorous or if he suspected I was a plant and might suddenly give me the same treatment he'd given Dexter Blake. We stayed at the Stardust Club for about an hour. Francis hardly even eyed my necklace. He became more romantic and suggested we go to his apartment. We stepped outside to hail a cab. A cab I knew would be driven by Pat. Hey, taxi. Oh, here comes one, Al. Oh, great. Go ahead, Jean. Step in. Where to, Doc? 1785, Bayside. Right. Nice to be alone for a while, huh, Gene? Just the two of us? Mm-hmm. Gene, every minute I was in the club, I... I wanted to kiss him. Oh, Al, the driver can see it. Why does he care? Come here. Oh, Gene. Did I... you say 1785, Bayside? Yes, yes, I did. Okay. Look at those stars up there, Gene. See? Through the window. We mustn't let them go to waste. Just one kiss. Come close to me. Closer. Oh. Hey, Jack. Doc! 
I don't think there is any 1785 Bayside. I have reason to think there is, driver. You see, I've been living there for nine years. Oh, okay. Gene, honey, I never thought I'd be lucky enough to meet anyone like you. I always used to say to myself, deep in my heart, Al, I said... Hey, you think the Yankees got a chance this year? Look, friend, just drive the car. Okay, Doc. When you walked into the Stardust Club, Gene, I thought for a while that someone might be with you. Then I realized you were alone. It took a lot of courage to go over to you. I don't know what I'd done if you turned me down. We're together now. That'll be 45 cents. Thanks. Come on, Jean. Al, I, I... I've sort of a headache. I've got just a thing for it. Come on. No, really, I, I think I'd, I'd better keep the cab and go home. I'm so tired. You'll feel better when we get upstairs. I have some turkey on ice and a bottle of rice. Yes, but thanks. Ah, don't I... disappoint me. Just for a few minutes. We Come can... on, Bud. You heard the lady. She wants to go home. Who asked you to get into this? I invited myself. You know, I met some fresh cab drivers in my day, but you... Look, the you... lady has a headache. But she's going home now. Oh, you're going to get real cute about this, aren't you? Good night, pal. I'd love to knock your teeth down your throat. Oh, Al, don't start a fight with him, please. Come on, bud. Let's play rough. I don't like your face. I think I could fix it up a little. Al, please. No one must know you and I are... All right, Gene, all right. I'll call you tomorrow. What's your number? Uh, just meet me at the club. Same time as tonight. Fine. Bye, Gene. Bye. You're the most wonderful cab driver I've ever had, Pat. Oh, thank you, ma'am. Where to now? Just drive along the bay. But we don't live out this way. Yes, I know. But didn't you hear what the man said? We mustn't let those stars go to waste. Well, the fellow I borrowed the cab from is waiting. It's all right. Cab drivers understand things like that. <laughs> morning, Pat was just leaving his office. He was on his way to see Frank Tracy. Come in. Good morning, Mr. Abbott. Well, Mrs. Blake. Do you have a moment? I certainly. I've been wondering about what sort of progress you've been making. Have you found any clues to the identity of the man who killed my husband? Oh, I don't talk about my cases until they're cleared up. Oh, I think I have a right to know what you're doing. After all, I was married to Dexter. Frightened, Mrs. Blake? Why should I be? Afraid that what comes out in the wash won't be very pretty? Not in the least. I went to the trouble of looking into the details of your background, Mrs. Blake. I wouldn't exactly call it nice reading for the kiddies. Three husbands... One of them had to go to Mexico for his health when the Justice Department cracked down on the chemical monopoly. Another husband of yours has been barred from every racetrack in the country. Then there was that party in Hollywood where you ducked a marijuana charge that might have meant five years in the clink. How did you get out of that one? I off the judge. Where did you get all that information? I called up the answer man. Very funny. Shall I tell you why you really came here, Mrs. Blake? I want to know who killed my husband. You came here because the life insurance company is ready to ante up with a small fortune now. You're his beneficiary. You're afraid I could prevent that by coming up with evidence that uh, you might have done the killing yourself. You want to make sure I'll stay out of the picture. You are going to stay out of the picture, Mr. Abbott. Well, I'll tell you the next step, too. Now comes the pearl handled revolver in the pocketbook. When you get shot with one of those, you're just as dead as with the other kind. So help me if you stop from if you stop me from collecting Dexter's life insurance. That's I... a dime a dozen to me, Mrs. Blake. They're part of my business. I collect them. Like other people collect butterflies. Good afternoon, Mrs. Blake. Look, you two bit key old peeper. If you and your junior G Man badge stand between me and a couple of million bucks, it wouldn't mean a thing to me to kill you. I've done a little investigating myself. Details about your background. You're mixed up in half a dozen cases where one of the suspects might knock you off at any time. And if you're ever found dead, my friend, it'd take the police forever to figure who did it. They'd get into a jigsaw puzzle that'd have them flipping. And I don't mind telling you about it this way either, because I also found out your office isn't tapped. That's very thoughtful of you. I think of everything. 
Like, for instance, down at the piers, there are men who would be only too glad to take care of you for me. I can buy your death, Pat Abbott. A man no one ever heard of, no connection with you, bumps you off. Disappears on a boat to heaven only knows where. I wonder if you're so upset with me because I might cost you the two million bucks or because I froze up when you made a play for me. Oh, it's the two million. And as for you, personally, I... I said good afternoon, Mrs. Blake, a long time ago. You're underestimating me, Mr. Abbott. And you may not live to regret it. Good afternoon, Mrs. Blake. That little interruption over, Pat went on to the insurance company's office to see Frank Tracy. Now, Mr. Tracy, I think I've got your man. Really? Mm -hmm. Who is he? He lives at 1785 Bayside. Smooth-looking chap, tall, thin, dresses very well. Oh. How did you do it? Uh, did you see the necklace? How can you be sure? I arranged a trap for him. Got him to go after a necklace my wife purposely wore to the Stardust Club. I see. Well, uh, what are we waiting for? Why don't no, we... No, 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 no. If we sail in and grab him now, we won't have much evidence to hold him on. We've got to give him more rope. He's seeing my wife again tonight. Is he, uh, connected with Kathy Blake, as I suspected? Well, that's hard to tell. But give me another 24 hours. I think we'll strike oil. You mean we can arrest him within 24 hours? Probably. Excellent, Mr. Abbott, excellent. Now, uh, do be careful. Francis is liable to be very slippery. Oh, uh, how about Mrs. Blake? Do we just let her wander around? Yeah. Remember the nursery rhyme about the lost sheep? Leave them alone, and they'll come home. That night, I put on a very slinky evening gown. I was getting ready for another session at the club. But Pat stopped me. Ah, uh, you're not going to the club, Jean. Oh, Pat Abbott, just because you're going to close in on Francis, you're getting the willies. You're afraid I'll be hurt. No, that's not the reason. Well, then what is it? Francis won't be at the club to see you. He's going to be late. Very late. I couldn't follow Pat's reasoning at the moment. But, as I learned later... Francis was at home just then, having a visitor. One second. Sorry to keep you waiting, I... What are you doing here? Why the... Why the gun? I... I didn't make any mistakes. Put down the gun. Put down the gun. You did make a mistake, Al. No, Tracy, no. I... I did everything you said. But I told you not to kill anyone, Al. Blake tried to stop me. He started screaming for the police. Then you should have beat it. Well, you told me... Where I... is the necklace? It's in the dresser drawer. So here, I... I'll get it for you. Here. Here's the necklace. Thank you, Al. Lovely, isn't it? I didn't mean to kill Blake. I just wanted to shut him up. I just went to hit him in the leg. You were very careless... They're not too close to me, are they? Now, take your hide. Where is he? Who is he? Abbott. He's very close, Al. Too close for comfort. Well, well what do we do? Well, the answer is simple. Well, can you get me out of here? Or get me out of the country, maybe? Till things cool off? No, Al. Well, then, give me my cut on the necklace. I know some people. They'll help. Twenty-five grand, I can travel fast. You're not getting any money. Well, then what... It's terribly dangerous for me to have you alive, Al. You get rattled too easily. You might say something that would be very embarrassing oh, to Now, me. wait, wait, Tracy. Uh, listen, uh, listen to me. I don't want to cut. I I wouldn't sing that, but I'll go away. That's all I want. I, I want I want to get away. You, you've got to let me. Uh... Sorry, Al. It would be stupid of me to let you go. Wherever you are, you're a potential threat to me. Now, we're wasting time. Oh, don't shoot, so... Tracy. Don't shoot. Don't! Don't! Drop the gun, Tracy! What? Abbott! Ow! Ow! My hand! Keep away from that window, Al. Oh. I've got more bullets than I like playing rough, remember? You're the, the cab driver. That's right. 
I overheard your conversation, Tracy. Al wasn't half as careless as you were. Look, maybe we we can make a deal, Abbott. What do you say? Uh, how about a deal? Our company had a very high recovery rate on jewelry, Tracy. And you insisted on not working with the police. That seemed kind of strange. But you clinched it yourself the last time we talked. When I told you I'd found our man, you said Francis is liable to be very slippery. I'd never mentioned his name, Tracy. Look, I... I I've got plenty of money, Abbott. Uh, make it worth your while to forget this. I purposely told you I wasn't closing in on Al for 24 hours. I knew you'd come in here to see him. Now get up, Tracy. How's 10,000 cash right now? Stand up. 15,000? I said stand up. You too, Al. I've got the same taxi waiting, Francis. The one we were in before. But this time we'll all have a nice, quiet, smooth ride. This time we'll have a police escort. A few hours later, Pat had disposed of his two friends and had come home to his ever-loving wife. Well, darling, I suppose you're full of questions, as usual. As usual. Tracy had a very cushy spot figured out for himself, didn't he, Pat? He sure did. The lug steals the jewelry. Tracy gets his company to shell out, uh, oh, say, $50,000 to get it back. Tracy quietly splits it with his pal. The company saves a fortune. Gal gets her necklace. Everything is moonlight and roses. Mm. Well, what about Mrs. Blake? <laughs> no. Yeah, she was just a hellcat. She wasn't in on this deal at all. Okay, Bob. Now, how do we go about celebrating your solving the case? You want to go down to Fisherman's Wharf and have a seafood banquet? Ooh, I don't know. Head for Chinatown and have... Press duck? Maybe. Um, I'm not sure. Hmm. Well, you got any other suggestions? Well, yes, I did have something else in mind. Uh, what do we got in the refrigerator? Just some cold chicken, a couple of cans of beer. Well, let's stay right here and eat alone. Hmm? But why? Because right here they got services the other places don't have on the menu. <laughs> National Broadcasting Company has presented The Adventures of the Abbots, starring Claudia Morgan and Les Damon as those popular personalities of detective fiction, Pat and Jean Abbott, created by Francis Crane. In our story tonight, Miss Sherry Britton portrayed the role of Kathy Dexter. Others in the cast were Everett Sloan and Santos Ortega. The Adventures of the Abbots was written by Howard Merrill. Original music composed and conducted by Dewey Bergman. Produced by Ted Lloyd and Bernard L. Schubert. Directed and recorded by Harry Frazee. And now this is Wayne Howell inviting you to join us next week, same time, same station, for another exciting adventure in crime with Pat and Jean in The Adventures of the Abbots. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. Maybe I can repay the favor sometime. Maybe I can do something for you, like cutting your throat. W.O.R. presents the distinguished American actor, Walter Hamden, in The Adventures of Leonidas Witherall. Tonight's adventure, The Corpse Meets the Deadline. Leonidas Witherall is the New England schoolmaster who looks like Shakespeare and is always getting mixed up in murders. At the moment... Mr. Witherall has gone to the city desk of the Dalton Herald. It's a very urgent mission on behalf of his housekeeper, Mrs. Mullet, 
And Leonidas, along with Mrs. M., is explaining it to the Herald's editor, Mr. Forrest. Uh, you see, Forrest... Uh, yes, Leonidas? Uh, Mrs. Mullet here is... Uh, uh, what's your title, Mrs. Mullet? I'm director of public relations for the Dalton's Ladies' Aid and Get-Together Society, early Wednesday afternoon group, section two. Leaving on track seven? And our group's holding a special meeting tomorrow. They're having a guest lecturer, Forrest. Oh, really? Who is it? We're having Mrs. Hildegard Fish, who wrote South American Question Mark and Balkan Riddle. She's going to speak on Russia, Russia, what does it mean? Completely baffled, isn't she? And you want us to mention it in the Herald, huh? Mention it? Well, if you could uh, eliminate the news about General Eisenhower and General Patton and just turn, say, uh, ten columns over to Mrs. Mullet's group, Forrest. Uh... Aside from Mrs. Fish, we're having an election and our spring tea dance. Going to be a big day. All right, Mrs. Mullet. We'll see that you get all the space you deserve. Mm. How's that, Mrs. Mullet? I told you we could persuade Mr. I'll Forrest. Persuade him? Why, he should be glad. I'm giving him a scoop. Oh, I am, Mrs. Mullet. We don't often get a break like this. <laughs> There you are, Forrest. Mr. Bennett. Hello, Mr. Bennett. Hello, Mr. Forrest, Bennett. you're a stupid, irresponsible, cheap, yellow journalist. Now, look, Bennett, all I did... Look at this paper of yours. Look at that picture. On the front page, too. I told you not to print that horrible picture of my daughter. There's no harm in that. Running this picture of that rotten gambling den with all those crooks there at the table, my daughter. I can't help it if your daughter visits gambling joints, Bennett. The girl's just 18 years old. She went out on a date. She's no idea where they were going. Just the same, she was there. She wanted to leave the minute they got to that... That evil, iniquitous But place. she didn't leave. The cops came in and our man got the picture. It's not our fault that she's in it. Well, Forrest, I told you yesterday not to print it. Sorry, Bennett. It was the only shot we had, and a good one, too. Well, you've ruined my daughter's reputation. You've disgraced her. Oh, don't be such a blue nose, Bennett. Now, if you don't mind, I'm busy. I've got an addition to get out. I ought to thrash you, Forrest. I oh. ought to treat you the way my grandfather handled a smart aleck newspaper man out west. He got a horse whip, and he whipped that editor within an inch of his life. If you don't watch your tongue, Bennett... I'll have you thrown out of this office. Oh, you wouldn't dare. Uh, no, 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 Mr. Bennett. I, I don't want to interfere, but uh, perhaps if you'd uh, cool off... You keep your beard out of this, with Witherall. And you mind your tongue, Mr. Bennett. Forrest, you filthy... Get away from this desk, Bennett. Just let me get my hands on you. You throw Forrest. Mr. Mr. Bennett, the I'm going to show you. Uh, let go of me, brother. Mr. Bennett, uh, take your hands off. I will. you let go of him, Mr. Bennett? Oh, oh, come on, Mr. You. Bennett, or I'll... All right. All right. You crazy fool. Get out of here. I warn you. All right, Forrest. I'm getting out now. But this isn't the end of it. Go on. I'll yes. see that justice is done, Forrest. I'll see that you're taken care of no matter how far I have to go. Hmm. Looks as though Mr. Bennett's going to be a very serious problem, Forrest. Oh, him, Leonidas? No, I'm... I'm used to that. He seems to be extremely excitable. No, you've got him all wrong. Sure, he'll rave and rant for a while, write letters, and then he'll calm down. Well, I hope so. It doesn't seem as trivial as that, though. I know Bennett. He's a very headstrong old gentleman. And your printing that picture has defiled his little child's good name. Oh, forget it, Leonidas. Oh, come on. I, I don't often have you down here. Suppose I show you and Mrs. Mullet around the place. Uh, feel like uh, touring the plant? Oh, I'd love to. Lead on, MacDuff. I'd like to see the room where the news tickers are. Mr. Mullet knew a lot about news, you know. He had a definition of news, Mr. Witherall. Uh, was it by any chance about uh, a dog? Well, that's right. He said that when a dog bites a man, that's not news. But when a man bites a dog... Tell me. Yes? Anyone ever take a good bite out of Mr. Mullet? Well, how did you know? <laughs> Uh, these are the linotype machines, Leonidas. Oh, well, quite a formidable array of them, Forrest. Yeah. Could we go over to one of them and get a closer look? Oh, sure. Come on. Uh, Pat Welch over there will explain his machine to you. Uh, Pat. Yes, Mr. Forrest? Uh, let up a second, Pat. We have visitors. This is Mr. Witherall and um, Mrs. Mullet. How do you well, do? How do you do? Uh, Pat here was once a publisher himself. No, really? Yes, but... I don't talk about it much. Uh, Pat had uh, an unpleasant experience. Uh, lost his paper. It was very sad, Leonidas. Uh, terribly sad. The machines worked like a big typewriter, you see. You push the keys and they cut letters on what we call lead slugs. Yes, uh, Pat had big ideas once, but he, um, he had to learn. The lead isn't wasted. After we print the paper, it's melted down again. Of course, uh, lots of us have to learn. We all make mistakes. It's evident, Forrest, that Pat would rather not talk about his old career. Now, uh, where do you melt down the lead? Oh, we have it in those big cauldrons. Uh, you see them on the platform up there? Uh, they're right over your head. Oh, yes. You see the steam coming off? 
Well, that's piping hot lead in that cauldron, boiling like a noodle soup. Ah, noodle soup. Get that, <laughs> Mrs. Mother? Uh-huh. <laughs> well, the slugs are melted right in there, you see, and then we cool it and feed it down to the machine. Well, where are the presses? That's another thing I want to see. Oh, we'll go there now. We're running an addition, so you'll see the whole works. Running an addition? Well, shouldn't you do something first about my story, The Lady's Literary Group? Oh, yes, Forrest. Mrs. Mullet would like you to stop the presses for it. Oh, we'll get it in the next edition, Mrs. Mullet. I'll put our top reporter on the job. Uh, Jackie Bigelow, the minute I get back upstairs. Oh. Jackie's our best man, you know. You'll do your story for Jackie. You sent for me, Mr. Forrest? Yes, Jackie. I just left Leonidas Witherall. He had some woman with him, and Mrs. Mullet. Mullet, yeah, I know her. Sort of a neighborhood housekeeper up around the Birch Hill section. Yes, well, she's having a taffy pull for a ladies' club. Get one of the kids out front to call her Witherall. Get the whole story. Write a couple of sticks for the three stars. All right. That's all, Jackie. You can go. That's all as far as you're concerned, Forrest, yes, but I want to do a little talking. This is just as good a time as any. Well, hurry up. I've got a desk full of copy here. Uh Uh-huh. You know what it's about? It's about a phone conversation you had with Cosmopolitan Syndicate. Oh, that wasn't anything. Oh, that wasn't anything, huh? I worked for six months to get Cosmopolitan to make me that offer. You wouldn't have enjoyed being a foreign correspondent, Jackie, especially in Chungking. It's tough grind. Thanks. I wouldn't, huh? That just happens to be why I got into this newspaper racket. All my life I've wanted to be a foreign correspondent. You knew that. They asked me for a frank opinion, Jackie. I told them I thought you were a pretty fair reporter. Don't lie to me, Forrest. You told them I was a punk reporter. I found out. You did that for one reason. Because you're naturally a louse. What an imagination you've got, Jackie. You didn't want to lose a good man yourself. These days that's tough, isn't it? Will you cut it? I couldn't get into this man's war the regular way. The army turned me down. You knew that, too. You knew I'd been eating my heart out covering this small town junk. Or just a little way down the railroad tracks, the whole bloody world's on fire. Still the velocity. You killed my chance, Forrest. I'll never get out of this town now. It might be a year, two years, maybe forever. That was my one big chance, and you fixed it so I'd miss the boat. Lay off, Jackie. I'm going to... You heard me. Lay off. City does, Forrest. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Right. Get into that jalopy of yours and beat it over to the Perkins shipyards. Burning up. Three alarms have gone out. Okay, I'm on my way. And thanks, Forrest. Thanks for everything. Maybe I can do something for you sometime. Like cutting your throat. What can I do for you, Mr. Bennett? I've come here to your place, Mr. Witherall, to apologize for my behavior this morning at the Herald office. It uh, was uh, deplorable, Mr. Bennett. But, of course, uh, you felt printing that picture of your daughter was very embarrassing. That's just the point. I wanted to apologize to you, but I certainly don't intend to retract anything I said to Forrest. In fact, I want your help. Really, Mr. Bennett? Isn't this uh, much ado about nothing? As the poet said, you have too much respect upon the world. They lose it that you buy it with much care. Mr. Witherall, I realize that legally I haven't a leg to stand on. So I decided the best thing to do is to blacklist that newspaper. Mr. Bennett, I hardly think your personal grudge against Mr. Forrest justifies organizing a huge boycott. Oh, but it does. That man has to learn that tactics like his won't be tolerated in Dalton. Here's your coffee, Mr. Witherall. And yours, Mr. Bennett. Oh, uh, thank you, Mr. Martin. Thank you. Now, Mr. Witherall, about blacklisting the Herald, if a group of prominent citizens of Dalton, led by you Shut and me... Shut the what... Listen to those fire engines huh? go. Uh, you'll have to excuse Mrs. Mullet, uh, she's an enthusiast. Engine number five, that tank for Dorothy. Number three, well, that's Jimmy. Gracious, they're all out. I'll bet it's three alarms in me. Oh, dear, I wish I was gone. I could put them in the room myself. Take your number two hose out. Move the ladder over. It's too close to the other building. Come on, come on, get the lead out of your pants. Well, well, if it ain't the Herald Star Reporter. Hiya, Jackie. Oh, Chief. Well, it's a nice little blaze you got. Yeah, it's on it, Jackie. But we'll have it licked soon. Anybody got any idea about how it started? That's what has us wondering, Jackie. It looks phony. You mean it wasn't an accident? Well, now, I don't want to be quoted as saying I'm positive. But I wouldn't be surprised if this shipyard's burning because of saboteurs. No kidding. Saboteurs. Uh, I said I'm not positive, Jackie. But we suspect it. Thanks, Chief. I gotta go call the desk. Brother, sabotage in a little old Dalton. Me for that telephone. Well, what is this today, Pat? Everybody's after me for something. Now, what do you want? Forrest, yes? this morning when you brought Witherall down to the linotype department, you sort of went out of your way to take a couple of pot shots at me. 
Oh, about the way you once owned a paper, Pat? Well, that struck me as a funny story. A little sidelight on one of my employees. You like that idea, don't you, that I'm just one of your employees now? Pat, in San Francisco ten years ago, when you started a paper that you said would put mine out of business, I warned you. I said not to try it. Because you wanted to be the boss of the whole show, huh? You weren't making enough money. You had to squeeze the life out of any paper that tried to get started in the same town. I was just meeting competition, Pat. Yeah, by having my delivery boys beaten up in dark alleys. By sideswiping my trucks so the two of my drivers spent a year in the hospital. By knocking over any stand that carried my papers. And by breaking that poor Italian peddler's neck. That was just an accident, Pat. Sure, that's what the police called it. But I've got another version. I know you've got blood on your hands, Forrest. And you wrecked me. I lost every penny I had trying to buck you. I told you then, don't try it. Remember? All I remember is that you're a crooked chiseler who ruined my business. You're a gangster and a killer and I'd like... Yes? Forrest, this is Jackie Biglow. I'm at the Perkins shipyard. Yeah, what have you got? Better hold the three star for a replay. This ain't no ordinary fire. Looks like sabotage. Sabotage? What's he saying? Sabotage at the shipyard? You stay there, Jackie. Get busy. Dig up everything you can. Don't lose touch with me. Now, give me the details of what you know. City desk, Forrest. Boss, this is the press room. Number three and four presses just broke down. Broke down? Now? Oh, me with a replay on that sabotage story of all the condemned... Bro- Why can't you guys fix it? Well, nobody down here, boss. They're all out for lunch. Wow. Well, Besides, it's something very screwy. Usually I can fix it myself, but I can't figure out what's wrong this time. That would happen now. Ye gods, what kind of a day is this? Everything's going wrong. You better hurry, boss. Sorry, but I'm afraid you'll have to take a look at it yourself. Okay, I'm on my way down. This business will drive me nuts. Nuts! What's wrong with these presses? Where is everybody? What do I pay people for? The presses are bollocks up and there's nobody here. I... Of all that... Hey. Hey, what are you doing up there? Come down off that platform. Get away from those cauldrons. There's a hot lid in there. Are you crazy? Don't push them over. Don't. 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 Ah! <laughs> Mr. Weatherall in. Why, yes, Mr. Bennett. Ah, another visit, Mr. Bennett? You're quite determined about the Herald, aren't you? Mr. Weatherall, something's happened, something horrifying. Oh, what is it? It's Forrest. Oh, has the editor printed another inflammatory picture? No, no, it isn't that. Forrest is dead. Really? He's been murdered. It's all over town. It is, and I didn't know it. Hmm, You must be slipping, Mrs. Muller. Of course, since he's dead, well, you know the consequences. Sure. They'll have to turn in his ration book to the OPA. How did he die, uh, Mr. Bennett? Well, in a pretty gruesome way. Hmm? He was evidently trapped. He was alone in the press room when the killer dumped one of those huge kettles of boiling lead over him. Say, that's a new one. And uh, the body was found in the press room? No. The murderer took the body and dumped it down a chute. The chute where the papers come off the press and roll out onto the delivery trucks. And just a little while ago, the body came rolling down the chute along with the newspapers. Uh, Mr. Bennett, uh, why have you come here to tell me about this? Well, I know you've been mixed up in murders, Mr. Witherall, and that you've been rather successful at solving them. Yes, and I heard you threatening Forrest. You weren't by any chance near the Herald building at the time of the murder. Heaven help me, I was in the building. But you know nothing about the murder, of course. Absolutely. I've never been in the Herald press room in my life. I don't know a thing about kettles of hot lead or delivery chutes. Mm, You'd have a little difficulty, Mr. Bennett, proving that. I realize that. That's why I'm here, Mr. Witherall. Would you represent me? Well, frankly, Mr. Bennett, I don't uh, represent anyone. If you uh, think my looking into the story might clarify it or speed the solution... That's all I ask. I want you to come to the Herald office now and get at the truth. We're going to look into the murder, huh? I'll get to the bottom of this. Where's my hat? Where's my coat? Yes, and don't forget your bloodhound. <laughs> So, uh, you see, Sergeant McCobble, Mr. Bennett claims he knows nothing about Mr. Forrest's death. Mr. Bennett? Yes, Sergeant? You admit that you were here in the Herald building at 3.30, huh? When Forrest's body came down that chute? That's right, Sergeant. But I had nothing to do with it. What were you doing here, Mr. Bennett? Well, I I was on the street floor. 
I decided to come back and demand that Forrest print an explanation, an apology for printing my daughter's picture. But you never got up here to the city desk, uh, Mr. Bennett? No, Mr. Witherall. I changed my mind and I left. Now, you see, Shakespeare, you can't expect me to believe stories like that, can you? Wait till you hear the fairy tale that Linotyper's got. Hey, boy, it's a dilly. Don't mind Sergeant McCobble, Mr. Bennett. They figured, figured morale in the police force was too high, so they took him in. Ah, Mrs. Mullinson again. She's the only overage destroyer that never got to Britain. What's that? Tut, 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 tut. Now, isn't that the line of type of coming now, Sergeant McCobble? That's the guy, Shakespeare. Name's Pat Welch. Uh, over here, Pat. Sergeant, I told you my story once. I want Mr. Witherall to hear it, Pat. <clears throat> Get this, Shakespeare. It's a honey. Well, I work in the linotype department. I came up here to Forrest's office to talk about the next edition. Then Jackie Bigelow, the reporter, telephoned from the shipyard while I was in Forrest's room. Then I left him and went downstairs. That was, oh, about 3.15, I think. You're rather definite <clears throat> about the time, Pat. Yes, I looked at the clock when I got back to the linotype department. Then I got a telephone call saying my mother was sick. You see what I mean, Shakespeare? About fairy tales? Why didn't you go the whole hog, Pat? Say that you had to leave because your grandmother died. Or did you pull that one to get to a ball game? That's the truth, Sergeant. I swear it. That your whole story, Pat? No. As soon as I heard about my mother, I ran to the elevator to get home. But I got stuck inside. I presume the elevator operator can confirm that. No. It's a self-starting elevator. There isn't any operator. But it's stuck. The superintendent will swear to that. It hasn't been fixed yet. I've got a little nephew, Pat. He's four years old. The kid could make up a better story than you've got. Pretty sure of yourself, ain't you, Sarge? Now look, Mrs. Mother. It's time for spring cleaning. Why don't you go home and rearrange the dirt? Why, no, 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 no. You, Suppose we that. save the second-hand wit for amateur night and mm. get on with finding the sparrow that killed Cock Robin. Pat, um, uh, where's the main switchboard? Downstairs. Going down there, Shakespeare? If you'll excuse me, Sergeant, yes. It's possible that the phone girl can confirm whether or not Pat received a call after three this afternoon. Okay, go on, I'll wait here. Look, Mr. Witherall, you said you'd help me. Now you're wandering off to corroborate this man Welch's story. Mr. Bennett, our objective was the truth. Remember? <laughs> Dalton Harold, good afternoon. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Forrest is out. He's getting a fitting for a wooden suit. Yes, yeah, somebody didn't like his face, so they pushed I, him uh, into that. I pardon. I understand your name is Ruth. That's and... right. He says if you don't look like what's his name, um, Shakespeare. Mm, if I could only write like him, too. But my name is only Witherall, uh, Ruth. Oh, that's it. You're from Meredith Academy. Yes. Yeah. I'm uh, curious about what happened earlier this afternoon to, uh, what's his name, Forrest? Oh, oh, that. Gee, Pat Welch is in a fix, huh? Everybody knows him and Forrest hated each other's guts, if you'll uh, pardon the expression. Uh, Ruth, uh, was there a phone call for Pat this afternoon? Oh, yeah, yeah, about uh, three o'clock. I don't know who it was from. I only ask who's calling when they ask for an executive. Oh, ain't it a shame. Patty's such a sweet guy. And Forrest, if you'll pardon the expression. Gresham was a high-class stinker. Hmm. We must have you address our English literature classes at Meredith sometime, Ruth. The uh, tragedy of illiteracy might be the subject. Oh, gee, I'd be only too happy. Uh, with you as Exhibit A. Hiya, Mr. Witherall. Well, what are you doing here? Hiya, Ruthie, baby. Man, oh, man, what a fire I've been to. I'm knocked out. I'll get ready for a Lulu, Jackie boy. Why, what's up? Well, while you were at the fire, somebody gave Forrest a bath with a bucket of that lead in the press room and then sent the corpse roller-coastering down the delivery chute. <laughs> Cute, ain't it? No kidding. That's it, Jack. The police are upstairs now. Hallelujah. Forrest knocked off? Boy, this is my lucky day. I get a terrific story, and on top of that, somebody puts Forrest where he belongs. Who did it, huh? They know? Uh, Sergeant McCobble's upstairs now with Pat Welsh and Mr. Bennett. They're the most uh, likely candidates for the honor at the moment. Well, what are we waiting for? Let's go on up there. This well, I gotta see. All right, Jack, we can... No, no, wait a minute. Not that way, Mr. Witherall. Up the stairs. The elevator's broken. See ya, Ruthie. Okay. Bye, Mr. Witherall. Uh, toodle you, Ruthie. Uh, come out to Meredith sometime. As the students say, you'll be hotter than a two-dollar pistol, if you'll pardon the expression. <laughs> Now, Jack, 
You say Forrest cheated Pat here out of a newspaper, huh? Put him out of business? Yeah, that was the deal, McCobble. It was in Frisco about ten years ago. I'm sorry, Pat, but the fact's a fact. I'm not worried, Jackie. Man that's innocent doesn't have anything to worry about. Yes, as the Bard wrote, truth is truth to the end of reckoning. Sergeant, aside from the fact that I happen to be in the building, you haven't a scrap of tangible evidence against me. But when it comes to motive, Mr. Bennett, you did have a violent argument with Mr. Forrest about that picture of your daughter. Since when do you convict people on that kind of evidence? We'll get all the evidence soon enough. Give the sergeant a chance, Mr. Bennett. He'll learn. Won't you, squeaky shoes? Mrs. Mullet, don't stand there with your teeth in your mouth. Why don't you... Easy, easy, easy. Uh, Talking about motives, Jack, I happen to know that Forrest cut you out of the job you wanted, working for that syndicate in Chung King, and I also know what it meant to you. Sure, that's right. Oh, I'm not sorry he's dead. I'll bet everybody in the building had a motive for wiping out that lug. Oh, uh, what happened to your wrist, Jack? Huh? Oh, oh, the bandage? (laughs) I burned myself at the fire. Now, the chief will back me up on that. I was poking in the ruins for sabotage evidence. Mm, you've been at the fire since that first call came in Came in about it, Jack? Yeah, I've been there all the time. I telephoned for us from there. Anybody will tell you that. You left the moment the news flash came in? Mm-hmm, yeah, about three o'clock it was. Pat, um, you saw Mr. Forrest alive in his office when Jack telephoned? I did. After Jack called about the sabotage development, Pat, uh, you went back to the liner type, as I understand it. That's right. When you did, you looked at the clock, and it was 3.15. Uh-huh. Then you received a call from your that your mother was ill. You dashed for the elevator, but it broke down while you were inside. I told you the super will confirm that. Therefore, the elevator broke down roughly about uh, 3.20. And that's about it. Hmm. Very interesting. What's the angle, Shakespeare? Now, Jack, uh, you say you've been at the fire since a few minutes past 3.00. And we know that the elevator broke down about 3.20. Get to the point, Mr. Witherall. Yeah, what's this all about? Uh, Jack, it's about the fact you're supposed to have been at the fire since shortly after 3, long before the elevator broke down. Yet when I met you downstairs with Ruth, you remarked quite casually that uh, we should take the stairway because the elevator didn't work. How did you know that, uh, Jack? Why, I, uh... Sounds like a payoff question to me, Jack. One of the truckmen outside on my way in, he told me. Just before I found you at the switchboard. Really, Jack? Hmm. I suppose you'd be willing also to submit your wrist to a medical examination? My wrist? Wrist? Why, certainly I will. Why? Why? Because, Jack, I think you burned your wrist while dumping the cauldron of hot lead over forest. As you know, a medical examination will reveal whether that burn was caused by flames or um, if there are traces of lead in it. I'll uh, have another cup of coffee, Shakespeare. Then I'll be meandering home. You figure Jack went straight to the fire, huh? Yes, Ricardo. He stayed there long enough to establish his presence. Uh, then he raced back unseen to the neighborhood of the Herald. Uh-huh. He called up Forrest uh, from downstairs with the sabotage story, uh, creating the impression that he was still at the fire. I get it. Then he buzzed Pat Welch, probably using a phony voice to tell him the lie about his mother being sick. Yes, uh, that uh-huh. got Welch out of the way. Yeah. And gave Welch a very weak excuse, too. Then uh, Jack uh, Monkey wrenched the presses, uh, forcing Forrest to go down to the press room where he was killed. The whole affair couldn't have taken more than a few minutes. Then Jack went dashing back to the fire. He'd gotten away with it, too. But he hadn't pulled that boner in front of you about the elevator. Yes, there was that. And the wrist burn. Shakespeare, how did you know the wrist burn could be analyzed for traces of hot lead? I never knew that. Um, Sergeant, um, shall I confess something to you? Uh, Neither did I. What? It uh, sounded like such a good idea at the time. Oh, you (laughs) faker. Rather neat, eh? Worked beautifully, too. Jack might never have confessed. You know, I think my students at Meredith have given me a superb training in the art of um, uh, what they call manufacturing applesauce. Yeah, well, applesauce or not, Shakespeare, we caught that killer, and that's what counts. Those murderers can't get to the chair fast enough for me. As a matter of fact, Considering what kind of a man that newspaper editor was, he deserved to get wiped out, too. Probably, Sergeant. There's no doubt that uh, society's transgressors must be punished. Yet uh, we mustn't make quick, violent judgments. We must always remember what the gentleman I'm supposed to resemble once wrote about mercy when he said, It is twice blessed. 
It blesseth him that gives, and him that takes. It is mightiest in the mightiest. It becomes the throned monarch better than his crown. His scepter shows the force of temporal power, the attribute of awe and majesty, wherein doth sit the dread and fear of kings. But mercy is above this sceptered sway. It is enthroned in the hearts of kings. It is an attribute of God himself. And earthly power doth then show likest gods when mercy seasons justice. has presented the distinguished American actor Walter Hamden in The Adventures of Leonidas Witherall. Mrs. Mullet is played by Ethel Ramey, Sergeant Picabel by Jack McBride. The character of Leonidas Witherall is from the mystery novels by Alice Tilton. The radio script is written by Howard Merrill, and the program is under the direction of Roger Bauer. Next week, Leonidas meets a very interesting hitchhiker, doesn't he, Mr. Hamden? Oh, yes. Leonidas is driving along the highway when he meets a young lady who asks him for a hitch. And a very informative young lady she is, too. In fact, uh, before long, Leonidas is receiving a very practical lesson in how to win friends and influence homicidal maniacs. We hope you'll be listening next Sunday at 7, and until then, good night. <laughs> Listen again next Sunday evening at 7 p.m. Eastern War Time for The Adventures of Leonidas Witherall. This program came to you from the studios of WOR in New York. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Ladies and gentlemen... The American Broadcasting Company brings to its entire network one of radio's most unusual programs. Pat Novak, for hire. says, Pat Foghorn for hire. Oh, there are other ways to say it, but down on the waterfront in San Francisco, you got to put your best foot forward, especially if you want to trip up a friend. Down here, a friend is anybody who's been dead more than ten years. And then it pays to watch out, because if you relax, somebody will come along and knock you on the back of your stomach. Works out all right, though. I rent boats and do anything else you can hide in the dark about all you can ask, because along the Embarcadero, nothing's perfect except the heels. I found that out Wednesday afternoon. She was a lovely girl, the sort of person you'd expect to see in a choir loft about three hours after choir practice. Her hair was red, her eyes were as cold as rigor mortis, and you knew the first time you met her that you'd been seeing her too often. Must have been about five o'clock in the afternoon. I was walking down toward Pier 19 when she pulled up alongside of me in a cream convertible. Can I give you a lift? You already have. Well, is that love or reflex action? What's on your mind? You are, Mr. Novak, but don't put on your tracksuit. It's a business matter. Well, in that case, you've got a name. I'm Con Regan. I went by your office a few minutes ago, but you were out. I'm in now. Go ahead. It won't take me long, Mr. Novak. Stay away from Rory Malone. Well, I'm doing all right so far. Who is he? He's important to me. 
I don't want to lose him, Mr. Novak, so please stay away. Go tell a girl. I don't even know the guy. You will. You're not lying now. He's a prize fighter, and someone's going to try and hurt him. Then you'd rather hurt him first. I'm willing to pay you to stay away from him. Suppose I'm going to see him a lot. Will you pay a lot? I'll give you $300. All right, Mr. Novak? You know, you're not smart, Angel. If you're pressing that hard, the other team's going to bid, too. The answer's no. I'm afraid that's up to you. But I'm warning you, don't do it. That's Please what... don't do it. Yeah, that's what Mother used to say. I'm still all right. Maybe Mother liked you better, Mr. Novak. See you later. <laughs> Well, I watched her for a minute as she brushed her hair back and started the car. It was nice hair, and the dress helped, too. It was dark blue and had a V-neck, but the designer believed in big letters. She pulled away and gave me a look you could take on a safari. It was enough to tell me that she was as safe as a tap dancer on a floor full of dynamite caps. I walked up and turned in at Pier 19. When I reached the door of the office, I could see the old man sitting by the desk. He looked tired and a year older than the Bible. His hands were shaking and his skin was coarse in the color of an old razor strap. When I walked in, he glanced up at me and looked about as happy as a cocker spaniel with a stomach ache. Uh, I could talk to you, please, Mr. Novak. We'll try it once. Go ahead. I'm an old man. You want to argue or go on? I'm too old, so I must come to someone for help. Uh, my name is Hans Neumeyer. I would like you to watch someone for me. Someone like Rory Malone? Yeah. But you do not what know... What is this? Save Rory Malone week? What's he to you? I am his uh, manager. Oh, you don't ever hear of me because I'm old and uh, not a very good manager, I guess. After this fight, Rory find new manager, maybe. Yeah? What's, when's this fight? Uh, tonight. Oh, you, you don't know Rory. He's a good boy. He's a very good boy, Rory. Is. Yeah, well, good boys don't need watching. Has he got some bad coming out? Uh, something funny about this fight. He meets with bad people. And Rory is a good boy. Yeah, I just met one. How deep do they run? Uh, the worst is a fellow named Joe Slagle. He's a bad man. A gambler. Please, Mr. Novak, you just watch Rory tonight and see he's all right. Are you that rich? Oh, please, I don't have much money. Just uh, $300, maybe, what I got from the fight. Maybe 300 I don't know. I just got a little money. It's a tie, Pop. You win the toss. <laughs> please, you, you don't help me. You win, you win, Pop. When do I look at him? Uh, tonight you come before the fight. In the dressing room, I show you to Rory, and you see he's all right. Yeah, about nine? Yeah. Please, Mr. Novak. I, I thank you all my life. You watch Rory. I, I thank you all my life. Yeah, well, I'm getting short shift on that, but I suppose it's not your fault, Pop. See you at nine. <laughs> Well, I felt sorry for him when he turned and walked out of there. I could afford it. With 300 bucks, you can buy a lot of crying towels. At the door, he turned and smiled once before he shuffled out. He moved down the pier with a nervous, uncertain motion like a flower petal in a warm wind. When he disappeared, I took a cab and rode up to the press club. Oh, I found out a lot about Rory Malone, and most of it was good. He was a lightweight and... Hans Neumeyer had picked him up and brought him through the prelims up to main event stuff. He was fighting tonight against a Cleveland boy named George Zarek, and the betting was even. I ran into a Chronicle man whose wife divorced him and named a fight club as correspondent, and he said not to worry about Joe Slagle, that Rory Malone fought for purses, and that's all. He knew about the girl, Con Regan, but he didn't want to say much, just that she was a fast, five-gated horse trying for seven. Well, I had some dinner, and I went over to the arena about 8.30. When I walked into Roy Malone's dressing room, Hans Neumeyer wasn't anywhere around. I stood over in a corner and watched him get ready for the fight. There was enough liniment being thrown around to keep an old lady's home spry for years. The other handlers were in, watching him tape up Malone and put on the gloves. Most of the people cleared out then. Malone shadow boxed a minute before a second threw a robe around his shoulders and shoved him toward the door. As he passed, I fell in beside him, and we started walking under the arena. A few feet down, I bumped up against him. 
Sorry? About what, Hans Newmeyer? Who are you? Where's Newmeyer? What do you care? My name's Novak. I'm supposed to meet him here. Do you know where he is? No, he didn't show up. He's probably out drunk. Does he drink? No. Well, that's a funny answer. I don't know where he is. All I know is I need him tonight. I got to get up to the ring. I'll go with you. Suit yourself. You gonna win tonight? You never know. Sometimes you do. Mister, you're either too smart or too dumb. What's the difference? You can't fight twice in one night. I want to talk to you, Rory. Not now, Kitty. You have to fight. Please, Rory, talk to me now. Kitty, you're crazy. This guy's standing around, a lot of other people. What do you want to do, put him on the radio? Where's Hans? He hasn't been around. Where is he, Rory? I don't know, Kitty. If I knew, I'd get him. There's something wrong, Rory. I've been watching, and I know there's something wrong about this fight. Yeah, yeah, there's only going to be one guy fighting if you don't let me Please, out. Please, Rory, don't brush me off like a dumb fly. I, I know there's something wrong. I don't want you to get into trouble. All right, Kitty. Oh, don't say all right when you know how I feel. Well, let's talk about you and Joe Slagle. Oh, please, Rory. You don't know what it's like to see somebody you love go crazy. Your dough is safe, Kitty. <laughs> that doesn't count. You know that doesn't count, Rory. The little money I saved doesn't count next to you. Oh, please, Rory, don't do anything wrong. I'd I die. I'd I die of terrible heartbreak. It hurt me all my life. Stop it, will you, Kitty? Now stop crying. Don't worry, I'll win. Just, just don't let anything happen, Roy. I won't. I'll see you after the fight. Come on, Novak. Yeah. You're real good with your women, Malone. After this fight, I want to match with you, Novak. I've met two of them, and they both have you in their dream books right on the fly leaf. I'll remember. Talk some more. I'll talk enough to tell you that you're being followed about 12 inches behind. That's right, Malone. Keep walking. Turn in the next door. Hey, wait a minute. Wait a minute. You better walk, Malone, unless you can outrun a bullet. You too, mister. I agreed an hour ago. All right. Open the door for him, Eddie. Okay. You stand over here. I'm alone. Take off your glove. I'm gonna need it. You're gonna be eating teeth. Take off your glove. Help him, Eddie. Yeah. That's it. Hold him on the other side, Steve. Put his hand on the table, Eddie. Now give me the block. Yeah. You can cry, Malone. It's gonna hurt. <laughs> Hold him up. Keep his hand out there, Eddie. Put the glove back on, Malone. It's too smashed up. It'll hold the pieces. Put it on. You better put it on, Malone. You're overmatched. That's it. Now go on up there and look good. Yeah, why don't you loan him the gun and he'll win in two rounds? Look, mister, I don't know who you are, but I'm sick of your mouth. It's a big floor, so stretch out. <laughs> two hours, they either moved me or the arena because I woke up in an alley down near the Golden Gate Theater. It was in back of a restaurant, and I was lying there trying to look good in a mixed green salad. My head was about the size of a diving bell, and my clothes were so rumpled and dirty, I looked like a leg man for the hobo news. I tried to get to my feet once, but it wasn't easy. It was like trying to push a basketball through a stovepipe. I think it was close to 11 when I got out to the street. I didn't even buy a paper to find out about the fight. I grabbed a cab and went up to my apartment to iron out my spine. It was a good idea, but the girl at the desk had a message from Hans Newmeyer. He was out at the California General Hospital, and he wanted to see me right away. When I got there, he was at the end of a ward on the third floor, but the duty nurse wouldn't let me by. Oh, she was a real pretty nurse, if you like pure mammal. Somebody buzzed, and when she oozed down the hall, I ducked into the ward and started looking for Hans Newmeyer. It was dark, and he was away down at the end behind a white screen. He looked tired, and his eyes were moist and soft, like a ripe fruit that's just been squeezed too hard. Uh, please, Mr. Novak, you come to see me. Yeah, just as soon as I got your message. Uh, you make mistake with Hans. I don't send message. Somebody wants to be your secretary. What happened to you? In my room. I just go to my room. Somebody is there. I don't know. Rory's all right. 
I limped a little, mister. Your boy got his hand smashed. You always a good boy. He's got a good girl. Who's Kitty? Oh, she's go with Rory a long time. Save money to marry this. Wait a minute. Keep still. Something the matter? Yeah. Somebody coming. Down this way. Coming up behind that curtain. Maybe if Rory comes to visit me. Whoever came to visit him didn't stay long. The old man leaned back in the bed and quit without any fanfare, like a long summer coming to an end. Well, I went out to get the nurse, and I found her down at the end of the hall giving an intern some greedy talk. She hadn't heard the shots, and they hadn't seen anybody come out of the ward. I told her as much as I could, and then she wheeled the old man into another room and called homicide. Well, that call to homicide didn't help, because from now on, things weren't going to improve. I was fighting a forest fire with a can of kerosene. About 20 minutes later, Inspector Hellman showed up. He was full of finesse and fury, and he came charging over about as graceful as a lame lobster. Hello, Novak. You're up late. I had company most of the time. Yeah, and did he bore you? Somebody got tired of him. It happened behind a screen down there in the ward. Who is he? Guy by the name of Hans Newmeyer. He manages a fighter named Rory Malone. Yeah? The killing's mixed up with a fight fix. Not the Zarek fight. Yeah, that's right. They got to Rory Malone ten minutes before ring time. You got a thin story, Novak. Look, I got a fat one. And I got all the gambling going town on my side. The old man got it because Roy Malone was dumped in that fight. I don't believe it. You don't have to believe it, Hellman. They smashed him up. His right hand was as limp as an old piece of lettuce when he climbed into that ring. They should have smashed both hands. Huh? Because Rory Malone won by a knockout in the fifth round. Try another page, Novak. When Hellman told me Rory Malone won that fight, I might as well have handed him a feather. I stood there feeling like a guy peddling dope at his sister's wedding. How could Rory Malone have won that fight with a, without a hand grenade? When I saw the hand, it wasn't strong enough to flatten a piece of silk on an ivory table, and yet he won by a knockout in the fifth round. Well, it pointed to one thing. Zarek had taken a dive. But why the double fix? Why had they smashed Rory's hand? Oh, it was a goofy pitch, like sending for a plumber to fix a hole in Boulder Dam. I didn't have time to wrestle around with it because Hellman had talk on his mind. You can't get a bookie in town to take bets on this one, Novak. No, not with you setting the odds. They were that way when I got here, so don't write up a clean bill of health. The guy's dead and nobody else is volunteering. Oh, you'd muff a confession anyway. Before you tumble, they'd have to cut it in stone across the front of City Hall. What were you doing with the old man? Helping him over the rough spots. Or taking him over the hurdle. He hired me to watch Rory Malone. They were stepping up the pace on his boy. For instance? For instance, Joe Slagle. Everybody says he had a stake in the fight. You don't throw a fight by winning in the fifth round. That's what the book says, but sometimes the book's wrong. You better look up Joe Slagle, and on the same trip, you can stop by and see a gal named Con Regan. Yeah? Why? She's Malone's new sparring partner, a tall redhead with lots of dry cells. Oh. She sounds nice. I'll talk to her. And Slagle, too. But I'm going to find out about you and Rory Malone first. I'm going to run down the stuff on this fight, and I'll find out where you fit in. Don't worry, Novak. I'll dig you out. You could take the jelly out of an omelet, Hellman. Look up the girl and Joe Slagle. They'll talk. Not about each other. There's some connection there. I'll give even money their friends. They ought to be. What? They were married a month ago in Las Vegas. Or don't you know about love? <laughs> Hellman stood there a moment and smiled like a guy who's just killed a landlord. And then he turned around and walked out. Well, I stayed until they wrapped up the old man. And after that, I went with the Chronicle office and pulled the clips on Joe Slagle. He'd been to three jails and gotten his masters at Alcatraz, and there were some pictures of him at the racetrack. He had a face any museum would buy and a forehead that was so low he must have had to look down to see his hairline. There was one other thing about him I noticed. He was the same guy who'd smashed Rory Malone's hand. I began to wonder about that friendship, but it was getting late and I had to work fast, so I looked up the only honest guy I know, an ex-doctor and a boozer by the name of Jocko Madigan. Well, he's a smart guy, and until he decided a head on your beer is worth more than a head on your shoulders. I finally found him in a little joint down on Geary Street talking to some woman into giving up all men under 50. Ah, Patsy! I've missed you in a rather trivial way. Yeah, all right, Jocko. I'm giving this woman a lecture on diminishing returns. Jocko, will you stop drinking long enough to listen? 
Patsy, you fail to understand my drinking. Actually, I hate whiskey, but I go on drinking as a sort of shock to Providence. Yeah. Because everyone knows the guardian angels take care of small children and tipplers. And since I've passed the age where I look well in rompers, this is a very clever dodge to get a little outside help. Jocko, are you ever going to change? Patsy, don't... Don't you know what a burden change is to a man as old as I am? Oh, yeah. Oh, it's, it's not the change we mind. It's the way it happens uh, by degrees. Never giving you a chance to remember anything else. So it's heartbreaking, Patrick. All right, all right. It's like visiting a half-forgotten neighborhood. It hasn't changed completely, just parts of it. A few old houses and some human remnants is still around. Enough to remind you of the change, but never enough to make you happy. It's that way with growing old. Will you listen? They don't allow you to grow old suddenly and leave. They insist on this policy of having you dribble off into eternity. It's undignified, Patsy, feeling like a bowl of old dishwater with the stopper pulled out. Jocko, I want to talk to you. Why didn't you say so? What's the matter? An old guy by the name of Hans Neumeyer is dead. Oh, bless him. Homicide's full of fever. They think I killed the old man. What did he do before he uh, stopped doing it? A fight manager. He hired me to watch his fighter, Rory Malone. He should have hired a team because somebody got to him in the hospital tonight. How do you fit in? Well, I was just passing through when the noise started. Uh, that was General Custer's problem. It's tied up with tonight's fight. Newmeyer was afraid of a gambler named Joe Slagle. He was around tonight and smashed Malone's hand before ring time. That's a hard way to lose. Yeah, well, it's a harder way to win. Malone won by a knockout in the fifth. Was he fighting his father? I'm not getting any place, Jocko, and I'm doing it in a hurry. It's a bad fit all the way around. They took two tries to get the old man, and if Slagle bought the fight, why'd he smash Malone's hand? Let's have a drink. Jocko, you've got to help me. Oh, it's the thirst that's confusing. I want you to get up to Roy Malone's place. You can find it in the book. Go through his stuff and try to pick up a lead, will you? Why don't you do it? I'm going to look up a girlfriend named Con Regan. She's married to Slagle, but she's trying to work Malone into the act. Oh, well, in that case, uh... I'd be in the way. Look, I'm in a spot, Jocko. Now get up to that apartment, will you? What if Malone walks in and finds me going through his stuff? Stop worrying. He almost killed a man with one broken hand. Suppose someone smashed the other one. Well, I had to do something quick because the kettle was on to boil. By the time Hellman got to him, Slagle had have an alibi, and my story about the smashed hand wouldn't prove a thing. Oh, I had to grope around and pretend like a guy on the second verse of the National Anthem. I decided to tag by Slagle's place, and on the way, I bought a paper to read about the fight. Malone looked real bad for four rounds, and then came out of the woods fast with a left hand in the fifth. It was about midnight when I got to Slagle's apartment, and began to look more and more like it when Con Regan opened the door. Oh, I could see Rory's point. She was the sort of a woman you'd never give a second look. Because the first had paralyzed you. Her red hair looked brighter now, and, well, legs like that are the reason silkworms are born. She smiled, and you knew if you never made Naples, you could die happy with her. But I guess she picked her friends. It's too late for the 300 now, Mr. Novak. I'm working free. Invite me in, huh? Sorry, darling. You look lonely. Where's Slate? I agreed to marry him, not follow him. How about Malone? Somebody killed his manager. I'd like to help you, Mr. Novak, but I don't like you well enough. Well, you can make love later. Give me answers now. Where are you going? You're not welcome. I want to know what those bags are packed for. I don't trust the drawers. Now get out of here, Mr. Novak. Calm down and put the gun away. Get out of here. You came uninvited. I'll kill you the same way. Hello, Novak. You going to lose an argument? Well, it looks that way. If she's yours, call her off, Malone. You're too tough, Con. Let him walk out. He's steamed in here full of questions. That's a bad way to answer. Relax. That's what your man Newmeyer's doing. Somebody killed him tonight. I know that, Novak. Your eyes aren't very red. I can't help it, Novak. All I can do is square his beef. Well, you can start with your girlfriend. She's leaving town, or did you buy the tickets? That's your hurry, Con. If I want to leave, I can leave, Rory. I'll argue with you. You'll get the short end, Rory, because I'm leaving. Stay away from me. You're too close. Oh, Rory, stop it. Someday they'll match you even, Rory. Maybe it's a referee. I'll get it. Yup. You got a deep voice, Miss Regan. What's on your mind, Hellman? Joe Slagle right now. He cleaned up in tonight's fight. Not with a betting even. Wasn't after the first round. Word got out that Malone broke his hand. The betting changed. And Slagle covered every bet in the house. That's right. Well, the old man tumbled before it happened. That's what he was afraid of. And the shock killed him? Slagle did. You got a motive now, Hellman. You better look him up. We did. He's dead. He couldn't be dead. If he's not, the bullet holes are good fakes. See you soon, Novak. <laughs> I 
didn't talk to the girl and Rory because I knew they'd dummy up on me and I had nothing to go on. Oh, it was like trying to build a wall out of jelly consomme. Nothing added up now. Whose side was Rory on and where did that other girl, Kitty, fit in? My luck was on the black market tonight and I knew it. So I went by my place to check with Jocko. He was in the kitchen and he looked worried. Ah, Patsy. Uh, you know, I was going to break open the thermometer until I found this bottle in the closet. All right, Jack. What'd you find out? That it pays to know Joe Slagle. There's a $20,000 check in Malone's desk. Slagle signed it. He could afford it. Somebody killed him an hour ago. Where was Malone? I don't know, but that's not gratitude. Well, maybe he'll wire regrets. Hmm? You'd better get up there. All his stuff's packed for a long trip. Well, well. A couple of trunks and all his bags. Uh, does that sound like a weekend party? I don't know, Jocko. He's kind of fancy. Maybe he likes a lot of laundry. Up to now, it was like trying to melt a pound of diamonds. But when the turn comes, everything happens in a hurry. And things began to fall faster than snow off a warm roof. If Jocka was right, it meant Rory and the girl fought, but they did a lot of clinching between rounds. Well, I got a hold of Hellman and brought him up to date, and then I started for Rory Malone's apartment. When I got there, Hellman was outside the door listening, as quiet as a washing machine full of pebbles. They must be in the back room. I can't hear a thing. You couldn't hear a rifle shot in a boxcar, Hellman. Let's get a better view, huh? Hello, Novak. Gonna miss your train, Malone. I don't believe you. It's a chance to bet, Mr. Novak. This is Inspector Hellman from Homicide. Well, you guessed wrong, Inspector. I'm covered for Joe Slagle. Novak here's alibi for Miss Regan. We can check. You're scraping bottom, mister. We can start with that $20,000 check from Joe Slagle. That's where you'll stop, too. A $20,000 covered a sale of my contract. The fight commission can beef, but that's all. You ready, come? I hope you are, too, because you're going downtown. Look, fella, you'll make us miss a train, but we'll catch the next one. You're wishing now, Roy. Who's this? A fast friend with a slow burn. Hello, Kitty. Your boyfriend's gonna leave. Say goodbye. Please, Rory, you're crazy to go with her. She makes me that way, Kitty. I'm sorry. Rory, I've done too much for you. I've kept loving you all this time. You can't leave. You can't leave now. I don't want to be alone. Buy a dog. Oh, no, Rory. No, I won't let you go. You're too good with guns. Drop it. <laughs> you better take her, Helmet. She's anxious. Oh, please, Rory. I loved you too much for this. I loved you enough to kill somebody. You can't leave, Rory. You can't leave me to myself. When the guy comes, tell him where the baggage is. What'll become of you, Rory Malone? What'll become of you, Rory Malone, when you have to think about me? When you hear the sound of me in your head? Oh, you're brave, Rory. You're brave to leave me alone. Come on, Con. In a place like this, we're wasting you. Come back! Come back, Rory Malone! Come back long enough to watch them laugh at me. <laughs> watch them laugh at me for the fool I am. Oh, it's the great fool of the world I am. doesn't prove much, except the right kind of a heel can grind you into the dirt fast. Well, Hellman pieced most of the story together. Slagle and Malone planned the fight, and it went off without a hitch. Slagle bought off the other fighter so that Malone could win as soon as the bets had been covered. Hans Neumeyer had an idea, but he liked Rory too much to believe it. They found out he was coming to me, and Con Regan tried to scare me off. She looked too good to Rory, and the scheme started to grow. He lied to Slagle after the fight about Newmeyer, so Slagle went into the hospital and killed the old man. That left Slagle around to cloud things up, so Rory Malone told a phony story to his girlfriend, Kitty. She loved him enough to kill Slagle. There was no way to stick Rory Malone. He could never fight again with that hand. But he had a check for 20,000 bucks to start on him. That's enough to keep love in the living room. Well... Hellman asked only one question. Why would a smart gambler like Slagle take a chance on giving Malone a check for 20,000 bucks? I guess Malone found out when he tried to cash that check because Joe Slagle was big-hearted but broke. 
Broadcasting Company has just brought you the sixth of a new series, Pat Novak for Hire, starring Jack Webb. Pat Novak is produced and directed by William P. Russo. Jocko Madigan is played by Tudor Orlean. Inspector Hellman is played by Raymond Burr. Music was composed and conducted by Basil Adlam. In our cast were Yvonne Paty, Stephen Schnabel, Frank Lovejoy, William Bayef, and Ted DeCorsia. This program is being released to our service men and women overseas through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Be with us again next week when over most of these same ABC stations, we will bring you Pat Novak for hire. This program came to you from Hollywood. Listening reminder. Don't miss Gene Arthur and Robert Morley when they star in the compelling drama Yesterday's Magic on Theatre Guild on the Air tonight. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Personal notice. Danger's my stock and trade. If the job's too tough for you to handle, you got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details. of California, on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations throughout the West, invite you to Let George Do It. Sweet Poison, another adventure of George Valentine. Dear Mr. Valentine, I'm writing to you because I don't know where else to turn. And in this hour of need, I must turn somewhere. Can you hear me? Hello, can you hear me, Mr. Valentine? Yes, yes of course I can. But who are you? What are you calling Please me? Please don't interrupt, Mr. Valentine. I've already wasted five minutes writing full details the way your ad says to, but if you won't listen, if you make me send it through the mail, it'll be too late. Well, all right, lady. Go on and read your letter. Thank you. It is essential that you come at once to solve a crime. Please hurry. Because, Mr. Valentine, there has been a murder at our house. What? Where? Mr. Valentine. At our house, and I need your help desperately. Signed, yours truly, Gloria Bishop, 603 North 72nd Street. I'm sorry, we don't want any, not even samples. Come again sometime. George. Oh, no, you don't, Buster. Exit, will you? And don't forget to take your foot out of the door. This is 603 North 72nd Street, isn't it? Darling, it is also Monday afternoon, and on Monday there is a deadline. And inside is a man at work who doesn't like to work, not even on Monday. So please, if you love your fellow man... Who is it, Melville? I hate you both. Nobody! I like you too, Melville. Oh, you... Where? Hello. Nobody. Ah, the name's Valentine. This is Miss Brooks. Don't How apologize. Do you? Sit down. We'll talk. Know anything about the vintage wines? Political? Uh, cooking? Joe, please ignore them like they never happened. Get back to the easel. It's three o'clock. There's a whole lithograph company waiting. Silence. Oh. Forgive my rude friend, Mr. Valentine. This is Melville Bond, my publisher. Publisher? If I don't look the type, it's from smoking too many cigars and pulling out too many gray hairs. Men's magazines, that's my line. But what's in men's magazines? Women. And how do women get in men's magazines? By me trying to make characters like Jonas here work. Hey, hold it, hold it, hold it, will you? The drawings on the wall, all of them girls. He calls you Jonas. Well, you're the famous painter Wentworth Jonas, aren't you? Your clairvoyance is frightening, young man. The Jonas girls? Well, of course. Yeah. I'll bet your name is on every pin-up picture. You needn't spoil my afternoon, Miss Brooks. I know. Ashtrays, calendars, neckties. There's nowhere my infamy hasn't reached. 
But I was an artist once. I painted still life. Beautiful cabbages and beefsteak and... And it's three o'clock and there's a girl in a bathing suit carrying a turkey for the Thanksgiving covering. Well, take it the way it is. But you haven't painted the bathing suit yet. Oh, for the last time, gentlemen, stop it, will you? Maybe neither one of you two gentlemen cares, but I came here to see about a murder. M -m murder How considerate. If you'll just give me five minutes to lay out the court. Okay, skip it, will you? But there's some crazy girl by the name of Gloria Bishop who telephoned me. Gloria? And... Well, why didn't you say so? Young man, I'll have you know Miss Bishop is the only woman in the world with a figure like one of my drawings. Go around to the back door. What? Of course, my back door. She's my housekeeper. A girl like that is your housekeeper? Well, what did you think she was? My mother? <laughs> Beat it, Mac. Go on, go on. You too, sister. Beat no, it. no, not again. Hey, wait a minute. Look, what do you nice. want to see her for in the first place? I'm getting a little tired. Pushing won't do you any good. I said beat it. Is that so? Oh, George. <laughs> yeah. That's better. <sighs> the perfect bodyguard, huh? You know how to shoot that thing? I want to find out. Hey, what is this? I knock on the back door. Stay away from Mac. Far away. Otherwise, you're... Uh, excuse me. Hello. Wow. Hello. I guess you're Gloria Bishop. Hmm. No question about that, George. Mr. Valentine and Miss Brooks, of course. But did you see a young man? Oh, sure, sure. We uh, bumped into him. Left in kind of a hurry. Oh, that's good. I didn't want him here when you... Who is he, Gloria? Oh, Matty Riga. He's just a boy. I met him someplace. I'm always meeting people someplace. Yes, I can imagine. But he is kind of attractive, don't you think? <laughs> it's adorable. Okay, Gloria, you got us into this menagerie by yelling murder. Now, come on, fast. Let's have it. Oh, the murder. Well, come here. Come to here. I've been so upset I'm all unstrung. There, you see? Yeah. A dead cat. Wouldn't you know? He just lies there not doing anything. And he's so young. His life had barely begun. Did he get run over? Oh, no, I never allow him outside. His name was Hansel. Never outside, huh? Gloria, what did you feed him? Well, fresh liver. And the raw egg, that's for his fur. Looks and... like he was poisoned. Oh, I knew it must be something awful like that. Well, he must have got to something. Have you asked Mr. Jones? Oh, no. I haven't told a soul. And I wouldn't dare bother him. He says I should be seen and not heard. He scares me. He does? Well, then why do you work for him? For pay. Isn't that why you work? Uh, yeah. Now, look, uh, Gloria, could that cat have got to any chocolate? Chocolate? Oh, yes, he was practically carnivorous. Hmm? That means he'd eat anything. But, well, I never keep sweet things around. I mean, if I lost my figure, where would I be? Uh, never mind. Uh, but maybe you've uh, got a case at that. Because, uh, look on his fur here. Yeah, I think Hannibal died from eating a chocolate cream. Of course, I didn't poison the beast, Mr. Valentine. I haven't killed anything for weeks. All right, Mr. Jonas. Besides, it didn't occur to me. Cats give me a rash. You know, all across the stomach, like polka dots. So if you expect me to weep copious tears... I expect somebody... you to answer questions, that's all. Chocolate creams, I said. Do you eat them? Huh. My doctor hasn't let me touch anything richer than my pocketbook since the Battle of the Bulls. But the cat hasn't been out of the house. Where did it Hold get? Hold on. Hold on, young lady. I believe there was a box of frustrating things around here somewhere. Well, oh, why did you say so? Well, how should I know? Go look for them. Yes, Mr. John. I'll help you, Gloria. Huh. Women. Do you know I've painted wishful curves onto their silly skeletons until I'm positively seasick? Yes, well, my heart bleeds for you, Mr. Jonas. But just where did you get the candy? <laughs> Stubborn, aren't you? Came through the mail, I suppose. Everything does. Oh, what do you mean? The ridiculous distortion of the female frame that I popularize seems to have dragged me into the limelight, Mr. Valentine. I'm a public hero, like Ali Khan or General Delivery. You get fan mail? Buy the garbage cans full. Letters I can't read, cigars I can't smoke, candy I can't eat. Uh huh? George, here's some wrapping paper about the right size. It was in the wastebasket. Uh huh, yeah. Addressed to Jonas. Mm -hmm. No return address, though. Postmark last night. Yes. That's it. I remember unwrapping Mr. the box, Jonas. But... 
I think somebody sent poison candy to you. A critic. Hmm. Only Gloria's cat got it by mistake. Have you got any particular enemies? Ever receive any threats? Only from women's clubs. No, I... Well, this room was broken into about a week ago. What? At least my desk has been rifled, and uh, Gloria certainly... Anything wouldn't... taken? My entire fortune. File copies of my income tax returns. What else can a man say? All right, let's start taking it serious. Young man, I take everything seriously. Even myself. But not somebody trying to kill you. Well, what do you expect me to do? I'm just trying to think. Trying to remember. Gloria, have you found that candy yet? No, I haven't, Mr. Jonas. I'm looking everywhere. Uh, wait a minute. Valentine. He left here walking. Huh? His apartment hotel's only a few blocks down the street. Who? Melville Bond, of course. I done wrapped it. The cat must have taken a piece. But then I gave the box to Melville. You mean just now? No, 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 no. It was early, around noon. He's been back and forth all day making me finish his blasted sick. Holy. And by now he's probably eaten a lot more than the cat ever did. Wait. I'm just remembering why it seemed like a good idea for him to take it. Huh? It's his wife's birthday. <laughs> There he goes, Angel, through the revolving door. Apartment Hotel, that's right. Georgie's coming out again. Hey, Mr. Bond. Hey, get back in again. What the, what's the... Georgie's falling. It's just going round and round. Come on. Hey, come on. Come on, let go of that thing, will you? Let's get out of here. Now, here we go. Hey, Bond. Bond, can you hear me, Mr. Bond? Yes. Yes, I... Are, are you the doctor? He's not dead. He's just sick, that's all. But Lieutenant Johnson, when we got to him, he wasn't carrying a box of candy. He must have eaten only a piece or two of it. That's what the hospital says. Well, what did he do with the rest? I know. Where's the rest of it? That's what I'm talking about. Hospital's got him asleep. How you managed to get mixed up in cases where nobody can tell us anything. What about his wife? Mr. Jonas said that's why Mr. Bond took the box for his wife's birth. She hasn't got it. Mrs. Bond has been at a bridge luncheon all day eating carrots, spud, and greens. So now we've got to canvas every place in town oh, that he's been... Hey, Valentine, where are you going? Hey! Joy! Yes, Mr. Valentine, this is Mr. Bond's office. I see. Well, uh, Miss Smith, I wanted to ask... But if it's about Mr. Bond's magazines, that's all over at the printer's building. Oh, they have all the fun over there, darn it. I'm just the business department... And believe you me, for a girl who's been used to a social life... Yes, I've already been there. Also his club, a restaurant, and a barber no, shop. No, he gets around, but I don't. When a girl's married to a type... Had Mr. Bond been here? Was he carrying a box of candy? No, if you're not the sociable type. Candy? Oh. <laughs> uh, Smith, look, I said, has he... Yes, he was here, in and out. And the candy, the candy, a box he picked up at Jonas's. He was going to take it home to his wife. What? He was? Gee, if I'd realized, I mean... Went hurrying out, and it was just sitting there with his umbrella and newspaper. I mean, when a girl's had practically nothing for lunch, and it's all alone in an office. Smith, and... I'm afraid to guess. Where's the candy now? Wastebasket. Wastebasket. I mean, well, I've always been weak that way. But you won't tell Mr. Bond, will you? Yeah. Here's the box, all right. It's empty. Oh, you're empty. Smith. Coroner's report. 14 grains, tetranic, myoxide, and stomach. No hope of counteracting. Miss Smith was dead on arrival. Turn to tonight's adventure of George Valentine in just a moment. When do you think your car's engine takes the worst feeding? When it's running 40 or 50 miles an hour? No. When it's in stop-and-go traffic? No. Actually, it's when your car's standing still. 
Automotive engineers have proved that 80% of all wear inside your car's engine begins the moment you turn off the ignition. It's the chemical action of acid-laden moisture forming on cylinder walls, and the result is costly rust. But you can stop this engine wear completely by using RPM motor oil. RPM is specially compounded to keep a moisture-proof film of oil on all internal parts at all times. Even though you left your car standing idle for days or weeks, RPM would not drain off parts. It stays on metal, prevents that acid-laden moisture from touching metal. So no wonder RPM is first choice in the West. It's the oil that stops 80% of engine wear. Ask for RPM motor oil at standard stations and at independent Chevron gas stations where they say and mean we take better care of your car. Back to tonight's adventure of George Valentine. A box of poison chocolates. One piece killed a cat. Then Mr. Jonas gave the box to Melville Bond, his publisher, who needed the present for his wife's birthday. However, before Bond ever got home, he tasted a piece or two himself and lived, though sickly, to regret it. The rest of the candy had been left forgotten at the office, and so a poor, unsuspecting secretary, Miss Smith, satisfied her appetite for sweets forever. Indirect, but it's still murder. If your name is George Valentine, what bothers you is where did the box come from in the first place? Valentine, the notion that anyone in this wide world would want to kill me is utterly ridiculous. You mean you wish it were? Yes, Mr. Jonas. The candy was addressed to you. But why? Nobody hates me. They love me. The idiot. You mean they love the kind of pinups you kind of Stop telling me what I mean, young man. I've never known. How should you be able to? Jonas, please, please listen to what the detective... Melville, take a trip somewhere. Go convalesce. Now, look, both of you. Yes, I'm sick, and this is the thanks I get for worrying about you. (laughs) Scares you, doesn't it, Melville? Yes, where would your magazine be if your little gold mine were dead? I almost wish I'd thought of you and gone off my diet. Jonas, no, no, please don't joke. It might happen again. Oh, now, cut it out, both of you, will you? In the first place, it's not going to happen again. Lieutenant Johnson's putting a bodyguard on you, Jonas. A sergeant who'll stay at your house and who'll bring every piece of mail you get down to headquarters unopened. Oh, good. I hope there are lots of bills. And in the second place, Jonas, I don't think so much of your sense of humor. Mr. Valentine, I almost wish I'd gone off my diet and eaten the candy myself. I mean it. Why? I'm thinking of that poor girl just as much as you are. She was reasonably young reasonably intelligent. You knew Miss Smith? Occasionally, she'd bring my checks from Melville to the house. She did just last week. You know, she's the only girl I've ever met who didn't seem envious of that preposterous invention line, the Jonas female figure. Miss Smith was not a dreamer. She was well-shaped like a human being, even fat like I am. And for such a rare, honest creature to suffer in my place... Oh, don't get carried away, boy. What should I do? Wear a girdle on my tongue? I know, it would be better if I had, because, of course, I make enemies, Valentine. I just hate to face the fact that an innocent bystander should have taken my medicine. Get to work, will you, Valentine? Find the murderer. Oh, what a night. Yeah. Jonas finally broke down and gave us a list of people he'd insulted. Half the town, I'll bet. That wrapping paper the box was sent in, we ran through every test known to mankind to Dick Tracy. Results? We've still got the anonymous poison. Oh, great, great. They're in an envelope, the boys tell me. For the last world, he remains a Miss Smith, an innocent bystander, as the saying goes. But suppose this guy decides to mail somebody else something. How can we stop it? Lieutenant, what about that boy, Matty Riga? The one who acted so tough with a gun at the back door. Rieger? Nah. He's a strong arm, that's all. Works for anybody. But connect him with Jonas? Nah. He's never even met the guy. Listen. What is it you want to bet? Huh? Another attempt on Jonas? Or is it our nutty killer sending poison to somebody else through the mail? Or is it your wife saying come home for breakfast? Hello? Johnson speaking. 
Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Who is it? Melba Bond. Well, let me hear this. Go on, go on. What's the matter? Get out here, Lieutenant. Get out here quick. Uh, uh, but where are you, Mr. Bond? I came over to see Jonas first thing this morning. But no one answered the door. I... Please hurry, Lieutenant. But there's a sergeant of mine out there, Douglas. Where's he? I'm an ailing man, gray hair, and I don't... What's feel... the matter with you? I'm all right. I just can't stand the sight of blood. <laughs> Blood. So that's it. Sergeant Douglas? He's all right, though. Knocked out, that's all. Yeah, somebody smashed the vase over his head, see? Hmm. I'm most alert, Sergeant. But where's Mr. Bond? Right where he left us, Miss Brooks, by the telephone. Oh. Get his collar open. Come on, friend. Wake her. Wake her. And hey, Brooks, come, come on now. Here. What is it, George? Get up. Do your feet hurt? Huh? Do your shoes pinch? Does your pocketbook pinch? What on earth? And for a shoe store, Angel. Postcard here on the floor with the sergeant. Huh? Well, don't you get it? Maybe our killer is running a repeat performance. At least the mailman's already made a morning delivery. George. And who's the only person I can think of who could get the drop on Sergeant Douglas? Gloria. Uh huh. Gloria. Come on. Well, she's not in her room. Yeah, but if we're right, Angel, there wasn't much time to get away. I'm not in there either. Oh, my, yes. Ah, hello, Gloria. Cleaning closets. Oh, oh, Mr. Valentine, I didn't do anything honest. I didn't mean to hit him so You hard. didn't what? I didn't, but the vase broke, and I guess it cut him, but I didn't mean to. And then Mr. Bond rang the bell. Hey, Gloria. Hey, kid. Here I am. Gloria, I brought my car like you said. What's happened? Gloria, You mean where... what's going to happen? Slow down, Buster! Get the gun, Angel. Yes. That's more like it. Hey, Valentine, what in the Johnson, name Johnson, meet Matty Riga. A tough boy. What's going on in my house? The birth of a nation? All right, all right. Suppose we start with you, Mr. Jonas. Where have you been this morning? I went out for a walk. A walk? <laughs> Yes, I've been reflecting. It's one thing for me to hate the world, but to reconcile myself to the idea that anyone should dare to hate me, enough to want to kill me, I still just can't conceive. Maddie hates you, Mr. Jonas. What's that? He does, Mr. Jonas. Maddie's divinely jealous. Hey, wait a minute. Slow down, kid. That's a cop over there. But you are jealous, Maddie. You won't let anyone come near me. That's right, Gloria. Keep it up, keep it up. Cut it out, both of you. I don't hate him. Hey, Gloria... Is he jealous because you live here with Mr. Jonas? Oh, you're crazy. That's what's good about her, see? She's it, see? The only girl in the world with a figure like a Jonas pinup. That makes me a big shot if we know she's my girl. I like it that she's his model. You don't think it's her brain, do you? I'm a big shot. Mary! Before scandal rears its ugly head, may I point out to you, Junior, that Miss Bishop is my housekeeper, not my model. What? Oh, now look, really, she's the only girl in the world with I a figure... I keep Miss Bishop here solely to scare away other applicants for the job. Models make me ill. I invented that hideous pin-up figure solely out of the dregs of my mind. Out of your mind? Huh. Well, what's in your mind most of the time, Lieutenant? All right, all right, skip that. Gloria, you thought Maddie hated your boss. That's why you knocked out Sergeant Douglas, isn't it? Yes, Mr. Valentine. Because something must have come in the mail this morning. Addressed to Mr. Jonas. And you figured it was Maddie who sent it. That he sent the other one, too. Well, of course. But I couldn't let him get away with it. And I couldn't let anyone find out, either. I mean, I didn't know what to do except get the package and then find out. Well, it just had to be Maddie. Why? Why were you so sure? Well, gosh... None of us hate Mr. Jonas, not you or Mr. Bond or even the police. It hasn't been in the newspapers yet, and just any old anonymous wouldn't send a second package to the same man unless he was here to know the first one didn't work. I mean, would he? George? Yeah, yeah, out of the mouths of babes. Huh? Me? Oh, I know I should be seen instead of heard, Mr. Valentine. Never mind, but kid, I... never mind. You're at the head of the class. Now, you and Maddie go into the next room, would you? Johnson, have you still got that envelope with the papers and things of Miss Smith? Sure, sure. What are you talking about? I don't know. Maybe it's not important, but motive, maybe. Yeah. Take a look through it, Brooksy. See if you find anything. Okay, sir. 
Mr. Valentine, I've been sitting here quietly because I don't feel so good. But you've been leaving me out. I know what that means. You think I'm the one. Well, if you think I hate Jonas, my own best meal ticket... Skip it, Mr. Bond. I know you don't want him dead. Well, then who does? It must be a crank. That's the first sensible thing you said, Melville. Gloria, let's have the package. What? Come on, come on. The package that came in the mail this morning. The one you took. All right. All right, Mr. Valentine. I'm sorry I took it. Here. Well, let's see that. Yeah, yeah, same printing. To Mr. Wentworth Jonas. Same size package, same paper. More candy, no doubt. I hadn't touched it yet. Oh, no, no. Just smeared the fingerprints, that's all. Well, what happens now, Lieutenant? You take it to the police laboratory? That's right. We run it through an x-ray first, then we take Give it... Give me over. that! I'll show you it's all a mistake. There's no poison. No, 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 wait. No, 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 no. no, no. no. Now, there, you see? An ordinary box. Now, let go of me. Just one more string inside the pool. Hey, it's a firing pin of a grenade. Give me that. Look out! Oh, Mr. Valentine, I guess... Somebody doesn't like me very well. Oh. No, Jonas, you're wrong. Sending me hand grenades? Poison? You know, I don't feel very well. Well, see, what did you find in it? Well, I found... I mean, here, George. Income tax return. Huh? What? Sure, sure. That might do it, mightn't it? Your old tax return copies. Remember, Jonas, taken out of your desk a week ago. George, he said Miss Smith was up here to bring a paycheck a week ago. Hey, hey, what's all this? They were found in Miss Smith's effects, Jonas, so she must have taken them. I don't understand. It's simple, very simple. Nobody hates you, but you could be a relay point for a box of poison candy. But the grenade... Forget the grenade, Johnson. Don't you get it? That candy was meant to deliberately murder a woman who couldn't resist it, Miss Smith. She wasn't any innocent bystander. She was it. What? Yes, Mr. Bond. Does stealing the tax files mean your secretary was curious about how much of Jonas's income you were pocketing? You're, you're crazy. Why, would I be sending a meal ticket a grenade? Would I blow up a gold mine? Sure, why not? You're a cautious guy, Mr. Bond. You even ate a piece of candy yesterday to make that one look good. George, he was the only one there when you told Jonas he couldn't open his own mail. Sure, Brucey. He knew the grenade had come down to headquarters unopened. The X-ray be harmless. But why would he send the grenade? Someone, somehow, might think Miss Smith wasn't just an unfortunate accident. So pound it in. Everybody hates Jonas. Look for a mythical crank. No, no, Mr. Valentine. I, I'm not a well man. I, I feel faint. That's right, sure. Go ahead, faint. That's where you made your mistake. Because this morning you walked into this room, you saw what we saw, that the package was missing. And then, well, who else would have fainted so soon? Who else but the guy who knew what was inside that missing package? <laughs> All right, fade again. See if we care. Valentine, I tell you, the man had fantastic optimism. Expecting poor Miss Smith to be the... You mean the candy? Mm. Oh, I don't think so. He knew you wouldn't eat it. Gloria wouldn't eat it. He knew he'd be at your house on the day it arrived, and you'd give it to him if he asked for it for his wife. But how did he know Miss Smith would eat it? <laughs> well, how do you know a mouse will eat cheese, a, a cat will eat milk, and... Uh... Uh, yes, George. Did you ever actually hear of a cat eating a chocolate cream? Uh... No. Hannibal was carnivorous. That means he'd eat anything. Huh? Are you still here? Haven't you gone home or married a gangster or something? I'm sorry, Mr. Jonas. I'll try to be seen and not heard. But goodbye, Miss Brooks, and goodbye, Mr. Valentine. Well, see, that is our cue. <laughs> I found that gangsters were fickle. What? Valentine, wait. Don't leave me with this, this, this pin-up. She's like a nightmare. Come back to haunt me. My own hideous invention turning on me. Look at her. Oh, no, sir. I just decided I love you, that's all. Oh. <laughs> Good night, Mr. Jonas. Valentine, come back. Doesn't anybody hate me? What earthly good is she? Good night, Mr. Jonas. If you're planning a Thanksgiving motor trip, it'll be a better trip all the way. If you go on Chevron Supreme gasoline, or it's climate tailored to get the best out of your car wherever you drive and whenever you drive. This scientific tailoring is based on year-round weather reports gathered throughout the West. 
That's why you can be sure of peak performance from Chevron Supreme any month of the year and in the West's different altitude and temperature zones. Try a tank full of premium quality Chevron Supreme tomorrow. Right away, you'll notice your car's improved performance. You'll notice that it starts faster, has snappier pickup in traffic, and gives extra ping-free power on hills. As a matter of fact, you can't buy a better gasoline for today's high-compression engines. Ask for Chevron Supreme gasoline tomorrow at independent Chevron gas stations and at standard stations where they say and mean we take better care of your car. Tonight's adventure of George Valentine has been brought to you by Standard of California on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and Standard stations throughout the West. Robert Bailey is starred as George with Francis Robinson as Brooksy. Let George Do It is written by David Victor and Jackson Gillis and directed by Don Clark. Also heard in the cast were Ken Christie as Lieutenant Johnson, Virginia Gregg as Gloria, Stanley Farrar as Bond, Ted Osborne as Jonas, Clayton Post as Riga, and Yvonne Patey as Miss Smith. The music is composed and presented by Eddie Dunstetter, your announcer, John Heaston. Listen again next week, same time, same station, to Let George Do It. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. On a cold and foggy day in May of 1886, a young doctor named Arthur Conan Doyle set aside his medical practice for the afternoon, took pen in hand, and began to write a mystery novel. The doctor-turned-writer did not realize then what a lasting effect his works would have on literature. Hello, and welcome to two more new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. My name is Harry Bartell, and I'm proud to say that I was the announcer on the Sherlock Holmes radio series starring Basil Rathbun and Nigel Bruce. There are more true facts available about the real life of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle than all the fictitious conjectures on the written life of Sherlock Holmes. Yet it was Conan Doyle's great detective that brought the author worldwide fame. This saddened Conan Doyle, for he was really a romantic writer who wanted desperately to be recognized through his well-written historical romance novels. But it was not to be. The first short story to appear, A Scandal in Bohemia, was what made the name of Sherlock Holmes a household word. After writing but six short stories, Conan Doyle tired of the great detective. He wanted out. But Conan Doyle's agents, his book publisher, his reading public, and even the author's own mother continued demanding more and more Sherlock Holmes stories. Conan Doyle gave in, spending most of his time devising mystery plots for the great detective to solve, devoting only small periods of time on his other works, all of which he considered more important than Sherlock Holmes. Within months, the popularity of Sherlock Holmes spread worldwide. Conan Doyle was no fool. He knew which side his bread was buttered on, and he soon gave up his medical practice to spend all his time and energy on writing. Today, anyone can go into a bookstore and ask for a copy of Sherlock Holmes stories. Try to do that with any of Conan Doyle's other great works. Such is the power and attraction of the greatest detective of them all, Sherlock Holmes. Now, let's listen to Basil Rathbun and Nigel Bruce in one of the original Conan Doyle mysteries, The Adventure of Thor Bridge. This episode from the life of Sherlock Holmes will be transmitted to our men and women overseas by shortwave and through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Petri Wine brings you... Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes.
The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine, invites you to listen to Dr. Watson tell us another exciting adventure he shared with his old friend, that master detective, Sherlock Holmes. And while you're settling back comfortably in your chair, mind if I tell you about something I'd like you to share with me? It's a glass of Petri California Sherry. Of course, most people think of Petri California Sherry as the one wine that's really swell any time, but personally, I like a glass of that Petri Sherry just before dinner. You know, that's the time you're a little on edge, you've just finished your day's work, and you're waiting for your dinner, and, well, that's when you want to lean back and take it easy. And boy, that's the time a glass of Petri Sherry tastes like something just too good to be true. Try it. Petri Sherry is the perfect before-dinner wine. And incidentally, if you like your sherry dry, you know, not sweet, then you'll find that Petri Pale Dry Sherry is just made for you. The important thing is the Petri label, because when it says Petri, it always means good wine. And now for our weekly visit with our good friend and host, Dr. Watson. Good evening, Doctor. Good evening, Mr. Bartell. You're a bit late. I've been keeping some dinner hot for you. Here, pull up your chair and join me. That's very nice of you. Thanks, Doctor. Are you all set with tonight's story? Yes, my boy. I'm all set, as you call it. As a matter of fact, I was going over my notes on the case just before you arrived. Uh, last week, you hinted that a beautiful girl figured prominently in your adventure. That's quite right, Mr. Bartell. An extremely beautiful girl. In fact, I often used to say to Sherlock Holmes that if I'd been a little younger at the time, I might... Oh, well, you haven't come here to... <laughs> Listen to my personal reminiscences. You want to hear the story that I called The Problem of Tor Bridge. That's what you promised us, Doctor. How did it begin? On a windy morning in October, in, 18, in the 1890s it was, as I was dressing, I observed how the last remaining leaves were being whirled away from the solitary plane tree which graced the yard behind our Baker Street house. I descended to breakfast, prepared to find my companion in depressed spirits, for, like all great artists, he was easily impressed by his surroundings. But, to my surprise, he was in an unusually gay mood. As I entered the room, he looked up at me and, with a, with a smile. Hello. Morning, my dear fellow. Hope you slept well. Splendidly, thank you, sir. Oh, I'm so glad. You're very solicitous this morning. I, I think you must have got a new case. <laughs> Am I right? The faculty of deduction is certainly contagious. Yes, I have a new case. After a month of trivialities and stagnation, the wheels revolve once more. Good. Tell me all about it. Well, as yet, there isn't much to tell. Have you ever heard of Neil Gibson? Neil Gibson? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Something to do with gold mining, isn't he? A great deal to do with it, my dear fellow. In fact, he's considered the greatest mining magnet in the world. About five years ago, he bought a large estate in Hampshire. Perhaps you've read of the tragic death of his wife. Oh, yes, of course. I remember the case now. She was murdered by a jealous governess who was in her employ, wasn't she? That point will be decided when the lady in question, uh, Grace Dunbar, I believe her name is, comes up for trial at the forthcoming Winchester Assizes. In any case, it's hard for me to see what I can do for my client at this late date. Your client? Oh, yes. I forgot I hadn't told you. I'm getting into your involved habit of telling a story backwards. Oh, yes. Better read this letter. Came this morning. Oh, let's have a look. Dear Mr. Sherlock Holmes, Miss Dunbar is innocent. I can't see the finest woman in the world go to her death without doing everything possible to save her. I shall call on you at 10.30 tomorrow morning to discuss the matter yours faithfully, Neil Gibson. Good gracious me. There you have it, Watson. That is the gentleman I await. Uh, do you know anything about his dead wife? Only the, what I've been reading in the papers. Apparently she was past her prime which was the more unfortunate, as this Miss Dunbar, who superintended the education of the two young children, is reputed to be a very attractive young lady. <laughs> the eternal triangle, eh? Well, where did the murder take place? On Gibson's estate in Hampshire. His wife was found in the grounds nearly half a mile from the manor house, late at night, clad in her dinner dress with a shawl over her shoulders and a revolver bullet through her brain. Any weapon found near her? No, there were no clues found at the scene of the crime. What made them suspect the governess? Well, in the first place, there was some very incriminating evidence. A revolver with one discharged chamber, the caliber corresponding with a bullet in the dead woman's head, was found on the floor in Miss Dunbar's wardrobe. Oh, was it? Pretty damaging evidence, Holmes. Mm, so the coroner thought. And to make the case even blacker against Miss Dunbar, the dead woman had a note on her making an appointment at that very spot. And the note was signed by the governess. It seems obvious that the girl's guilty. And the motive's clear. Mr. Gibson would be a great catch for a young girl. Love... Fortune, power, all dependent on one life. 
Possibly, Watson, but circumstantial evidence can be very misleading at times. Ah, as the gentleman in question, unless I'm very much mistaken, considerably before his time. I can see him from the window here. Formidable looking fella. Must be well over six foot tall. Oh, judging by the way he's wrenching at that doorbell, he's a man with a violent temper. Mrs. Hudson's opening the door to him now. Uh, meet him on the stairs, will you, old chap? It'll save Mrs. Hudson a journey. Uh, sure, huh? Up here, sir. Thank you, Mr. Hudson. All right. Are you Mr. Sherlock Holmes? No, no, indeed. I'm his colleague, Dr. Watson. Uh, come along in, won't you? Mr. Neil Gibson, I presume? That's right. So you're the great Sherlock Holmes, huh? <laughs> the adjective is your own, Mr. Gibson. Sit down, won't you? By the way, you may speak uh, quite freely in front of Dr. Watson. Hmm. Well, I may as well begin by telling you that money means nothing to me in this case. You can burn it if it's any use to you in lighting the truth. Miss Dunbar is innocent, and it's up to you to prove it. Just name your fee. Now, Mr. Gibson, my professional charges are on a fixed scale. I don't vary them, except when I omit them altogether. Very well. I imagine that you've read the newspaper reports of the coroner's inquest. Yes, very thoroughly. I don't see that I can add anything that'll help you. But if there are any questions you'd like to ask, I'll answer them. Well, thank you. First, now what were the exact relations between you and Miss Dunbar? I suppose you're within your rights in asking such questions, Mr. Holmes? We will agree to suppose so, shall we? Then I can assure you that my relations with Miss Dunbar were always those of an employer towards a young lady with whom he never conversed or even saw, except in the company of his children. Oh. Rather a busy man, Mr. Gibson, and I've no time or taste for aimless conversation. I wish you good morning. What the devil do you mean by this, Mr. Holmes? My dear sir, the case is difficult enough without your giving me false information. Meaning that I lie, sir? I was trying to express it as delicately as possible, but <clears throat> if you insist on the word, I won't contradict you. Why, you confound me. Don't be noisy, Mr. Gibson. Please don't be noisy. I find that after breakfast, even the smallest argument is unsettling. I suggest that a stroll in the morning air and a little quiet thought will be great to your advantage. I suppose I can't make you take the case, <clears throat> but you've done yourself no good this morning, Mr. Holmes. I've broken stronger men than you. No man ever crossed me and was the better for it. Good morning, Mr. Gibson. You've a great deal yet to learn. <laughs> On my soul, Holmes, you were unusually severe with him. <laughs> I dislike liars, Watson, and I cannot tolerate arrogance, particularly when it's coupled with great wealth. Well, how did you know about his relations with the governor? I didn't. It was pure bluff. Bluff? <laughs> it certainly worked. Think he'll come back? Oh, of course he will. He needs my help too badly. He'll probably change his mind before he's halfway down the stairs. Come in. <clears throat> ah, <laughs> Mr. Gibson, just saying to Dr. Watson that I was certain you'd be back. I've been thinking it over, Mr. Holmes, and I feel that perhaps I was hasty in taking your remarks amiss. Just the same, I can assure you that the relations between Miss Dunbar and me really don't affect this case. Surely that is for me to decide, Mr. Gibson. You see, Mr. Gibson, my friend is like a doctor. He wants every symptom before he can give his diagnosis. Fire away, Mr. Holmes. What is it you want to know? The truth. I can give it to you in very few words. To begin with, I met my wife when I was gold mining in Brazil. Uh, your wife was Brazilian by birth, wasn't she, sir? Yes, Doctor, and very beautiful. Well, to make a long story short, I fell in love and married her and brought her to England. After a few years, I realized that we had nothing, absolutely nothing, in common. And then I suppose this young governess, Miss Dunbar, arrived on the scene. That's right, Mr. Holmes. Well, the story should be obvious to you from there. You, uh, fell in love with this girl, I suppose, sir. Who could help it? Did you suggest marriage to her? Yes. So I knew that my wife would never divorce me. I see. Then you made an utterly insincere proposition to her. Now, look here, Mr. Holmes. I came to you on a question of evidence, not of morals. I'm not asking for your criticism. It's only the young lady's sake that uh, forces me to touch your case at all. Now, tell me, sir, uh, what is your own opinion as to Miss Dunbar's guilt? It's very black against her. I can't deny that. One explanation of the tragedy did come into my head, Mr. Holmes. I give it to you for what it's worth. Very continue, Mr. Gibson. My wife was bitterly jealous. She was half crazy with hatred. She might have planned to murder Miss Dunbar, or we'll say to threaten the girl with a revolver and so frighten her into leaving us. There might have been a struggle in which the gun exploded and gone off and shot my wife, who was mm -hmm. holding it. Well, that possibility has already occurred to me. It's the only obvious alternative to deliberate murder. The revolver, Holmes. It was found on the floor of the governess's wardrobe. Now, Mr. Gibson, I should like to examine your house and the scene of the murder as soon as possible. Certainly, Mr. Holmes. Sergeant Coventry of the local police is still down there. He'll give you any help you may need. Excellent. Watson, old fellow, I'm out of the timetable. We're catching the next fast train to Winchester. So we 
if I have to have someone else on the case, I'd rather have you, Mr. Holmes. The yard gets called in, then, then we local police loses all credit for success. <laughs> Generally gets blamed for the failures. Now I've heard that you play straight. <laughs> I never appear in the matter at all, Sergeant Coventry. If I can clear it up, I don't ask to even have my name mentioned. Oh, that's handsome of you, I'm sure, and I, I know your friend Dr. Watson can be trusted, too. Oh, don't worry, my dear fellow. We won't steal any of your thunder. Well, that's nice and friendly of you, Doctor. Well, come on, gentlemen. I'll walk you down to the bridge. That's where we found Mrs. Gibson's body. It's not far from the house here. Well, I must say, Mr. Gibson has a beautiful estate. It must be 60 or, or 70 acres. Oh, nearly twice that, Doctor. The woods back of the house there belongs to him, too. Mr. Holmes. Yes, Sergeant? There's a question I'd like to ask you. A question I wouldn't ask anyone else. Then please ask it. Don't you think there might be a case against Mr. Gibson himself, sir? I've been considering that possibility. That there, Miss Dunbar's a bit of all right. If you ask me, he wanted his wife out of the way, and the pistol she was shot with was his pistol, you know. Oh, uh, was, uh, was that fact uh, proven? Yes, Doctor. It was one of a pair that he had. One of a pair? Where's the other? Well, Mr. Gibson has a lot of firearms. We never quite matched that particular pistol. But the box was made for two. Well, if it was one of a pair, surely you'd be able to match it. Well, we have them all laid out at the house if you want to look them over. And we'll do that later. Ah, this, I presume, is Tor Bridge. That's right, sir. Found Mrs. Gibson's body lying right here at the approach to the bridge. I see. I gathered from the newspaper reports that the shot was fired at very close quarters. Yes, sir, very close. Near the right temple, wasn't it? Just behind it, sir. How did the body lie, Sergeant? Oh, on its back, Doctor. No trace of a struggle, no marks, no weapon. The note from Miss Dunbar was clutched in her left hand. Clutched, you say? Yes, sir. We, we could hardly open the fingers to get at it. Ah, that's of the greatest importance. It excludes the idea that anyone could have placed the note there after death in order to furnish a false clue. Well, what did the note say, Sergeant? Little enough, Doctor. It just said, uh... I will be at Tor Bridge at 9 o'clock, and it was signed Grace Dunbar. Did Miss Dunbar admit writing it? Oh, yes, sir. What was her explanation? She wouldn't say nothing. Said she was saving her defense for the trial. Yes, it seems odd that Mrs. Gibson was still clutching that note. Seems perfectly natural to me. Oh, come now, old fellow. Argue the thing out logically. If the letter is genuine, it was certainly received sometime before the tragedy, say an hour or two. Why then was the dead woman still clasping it in her left hand? Why should she carry it so carefully? She certainly didn't need to refer to the note at all at the interview. Doesn't it strike you as rather strange? Well, now you put it that way, it does seem a little peculiar. Hello. Did you notice this, Sergeant? Oh, you mean that chip out of that stone on the underside of the parapet of the bridge, sir? Yes, I noticed it. Uh, didn't think nothing of it, though. Well, it's a very large chip. Yes, but it's been done recently. That's how the stone work is white just here. It took some violence to do that. Hand me a cane, Watson, will you? Here you are, Thanks. Yes. It's a hard knock. And in a curious place, too. But it's 15 feet from where we found the body, Mr. Dow. Yes, Holmes, I don't see how it could have any connection with Mrs. Gibson's well, murder. it hasn't. But it's a point worth noting. There were no footprints, you say, Sergeant? None, Mr. Holmes. The ground was as hard as iron. It's been a very dry summer, and we haven't had any rain to speak yes, of this. Yes, mm. Well, Sergeant, I'm much obliged to you, and now I think we'll get back to the house. Right. Uh, Cesar will show you where the firearms are, sir. Oh, uh, who is Cesar? Well, funny kind of a bloke. Brazilian, he is. Brazilian, eh? Like Mrs. Gibson? Yes, Mr. Holmes. Uh, comes from the same town that she does, as a matter of fact. Something very fishy about him, if you ask me. Now, if you'll excuse me, gentlemen, I'm going to take a little stroll around the grounds. You started me on a new train of thought in this case, Mr. Holmes. Oh, oh. I'm delighted, Sergeant. I'll get back to the house. I see. And these are all the firearms in Mr. Gibson's possession, eh, Cesar? Mm. Except for the revolver that is missing from the case. Yes, so I say I see him. Well, I've never seen such a collection of guns and revolvers in my life. Mr. Gibson had many enemies, senor. He always sleep with a loaded pistol beside his bed. She's a man of great violence. There have been times when all of us were afraid of him. Did you ever witness physical violence towards Mrs. Gibson? No, senor. I cannot say that I have. But I have heard him say many terrible things to her. She would taunt her in front of we servants. I have heard him do it many times. Thank you, Cesar. That will be all. Muito bem, senor. You know, Holmes, I 
do think the case against Miss Dunbar looks very black. I should agree with you if it were not for one fact. The finding of the revolver in her wardrobe. Well, Miss Sol Holmes, that seems to me the strongest evidence of all. I think not, old chap. Huh? We must look for consistency. Where there is a, a want of it, we must suspect deception. I don't quite follow you. Suppose for a moment that we visualize you in the character of a woman who in cold, premeditated fashion is about to murder a rival. You've planned it. A note has been written. The victim has come. You have a, a weapon. The crime is well done. It has been workmanlike and complete. You mean to tell me that after carrying out so crafty a crime, you'd be so stupid as to forget to fling the incriminating revolver to the bottom of the stream? Or perhaps in the uh, dense reeds that border it? Would you carefully carry it home and put it in the first place that would be searched? Your wardrobe? Well, perhaps in the excitement of the no, moment, one... No, my dear chap, I won't admit that's even possible. When a crime is coolly premeditated, then the means of covering it are coolly premeditated well, also. Well, then if Miss Dunbar didn't shoot Mrs. Gibson, who the devil did? I hope I can give you the answer to that question, Watson, when we've made one further visit. Oh, Lord, where are we going now? To prison, old chap. Prison? Yes, we're going to Winchester Prison to call on Miss Dunbar, I'm certain that the key to this strange mystery lies in her hands. You'll hear the rest of Dr. Watson's story in just a few seconds. Just time enough for me to remind you that the easiest way to make good food taste better is to serve that good food with a good Petri wine. If you like a red wine, well, you want a Petri California Burgundy. If you'd rather have a white wine, then you want a Petri California Sauterne. But red or white, Petri Burgundy or Petri Sauterne, you're choosing a dinner wine that's sure to turn a simple meal into a feast. Your whole family and all your friends will love Petri, the wine that makes good food taste better. <laughs> And now, back to Dr. Watson and tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure, The Problem of Tor Bridge. Well, uh, Doctor, did you go to Winchester Prison and see Miss Dunbar? We did, Mr. Bartell. An hour later, I found the two of us sitting in a dank and gloomy cell, talking to one of the most beautiful girls that I've ever seen. Her bright, flashing eyes and her air of quiet confidence seemed sadly out of place in such a setting. Holmes spoke to her quietly... Uh, tell us of your true relations with the dead woman. She hated me, Mr. Holmes. She hated me with all the passion of her distorted mind. Please tell us exactly what happened on the evening of Mrs. Gibson's death. Well, I, I received a note from her in the morning. A note imploring me to meet her at the bridge after dinner that night. She said she had something important to say to me. Did you keep that note, Miss Dunbar? No, Doctor. She, well, she asked me to destroy the note, so I burned it in the schoolroom grate. I saw no reason for such secrecy, but, well, I, I did as she asked. Mm, and yet she kept your reply very carefully. It's interesting. Tell me what happened when you met her that night. When I reached the bridge, she was waiting for me. I, I won't tell you what she said, but she poured out her whole wild fury and burning horrible words. I didn't answer. I couldn't. It was dreadful even to look at her. She was like an insane woman, standing there screaming disgusting insults at me. I, I put my hands to my ears and rushed away. Where was she standing when, when you left her? Within a few yards of the spot where her body was found later. And yet, presuming she met her death shortly after you left her, you heard no shot. No. No, I heard mm. nothing. But I was so upset, Mr. Holmes, that I rushed straight back to my room. Did you leave it again that night? Yes. When the alarm came that Mrs. Gibson was dead, I ran out with the others. Did you see uh, Mr. Gibson? Yes, Doctor. He had just returned from the bridge when I saw him. He had sent for the doctor and the police. Uh, this pistol that you found in your room, have you ever seen it before? Never, Mr. Holmes, I swear it. When was it found, Miss Dunbar? Next morning, when the police made their search. It was on the floor of my wardrobe where I keep my shoes. Mm, you've no idea how long it had been there. Well, it hadn't been there the morning before. How do you know? Because I had tidied up the wardrobe that day. I see. Then someone must have come into your room and placed the pistol there in order to incriminate you. I'm certain of it. Well, when, uh, when could they have done that? Well, it, it, it could have been at mealtimes or when I was in the schoolroom with the children. Yes. 
Miss Dunbar, on exam examining the scene of Mrs. Gibson's death, I noticed that a piece of stonework on the underside of the parapet of the bridge had been broken away. Can you suggest any possible explanation for that? Oh, surely it must have been a mere coincidence, Mr. Holmes. Possibly. But why should it appear at the very time of the tragedy and at the very place? Could it possibly be the... Why, yes, of course. Idiot. Why didn't I think of it before? Come along, Watson. Where are we going, Holmes? Back to Thor Bridge, old fellow. As fast as we can get there. What have you found out, Mr. Holmes? The answer to this mystery, I hope, my dear young lady. You will get news before the day is out. And meanwhile, take my assurance that the clouds are lifting and that the light of truth is breaking through. <laughs> Mr. Holmes, you're soon back here. What have you found out? Soon in a few moments. Uh, you got my message? Oh, yes, sir. Here you are. All a twine. What you wanted for, I can't imagine. Uh, you'll soon see, Sergeant. Uh, Watson, I uh, have some recollection that you usually go armed on these excursions of ours. Yes, I'm carrying my revolver. Why? Uh, give it to me, old chap, will huh? you? Thanks. Thank I, I believe your revolver may have a very intimate connection with the mystery we're investigating. <laughs> you're joking. Now, Watson, I'm very serious. Huh? I have a test to make. The test is successful. Miss Dunbar will be free before nightfall, and the test will depend on the conduct of this revolver of yours. Yes, take the precaution of unloading it. Uh huh. There we are. Now, Sergeant, ball of twine, please. Wish I knew what you was up to, sir. I tie one end of the twine like this to the handle of the revolver. So. Sergeant, see if you can find me a heavy stone, will you? Oh, Roger, sir. Holmes, what are you doing? Trying to reconstruct the killing of Mrs. Gibson. But you've seen me miss the mark before, Watson. I have an instinct for such things, and yet it has sometimes played me false. It seemed a certainty when it first flashed across my mind in Miss Dunbar's cell. But one drawback of an active mind is that one can always conceive alternative explanations which would make our scent a false one. And yet, oh well... We can but try. Here's a nice stone, Mr. Holmes. Thank you, Sergeant. Yes, now, sir. I tie the other end of the twine to the stone. Wait a minute. Like that. Splendid. Uh, Sergeant, will you please take the stone and stretch the twine across the parapet of the bridge there so that the stone will swing just clear of the water on the other side of the bridge? Right, sir. Sir. I'll stand on the spot where Mrs. Gibson's body was found. That's it, Sergeant. Over the parapet. How's that, Mr. Holmes? The stone swinging about eight feet above the water. Splendid. Now, Watson, watch closely. I raise the revolver to my head. Careful, Holmes, careful. Nobody, old chap's not loaded. Now, let us imagine I am the late Mrs. Gibson. I raise the revolver to my head and fire it. Instantly, my fingers release that grip and... There's your answer, Watson. Great, Scott, the revolver flashed back out of your hand. Struck the parapet of the bridge and then the weight of the stone flipped it over into the water. Was there ever a more exact demonstration? Come on, old fellow. You're a blooming magician, Mr. Holmes. That's what you are, a blooming magician. Look at that. Observe the second chip on the stonework, the parapet here. Same size as the first. And the murder of Mrs. Gibson... It wasn't murder at all. It was suicide. But We can follow the various steps quite clearly. A note was extracted very cleverly from Miss Dunbar. A note which made it appear that she had chosen the scene of the crime. Mrs. Gibson, in her anxiety that the note should be discovered, somewhat overdid it by holding it in her hand to the last. That alone should have excited my suspicions earlier than it did. So she stole one of her husband's revolvers... And planted and... the other one in Miss Dunbar's wardrobe. Exactly. After discharging one of the cartridges, which you could easily do in the woods without attracting suspicion, she then went down to the bridge, where she contrived this exceedingly ingenious method of getting rid of her weapon. When Miss Dunbar appeared, she used her last breath in pouring out her hatred, and then, when the girl had left, carried out her terrible purpose. In the missile revolver... You'll find it uh, with the aid of a grappling hook at the bottom of the stream, and also the stone and the string, uh, with which this vindictive woman attempted to, to disguise her own crime and fasten a charge of murder on an innocent victim. Yes, Sergeant, and don't forget while you're at it that my revolver's down there, too. Oh, don't worry, Doctor. I'll get some grappling hooks right away. <laughs> I must say, Holmes, you've solved this case brilliantly. Quite brilliantly. Uh, I disagree, old chap. And I fear that you will not improve my reputation by adding the case of the Tor Bridge mystery to your annals. Oh, nonsense, but that's ridiculous. Oh, no, it isn't, old boy. I've been sluggish in my mind and wanting in that mixture of Imagination and reality, which is the very basis of my art. I confess that the chip in the stonework was a sufficient clue to suggest the true solution, and I blame myself for not having attained it sooner. Well, Holmes, personally, I agree with the sergeant's opinion of you. Oh? What was that, old fellow? 
You're a blooming magician, Mr. Holmes. That's what you are, a blooming magician. Oh. Well, Doctor, Holmes really was a magician. That is, if you did find Mrs. Gibson's revolver and your own in the oh, stream. Oh, you found them all right. You don't think I'll tell you the story otherwise, do you? Uh, what do you take me for anywhere? Well, now that you ask, I'll tell you. I take you for a very charming gentleman, a wonderful oh, storyteller, and a fine host. Oh, yes, I do. I really, I... Well, you are a gentleman of the old school. Oh, and you do old. tell a fine story. <laughs> you flatter me, you... Uh... And you are a perfect host. Oh, that mean, meal we had tonight was wonderful. Oh, it was, eh? And, um, that, that wine, what kind was it? It was Petri wine, and you know it. <laughs> and I should have known that you were leading up to something. Mr. Bartell, you should be ashamed of yourself. You will do anything to get a chance to talk about Petri wine. Oh, I can't say it, I blame you. Well, honestly, Doctor, I meant everything I said. But you don't really want me to stop talking about Petri wine, do you? After all, it's worth talking about, isn't it? What other wine is made with the loving care that goes into Petri wine? Don't forget, Petri wine is made by the Petri family. Winemaking is their business. Why, they've been making wine for generations, handing down from father to son, from father to son, all their skill and knowledge and experience. You can be sure the Petri family really knows plenty about the fine art of turning luscious grapes into delicious wine. That's why, whether you want a wine for before dinner, with dinner, or for any time, you can't go wrong with a Petri wine, because Petri took time to bring you good wine. And now, Dr. Watson, what new story are you planning to tell us next week? Well, next week, Mr. Bartell, I'm going to tell an adventure that Holmes and I had amid the oriental magnificence of a Maharaja's palace in India. India? Sounds intriguing. Uh, what were you and Sherlock Holmes doing out there, Doctor? Well, you'll have to wait uh, till next week for the answer to that question, my boy. But I can tell you that it was one of the weirdest problems that we ever had to solve. I call the story The Vanishing Elephant. <laughs> Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure is written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and is adapted from the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle story, The Problem of Tor Bridge. Mr. Rathbone appears through the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer and Mr. Bruce through the courtesy of Universal Pictures, where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. The Petri Wine Company of San Francisco, California invites you to tune in again next week, same time, same station. Oh, the Petri family took the time to bring you such good wine. So when you eat and when you cook, remember Petri wine. To make good food taste better, remember... Pet, pet, Petri wine. This is Harry Bartell saying goodnight for the Petri family. Sherlock Holmes comes to you from our Hollywood studios. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. One man's opinion. Want to know why? You want to tell me? My old man died last week. He left everything he owed to me. Huh? You remember my old man, Danny Gatling, don't you? Sure. We did business together a couple of times. Yeah. Nice guy, your old man. Yeah, great. Yeah. But all he left me is one dollar. An ordinary one dollar bill. Oh, that's tough. 
Well, I don't think so, because he told me you'd like to have the dollar he left me. Hmm? That's right. Well, well. I want you to meet me somewhere, let's say, in back of that old closed-up filling station on Bleak Street in an hour. Can do. I thought you could. You'll, uh, have the uh, dollar bill with you? Sure, I'll have it. I'll sell it to you, Weaver, for $50,000. Now on to Dick Calmer as Boston Blackie. Enemy to those who make him an enemy. Friend to those who have no friend. Here I am, Gatling. Waiting over here for you. Ah, you must be anxious to get that buck I called you about. You got here before me, Weaver. Uh, got the, uh dollar with you? Sure. Let's have a look at it. Let's have a look at your face first. I don't do business with guys who cover up. What difference would I look like? Give me that dollar and I'll uh, give you the 50 grand you wanted. Let's see the 50,000 at least. Well, I'll tell you. I'll let you see this instead. Darn eh? Well. <laughs> what I got on me, Weaver, means you couldn't buy this dollar bill of mine now for a half million. Which is what it's worth to you. <laughs> Please, lady, move a little, will you? I beg your pardon, No, please. look, I, I've got to get to the television. Well, you now. will when it's your turn, and stop yeah, but, pushing. But I, I'm in a hurry, miss. You can I, certainly I'd, I'd wait like... your turn. Besides, I won't be long. There's only one man ahead of me. All, All right, right Wesley, you're next. See, it's my turn now. All right, but hurry up. Well, I'm not going to stop for tea. Well, that's good. Hello there, Miss Wesley. God. How's Boston Blackie? Fine, thank you. I'd like to deposit this check, please. Of course, Miss Wesley, of course. Huh, look, really. Miss, mm -hmm. I... Here you are, Miss Wesley. Oh, thank you very much. Hey, look, will you hurry, Miss? All man? right, all right. If Blackie were around, your friend in back of you would be slowed up a bit, wouldn't he, Miss Wesley? Oh, there's no question about that. Well, goodbye. Bye. Next. Yeah, I'm next. But uh, I, uh, I want to wait a second. Uh... Okay, she's out. Now, you be quick, be smart, and be quiet. Oh, what's the... Uh-oh. Uh-oh is right. There's a gun in my hand, buddy. This is a stick-up. But don't get excited. All I want is one dollar. Keep back in the bushes, Bart. Yeah. That guy Gatling is smart. You ain't kidding, Weaver. He's smart enough to get you to hold up the Bleak Street Bank and not get what you want. Shut up. Yeah, okay. Now, I'll... look, I had to get that dollar he wanted to sell me. What's so important about that? I'll write you a letter. I would have uh, killed him when I met him at that closed-up filling station to get that dollar bill his old man left him, but he slugged me. I would have killed the teller in that bank if he hadn't given me what I asked for. You know, Weaver, you ought to killing this guy. What made you follow him to the bank? He knew I was after the bill. Huh? He knocked me down. I followed him. Huh? When he went into the bank, I figured he was going to put it there for safekeeping. Weaver. Yeah. Yeah, I heard. That car just stopped out front. And here he comes up the walk. Come back. Get him, Bart. Get him. When I should slug him hard enough to kill him. I don't care. Just hit him. Okay. And get that bill. Give it to me. Go ahead. Okay, okay. okay. Hey, yo. Huh? Who are you? Me. Just me. And this. <coughs> nice work, Bart. Now, I'll get out of his wallet and look through it while I get through his pockets. Yeah, leave it. Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's not in this pocket. This one either. Not in his wallet. There's only fives here. Not in any of his pockets. Isn't he? Hey, Weaver. You said the dollar was worth killing for, didn't you? Yeah. I hope you're right. Gatling here's dead. Now, we know you couldn't give us a description of the man who held you up in your bank. Yes. But uh, you wanted to look at the body of this man we found murdered. So look. Oh, sure, Inspector Faraday. I'm sorry I didn't get a good look at the hold-up man, but his hat was pulled down over his eyes. Yeah, I know. But take a look at this body. Mm hmm All right, you heard a description of him over the radio. You thought you might know him. That's right. Well? Yes. 
Yes, I know who it is. Who? Oh. It's the man who asked me to change a five-dollar bill for him just before the robbery. Right in front of the guy who held you up, huh? Well, and not exactly. He was in front of Miss Wesley, and Miss Wesley was in front of the man who held me up. I didn't get a good look at him. Miss Wesley? Not Miss Mary Wesley? Why, yes, Boston Blackie's girlfriend. You know her, don't you? Yeah, and I know Blackie, too. And I might have known this would happen. Why, what's happened? What well, always happens as soon as I get a case without Blackie in it. I find Blackie right there, just the same. <laughs> Blackie, have I got something to tell you, and is this exciting? Well, this apartment of mine can stand a little exciting, Mary. It's been a dull day. Oh, not for me. You heard about the bank robbery a little while ago. Yes, I heard about it on the radio, but they uh, didn't say how much was taken. Oh, never mind that. I was there, Blackie. Don't tell me you did it. Oh, now, look. Uh, Well, will you believe I was right in front of the man who did? (laughs) How do you know? All the time of the holdup, and and he kept kept hurrying me. Blackie. I think that right after I left... Uh, oh, <laughs> wait, wait a minute, will you, Mary? Yeah, sure, yeah. Uh-huh. Well, aren't you proud of me, Blackie? No, I'll let you know as soon as I find out what this phone call is. Oh. Well, hello. Hello. Uh, hello, Blackie, this is Faraday. It is? I bet you wouldn't bet it was, Inspector. Whimsical. Blackie, what are you doing? <laughs> Nothing. Uh, stay that way. Is Miss Wesley there with you? Well, now, Faraday, let's not get personal. Put her on. Okay. I want some information. I see. And don't ask me what about, because I'm not going to tell you. You don't have to. Because I'm going to tell you. Oh, you think you know, do you? Yes, Mary was in front of the man who held up a bank today, and he wanted to give you a description of it. Oh, she's already talked to you about it, huh? Yes, she's here right now. I'll put her on the phone if you want. Never mind. Put her in your car. Bring her down to see me at the morgue. Your new office? That was very appropriate. I'm not dead. Well, I like the other side of the argument, but Uh, uh, what is on your alleged mind? There's been a murder. The bank teller tells me that the dead guy was in the bank in front of Miss Wesley just before it was robbed by the guy in back of Miss Wesley. Uh, Faraday, your natural confusion is catching. Mm -hmm. It's getting me. A man was in front of your girlfriend. He left. He's the guy who was found murdered. Mm Mm-hmm. I understand. The teller recognized his description and identified him for you. It's Now you want Miss Wesley to help describe the man in back of her. Hooray! Okay, pal. Don't pal me! Only, uh, tell me, how much did the man who stuck up the bank get? How much did he get? Uh Uh-huh. He got just what he asked for, a single-dollar bill. Fool around with that, genius. Uh Uh-oh. What's the double O for, Weaver? Story in the paper here, Bob. About the bank robbery. About finding Gatling's body, too, huh? Yeah, but that's not what worries me. No? Right in front of me and behind Gatling was a girl named Wesley. Mary oh. Wesley. She identified Gatling's body, same as the bank teller did. Yeah? As a hint here, she might be able to describe the guy in back of her, too. Well, that's you, huh? Yeah, that's me, all right. The teller didn't get a look at me. Not a good look, anyway, because I kept my hat pulled down over my eyes and I held him up. Yeah? Uh-huh. <laughs> Somebody's on a spot. And that's you, huh? Yeah, that's me. Uh-huh. So, uh... Somebody is going to have to do the same to Miss Wesley as we did to Gatling. And Bart. Yeah? That's you. Okay. Yeah? Uh, you Miss Mary Wesley? Yes, I am. I got to talk to you, ma'am. It's important, oh, go and ahead. Uh, it's got to be in private. Well, all right, come in. Thanks. Hey, nice place you got here. Oh, it's quiet. Yeah. Now, what do you want? Uh, are you alone? Yeah. That's all I want to know, Miss Wesley. I got to... <laughs> <laughs> What'd you scream for, Mary? Oh, Blackie, I didn't think you were going to hit him in time. I was getting a little excited. I was set from the minute he came in the door. Uh-huh. I thought it was a good idea to hide when you had a caller. Oh. I figured that story in the papers would bring somebody to see you. Oh. Now, let's see who this guy is. Uh, I'll call Inspector Faraday while you're looking through his wallet. Uh, no, Mary, don't. Wait no? a minute. Uh, yeah, yeah. Here's, uh, here's his name in the wallet. It's uh, Bart Everson. Bart Everson. And here's a single dollar bill folded up in his identification holder. Well, so what? So it might be a special dollar. Oh, Remember, hey. just one dollar was stolen from the bank. Oh, that's right. I'm going to examine this, Della, very carefully and return it to the wallet. You are? Why? So he still has it when he leaves here with us following him. Well, what for? What for? Yeah. Why, to see if we can make this dollar bill make sense. But now, back to...
to Boston Blackie. Joe Gatling offers to sell Bill Weaver a $1 bill for $50,000. Weaver tries to take it away by force. Fearing for his life, Gatling pretends to put the bill in the bank. Weaver robs the bank for the bill, finds that it is not there, then later kills Gatling. But still, the bill is missing. Boston Blackie's friend, Mary Wesley, was in the bank. So Weaver's trigger man, Bart Everson, tries to kill Mary. As we return to our story, Bart pays a visit to his girlfriend. Hiya, Gertie. Oh. oh, it's you, is it, Bart? Where'd you get that black eye? Ah, uh, Weaver sent me to knock over a gal named Mary Wesley, see? Huh? And then some guy clipped me and knocked me cold. What? But I pulled a fast one on Weaver. I don't care what you did. Yeah, but this one was a slick one, Gertie. Oh, Him but... and me was looking for a certain dollar bill, see, so off a guy named Gatling. An important dollar bill. A dollar bill? Yeah, one that Mr. Weaver wants real bad. Bad enough to kill for it. Well, what about the dollar bill? Well... I figured it was something special, so when I found it on Gatling, I palmed it and I told Weaver it wasn't on the guy. On the body, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, Gatling was dead by then, right? Sure. Uh, look, um, uh, about that dollar bill, uh, do you have it with you? Yeah, I got it right here. I got to pull it up in my wallet. See? Uh, I'd, uh, kind of like to have that <laughs> dollar, but <laughs> you wouldn't give it to your girlfriend, would you? No, I guess it'll be worth more than a dollar, Gertie. Well, um, would you sell it to me? Yeah, sure. How much? Well, I went to a lot of trouble to get it, Gertie, oh, so, I... uh... Would two dollars be asking too much? Well, Blackie, we followed that fellow Bart this far. Why don't we go upstairs where he went instead of waiting in the hall? Because I prefer to wait here, Mary. I saw the bell Bart rang. It was under the name of Gertrude Lanning. Yeah? It could be she's Bart's girlfriend. Oh. And I don't want to nab Bart till he's taken me to his boss or partner, if any. Well, 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 he's up there with her. We can hear their voices. But, Blackie, what do you suppose this is all about? Certainly not just a, a dollar bill. The bill means something, Mary. Well, what do you there were markings yeah. on the back of the bill in Bart's wallet, and I made a copy of them. I know, I saw you, but they don't make any sense. And neither does the circle around the last two numerals in the serial number. Well, I copied the serial number, too, just in case it will make sense someday. Oh, I still think you should have kept the bill instead of putting it back in Bart's wallet. Oh, no, Mary. I want him to think that we don't know about it. Look, would you do something for me? Uh-huh. Phone Faraday and tell him to join us down here as soon as he can. Oh, he must be expecting trouble. When our friend Bart comes down from the room upstairs, I'm hoping for trouble, Mary. But it's going to be all his. Homicide, Faraday speaking. Hello, Inspector. This is Mary Wesley. Oh, hello, Miss Wesley. Yeah. You uh, talk to any more bank robbers lately? Inspector, I'm calling for Blackie. Mm. He's not here, oh. I'm happy to say. I know that. He's in a hallway at 1080 Eastern Avenue. Did you get that? And he wants you down there right away. Right away. Oh, he does, does he? Yes, he does, does he? Miss Wesley, you sound more like Blackie every day. Oh, now, Inspector, how soon can you meet him? Yeah, I'm not sure, but you can tell Blackie something for me. Inspector, please. Yeah, relax. It isn't that at all. No? Oh. I want you to tell him what I found out about Joe Gatling, the man we found dead. Yeah? What? He was the son of the late Danny Gatling, big bank robber, who died last week. Get that? Yeah, I got it. About $150,000 in bank loot Gatling stole was never recovered. Yeah. It's still hidden, and not anywhere that Blackie is, I guarantee. What's down there, anyway? A man with a marked dollar bill. A mark. And before Blackie gets through with him, he's going to be a marked man. <laughs> Now that I gave you that dollar that I swiped off Gatling, Gertie, you going to tell me about no, it? I don't know you why You said I... that, that, that you knew whatever it was that, that makes Weaver want it so bad. I'll let you in on a little secret, Bart. Yeah? Yeah. I know about another dollar bill that's just as important. Yeah? Where do we get that one? Weaver has it. No kidding. Mm-hmm. Hey, what? Oh, hey. come in. Who could that be, huh? You'll see. Weaver. Hello, Gertrude. Hmm. Hi, Mr. Weaver. Oh, come on in, Bill. 
Uh, hey, it's built to you, huh? Since when? Well, Since I figured that you palmed that dollar bill when we were searching Gatling's body, Bard. What do you mean? And I called right your girlfriend here to tip me off if you showed up with it. Oh, that's what you were doing in the other room a while ago, guys. Now, look here, Bard. Huh? Quarren Weaver, Kevin made a double cross. Why, I think you're I... not going to do anything, Bard, but get a good lesson. Now, please, Bill, don't hey, kill him. Oh, my God. Sure. Bill, please don't hurt himself. He's just dumb, that's all. Hey, cut it out. He's gonna be dumber when I get through with it. Oh, now, Bill. Oh, easy, will you? Yeah. I think that'll teach him a little lesson. So when he wakes up, Gertie, you, uh, you keep him here. All right, if you want me to. I'll be back to take him with me. Okay. I need him to get $150,000. <laughs> I called Faraday and I'm back, and if we wait in this hallway much longer, we'll be getting our mail here. Why did we go upstairs? Mary, a few minutes ago, another guy rang Gertrude Lanning's bell and went upstairs. Who do you think he was? I don't know. But I think we'd better wait for Faraday. Did he say he'd be here today or tomorrow? <laughs> he said he'd get here as soon as he could. Oh, great. Oh, well, he'll That means we may not see him for a week. Oh. Well, we'll see this thing through ourselves. Mm, I wish I could see through the marking on that dollar bill in Bart's pocket. Maybe we're silly, Blackie, and it has nothing to do with the case. Mary, the dollar has everything to do with it. First is the reason the bank was robbed, then Joe Gatling was killed for it, then you were threatened. Almost killed. Why, I could have been All right, Mary, I know. Uh Uh-oh. Here comes somebody. Who is it, Bart? No, the man who went up to the girl's apartment a few minutes ago. Step back. Yeah, sure. I'm going to put this guy and ask questions later. Hey, you. Oh, me? Sure, why not? <coughs> oh, boy, that was a good poke, too. Bro. I doubt whether my friend appreciates it. <laughs> yeah, let's see who this guy's wallet says he is. Oh, he's certainly not Bart Everson. No, well, his wallet says he's uh, Bill Weaver. Weaver, that's it. Now, name. let's see if he has the marked dollar we found on Bart. Yeah. Mm-hmm, he does. Blackie, he has two dollar bills. Yeah, I just noticed that. Well, I wonder what that... And Mary, mm-hmm. there are funny marks on the back of this other one, too. Yeah. And the last two figures and the serial numbers are circled. Same as the other bill. Yes, but the numbers are different. Yeah. And the marks on the back are different, too. But look. Uh, yeah. If I fold the two bills in half, place them together, the marks run together. It looks like a map. Yes, it does look like a map. And Mary, this bill I just found has a word on it. Two words. Brent Wood. Oh, man's name. Also a place, Brentwood. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's right. And, uh, and look at this black dot here. Mm-hmm. When Faraday gets here, that's the place we're going to start. To start what? To start something that will not only finish Weaver and Bart, but this case. Okay, Blackie, we're at Brent Woods. We found the starting place, according to the black dot on that bill you copied. So what? So now we have to figure out where to go from here, Farrell. Yeah, I know where I'm going to go. Right back to my office. If you'd had any sense, you wouldn't have made copies of those bills. You'd have brought them along. Look, I copied everything that was necessary. And I wanted Weaver to have his bills. Why? You'll see why. In case we don't find anything out here. You know we're not going to find anything. Look at this place. Trees, trees. Nothing but trees. Coincidence, isn't it? Since we're in a forest. Very jocular. I thought so. What do we do now? Cut down every tree? Do we find what we're looking for? No. Or count them off? Hey, wait a minute, Faraday. You might have something there. Mm Mm-hmm. The serial numbers were circled. The last two on each bill. So? I wrote them down on this piece of paper here. Games. Always games. Put out that flashlight and we'll get out of here. Look, Faraday, 52 is circled on this bill, 28 on this one. I'm all agog. 52 what and 28 what? What do those figures mean? Inspector, I have to figure that out. Six, six, twenty-seven, seven, and twenty-eight. Here's a tree, Bart. Yeah, sure, huh, Weaver? Yeah, and you're lucky I didn't take care of you for crossing me. Or I'd be bringing you out here to bury you, not to make you rich. I sure do thank you, Mr. Weaver. Forget it. What's all this about this, this dollar bill stuff and all that? Well, Bart, Joe Gatling's old man and I were partners on the bank robbery. Yeah? Right? Old man Gatling hid the dough and marked the spot on two one-dollar bills. And so? He kept one, I kept the other. Uh, uh, and when he kicked off here, his son got the dollar that, that he kept, huh? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And young Gatling knew what it was worth and tried to sell it to me. When I tried to take it away from him, he got sore and decided he'd never give it to me. Huh? Oh, 
That's why he went to the bank, huh? Sure. But Mr. Weaver, he, he didn't put the buck in the bank. No, but he wanted me to think he did. Oh. You see, that way he figured I'd never get it. I'd never get it without holding up the bank. <laughs> he didn't think I'd dare <laughs> stick it up for one buck, you understand? Yeah. <laughs> Too bad he was so tricky he got himself killed for it. Yeah, <laughs> you said it. So, Mr. Weaver, how, how do we know that we got the right three from just them dollar bills? And that uh, 52, 28 stuff. It's very simple, Bart. The serial number ending in 52 begins with the letter N for north. It means 52 steps north. And the other uh, bill begins with an E. An e is for what? For east, you dope. Oh, oh. So after we took 52 steps north, we took 28 steps east. Because the last two numbers on the bill beginning with E are 28. Now climb the tree. Yeah. Doe is somewhere up there in the branch. And so are we. We've got to drop down on him. Hey, look out, Weaver. That's good bag up in the tree. Watch out. You take Weaver. I've got a body. Let it go. Well, yeah. that takes care of them. Yeah. We'll let them see the money we found when they wake up in jail. Uh, you're proud of yourself for figuring what that 52 and 28 meant, huh? Sure. Now, do you see why I covered the bills and let them keep the originals? Yes. Bring them out here so we could grab them. Uh-huh. I'll tell you something, Inspector. What's that? This isn't the first time I've ever solved a case by going out on a limb. Uh, good morning, Miss Wesley. <laughs> good morning. Making another deposit again today? No. No, not this time. Cash this for me, will you? I certainly will. Thank you. Hello, Blackie. Hello. And just because I'm right behind Miss Wesley, don't think I'm going to hold you up. <laughs> now on, every time I see Miss Wesley at my window, I wonder who's behind her. Oh. Well, the chances are it'll be me. <laughs> I hope so. Here you are, Miss Wesley. Uh -huh. $50, four tens, a five, and five ones. Oh, thank you. Goodbye, Miss Wesley. Goodbye. Goodbye, Blackie. Goodbye. Come on, Mary. Okay. Let's see how fast you can spend that 50. Mm, that won't be high. Now, look, look here. Now, don't bother to count it. There are 50 there. These I know. people know I'm how to count. The all right, go ahead and look at the one. No, but I'm what not. for? Well, now, look. Look at all the excitement just caused by a $1 bill. But there was something unusual about that dollar bill, Mary. It was marked. And matched another dollar bill that was also marked. Well, these are marked, too. Uh-oh. Here we go again. Yes, Blackie, here we go. To buy a new hat. Because that's what these bills are marked for. All right, stay back now. Stay back. It's not going to do the man any good if you crowd around him like that. Give him some room. Give him some room. Uh, are you sure somebody here is sent for an ambulance? Oh, yes, officer. I telephoned for one. But you didn't see the accident, huh? Eh? No. I guess no one did this time of night. I was just taking a walk down by the dock. Here comes the ambulance. Good. Now get back, everybody. All right, all right. Come get on. Back. Get back and let the ambulance through. Oh, yes. Get back. Come on, get back. Right here. Right here, boys. Right over here. Over here. Hello, officer. Hello, doctor. Right this way. Want me to help you, doctor? I'll let you know in a minute, driver. Okay. Open the back of the ambulance, someone. Uh, I will, doctor. Thanks. How is the officer? Well, I don't know. He looks pretty bad to me. Hit by a car, it looks like. How does he look to you? Oh, not too good. Yes, you're not good. I'll get the driver, and we'll get him on the stretcher and into the ambulance. Okay, now get back, everybody. Please. I'll be right back, officer. Okay. Oh, driver. Right you are, doctor. I mean, Joe. Is Amanda still alive? Yeah, Henry. But we're going to see to it, because he isn't. Very long.
private investigator means two things. You can be sure you'll run into trouble. And you can never be sure you'll get out of it. Not much you can do about it, I guess, except... Like Julie always says... Walk softly, Peter Troy. And now Peter Troy investigates the high-pressure harpy. You hear of people being bitten by the love bug. And maybe there's more than a little sense to that expression. In my book, love is a very odd kind of bug with more variations than the common cold virus, so that no two sets of lovers seem affected in quite the same way by this most deadly of diseases. Oh, but my philosophizing on the subject of love has come about as a result of my calling to mind a certain doll by the name of Diana Hoffman, in a case that actually began in a little corner store run by a guy whose name was Hegarty. Well, uh, there we are, Mrs. Pettifer, two and seven. Three shillings, four, six, eight, and uh, two is ten. Ah, thank you very much. Oh, thank you, Mr. Hegarty. Oh, look at the time. I must hurry home and feed my pussy. Well, goodbye, Mrs. Pettifer. Uh, now, sir, uh, what can I do for you? I stick up this place. Give me all the money, quick. What? Well, you kid. This you... shotgun blow your head off. Quick, all the money. Y- you'll never get away with this. The money, I say. All right, all right. Oh, uh, oh Mr. Hegarty, Mr. Hegarty. Oh, oh, dear. Shut up, you. You'll never get away with this. Open the money box. Here, here I do it. Uh, uh, give me that gun. Watch out. Help. Police. Help. I get out of here. You follow and I shoot. Stop, thief. Stop, thief. <laughs> There was something about the hold-up in the papers, but I didn't take too much notice of it. That kind of caper is strictly for the police. In fact, when Diana Hoffman swept into my office like a galleon under full sail, nothing was further from my mind than gunmen holding up corner stores. For not only was she stacked, but she must have stood five feet eleven in her stockings. And she had a way of making me feel that I was about four feet three on tippy-toes. Well, Julie was out at lunch, and like a dumb cluck, I'd left the door to my own office open so that there was little to impede the overpowering Amazon's invasion. You will be Peter Troy, no doubt. Oh, I, uh, yeah, yeah, I, I'm Troy. Good. Shall I sit here? Yes, this will do. Uh, look, Miss... Uh, Hoffman, Diana Hoffman. Uh, the Hoffman Business College, you know. Business College? Are you sure you don't mean a gymnasium? If that's meant to be funny, Troy, I can assure you it doesn't appeal to me that way. Uh, no, well... Uh, I've uh, come here on business, uh, your business. Uh, you are a private investigator, are you not? Well, that's what the sign on the door says, Miss Hoffman. You don't look much like a private investigator. Rather too soppy, if you don't mind my saying so. Oh, why should I mind that? You go right ahead. Anyway, you'll have to do. I can't spend any more time on this project. Project? Hmm. They've arrested Heinrich Capel for holding up Hegarty's store. They have? Oh. You don't sound as though that means much to you. Why, Miss Hoffman, it means a great deal to me. Of course, I've never heard of this Heinrich Capel or Hegarty or his store, but, oh, that's just a detail. Read your papers, man. For goodness sake, I should have thought a man in your line of business would be well up on all local crime. They say we learn something new every day, Miss Hoffman. Now you know. Know what? That a man in my line of business is not always well up on all local crime. Try, I'll thank you not to make frivolous remarks. I haven't much time. Well, I... Now, the position is this. Paul Capel's father is a shiftless person, but probably not the kind of man to commit a crime like this. Paul's convinced of his innocence, and I'm prepared to support him in that. At least I'm prepared to go to some trouble and expense to get at the truth. Oh, why? Why? Because Paul Capel's my future husband, that's why. Your future husband? Does he know? Of course he knows. I've already told him. He's one of my brightest pupils at the college, and he's good material. The kind of man I can lick into shape. Yeah, I'm sure, but what shape? Keep your mind on what we have in front of us, Troy. Miss Hoffman, my mind is well and truly on what's in front of me. Whew, to tell the truth, I'm just fascinated by it. What? Yes, I was just looking I'm at your... I'm back for lunch, Mr. Troy. <clears throat> I was just looking at your handbag, Miss Hoffman. Is that imported leather? Handbag? I didn't know I had a client coming in at this time, Mr. Troy. I have my notebook here. You want me to take notes, of course? Yeah, sure. Uh, Miss Hoffman, this is my secretary, Miss Summers. How do you do, Miss Hoffman? Have you been getting along all right with Mr. Troy? Getting along? I don't want to get along with him. If you ask me, he's pretty much of a fool. Handbag, indeed, of all the soppy dribble. Uh, Miss Hoffman wants us to look into the Hegarty case, Julie. Uh, look it up for me, will you? Yeah, Hegarty case. That's right. Under H for handbag. Uh, I mean, Hegarty. 
Uh, look, I hope you'll excuse me, Miss Hoffman, but I think I'll go out and have some lunch. Oh, but you had lunch an hour ago. You know me, Julie, just a growing lad. I need lots of nourishment. And uh, Miss Summers will take down all your particulars, Miss Hoffman. She's better at that than I am. I'll see you in half an hour, Julie. That's right, Troy. We've arrested this Henry or Heinrich Capel. Hegarty has identified him as the man who held him up. Uh, open and shut. Inspector, you shouldn't say things like that. You know it's only a temptation to me. What is? Well, when you're so smug about having solved a case quickly, I just love to prove you're wrong. And it's happened so often. It has not happened often. I'll have you know For that... the present, Inspector, suppose you just have me know the rest of the dope on this Hegarty case. We can tear each other's eyes out later. There's nothing to know. Three eyewitnesses saw the holdup. Mm -hmm. And they are? Uh, a Mrs. Janet Pettifer, a James Billings, and uh, one Archibald Mockridge. The two men were just entering the shop. Mrs. Pettifer was in it at the time. Mm -hmm. And I suppose they've identified Capel, too. Um, well, not yet, no. Not yet? Inspector, you're slipping. Now, look, the old lady, Mrs. Pettifer, is in hospital in a state of shock. The two men caught only a glimpse of the bandit. Oh, then you're not going to be able to rely on their testimony too much. No positive identification, even though they were there. Look, Troy, if you come here just to make trouble for them... I'd like to, Inspector, but I'm a little busy right now. Well, I don't need you to lecture me on the rules of identification if you're thinking of doing that. No, and you don't need me to tell you that so far you have only a very shaky case. Well, at least it's a start. Earlier, you said it was open and shut. That was to get rid of you. I get a little tired of running into you on every second case I have. Well, take heart, Inspector. That's only because you have all the interesting cases. Say, uh, what about the description of this bandit? Oh, it's all here. Here we are, about five feet ten, heavy features, large walrus moustache, dressed in a long, very worn gabardine overcoat, large, soft felt hat pulled well done. Mm-hmm. Uh, he carried a sawn-off shotgun under the coat, apparently hanging from his shoulder strap, so nobody would notice it prematurely. Yeah. And this description fits Capel? Of course it does. I told you, Hegarty knows Capel by sight. He lives in the neighborhood. And he swears it was Capel. I wouldn't harp on that if I were you, Inspector. You know it isn't enough. Now, just let's have the names of those witnesses again, will you? That's correct, Miss Summers. And I guess I'd say that description fitted the man pretty well. Although, as I told the police, I didn't see him too clearly. Well, thank you, Mr. Billings. There's nothing you feel you can add to that. You were at the door of the shop when the bandit ran out, I believe. Uh, yes, I was. Uh, Mockridge and I, he lives just up the street. We were going in almost together. That's when we heard the man call out. You heard him say something? What was it? Yeah, it's hard to say now. Something about sticking up the place, and he wanted the money. But it, uh, it was not too distinct. You know how these Italians talk? Italian? He had an Italian accent? That's right, broad Italian. You're sure it was Italian? I'm oh, quite sure. Do you speak Italian, Mr. Billings? <laughs> no, not me. But uh, I know an Italian accent when I hear one. French, you say, Mr. Markridge? Oi, oi, I, I'm telling you, aren't I? He was a Frenchy, all right. Do you happen to speak French, Mr. Markridge? Eh? I said, do you speak French? Speak French? Oh, no, of course not. What's wrong with English? But you're positive that the bandit spoke with a French accent? Of course, I'm sure. I said so, didn't I? I was over in France during the war. Oh, the last war? No, no, no. First one. Oh. The uh, only French I ever bothered with was Parley Vue and Toot Sweet and some of them mademoiselles from Armentiers. <laughs> oh, they were beauties, too, I can tell you. <laughs> well, thank you, Mr. Mockridge. But I know a French accent when I hear one. Uh, you can bet on that, son. <laughs> Definitely Italian, Pete. Uh, French. But uh, Billing said... Yeah, and Mockridge said French. Oh. Of course, he doesn't speak French and probably hasn't heard a French accent in 40 years, but he's certain sure. Uh, Billings doesn't speak Italian either. Yeah, it's weird, isn't it? <laughs> you know, this reminds me of that Edgar Allan Poe story. Hmm? What story is that? Uh, the Murders in the Rue Morgue. Ever read it? No, I don't think so. Well, there was this doll who was cut to pieces by someone. And the neighbors all heard a great yelling and screaming in the room before the murder. Yes. Now, one said he heard an Italian voice, another said it was German, and so on. None of the neighbors could speak the language, but they were sure of the accents. Well, that is like this case. What happened in the end? Did they find out who did it? Yeah. 
And was it a German or an Italian or what have you? No, it was a gorilla. Oh, Pete, stop kidding. I'm not kidding. It was a gorilla. You mean it might have been a gorilla that held up Hegarty's store? Oh, Julie, now who's kidding? But you said that. Julie, remind me not to tell you any more creepy stories from Edgar Allan Poe. It's too unnerving for you. I don't think you're the one to talk about being unnerved. The way that Diana Hoffman had you, your hands were practically shaking. Oh, I know it. Say, have you ever before seen so much woman all in one piece? Peter Troy, you had better... Ah, save it, Julie. Come on, let's go see what we can find out at Mrs. Pettifer's home. She's the last of our so-called eyewitnesses. <laughs> it could be she thought the bandit was an Arab. Julie is always inclined to cluck like a mother hen or something when beautiful dolls are within arm's length of me. But had she only known, she needn't have been too worried about that high-pressure harpy Diana Hoffman. Well, that doll may have been, but I like my women somewhat less overpowering and in smaller doses. Somehow, although I hadn't met him, I couldn't help feeling sorry for Paul Capel, the guy she'd decided to marry. And also, the son of the man Inspector Caswell was sure had committed the robbery at Hegarty's store. Oh, I personally didn't want too many conferences with the very dominating Diana. I was anxious to get rid of this case quick. And so, trying to short-circuit visiting Mrs. Pettifer in hospital, Julie and I went along to her modest little cottage. But, Pete, if Mrs. Pettifer's in hospital, what do you hope to find out here? Well, she lives with her maiden sister. Her husband's been dead for years. I found that out from Inspector Caswell. Oh. Yes? Oh, uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Troy. Peter uh, Troy, uh, my card, ma'am. Uh, Peter Troy, private investigator. Oh, you'll have come about the gas. The gas? Mm, yes, it's been playing up something dreadful, you know. It keeps going blip, 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 like that. It does? Yes, I do hope you can fix it before I cook Twiddle's tea. She hates raw meat, you know. Twiddle's? My sister's pussy, you know. Do come in, Mr. Inspector. Oh, yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, you're Mrs. Pettifer's sister, I guess. That's right. I'm Agnes Reedy. Miss Reedy, I might say. Miss Reedy, this is my secretary, Miss Summers. Oh, how do you do, dear? Hello. My fancy a gas inspector bringing his secretary with him at no box of tools. How do you hope to fix the gas without tools? Well, I haven't come to fix the gas, Miss Reedy. I'm a detective, a private detective. Oh, Oh, dear. Is it about Twiddles annoying that cocky next door? No, no. It's about the man your sister saw robbing Mr. Hegarty's shop. Oh, that. Oh, but the police have already been about that. Yeah, Mr. Troy is working for the man the police have arrested, Miss Reedy. We're trying to prove his innocence. Well, I don't really see how you can do that if he did it. Well, we're not satisfied he did do it at all, Miss Reedy. But he must have. Oh, what makes you say that? Well, I mean, he's so eccentric. Eccentric? Yes, he's a German, isn't he, that Capel? Oh, yeah, I believe so. Well, there you are, then. All foreigners are, foreigners are eccentric. Everybody knows that. Oh, the foreigners don't, Miss Reedy. But I mean to say dressing like that. Most odd. You can't tell me that he's not eccentric. What, you mean the long coat and the big hat well pulled down? Mm. Well, of course, that was to disguise himself a little. How could you disguise that great big moustache? Mercy me, it's like a yard broom. Yeah, mm. yeah, I see what you mean. And anybody who'd wear that kind of overcoat over denim trousers. Well, and I'm sure those rubber shoes can't be good for the feet. Rubber simply will not breathe, you know. My father used to say... Well, well, wait, wait a minute, Miss Reedy. Uh, we, we haven't heard anything about trousers and shoes before. Oh, really, Mr. Troy, did you think the man was barefooted? Well, no, but... As for the trousers, well, perhaps I shouldn't have mentioned it. Oh, why not? Well, it's not exactly a nice subject, is it? I mean, in front of this young lady, one doesn't speak of a man's nether garments in mixed company as a rule, does one? Um, oh, no, perhaps we could waive the strict rules of propriety on this occasion, Miss Reedy. This is a serious matter. A man's liberty might be at stake. Oh, well, uh, Perhaps, as long as you understand that I don't usually talk about such things so freely. Of course. Uh, Miss Reedy, how do you happen to know so much about the bandit? 
You weren't at the store at the time of the robbery. No, but, but Agatha, my, my sister, she, she tells me everything. She gave me very... Every last detail. I, I can see it all as though I, I was actually there. Well, that's very interesting, Miss Reedy. Very interesting indeed. Another cup, Pete? Mm. Oh, uh, oh, yeah, thanks, honey. Well, what now? You have hardly had a word to say for yourself since we came into this coffee shop. You must have been doing some very heavy thinking. Yeah. Julie, do you have those notes you took from Diana Hoffman? Mm -hmm. Right here in my purse. What do you want to know? About the Capel family. Uh, read it off. Uh, Capels. Um, just a minute. Um, uh, Capel. Here we are. Father Heinrich Capel. Mother died six years ago. Two children... Paul, age 28, and Edward, age 22. Mm -hmm. Edward. What about him? Well, you tell me about him. What do the notes say? Oh, um, Paul's a hard worker. Goes to night school, the Hoffman Business College. Yeah, yeah, I heard about that. Uh, oh, here we are, Edward. Oh, different type from Paul. More like his father, who is said to be shiftless. Edward mixes with a certain undesirable element, whatever she means by that. No, okay, that'll hold us for the moment. What are you getting at, Pete? A pair of blue jeans and suede rubber-soled shoes worn under an old gabardine overcoat. It does sound an unlikely combination. Yeah. Now, the guy who wore the jeans and the shoes would be more likely to have a leather jacket or some such. Mm. And my guess is we'll find that old Capel never wears jeans or suede shoes. All right, then who does? Somebody a lot younger. What? You don't mean Edward, his son. That's the guy I'm brooding over at the moment. But... Haggerty knows Capel by sight, and he said the man looked just like Capel. Oh, Julie, a son can look pretty much like his father. Well, what about the moustache? A big walrus moustache. Oh, Julie, don't give me that as a stumbling block. Those moustaches are among the stock in trade of any old novelty shop. You mean to say that Edward Capel put on a moustache like his father's, dressed up in that old coat and had to complete the illusion, and took a gun and robbed Haggerty? You might say I am toying with that idea. Can you poke any holes in it? Dozens. Name one. Well... The accent. The man spoke with an accent. Now, according to Miss Hoffman, the Capels have been in this country since Edward was a small child. They've even anglicized his name. So, Edward doesn't have an accent. And you don't think he could simulate enough of an accent to sound like his old man? Or make people think it was his old man's voice? Well, um, yeah, well I don't know. He could. Any more points? Pete, we're talking about the son of a man they've arrested. It's it's hard to believe he'd let his own father go to jail for him. It's even harder to believe that he planned it that way. But according to my theory, that's just what he did. Oh, what a little monster he'd need to be. No, not necessarily a monster. Just sick, maybe. Come on, let's pay a call at the Capel house and see who we find at home. You can come in if you like, Mr. Troy. Uh, though I can't help you much. Oh, thanks. I hope you don't mind coming through to the kitchen. I'm, I'm just making some tea. Oh, perhaps I can make it for you. Uh, no, it's okay. I, I can manage. Uh, would you like some? Oh, no, thank you. We've just had coffee. I just found a leak in the kettle, so I've had to put the water on the stove in a saucepan. And my old man was going to get a new kettle, but uh, he never seemed to have the money for it. Well, it doesn't look as though he'll be buying any kettles for quite a while now, Eddie. No, I don't. Anyway, don't expect me to say I'm sorry. Sorry? For me, old man. Don't expect me to burst into tears if he goes to jail. He had it coming to him. He's got it coming to him now, if he did that job at Hagerty's. But that doesn't mean that you can't feel sorry for him. And why should I feel like that? What did he ever do for me? Except belt me ears off. Well, I don't know. You tell us what he did for you. Nothing. That's what? Absolutely nothing. It was always Paul. Well, Paul was a bright one, a genius. He was going to do great things. Only since Mum died, the old man's even lost interest in Paul. He hardly even works these days, just loafs about. Talking about how good things used to be. And robbing stores in between whiles, huh? Eat. Well, it's true, Julie. This kid's old man sounds like a real creep. Right, Eddie? Yeah, that's just what he is. Kept you short of money, too, I guess, huh? Money? He had never, never had no money. Not for years now. I've had to keep us both. Oh, what about your brother, Paul? Doesn't he live here with you? Oh, he is, sir, but uh, he's going to be married. 
He's moved into a place of his own. And any money he has, it goes in the bank and stays there. Yes, I expect Miss Hoffman would see to that. You seem to have a little bit of money to spend on yourself, Eddie. Those are pretty natty suede sneakers you're wearing. Oh, uh, these? Uh, you like them? Yeah, I got them cheap, though. Uh, from Black, I know. Uh, a damaged stock from a fire, you know. Or from another store robbery, maybe, huh? And uh, what do you mean? The spivu sold you those shoes cheap. He didn't get them from any damaged stock, did he? He's a thief, just like you. Yeah, I don't like the way you're talking, mister. You cut that out. No use, Eddie. You've sewn up all the loose ends for us. Loose ends? Yeah. You've hated your father for years. And in holding up Hegarty's store, you saw a chance to get your hands on some money and at the same time get your father put away in jail. Now, what are you talking about? You can't say things like that to me. I can say them and I can prove they're true. You can't prove nothing. Well, Hegarty himself said the bloke who robbed him was my old man. Yeah. But Hegarty didn't notice that the bandit was wearing blue jeans and suede shoes, Eddie. And I guess it's going to be easy to establish that your father never wears those things. I, I don't know what you're talking about. Get your jacket, Eddie. We're taking you to police headquarters. Wait. Okay. I know when I'm beaten. Uh, my jacket's in this cupboard over here. I I'll get it. This water's nearly boiling. I'd better turn the gas off. We won't need it now. Okay, you two. Get your hands up quick. What? You dumb idiot. Put that shotgun down. I'm warning you. I'm getting out of here. And if either of you wants to be very dead, you just try to follow me. Uh, mind what you're doing with that water, Julie. Don't spill it. Don't spill it on yourself. What that? Oh, yes. You two just stay where you are now. I'm coming for you, Eddie. Stand back, Troy. Julie! Right! <coughs> oh, good girl, Julie. I hope you get the message about the hot water. Give me the gun, Eddie. Thanks. It was nearly boiling. It must have hurt you. I hope so. Come on, you young jerk. Knock off the whaling. You don't hurt that bad. You've got an appointment downtown with a certain Inspector Caswell. And uh, you have one with a certain Miss Diana Hoffman. What? Oh, don't remind me, Julie. Oh, brother, when I meet that Amazon again... Ah, yes. You'd better walk softly, Peter Troy. What we were able to give him, dear old Inspector Caswell had no trouble in pinning the rap for the robbery on Eddie Capel and releasing his father. None of it made anyone much happier, but that's the way it had to be. It didn't make me any happier, I can tell you. And when I had to report back to Diana Hoffman, it was one time I was glad to have Julie around. I couldn't escape the feeling that that giant doll was always on the point of eating me alive. And if I have to die at the hands of a woman... That is not the way. Walk Softly, Peter Troy is an Artranda production written by Cressick Jenkinson and directed by Russ Ryder. The F.W. Fitch Company presents Dick Powell as private investigator Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. W. Fitch Company, makers of Fitch's Tapanified Coconut Oil Shampoo and Fitch's Shaving Creams, presents Dick Powell as Private Investigator Richard Rogue. In Rogue's Gallery. For the benefit of those who tuned in hoping to hear Cass Daly, may I introduce myself? My name is Richard Rogue. I'm a private investigator. <laughs> I said it and I'm glad. Private investigator. That's the Harvard way of saying I'm a guy who has parlayed a hard head and a great curiosity about other people's affairs into a career. At least that's the way the homicide squad's Lieutenant Urban, who shares my interest in unalive bodies, feels about me. And I'd also better tell you now that I have a certain personal idiosyncrasy. I hold audible consolations with my alter ego once in a while, 
when I'm confused and in need of advice. His name is Ugor, which is rogue spelled backwards, and he's a very fresh little spook. Of course, I wouldn't have known I had an alter ego if Betty Callahan, the girl I would rather be marooned on a desert island with than not, hadn't browbeaten me into reading Sigmund Freud. Betty, who is the sharpest newspaper woman in town, extends upward about five feet from the floor, has hair the color of cordovan leather and firelight, and a tip-tilted Irish nose shying away from the most kissable mouth in the world. She's, well, she's wonderful. And on this day I'm going to tell you about, she and I had had lunch together. She had an hour to kill, so she walked back to my office with me. You know, Richard, this is much too nice a day to work. Look, Betty, if you can get rid of that assignment you have for this afternoon, we'll go to the races, huh? Oh, I haven't been out this year. I got some information from Herb Hyde at the cigar store in the lobby. He gave me two horses who gave him their word they were ready today. Talking horses? Only to Herb. They don't speak English, but fortunately he speaks horse. <laughs> now get on the phone and ask that slave driver at your city desk for the afternoon off. Tell him you have to go to your grandmother's wedding or something. Well, I'll try, but it's not going to work, and I know it. Just sit right down there and pay no attention to that sign asking you to leave a nickel in the cigar box for every call. Oh, thank you. Oh, it's nothing. It's nothing. I'll do anything for the girl I love. I better think of something better than my grandmother's wedding. I know. I'll tell him I want to go to the race. Okay, but... You're, you're, you're Richard Rogue. Yeah? A detective in New York named Clement Cohan referred me to you. My name is Charles McDonald. Yeah, I got his letter. I got to see it right away. Uh, go on in that office there. I'll, I'll be in in a minute. All right. Please, hurry. What was the matter with him? He looked sick. Oh, probably been drinking. I, I noticed that when the... Oh, wait a minute. Hello, give me the city desk, please. Now, make it a good story. Tell him that your Shh, grandmother... Wait. Hello, Walter. This is Betty Callahan. Look, um, can you put somebody else on that Strubel story this afternoon? I want to go to the races. And... But Walter... Yes, but... Uh... Okay. What did he say? No. Oh. He told me to get right back to the paper, and I like my job, so here I oh. go. Oh, well, then wait a minute, wait a minute. I'll go in and talk with this guy, give him the quick brush and go over with you. Maybe I can talk Walter into letting you take the afternoon off for the betterment of racing. Huh? Well, you'll have to hurry. Walter's mad. Well, just take it easy. I'll be right back. Hey... Hey, what's the matter? Good Lord, Betty. Richard, what happened? Oh, he fell out of his chair. Yeah. Get Urban on the phone and call him for an ambulance. Oh, Rich. He's dead. Yeah. Yeah, very dead. <laughs> we'll continue our story in just a moment. First, impressions often count a lot. And remember, the appearance of your hair is an important factor in impressing people favorably the first time you meet them. Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo can be a real help to you in attaining the well-groomed hair that people admire. For Fitch Shampoo removes every trace of that enemy of good grooming, dandruff. It's the only shampoo made whose guarantee to remove dandruff is backed by one of the world's largest insurance firms. There's nothing magical in the way Fitch Shampoo removes dandruff. It's simply that it has a special solvent action that penetrates the thousands of tiny hair openings on the scalp, cleansing them thoroughly and dissolving every trace of dandruff. That means not only the loose flakes of dandruff, but the kind that clings to the scalp as well. Then Fitch forms an abundance of fluffy lather that carries away the dissolved dandruff flakes. It rinses out easily and leaves the hair sparkling clean, completely free from dandruff. Try Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo yourself for the appearance that impresses. Now back to Dick Powell as private investigator Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. I should be inured to the sight and smell of sudden death by this time, but it always does something to me freezes my stomach and gives me a dull ache at the base of my brain. When I left Betty Callahan on the phone in my reception room and walked into my private office, I found my mysterious visitor falling forward out of his chair in death. I knelt by his side and loosened the long top coat he was wearing. 
The front of his suit and his shirt were red, and there were two bullet holes, one to the right of his heart and one a little below it. I tried to blame myself for not talking to him at once, for not understanding that his staggering, shuffling gait was not caused by drinking, but by loss of blood. I looked in his billfold for identification. His name was Charles McDonald, and he was assistant manager of a Park Avenue jewelry store in New York. There was a piece of paper in his hand. I looked at it. It carried an address, 1392 Squirrel Hill. I put the paper in my pocket. Then I heard the outer office door open, and a feminine voice said, Is this Mr. Rogue's office? I jumped to my feet and ran out there, closing the door behind me. There was a girl standing by the desk talking to Betty, a dark girl. She had a, she had a figure with enough O's in it to put it in the million-dollar column, and a face to match. Betty said, This is Mr. Rogue. Where's my husband? Well, I'm sure I don't know. What's his name? Charles McDonald. He's here. I saw him come in. Well, that's very interesting. Excuse me a moment. Betty, are they on their way? Yes, both of them. Thanks. Now, uh, Mrs. McDonald, what makes you think your husband is here? I saw him come in here. You were on the elevator with him? No. I just happened to be passing on the street. I saw Charles and spoke to him. He didn't even look at me. He walked right by. I couldn't understand it. He looked sick. I saw him come into this building. I followed him in. Oh, where have you been all this time? I missed his elevator. Why are you questioning me like this? I know he's here. I want to see him. Well, if you missed his elevator, what makes you think he's here? This is a big building, you know. I waited for his elevator to come back to the ground floor. I talked with the operator. He remembered my husband and told me that Charles had asked for your office. Where is he, Mr. Rogue? Where is he? Uh, Mrs. McDonald, would you uh, just please have a chair? He's, uh, he's here all right, but he's busy. You'll have to wait. Oh, hello, Lieutenant Urban. Come in. Well, Rogue, what goes on? Where's the... Urban, uh, I want to see you in the next office. Follow me, will you? Well, he sure did. How did it happen, Rogie? I'll tell you all I know. He came in here looking pretty sick. I, I thought he'd been drinking. That long top coat he had on covered the fact that he was bleeding to death. I told him to come in here and wait. I came in about two minutes later just as he pitched forward out of his chair and died. That's when I called you, or uh, had Betty call you. She was here when he came in and saw the whole thing. Mm, looks like a 38 caliber job. Two around the heart. His name is Charles McDonald, and he's from New York City. Well, that's interesting. Who's the girl outside with Callahan? Uh, his wife. Well, where does she fit in here? Well, she... Mr. McDonald, you can't go in there. I want to see Mr. Rogan. Sit down. I'm going in no, there. No, Mr. McDonald, no, you can't go in there. I know he's in there. I'm going in. Oh, Joe! Joe! Well, when that girl saw Charles McDonald lying there, as dead as yesterday's beer, she folded up right over him like a drop piece of string. Urban and Betty and I were still working over when the medical examiner and the technical squad from Homicide showed up. We picked her up, carried her into the outer office. As soon as she came to, Betty gave her a glass of water, which she sipped nervously when Urban started throwing questions at her like baseballs. Mrs. McDonald, I'm sorry to have to question you at this time. Uh, will you please put that glass down and listen to me? Now, your husband was obviously murdered. I have to have the information. I don't know who could have done it. My husband was a businessman. He wasn't mixed up in anything that could have caused his murder. Now, what kind of business was your husband in? He was in the jewelry business. Manager of a big store in New York. Mm-hmm. Richard, what was I your have address to get back to the paper. I have to get the story in. Okay, wait a minute, and I'll walk out of the hall with you. All right, come on. Where are you going, Rogie? Oh, I'm taking Betty to a cab. I'll be back. See that you are. Come on. What are you doing pulling me along like this? I have high heels on. I'm in a hurry, baby. But you told Lieutenant Urban you'd be right back. I told him I'd be back and I will. My rent's paid for another month. Well, where are you going? To do a little investigating. That's what it says in my card, investigator. Now, look, honey, when we get downstairs, I'm going to have to leave you. I'll see you tonight here at the office at 7 o'clock. Going down. Hello, Mr. Rogue. Hi, Shorty. Drop this thing, will you? I'm in a hurry. <laughs> I shot out of that building like a bat out of a belfry and jumped into a cab. I slipped the cab jockey a bill that made his eyes pop open like dropped eggs and told him he could keep it. If he could get me to 1392 Squirrel Hill in five minutes. That's the address I found in Charles McDonald's hand. We broke every law but the 18th Amendment in the next four minutes and 50 seconds. 
And I jumped out of the cab, hit the front steps of that big, deserted-looking old house in the dead run. The door was ajar, so I took my gun out of its shoulder holster, put it in my side coat pocket, and walked right in, into a blackjack. Oh! My glazed eyes told my brain there was a dead man lying there. And then my head hit one of the stars which were surrounding me, and the star exploded with a blinding flash. I felt myself flying upward at a speed that made me dizzy. I was grabbing at the tails of comets, trying to break my speed, but nothing could stop me. I looked down at the earth, and it seemed I seemed to be looking through the wrong end of a telescope. It was a little round ball, that's all. I couldn't get my breath. I fought for it, fought for it. And then my lungs seemed to explode, and everything was peaceful. I opened my eyes, and I was on cloud eight, my home away from home. Ugor was sitting there, dangling his little short legs over eternity, and combing his long white beard with his stubby fingers. <laughs> Hello, Rogie. Been using your head for a blackjack back stuff again, huh? Oh, never mind the cracks. I feel awful. Who did it? <laughs> Some big guy I never saw before. Oh, but why would he want to hit me? Well, you must have been interfering in his business, Chiefy. There was a dead man in that room, you know. Yeah, I know it. What was I doing there? I'm a little foggy. Well, you went there because it was the address that was printed on that piece of paper you found in Charles McDonald's hand. Remember? Oh. Oh, yeah. Hey, I, I, uh, I better get downstairs. I, I got a work to do. Help me over the side, will you, Hugo? Oh, look, Rogi. There's no dough in this case for you. Why don't you get out of it? Do you want to get yourself killed for free? I'll get out of it if I ever get back downstairs. Give me a shove, will ya? I'm going down there. Okay, Chiefy. But take care of yourself now. So long, Rogi. <laughs> Open one eye carefully. Then I closed it again so fast that I was afraid the guy who was watching me would hear it snap. He was a big man, and his eyes were the blue of ice cubes. Ice cubes with floodlights behind them. Hot ice. One of his hands was holding a gun, and the gun was pointed right where my heart would have been if it hadn't been in my throat. No use playing possum now, Mr. Rhodes. Mm. No, indeed. Mm. I am aware that you have returned to consciousness. Oh, 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 who are you? My name is Moore. Now come, Mr. Rogue. I realize that you undoubtedly have a headache, probably a splitting headache, and I'm regretful. But we can finish our business in just a moment if you'll sit up and talk with me. Okay, uh, I'll try. Excellent, excellent. Now, Mr. Rogue, where is it? Where is what? Now, now, time is of the essence. Let us not waste it. You know what I'm speaking of. The Star of Savoy. Where is it? You, uh, you have to believe me. I, I don't know whether you're talking about a burlesque dancer, a passenger liner, or a military decoration. What is the Star of Savoy, and why am I supposed to know something about it? You're jesting, of course. Oh, believe me, I never jest with a head like this. Look, uh, Messi, you got the wrong number. Do you think I killed this man here? Oh, indeed I don't. He was killed by a man named Charles MacDonald. Uh, you know Mr. MacDonald, of course. Oh, vaguely, vaguely, yes. He, he was dead when I met him. Uh, delightful sense of humor. I always admire a man with a sense of humor. Good. Well, then, look, I am going to get out of here. That's possible. Entirely possible. After you tell me where I may find the Star of Savoy, Mr. Rogue. I don't know. I don't know anything about it. Don't even know what it is. It's a large diamond, Mr. Rogue. One of the largest in the world. Formerly owned by the Hohenzollern family. Recently the property of a New York collector of famous jewels. It's a magnificent jewel, Rogue. Magnificent. Where is it? I don't know. I suppose you think I came here after it. Oh, I wouldn't know about that, Mr. Rogue. But you say you met my friend Charles MacDonald after he was dead. Very cleverly put. 
But when MacDonald left here, he went from here directly to your office. He was carrying the Star of Savoy in his coat. I know that to be true. I was following him. Well, we, we searched him, the police and I. He didn't have the Star of Savoy or any other diamond or a carrot any place on him. That's the truth. Only thing I found on him was this address. That's why I came here. That's very strange. Yes, quite baffling. Have you met a strikingly beautiful girl? Tall, dark black hair, brown eyes, uh, very appealing. You, uh, you mean MacDonald's wife? Uh, well, yes, MacDonald's wife. Uh, you've met her? Uh, yes, yeah, she, uh, she was at my office when he died. Uh, who is this stiff here? Oh, uh, a former partner of mine. He was attempting to double-cross me, poor fellow. You see, Rogue, he and I had a market for the Star of Savoy, a very fine market. That's why we hope to get it from Mr. MacDonald today. MacDonald was most unreasonable, most unreasonable. Of course, I intend to continue in my efforts to acquire the Star of Savoy. Uh, this dark young lady, Mrs. Uh, MacDonald, was she alone with him at any time? Either while he was alive or after his death? Well, no. I, well, she came into my office and saw that he was dead and fainted. Oh, I see. Well, Mr. Rogue, I'm inclined to believe your story about knowing nothing about my diamond. I think I'll be running along. But just to make sure that you don't use your meager talents to pursue me, I'll have to... Oh! <laughs> We'll return to our story in just a moment. First, one often hears that a woman's eyes, the window to the soul, are her most expressive features. But did you ever consider that a woman's hair can be very expressive too? It can tell the world whether the woman is fastidious or careless. That's why so many millions of smart women depend on Fitch's dandruff remover shampoo to make their hair express good care and exquisite grooming. For Fitch's dandruff remover shampoo is a thorough cleansing agent. And while it cleanses, it also reconditions the hair. This reconditioning action perks up drab and tired hair strands, gives them more elasticity and a bright, gleaming texture. Then, since Fitch's dandruff remover shampoo is completely soluble in water, it leaves no dull, soapy film on your hair. It rinses out quickly and leaves the hair shining and lustrous. Let your hair be an expression of loveliness. Ask your beauty operator to give you a professional application of Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo, or buy an economical bottle at your drug or toilet goods counter. Fitch is spelled F-I-T-C-H. Now back to Dick Powell as private investigator Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. Well, what had started out to be a lovely, lucid day had certainly turned out to be as ugly and mad as a giraffe with a sore throat. The date I had with Betty Callahan had been interrupted by a stranger walking into my office and dropping dead of pre-digested murder. I got knocked silly and came to to find a guy named Moore politely annoyed with me about a diamond I'd never seen. So annoyed with me, in fact, that he was determined to kick my teeth out. I saw that big shoe swing from my jaw, and I ducked right into it. Oh, it would have been so easy for me to pass out again. But I fought it. I couldn't. I needed the time. I vaguely heard the fading footsteps of Mr. Moore through the aura of pain which was surrounding me like a fog. And after he'd faded out, I, I sat there for a while. Then I got to my hands and knees and crawled until my head cleared a little. When I got to my feet, I ran out of the house, grabbed a cab for the Park Crest Hotel. I thought I'd find more there looking for Mrs. McDonald. Oh, I must have looked like a hit-and-run victim as I approached the very proper clerk. He backed away, but I reached across the counter and grabbed him. Let go of me! I want some information. I want it fast. What room is Mrs. Charles McDonald of New York City in? Mrs. McDonald? Stop stalling. What's her room number? We have a Mr. McDonald, but there is no Mrs. McDonald. His wife is in New York. How do you know that? I, I sent a wire to her for him last night. There's no Mrs. McDonald out here. And now let me go before I call the house officer. I remembered then... Mr. Moore had hesitated when I pegged that tall, dark girl as Mrs. McDonald. That girl was an imposter. My head was still doing the Virginia reel with variations on the turns, but I couldn't slow up now. 
In spite of the racket inside my skull, I was thinking straight and clearly. I ran to my office. It was only a block. And I got that glass that Mrs. McDonald had been twirling in her fingers as Urban questioned her. I took it down to police headquarters and asked the sergeant of the fingerprint bureau to dust it for prints and tell a photo of the prints to the FBI in Washington. I told him he could find me in my office. I went back to my office and sank into my swivel chair and let sleep take over. Honey, you look so awful. Oh, oh, hmm. Oh, Betty, how? Oh. Oh. Hello, baby. What are you doing here? It's seven o'clock, Richard. You told me to meet you here at seven o'clock. Seven? Mm-hmm. Oh, seven it is? Oh, hey. What about those fingerprints? Fingerprints? Oh, excuse me a minute, baby. I, I got to call the identification bureau. You should be in a hospital. Oh, Richard, you can't take me to dinner looking like that. Oh, honey, I think how I feel. Mm. Identification Bureau, Sergeant James. Uh, Sergeant, this is Richard Rogue. Did you get an answer from the FBI on those prints I gave you? Yeah, it just came in, Rogue. They belong to a girl named Alice Ryan. Three years ago, when they took them at the aircraft company where she worked, she lived at 4435 Ethel Avenue in North Hollywood. Any criminal record? Arrested once in a competence rep, four years ago. Dismissed for lack of evidence. Thanks, Sarge. I owe you a cigar. Come on, Betty, we're going to go to North Hollywood. I'll explain why in a cab. Come on. No, Alice does not live here anymore. She moved into Los Angeles about uh, seven months ago when she quit her job at the airplane factory. Uh, did she leave a forwarding address? Oh, yes, I'll get it for you. Just a minute. You think she has the diamond, don't you, Richard? Sure. She lifted it off McDonald's body when she fainted over him. Oh, how awful. Here it is. It is a long drive from here in Los Angeles. Thanks. Alice Ryan? No, she doesn't live here anymore. She came into money or something. She lives in Hollywood now. Do you know uh, her dress there? A uh, big guy around here after an hour ago. It's uh, North uh, Serrano. Oh, wait a minute, I'll get it for you. A big man? That's the man? Yeah, who... yeah that's the man. He has an hour's head start. Uh, here, here it is. I wrote it down for you. Oh, thank you, sir. <laughs> Okay, now, Betty. Now, ring the bell and then stand back. Clear back against the wall and stay away from the windows. All right, Richard. You take care of yourself now. I always do. Stand where you are, and I'll go knock on the door. All right. You stay right there, Betty. I'm going to try the door. Now, stay where you are. I will. Come in. Come in, Mr. Rogue, and don't attempt to be clever because you present a beautiful target there in the doorway. Where's Alice Ryan? She's here. Drop your gun, please, Mr. Rogue. I can see you, you know. I have a bit of advantage. Drop your gun, Mr. Rogue. Close the door, Mr. Rogue. Now that I've turned the light on, you can see that you have found Alice Ryan. Oh, brother. Yes, I'm sorry. I was forced to eliminate her, Mr. Rogue. She was most unreasonable about giving me the Star of Savoy. She chose to pit her ordinary brain against my genius in this race to see who would be the possessor of the stone after Charles MacDonald was eliminated. And now, Mr. Rogue, you find yourself in much the same position. Yeah, I guess I'm not very smart. You, uh, you have the diamond? Indeed, I have. And I think perhaps you deserve a glimpse of it. There. Is that not the most inspiring sight you've ever seen, Mr. Rogue? Look at it. Glistening there. A hundred people have died, I would imagine, Mr. Rogue, in the history of this stone. Yes, at least a hundred. I have spent the last ten years scheming, contriving, bribing, stealing to get this lovely thing. And now, Mr. Rogue, it's mine. Yeah, you got it. What are you going to do with it? Just sit there and look at it? I can get a million dollars for it. A million in cold cash and no questions asked. A million dollars. I'm not at all sure that that is enough, Mr. Rogue. And now, 
I'm afraid I'm going to be forced, regretfully, to remove you. There was cold murder in the ice blue eyes that were looking into mine. Moore was enjoying every breath of my last few minutes on Earth. He was waiting for me to break. And all the time, he was talking in that cultured iceberg voice. Then I saw Betty. She was hugging the wall in the next room, creeping silently toward the killer. I wanted to shout at her, to shout at her, to tell her to go away. And then... Richard! Richard, are you all right? Yeah, yeah, I knocked his gun up the air when you scared him silly. Oh, Betty, Betty, bless your little pointed head, but why did you do it? Betty, well, of all the times to faint, isn't that just like a woman? Well, the police took it from there, and the story was pretty plain. Moore was the head of a gang of international jewel thieves, consisting of the man I found dead on Squirrel Hill, Alice with the dark black hair, and himself. They uh, had offered Charles McDonald a fortune to steal the Star of Savoy from the Park Avenue establishment where he was employed, and where it was on exhibition. They planned to kill him when he delivered the stone. But the trio triple-crossed themselves, and finally only Moore remained alive, which was a temporary thing, because Moore soon paid the final score for the murders he committed. And, uh, well, I got a $5,000 reward for breaking the case. $5,000 for just getting batted around a little. That, uh, isn't bad, is it, huh? I, uh, I split the reward with Betty Callahan, who certainly saved my life. And she went right out and spent her half on a fur cape. You know, women should never have money. They don't know how to handle it. Of course, the first time she wore the cape, she looked so lovely that I took her to the races and lost my half on a horse named Investigator. Oh, well, money isn't as important as true love, but there's a lot more of it. You know what I mean? <laughs> This is Dick Powell again, ladies and gentlemen. It's awfully nice to meet you on a new network. I hope you enjoyed our story tonight. Ray Buffum wrote it. Leith Stevens composed and conducted the music in D. Engelbach, produced and directed. Be with us again next Sunday, will you? We have a story for you about a triangle, a rendezvous, and a plan that failed. We call it Lady with a Gun. Thanks for listening, and now here's Jim Doyle. Listen again next week at this same time to hear Dick Powell as private investigator Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. Laugh a while, let a song be your style, you stitch shampoo. Don't despair, use your head, save your hair, you stitch shampoo. After and between Fitch shampoos, you can keep your hair shining and manageable by using a few drops of Fitch's Ideal Hair Tonic every day. Fitch's Ideal Hair Tonic is not sticky or greasy, yet it gives your hair that well-groomed look. Ladies and gentlemen, the ringing of that phone bell means mystery, adventure. Nero Wolf's office, Archie Goodwin speaking. Mr. Wolf? Yeah, he's right here. Who's this? Archie, hang up. Don't ask questions. You, uh, you have a what? Archie, it's past your bedtime. Well, I'm afraid, Mr. Wolf, uh, it's past his bedtime. Your bedtime. It's a client, boss. That's what I was afraid of. Foolish. Hello? Hello? Well, why do you look so bewildered? He's coming right over. He says he's got a date. With murder. Ladies and gentlemen, it's the detective genius who rates the knife and fork the greatest tools ever invented by man. The ponderous, brilliant, and unpredictable Nero Wolf. Created by Rex Stout and brought to you in a new series of adventures over this NBC network in the person of Mr. Sidney Greenstreet.
Tonight's story, The Case of the Calculated Risk, was as strange and baffling as any Nero Wolf had to deal with. It started late one night when a big-shouldered man sporting a reddish beard and billing himself as Dave Caffrey pushed his way in, walked up to Nero Wolf's desk, and rocked him with this opener. Tomorrow morning, Mr. Wolf, I'm going to kill a man. I beg your pardon, sir? I'm going to kill a man with these two hands. I've been told strange things across this desk, Mr. Caffrey. This is the first time a murderer has confided his intention to me in advance. This man you speak of... I'm not telling you his name. I'm not telling you where I'm going to meet him. The session tomorrow is going to be private and personal. But if anything happens to me between now and then, I want you to take over. Mr. Gaffrey, do you seriously think I could assist you in a matter of private vengeance? That's not what I'm asking. This guy deserves to die. I plan to kill him with these two hands, me, myself. But if I slip up, if he gets me first, I want you to see that justice is done. But I assure you, sir... I told you this guy deserves to die. Let me tell you why. Years ago, down south, there were three men in business together, partners. Me and two others. You know, Bugacci, if Mr. Gaffrey doesn't mind. You're wasting your time, Wolf. The names I'll use will be phony. I won't give you anything you can check back on. We'll take our chance, sir. Please proceed. It happened in a town about 40 miles from the place where we had our business. We'd gone there to collect some money, the three of us. Carl, Mitch, and me. Dave Caffrey. But all we collected was bad news. So bad that Carl hadn't even given our right names at the hotel. Said he was scared some of our creditors had come hitting up on us for what we owed. Three of us had had some drinks, and we'd been pacing around for nearly an hour. And I can still remember the way Mitch stood and looked at me. And then up at Carl, when Carl suddenly pulled to a stop and came out with this idea of his. So, Dave... You got 6,000 cash on hand. You counted it, Mitch. Well, didn't we make it 6240, Carl? Whichever. We've got this 6,000 R, plus some slow accounts receivable against debts of 38,000. With three of us trying to live from the business, we haven't got a chance. Well, we ain't got much of a one, Carl, but... It's hopeless, Dave. With two partners, though... Two partners? You reckon on pulling out, Carl? I say we cut cards for it, Mitch. Low man drops out. Break up the partnership? After sticking together all these years? Now, wait a minute, Dave. Wait a minute. Maybe Carl's right. Maybe this could work. Carl, you mean the low man drops out clean? Right now? Right now, Mitch. Other two to take over assets and debts and see if they can get this thing back in the black. Okay, Carl. Get the cards out. Dave? Well, that's what you guys want. Okay, then. Here's a new deck. Shuffle them, Mitch. All shuffled. Cut them, Dave. Go ahead, Mitch. You get first pick. Spread them if you like. Here goes. Ah, six. Your turn, Dave. Okay. Nine of clubs. Hey, lucky guy, Dave. That puts you in uh, whatever Carl pulls. I'll pull it fast. There she is. Denise. Sorry, Mitch. That leaves you elected. Well, Mitch, I'm sorry, too. I guess we all had a fair whack at it, but... Uh... Hey, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Let me see that ace again, Carl. Easy, Mitch. I said I was sorry, Look, but... Look, Dave. Yeah, what is it, Mitch? All the aces are marked. <laughs> Carl, I'm going to cram this dick right down your crooked throat. Oh, Look out, Mitch. He's got a knife. Right. Sure. Oh. Carl, you... All right. I've cut him for keeps. What do we do now? What do we do? Look, Carl, I, I didn't mark those cards. I, I didn't kill Mitch. And what's more... Shut I... up, Dave. We're both in and out now. Come on. Let's get out of here. Now what, Carl? Look, Dave. This is where we split up. Two men together, easy to trace. You head one way, I go the other. Yeah, but the door, I... I got no money. Here, I'll split up the 6,000. This is your head. Here, stick the envelope in your pocket. Now, grab that freight. Get set. I'll catch the next one going the other way. Get going, Dave! That's how it was, Mr. Wolf. It all happened so fast that I... Mm, this man you call Carl, <laughs> he would seem to be one of the world's choice creatures, Mr. Gaffrey. When I thought to look in that envelope he gave me, I found $40 and a few folds of wrapping paper in it. I was mad enough to... Well, I got off the freight and intended to go back, but... 
Then I picked up a paper. And read all about the murder of your friend Mitch with the statement that Carl had accused you of the crime and that the police believed him in view of your escape. That's it. Classical, but not at all original. Well, I was young then and stupid. And I'd had those drinks to start with. And you spent the intervening years hunting down the man Carl, am I correct? Yeah. I tramped the country from east to west, from north to south. Tramped it for years, searching for him. And yesterday, I located him. He's a big wheel these days up on that 37th floor of his. But tomorrow, when I get... Yes, to... Mr. Caffrey, the 37th floor of... Never mind what building. Now, wait a minute, Caffrey. If you expect Mr. Wolf to help you... I you... don't want him to help me. I'll help myself. But if I slip off, I know Wolf's reputation well enough to know that he'll never rest till this, this rotten, chiseling murderer is sitting in the chair. That's why I've come here. Just to provide a backstop in case my dear friend of long ago manages to get the best of me. How will we know? You see this envelope? Read what it says. Nero Wolf, 601 West 35th Street, New York. Delivered to him in case of my death. That's right. And this envelope was $500. Nearly all I've got in the world. Along with it, the full details on that knife. Real names, dates. The proof you'll need in case I don't finish it up. Go on. Tonight, Mr. Wolf. I'm going to give this envelope to the manager of the hotel where I'm stopping. I'm calling on, well, Carl. Tomorrow at noon, right after his secretary goes to lunch. If I'm not back in my hotel at one o'clock tomorrow afternoon, the hotel manager will deliver this envelope to you. Is that clear? Perfectly. But you don't think I'm going to allow you to go through with this wire plan, do you? You can't stop me. And don't have Goodwin follow me. I'd lose him in two blocks. Good night. Shall I try to tail him, boss? No use, Archie. Get Inspector Kramer on the phone at once. I want the police to help us head off this murder. Nero Wolf speaking. It's Archie. I'm calling from the morgue. And? They found Caffrey's body in a subway washroom, mugged and stabbed. Wallet gone, pockets cleaned out, no envelope. Just two hours ago, he was here. No envelope, eh? Gone. Witnesses? None so far. Homicide's calling it straight mugging and robbery. As it well might look, except for... Except for a guy named Carl. How much do I tell Kramer? All of it. I the inspector to start queries throughout the South on the original killing. The original killing? Look... It's our best chance of getting a description of the man called Carl. The original killing and the partnership. Starting from, say, eight years ago and working back to the middle 20s. Tell him to concentrate on towns on railway lines. Putting out pictures of Caffrey and... Pictures and dentistry. Fingerprints to Washington. Kramer will know. And if I come across a haystack, do I keep my eye out for needles? We are going to find Carl, Archie. We are going to find him if it takes him now till doomsday. Mr. Wolf, let's face it, we're licked. Lake Archie? Three days now. We found Caffrey's hotel here in New York. No traceable phone calls. Not a witness has turned up on that subway washroom party. And Kramer says he's getting nowhere with those answers from the Southland. The original story is bound to come slowly, Archie. We are asking a check on the unsolved killings of a dozen states over a 20-year period. Hmm. And what now? You start trudging, Archie. Trudging? Through office buildings, through 37th floors of many office buildings. You keep trudging till we find him. Oh, now, wait a minute, Mr. Wolf. This is a big city, remember? I might have to go through hundreds of buildings. This morning, Archie, the municipal reference library informed me that there are exactly 34 buildings of 37 floors or higher in Manhattan. Now, when you rule out the United Nations building, hotels Okay, okay. Maybe not so many 37th floors, but lots of offices per floor. Maybe 40 or 50. Call it 30 times 40 and you've still got uh, uh, 1,200 to start with. And you don't know what kind of business, you don't know what Carl's real name is, you don't even know what he looks like. There could be 4,000 men like him. 4,000 affluent men, aren't you? Yeah, well, all right. (laughs) Caffrey said he was in the chips, though. You know, for a guy who'd been bumming around, that could mean anything from 10 grand a year up. Say, wait a minute, that cuts your field to 1,000. 1,000 tall men? Tall? I've been over those notes. Caffrey didn't say he was tall. As plainly as you could ask. Caffrey was almost your height, but he said Mitch stood and looked at me. And then he looked up at Carl. Up, Archie. That makes Carl your height or taller. 
Yeah. Well, maybe Caffrey and Mitch were sitting down, and Carl was, uh... Caffrey told us the three were standing at the time. Check your notes. I've studied them. Okay. Maybe that does cut it down some. Yeah, it's still a lot of citizens that start checking for a southern accent. Don't rely on accent, Archie. Carl has had many years to lose any accent he might have had. Yeah, that's true. And so we narrow it, Archie. A man almost surely tall. A man not using the name he was born with. A man with an unexplained gap in his past. I ought to be able to reach right out and tap him. You go skeptical again, Archie. Well, it's still a pretty big haystack. Let's see if we can't trim it some more. On these building lists I've been going over, I've ruled out for now the members of professions requiring lengthy formal training. Medical men, lawyers, scientists of most kind. Yeah, that's chopping it down. I'll admit that. I'll have further eliminations as we get into it. And I'm putting soil pans on a second list this afternoon. Some of the credit references I'll handle by phone. So I start trudging, huh? You start trudging. And remember, Archie, since you'll probably be operating through secretaries, you're looking for a murderer named Carl. Not for a new set of telephone numbers to brighten your winter. Tall? I don't know what you're peddling, Goodwin, but if my boss put his elevator shoes on and stood on a box, he'd still be down somewhere around my necktie. If he stood on his money, though, <laughs> we'd need a helicopter to get up near his shoelaces. Oh, Miss Jonas, do you mind if I sit down? Why, of course not, Mr. Goodwin. Oh, thanks. You know, I've been in 12 offices on this floor, and you're the first girl who's seen the importance of this survey first crack out of the box. <laughs> well, I'm sort of new here, and, and I try to pay attention. Oh, when... you're not just beautiful. You've got a head on you. Is Mr. McLean in? Well, he's at lunch right now. Lunch? Oh, that reminds me. Know any good restaurants up this way? Well, I was just going to the downstairs drugstore myself. But I wouldn't say Well, that... come on. Put your bonnet on and let's skip the drugstore. <laughs> this meal is on the Executive Resources Survey. Hey, are, boss. The boil down. Tinsley, McLean, Fernandes, Tessero, and Kaplan. All five of them tall. All five a little misty in the background. You and Saul have done well, Archie. Very well. But I'm crossing off Fernandes and Kaplan. Why? The Credit Bureau report clears Fernandes, and Kaplan was on a special war job. The FBI x-rayed his record twice. Leaving J.P. Tinsley, Carson McLean, and Philip Tesro, huh? I'd like to see all three here, Archie. Get them here one way or another. And so you do admit that Tinsley isn't your real name. Mr. Wolf, are you a blackmailer or what? I'm a licensed private investigator, sir. Any disclosure you make will be kept in confidence, provided it doesn't touch on the case I'm engaged on. You haven't said what the case is. I don't intend to. If you prefer to explain this mysterious gap in your background at the district attorney's office... Well, I'm using the name Tinsley because I've got an undivorced first wife out on the coast. We broke up 20 years ago, but uh, she said she'd see to it that I never married again. And if she knew where I was today, well, I, I don't say I'm a saint, but uh, she's a vindictive woman. I see. May I have names, dates, and places starting 1924? I can't quite understand your interest, Mr. Wolf. It's rather complicated, to put it briefly, Mr. McLean. I'm working in the interest of a client. Our people have found this puzzling gap in your background, and I'd appreciate such clarification as you may be able to supply. But I told you, Mr. Goodwin, I was raised and educated in the Orient. Until 32, I was in business with my father in China. Where you say your father died? Died. With the Depression, I returned to New York, started this importing business in a small way, weathered through the early 30s, and I think my bankers can assure you of my standing today. They've done so. Carson, McLean, and company has an excellent credit rating. Thank you, Mr. Wolf. To switch somewhat abruptly, Mr. McLean, would you happen to remember how you spent the evening of the 19th? Of this month? Of this month. Well, I could hardly... Wait. 
You say the 19th. Would that have been on a Tuesday? Yes, it was Tuesday. Well, that simplifies it. I'm nearly always at the office on Tuesday nights dictating the revisions in our weekly wholesalers' lists. Let me see. Yes, I was there on the 19th. Had a tray sent in. Miss Tunis and I worked till just after midnight. Miss Helen Tunis. The secretary, Mr. Goodwin, spoke of. She's been with me for two or three months. Miss Tunis can confirm this dictation on the night of the 19th? Of course. And Mr. Wolfe, your manner is so persuasive that I'd scarcely realize you're asking some extraordinary searching questions. May I ask why in the world you... If you'll indulge me, Mr. McLean, my prying is nearly concluded. You say you were in China until 1932. Mr. Tesro, I'll be brutally frank. We know that your name's not Tesro. And we know that you served a prison term from 34 to 38 for arson. I'd like some straight answers. I didn't say I wouldn't answer your questions. The past can remain your own, provided... Now, look, Mr. Wolfe. I've been going straight for 12 years. And this business of mine is on the level. Now, if this is a shakedown... Or... I'm asking where you were on the night of the 19th. And I'm telling you I stayed in town. I ate alone. And I went to a movie. I caught the 11.35 for Stanford. And that's all there is to it. You're denying that you were ever in business in the South? I was born in the South, but I haven't been back there since I was a kid. What about the arson? I put in four years squaring for that mistake. Let's start again, Mr. Tesro. You say you were in Cincinnati in 1931. Okay, Mr. Wolf. three candidates and we're still on the one-yard line. Our one-yard line. Tesoro McLean Tinsley. No, no, rule out McLean. He gave references enough for those years in China. And with Helen Tunis, he's got the one firm alibi we've laid on to. Caffrey was killed before midnight. With conditions as they are in the Far East, Archie, it would be weeks before cables came back on McLean's claims. Uh, claims? You figure the whole Chinese background's a fake? I want you to see Miss Tunis again, Archie. Taking all precautions for her safety. And this is one time I give you permission to ply her with all the attentions you can contrive. <laughs> Are we far enough to pull tails on any of these three? I've got Saul Panza on Tesro. And Saul promised to have men on Tinsley and McLean. Pictures of the three have gone to Kramer for circulation in the south. No. Oh, no answer yet from the coast on Tinsley, huh? Not yet. For the moment, Archie, you'll concentrate on Helen Tunis. Helen, I've got to see you tonight. I'd love to, Archie, Now, look, but... Helen, I phoned you to come out in the car this way because I didn't want McLean to know we're talking. Do you still say you got that new mink coat on your own money? Mr. Goodwin, I don't know what right you Helen, have Helen, if you to... get five guys to buy your stuff, it's your business, Mr. But... McLean said his wife might be sent detectives around. But you can go right back to your old Mrs. McLean and tell easy, her that I... Easy, Helen, easy. He was dictating to me. You know, baby, the harder you lie, the prettier you look. <laughs> but if this is a fake alibi and if you keep propping it up, you're going to find yourself in trouble. Bad trouble. Now, how about it? Do I see you at your apartment tonight, or would you rather come down with me to Nero Wolf's right now? Archie, I... All right. I can't go with you now, and I've got a dinner date with my aunt tonight that I can't break, but I'll try to be back at my apartment by 11. Archie! Nero Wolf speaking. This is Archie, Mr. Wolf. I'm at Helen Tunis' apartment. Well? They could cut my throat for not making her come with me this afternoon. Trouble? Not for her anymore, poor kid. I got here three minutes ago and found her strangled. Couldn't have happened more than half an hour ago. McLean. McLean. Didn't Saul Panzer say he was getting a tail on him? He was a new man and he lost him. I should have left you on McLean, Archie. Yeah, we were both wrong. What do you want me to do? Phone the police immediately. This is 32nd Street. I'm only three blocks in a job from the office. What if I come back and call from there? Come back, then. I'll phone Kramer myself. Mr. Wolf, I'm still kicking myself for that. Look out, Archie. Too late, Mr. Wolf. Keep coming right in, Goodwin. With your hands up. No, I wouldn't try that. McLean. And keep your hand out of that desk drawer, Wolf. This time you're too late, McLean. My hand's in the drawer, and I think I'll leave it there. You don't think I'd shoot? I'm sure you would. But you've got two of us to cover now. 
No, Archie, don't try to draw yet. How'd you get in here, McLean? He surprised me after making his way in through the area way below, and of course, it had to be Fritz's night out. I caught your fat friend just two seconds before he could get in his call to the police, Goodwin. I overheard his talk with you from the hallway here. My apologies for not crying out sooner, Archie. Get your hand out of that drawer. Pull it out without the gun, Wolf, or I'll let you have it now. I refuse to, McLean. Seems obvious that you mean to kill us in any case. I'm afraid that's true, Wolf. When you called me here and Goodwin started making dates with Helen Tunis... Poor kid, I told her not to talk to you. She didn't, Goodwin. I've been scared of you and Wolf since I followed Colby here that first night. Colby? You knew him as Caffrey. I caught up with him afterward in that subway washroom. No, keep that hand up and watch that gun of yours, Wolf. When I found that envelope on him and read the letter to you contained in it, I knew he hadn't spilled the whole South Carolina story to you. South Carolina? Would the original knifing have been taking place anywhere near Hampton or Jasper Counties? Hampton County. But our business is over the line in Georgia. It doesn't matter now. Uh, pity, Archie. We learned this afternoon that we were growing warm on South Carolina. Mr. McLean, may I ask what you hope to achieve by this insane project of disposing of Mr. Goodwin and myself? I'm buying time, Wolf. I have 90,000 in small bills in that bag there, plus a plane ticket to Buenos Aires. I've got a silencer on this gun. If you two aren't found till tomorrow morning, I'll be out of the country before they start looking for me. You don't think the police will put out an alarm for you when they find the body of Helen Tunis? Goodwin left it to you to report that, remember? Let's remind ourselves to be prompter on reporting deaths, Archie. Starting with our own, Mr. Wolf. Glad you can take it that way, Goodwin. You actually think you can knock the two of us off? I'm about to find out, Goodwin. One moment, McLean. You've never been a real gambler. You know that. With marked cards, of course. But you're not the man to face a sure loss now. A sure loss? The loss of your life. Within seconds after you try to pull that trigger. I told you I had a silencer. You think anyone will hear the shots? There will be more shots than you count on. My hand's on a pistol now in this drawer, and Mr. Goodwin has a thirty-eight in his shoulder holster. You can't shoot through the desk. And Goodwin won't get a chance to draw. You're an intelligent man, McLean. Vicious, but intelligent. May I describe the certainty of your immediate death if you don't throw that pistol on the desk and give yourself up? There are two of you, I know that, but... McLean, you must be aware that in the actual fact, exceedingly few men are killed instantly by a single shot, even from a pistol of heavy caliber. The one you hold is a thirty-two, And it's a forty-five in that drawer, McLean. I assure you, McLean, that neither of us will surrender the weapons we have. Should you start shooting, we'll both do our best to draw and keep firing till you're dead. You're stalling, Wolf. What have I got to lose by trying for you both now? Your life? I'll correct that. The loss of some six or eight weeks of your life, possibly months. Whatever the time necessary to bring you to trial and to convict you and execute you for the murders you've committed. Suppose I cancel you out. And then take my chances with Goodwin. A better choice, but still a dubious one. I am fat, exceedingly fat. And for perhaps the first time in my life, I'm thoroughly grateful for that. My bulk affects the calculation, McLean. McLean, you could pull off all seven shots and still not hit Mr. Wolf where it counts. You have to start, you better start on me. You exaggerate, Archie, and I thank you for the gallantry of it. No, it's quite likely that with two or three shots, McLean might well dispose of me, but not uh, with your first shot, McLean, and we'll not permit you many more than your first. Look, if I promise to do no more than tie you two up to give me my head start, will you toss in your guns? Of course not. Do I speak for us both, Archie? Check. I say let's start it now. Uh, Wolf, if I give you half of what's in that bag, would you forget these admissions I've made and help on my defense? I've told you I refuse to bargain. I think that I should count five. If your weapon hasn't been tossed on the desk by then, I'll do my best to get my pistol into action. Are you in accord, Archie? Start counting. Wait a minute, Mr. Wolf. One. If I trade half that bag for no shooting and one hour's start, no tying up, just your promise that... Two. All the bag for a half hour's start. Ninety thousand. Three. Are you ready, Archie? All set, sir. Uh, Except if you're the one who walks out of this, call up every number in my little red book, huh? 
And tell each girl I was thinking of her just before you got the five. Agreed. I resume four. Okay. You win. Holy sweet Susan, it worked, it worked. Uh, Commander Bourgeois, McLean, for us at least. You see, I'm afraid I forgot to mention one slight factor which might have operated in your favor. What's that, boss? I must confess, Archie, that my forty-five is in the upstairs den where I took it to oil it last night. Holy cow, you didn't have a gun? Why, you dirty... Take it easy, I... McLean, I've really got one. Oh, by the way, Mr. Wolf, <laughs> signal's off on those women, huh? When my heart gets back down out of my throat, I'll call him myself. I'll trouble you for a beer first, Archie. And then if you'll be good enough to phone Inspector Kramer, you can bid him pick up his triple murderer. The one-time cutter of cards. Fortunately for us, who's never been a real gambler. <laughs> ah, have been listening to The New Adventures of Nero Wolf, starring Sidney Greenstreet. Tonight's transcribed story was based on the characters created by Rex Stout. This is an Edwin Fadiman program produced and directed by J. Donald Wilson. In the cast were Gerald Moore as Archie Goodwin and Lorraine Carter, Bill Johnstone, Howard McNear, Herb Butterfield, and Vic Rodman. Next week, at this same time, Nero Wolf and Archie will bring you The Case of the Phantom Fingers. Don Stanley speaking. <laughs> Here's Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, private detective. It's five o'clock in New York City, and the big neon signs light up the dark office that overlooks Broadway on the corner of 53rd Street. Behind a second-hand mahogany desk, relaxing in a swivel chair, is the leading figure of the Diamond Detective Agency, combination stockholder, office boy, and clue chaser. He is Richard Diamond, and his mind is on a lovely redhead named Helen Asher, as she sits on a couch talking about things he likes to hear. At this moment, however, another scene is taking place in the wealthy district of Long Island. A long black convertible is just pulling up to an old English mansion, and a curvaceous blonde steps from the car. She is met at the door by her brother. Well, good evening, my dear sister. You're looking simply ravishing. How would you know the difference? Oh, drop dead. You disgusting excuse for a man. Why don't you sober up for five minutes and take a look at yourself? I did once. Oh, by the way, our dear stepfather would like to see you in the study. Tell him to go. I to... already did. Now it's your turn. I don't want to. Now get out of my way, Chris. Mm, suit yourself. But Murray Lang's in there with him. Murray? Hmm. Did I start your heart going pity pat? Oh, shut up. <laughs> you better go in and protect your money, darling. My jailbird. Sot. I don't care what your plans are. They concern my daughter, and that's enough for me to put a stop to. You're not going to put a stop to anything. You can't intimidate me, Lang. You're just a cheap, no good gangster, and your methods are too well known to frighten me. Come in. Oh, hello, Liz. Hello, Murray. I'm glad you're here, Elizabeth. Mr. Lang and I were just discussing your future. I'm surprised you put up with it this long, Murray. Come on, let's leave my dear stepfather until he simmers down. Elizabeth, I want to talk to you. Well, I don't want to talk to you. Let's go, Murray. Listen to what he has to say. Maybe you'll get a laugh out of it. Well, what is it? I've just been talking with Lang about your intention to marry him. I have advised him that if such a thing were to take place, it would result in the most serious of consequences. Is that all? No, that is not all. When you got into your trouble with the police, my dear stepdaughter, you were paroled in my custody. If I should report to the board that you had violated the terms of your probation, you would most certainly go to prison. Why, you... What's the matter? Aren't you satisfied with the salary you collect for taking care of Mother's estate? How dare you, you little... Sit down. <laughs> you look bigger behind a desk. Well, just yell and scream all you want to. After Monday, you better start looking for another source of income. You know very well it's not the money. 
but your greasy boyfriend here would certainly like to get his hands on it. Look, you, I don't give a hang if you are a midget. I'm not going to stand here and listen to you. Laurie. No, baby, I won't take it. I'll wring his scrawny little neck. Go on, lad, go on. It would give me the greatest of pleasure to call the police and have you locked up. I'll fix it so you won't have a head to call anyone with. Laurie, leave him alone. Can't you see that's what he wants? Yes, well, Mr. Lang. Come on, Liz, let's get some fresh air. I want to say one more thing. Just remember, Father, my probation expires Monday. After that, you won't control any part of my income, so you better start getting packed. And if I report you to the probation board in the morning... I wouldn't. If you do that, you'll not only stop being my guardian, but you'll stop breathing. Get out. Get out, both of you. Come on, Mary. Try to intimidate me. I'll make them both sorry. Detective. Detectives. Private detectives, yes, yes. Ah, here's one. Full page ad must be doing very well. Richard Diamond, private detective. If you've got a case, share it with me. Richard Diamond. Seven, seven, eight, eight. Yeah? Mr. Diamond? That's right. I want to hire you for a few days. Oh, you saw the ad. Well, it just so happens I'm available. I can't tell you much over the phone, too many extensions in the house, but it's about my daughter. I'm afraid she's going to get herself into some serious trouble. Well, how old is she? Twenty. Tell her to wait a year. My name is Chase, Ralph Chase. I live at 82 Maple Drive, Sands Point. Will you come out this evening? A hundred dollars a day and dibs on the icebox. I'll see you about eight. Goodbye, Mr. Diamond. What was that all about, Rick? Oh, got a job, baby. When do you start? Oh, yes, you're right. No, Rick. You can start it in the morning. You can't break another one tonight. Now, come on, Helen, baby. A job's a job. And a date's a date. I won't let you break this one. Your car downstairs? Yes, but I can drive myself home. Please, Rick. You promised you wouldn't break another one. Keys in it? Yeah, look. I want to hire you to protect me for this evening. Hmm. I've been receiving mysterious phone calls, and I'm in fear of my life. Really? You've got to take the job. Old friends come first. I'll have to get home and shave before I start working. You mean you'll take it? After 12.30. Bye, baby. You beast. Oh, you must be getting tired from driving that big car around all day. Grab a cab, honey. It'll give you some rest. I'll take good care of your car. What? Want a buck for the cab? Huh? No, no. On second thought, you only live about 25 blocks. Walk will do you good. Rick. Deep breathing all the way up Fifth Avenue. Nothing like it. Bye, baby. Oh! On the way to the car, I thought about Helen, the most wonderful girl in the world. Money, looks, but she had one bad fault. She wanted to get married. I got into the big sedan and headed for my apartment. I'd been up late the night before with a blonde singer, and I was feeling tired. Funny how things change. My nights in college were just as busy, but at one o'clock the next afternoon, I was out playing football. I faced facts pretty well, so when I got home, I took a nap. I slept until seven and got up and dressed. I drove Helen's car out to Long Island, and at eight o'clock sharp, I was ringing the doorbell of the Chase Mansion. It was a big house, all right. If they built another one like it, Long Island would sink. Well, to someone at me chamber door. My name's Chris. Boo. Blow your booze some other direction. Your breath would wither a lung. My alcoholic exhalations are composed of the finest ingredients. You must have a weak stomach. Look, if you'll just stagger out of the way, I'd like to see Mr. Chase. Dead or alive? What? Nothing. I was just thinking out loud. Well, go right ahead. And after your talk with my stepfather, you can find me in the bar. <laughs> You'll probably wind up like I am. That's a sweet thought. Where can I find your stepfather? Probably in the library, lying in my money. I left him leaning against the front door, gagging on the fresh air. I wandered down a long hallway and a big sitting room, furnished with enough antiques to make the Metropolitan Museum give up in shame. There was something about the place, a heavy quietness, like a bar of gold in a dark room. The shot had come from up ahead, and I tried a couple of doors before I found the room. Mr. Chase! Mr. Chase! In here! In here! Mr. Chase? Yes, yes. Come in and shut the door. I looked over at Ralph Chase crouching behind a desk. He got up slowly, all five feet of him. 
and I tagged him for a guy who would give a thousand dollars for every inch you could put on his legs. He looked like he could afford to be a mile high. The tall French windows were open at the back of the room, and you could still smell burning cordite. Someone tried to shoot me from the garden. Yeah, I heard the shot. You must be diamond. That's right. Don't you think you better shut the French doors and pull the drapes before someone takes another shot? Yes, yes, very good idea. Uh, you pull the dime, the shade diamond. Hey, you can start earning your money right now. You're a little excited, but I'll start to work. All right. Uh, be careful, he might still be out there. Well, I doubt it. I can't see anyone out here. Oh, he just missed me. You can see where the bullet hit the wall. I jumped and hid behind the desk. Didn't you hear him on the porch? No, he must have stood in the soft grass that surrounds the garden. That's a good ten feet from the house. You're lucky he didn't move in closer. He probably wouldn't have missed. Got any idea who it was? Of course, it was Murray Lang. Murray Lang? The gambler? Yes, do you know him? Well, I used to be on the force. Set him up six years ago on a larceny rap. Then you know what he's like. He was in the house this afternoon. We had an argument and he threatened me. An argument with your daughter? Yes, about my daughter. How'd you know? Well, you told me she was getting herself into trouble. She couldn't have picked a better playmate than Lang to get there with. Father, we heard a shot. Not really. Oh, let's go. He's not dead. My stepchildren, Mr. Diamond. Oh, well, lovely. I'm quite alive, so you can both stop looking so unhappy. Does it show? Come on, sis. Let's find the guy who fired that shot. I want to give him a few pointers. Where's Murray Lang, Miss Chase? Yes, he's the man you want. I'm sure he tried... Don't be absurd. Murray left three hours ago. What are you, a cop? Does it show? You're wearing too much cologne. Come on, Chris. <laughs> oh, she's nice. That's Elizabeth. The boy's her brother, Chris. I'd hate to draw straws. I married their mother and raised those two brats after she died. The courts appointed me executor of this state. They don't like you handling their money, is that it? Yes. Since they've been old enough to ask for 50 cents to go to a movie, they've condemned me for watching their interests. You, uh, you said you were worried about your stepdaughter. Tell me about it. I'll make it brief. Hate long explanations. Elizabeth got into some trouble with the police. Hit and run. She had been drinking. The man died. Liz was sentenced to a year in Folsom. But I got her off on probation. Oh, what do you want me to do? Drive around with her and spoil her aim? Monday the probation expires. She says she is then going to marry this hoodlum, Murray Lang. And you don't want that because you think he's after her money? Exactly. When she marries, the will reads that I shall, as executor, turn over half of the estate to Elizabeth. What about Christopher? He looked irresponsible when he was born. His mother left instructions that he should not receive his share until he is 35. That's another eight years. Well, your uh, stepdaughter's old enough to know what she's doing. I can't see how you can stop her. That's what I want you to do. And if I do, you'd be in a pretty good spot. What do you mean, Mr. Diamond? You continue as executor. I can understand you thinking something like that, but believe me, as much as I dislike my stepchildren, I wish to keep them in line for their late mother's sake. Oh. Well, Mr. Chase, I'll, I'll take a look around outside. Maybe I can come up with something that'll point out the would-be killer. If it was Lang, you can stop worrying uh, about Elizabeth. Sing Sing doesn't boast a wedding chapel. I went out through the French doors and started looking around on the soft grass that bordered the garden. I had a fat hunch, so I stopped looking and started wandering. I was halfway through the rose bed when I spotted them. It was Elizabeth and a man. In the darkness, I couldn't make him out, but Murray Lang was my best guess. They went up a narrow path to one of those Chinese pagodas at the far end of the garden. And I stepped up close enough to give my ears a workout. It was Lang, all right. I don't care what you think. I didn't take a shot at the old man. Then who did? He's got a policeman in there now, and he's going to start trouble. Let him. I'm clean. If it was that lushed-up brother of yours... Chris hates him, but he'd never try to kill him. Well, then stop hounding me. Maybe you took a shot at the old boy. Murray! Well, you got a good reason. I'm tired trying to buck the whole Chase household. If you love me, let's take off tonight and get married. Tell the old man to go to the devil. You can certainly wait till Monday. Yeah, but he won't. He's going to cause some kind of trouble and get you tossed into Folsom. He's not going to give up all that money just because you're through with your probation. He probably cooked up that shooting to, just to get the cops here. Oh, Murray, what's going to happen to us? Oh, ask your stepfather. He's been doing your thinking for you. I don't have to. We'll get married Monday. Okay. I'm staying clear of this place till then. But what if there's more trouble? I haven't got anyone to turn to. You worry about it, baby. I got a police record that makes yours look like a merit badge. I was too good a target in the moonlight, so I started back up the walk to the house. As I passed a hedge, I noticed a funny-looking plant that was shoving its way out of the foliage. I'm sorry I did that. It was the Johnny Jump-Up variety. Black... <laughs> The guy on the other end of the sap gave it to me right over the eyes, and I went down like a crapshooter making a pass. 
I rolled over and watched the moon melt and run down in my eyes. Something warm and sticky spread over my face and turned the night red. Yeah, I was bleeding again. I guess I showed signs of recovering, so he started all over. This time, he used his foot in my side. Oh. Oh. Oh, a couple more kicks in the ribs and in the right place, and he could have whipped up a fast course of Nola. I felt tired, so I rolled up in an old rose bush and went to sleep. When you finally start coming around, it's like swimming your way out of an acre of mud. If you've taken enough beatings before, you diagnose things in a hurry. The pain in your head is where you got sapped. The ache in your ribs is where he booted you. And the thought in your mind is, oh, it's something about an eye for an eye if you've got one left. I sat up slowly and looked around. No one in sight. My watch said 10 o'clock. I'd been out for an hour, and I was feeling lonely until I started to get up. I made it to one knee and looked down at the best reason I could think of for staying home nights. It was Murray Lang, and you couldn't blame him for staring. He wasn't impolite, just dead. Something on the walk beside him gleamed in the moonlight. I took out my handkerchief and scooped it up. It was a little nickel-plated 32. You could still smell the fresh powder in the barrel. I put it in my pocket and stumbled back to the house. Chris opened the door. Well, you shouldn't drink so much. I never get so loaded I look like that. Well, try it sometime. It might be an improvement. Boo. I... I told you once before not to do that. Now tell me, where were you ten minutes ago? I was in the bar. Who was with you? Red and green midgets. Now let go of my collar. Okay. Where's the phone? In the hall. Hey, what's going on? Who beat you up? Nobody. I always bleed like this on warm nights. Huh? Big pores. Oh. Homicide, Sergeant Otis talking. Who taught you how? Did you sit up nights with a parrot? Oh, very funny. Only one guy could think up a lousy joke like that. What do you want, Diamond? A picture of you. I'm going to show some doctors that mercy killing has its points. Now, let me speak to the lieutenant. Comic. Homicide, Lieutenant Levinson. Hello, Walt. This is Diamond. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Let me get the bicarbonate. What's the matter? I get stomach trouble every time you call. Go ahead. All right. I got a killing for you. I know it. I know it. Why can't you be a good boy and stop finding corpses? I'm out at Sands Point, 82 Maple Drive. I think I've got the murder weapon in my pocket. Who's dead? An old friend, Murray Lang, and you better step on it. There's a drunk staggering around the place, and he's allowed to spot the body and put it in the cold shower to sober it up. Oh, all right, we'll be right out. Hold the fort. So Mr. Lang's dead. Hmm? You better stop sneaking up on people, Buster. And you'd better stop telling me what to do in my own house, Mr. Diamond. You sobered up pretty quick. I heard what you said about finding the murder weapon. May I see it? No. It stays in my pocket until homicide gets here. Whose gun is it? It's a 40-pound broadsword. Now, stop trying to look like a Chicago muscle man or I'll start slapping you... Oh, there you... you are, Diamond. I've been looking for you. I... Scott, what happened to your face? Someone was giving away hints. Chris, did you have something to do with this? <laughs> Hardly. Mr. Diamond has a decided advantage over me. He has muscles. I'll be in the bar. What's happened? Where's Elizabeth? I don't know, but her boyfriend's got troubles. He, he can't explain the hole in this chest. Lang, what do you mean? He's out in the garden. Someone shot him. Is he dead? Well, if he's not, he's trying awful hard. Then we'd better call the police. That's been taken care of. What kind of a gun do you own, Mr. Chase? You don't see... No, I don't. I just dig around till I come up with something. What kind of a gun do you own? Why, you're 45... Now, wait a minute, Diamond. If you've got any ideas about this murder, you'd better wait until the police get here. Now, look, Chase, I've been insulted in your house, had the air let out of my ego by your beautiful stepdaughter, and beat up in your garden. That's a full night's work, and now I'm on my own time. Where can I find Elizabeth? I don't know. She may be up in her room. Oh, where is it? End of the hall, head of the stairs, first door. Thanks. It's beginning to rain. What about Lang's body? Well, if he catches cold, call me. I went down the long hallway to the foot of a massive staircase. The only light was the one burning in the room I just left. I looked over at my sh over my shoulder and saw Mr. Chase framed in its dim glow watching me. In that moment, I thought who Chase reminded me of. A triangle hat, his hand in his vest, and Napoleon had a twin. 
I went up the stairs two at a time. Yes? Pardon me for barging in, but some guy in the garden just beat all the bashfulness out of me. How dare you? You get out of my room. You better put on something a little warmer, honey. That thing would start a Harry Carey epidemic in Boston. What do you want? Yeah. What did you do after Lang left you in the garden? What? Big ears. I overheard everything you said. I see someone pushed your face around. It's an improvement. Did Murray catch you eavesdropping? Well, if he did, he won't have much time to gloat. What do you mean? If you've done anything to Murray... Aren't you getting ready for bed a little early? I don't know what you want. I don't have to answer any of your ridiculous questions. Now, if you don't turn around and get out of here... What's the matter, baby? The drawer empty? Hmm. Lose something? No. Maybe this is it. Where did you get that gun? It was lying in the garden beside your boyfriend's body. Beside it? That's it, lover. Now sit down and relax. Is Murray dead? Like Jimmy Fiddler's gossip column. Didn't you hear anything after Murray left you? Oh, no. I was crying. I ran back to the house and came up here. Is there another way back to the house besides the path that Murray took? It's one that leads to those outside doors. I... I came right to my room. Please leave me alone. This is your gun, isn't it? Yes, but I didn't do it. I didn't. Murray and I were going to be married Monday. Ballistics will probably show it's the one that did the job. You better tell me everything you know. I don't know anything. I didn't shoot Murray. Someone stole my gun from the drawer. Oh, please find out who did it. If they hold me, I'll go to prison anyway. Please, Mr. Diamond, please. It's going to be tough if this is the gun. I'm pretty sure it is. You could still smell the powder when I... The powder... What's the matter, Mr. Diamond? Huh? Oh. Oh, nothing, nothing. Look, uh, you stay in your room. Maybe I can do you some good. I promise you'll stay here. Sure. I'm not going anyplace. Ah, and try and snap out of it. Sometimes you keep losing until there's nothing left to play with. It breaks the jinx. I went downstairs and started looking for Chase. As I passed the doors leading to the garden, I stopped cold flash of lightning turned the garden flat white. Someone was standing over what was left of Murray Lang. Well, like the view? Oh, oh, Diamond. I was just looking at the body. I talked with your daughter. She says the gun that killed Lang was hers. What? Claims they had an argument, but won't admit she shot him. Oh, no, I can't believe it. Certainly she had no reason, unless... Unless what? Well, unless she found out Lang was just after her money. Well, that's, uh, that's possible. Anyway, if she did do it, I still can't figure who worked me over. Maybe it was Lang. You told me yourself he didn't like you. Maybe it was Elizabeth. Oh, no. It would have to be somebody very strong. She might have kicked you, but never could she have hit you hard enough to crack your head open like that. Yeah. Uh, uh, tell me, when does Elizabeth come into her money? Why, at the end of the probation. The court set it aside until she was cleared of all charges. Who gets it if she goes to prison? Well, I'm the sole executor of the estate, but she's not going to jail. She didn't do this thing. I'll get the best counsel in the country. I'm sure you will. Uh, tell me something, Chase. It's pretty obvious that my face got pushed around, but uh, how did you know my ribs got the same treatment? What? It doesn't show. It just hurts. Why, I... Uh... Well, you told me. Uh Uh-uh. What are you getting at, Diamond? You'd have to reach pretty high to sap me, but if you were mad enough, you could make it. This is absurd. I'm going inside. And when I get grouchy, it's better to listen. I'm liable to use you to make the flowers grow. Go ahead, Mr. Diamond. I'm listening. Well, everybody in this house has some sort of motive for killing. With Elizabeth, it could be the old story of a woman scorned. With your lushed-up stepson, he could want to put the blame on his sister so he'd get more than his share of the estate. And we certainly know you stand to profit if Elizabeth goes to prison because you retain custody of the family fortune. I'm getting wet, Mr. Diamond. Everybody's story's weak, but only one of them doesn't stand up. You said earlier this evening someone tried to shoot you from outside your library. Of course they did. You have the shot and saw the bullet hole. That's right, I did. But you told me he was standing outside the room by a good ten feet. Nothing to say, Chase? You're trying to catch me up in something. Oh, you are so right. Now, when I walked into that room, I could still smell burning cordite. To smell fresh gunpowder like that, the gun would have have to have been fired outside the room. You staged it, so I'd think someone was trying to kill you. Is that all, Mr. Diamond? Outside of the slip you made about kicking me in the ribs. Now, let's go inside. I don't think so, Diamond. Oh. Oh, that the forty-five you were telling me about? Yes, 
Go ahead, make a try for it. I'm going to show you how it works. You kill Lang with your stepdaughter's gun and you're going to collect the money if she goes to prison. Oh, you're a slob. My stepdaughter could easily kill two men tonight. Now, you're in a spot. You can't shoot me with that 45 and make it look like the same person killed Lang, too. So you've got to get the 32 in my pocket. Give me Elizabeth's gun, Diamond. You try and get it, Chase. Why, you... Rick! Rick, are you out there? Better give it up, Chase. That's the law. He eats little men like you. Rick! Stay right there, Diamond. Another killing won't matter if you try and stop me. For Pete's sake, if you're out there, Rick, answer me. I'm getting soaked. Just keep your mouth closed, Diamond. I'm getting out of here. You'll never make a chase. They'll pick you up inside of an hour. Not if you're too dead to tell them. Yes, that's it. If I kill you, I'll eat at least have... Look up! You should watch your step, Chase. Keep your head down, Lieutenant. Somebody's mad. Shut up, Otis, and get out from under that bench. Rick! Over here, Walt. What's going on, Rick? Who's doing all the shooting? Oh, he took turns. He was just going to kill me when he tripped over the body of his first victim. I used this 32 in my pocket, shot him twice. He's dead, Lieutenant. Give me my baking soda, Otis. He yelled him. Don't look so unhappy, Rick. He was going to kill you. Oh, I'm not unhappy. I I'm just sore that I didn't have time to take the gun out of my pocket. I ruined a darn good coat. <laughs> The three of us went back in the house and Otis took Christopher up to bed so he could sleep it off. Walt listened to the story as I told it to Elizabeth. She cried a little and thanked me with her eyes. Walt went downstairs to clean things up and I sat by her bed and until she went to sleep. She didn't even wake up when I kissed her goodbye. <laughs> oh, I guess it was better that way. I said goodbye to Walt and Otis and headed for 975 Park Avenue. I was late. My face could use a mile of bandage. I hoped Helen wouldn't mind. Yes? Oh, my goodness. Hello, Francis. Tell Miss Asher I brought a car back. Oh, how bad a wreck was it, sir? Give me a glass with a backbone, will you, Francis? Yes, sir. Right away, sir. And Miss Asher's in the study. Ah, oh, thank you. Goodness. Thank you. Hi. Well, it's about... Oh, Rick, not again. Mm-hmm. Your poor little face. Yeah, my poor little face. Well, you just stretch out on the couch and I'll get you a nice tall drink. Francis is already on his way. Oh. Feel better? Yeah. Oh, yes. Got a pillow? I'll hold your head up. How's this? Mm-hmm. Like some music to go with it? Sure. Turn on the radio. You comfortable? Mm-hmm. How about you? Uh-huh. That music sounds like San Francisco. Remember the top of the mark? Yeah, <laughs> fun too. Mind if I turn off the light? The glow from the fire is enough. You're cute. Better? Much. The snow is snowing, the wind is blowing, but I can weather the storm. Why do I care how much it may storm? I've got my love to keep me warm. Mm -hmm. Me. I can't remember. A worse December Just watch those icicles fall What do I care if icicles fall I've got my love to keep me warm I like your singing, too Off with my overcoat Off with my glove I need no overcoat I'm burning with love, my heart's on fire, the flame grows higher, so I will weather the storm. Why do I care how much it may storm? I've got my love to keep me warm. Oh, that was nice. Hey, why did you turn the radio on? This is nicer. Come here, Rick. Oh, honey. Honey, you're reading my mind. Here's your drink, Mr. Diamond. Oh, my 
goodness. You have just heard the fourth of a new series, Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Helen was played by Virginia Gregg, Lieutenant Levinson by Ed Begley. Also in our cast were Wilms Herbert, Betty Moran, Jay Novello, Jack Edwards, and Tal Avery. Music was under the direction of David Baskerville. Richard Diamond is written by Blake Edwards and directed by William P. Rousseau. Even here in America, we're liable to have a few misconceptions about freedom. Many of us regard it as an outright gift with no strings attached. Well, that isn't quite so. All of us have received a heritage of liberty, a legacy of freedom forged in other days. Remember that the liberty you enjoy is a precious legacy, a legacy that can be lost through disuse. Don't ignore freedom, work at it. For freedom is everybody's job. Now this is Eddie King inviting you to be with us again at the same time next week when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. This program has come to you from Hollywood. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. The national broadcasting company presents Joel McRae in Tales of the Texas Rangers. Tonight, transcribed from Hollywood, another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Texas, more than 260,000 square miles. And 50 men who make up the most famous and oldest law enforcement body in North America. of the Texas Rangers come these stories based on fact. Only names, dates, and places are fictitious for obvious reasons. The events themselves are a matter of record. Case for tonight, Dead Giveaway. It is 1.30 a.m. December 4th, 1945. A single light glows in the living room of a farmhouse four miles from the town of Ashton in West Texas. Inside the house, a frantic young woman tries to place a telephone call. Operator. Operator. Oh, please. Operator. Operator. Get me the sheriff, quickly. Is that you, Mrs. Deneen? Yes, yes. Hurry. Oh, this is Mary Lou, Mrs. Deneen. I'm working nice now. Yes, I'm Mary Lou, stop talking and get me the sheriff. Oh, all right. Sheriff Ross speaking. Sheriff, this is Mrs. Deneen. You've got to come out to my house right away. Right away. Now take it easy, Mrs. Deneen. What seems to be wrong? Somebody's prowling around outside, trying to get into the house. Isn't your husband there? No. He went to Abilene on business. Something woke me up. And I thought at first it was the baby. And then I heard a noise outside. Mrs. Deneen, what is it? Somebody came in. I'll be right there. It took Sheriff Ross less than 15 minutes to get to the Deneen farm. But Mrs. Deneen and her four-month-old baby were dead when he arrived. The sheriff called for the assistance of the Texas Rangers. Ranger Jace Pearson was assigned. Jace Pearson? Yeah, Sheriff. You got here right quick. Yeah, I was over the next county when your call came through. Well, I hope you got a little sleep, because you won't get much now. Better come in out of this cold. How long ago did it happen? About a half hour ago, 1.30. Mrs. Deneen called me, woke me up at home, said somebody was trying to bust in. 
Right in here, Jace. Shot right through the chest, huh? Yeah. She leave the phone hanging off the hook like that? I reckon so. Whoever broke in, they broke in just before I hung up. Nothing's been touched, Jace. I know. I had a time getting past your deputies down the main road. The phone operator's been buzzing everybody. We don't want half the county barging in here messing things up, so I blocked them all. Good. Where's the baby? In there, the front bedroom. You can look if you want to, Jason. It's a little more than I can take twice. How old? Only four months, Jace. Little girl. Where'd he break in? Side door, I'll show you. Where's the husband? Abilene, on business. I call the chief of police there. He's going to check the hotels and notify him. Now, here's the door. It was wide open. That's how I got in to open the front door. Lock doesn't seem to be broken. Must have been picked. The Neens keep much money around the house? As little or as much as most folks, I guess. But I don't think any's missing. There's Miss Deneen's purse on the kitchen table. The killer couldn't have missed that. You check it? Yeah, about forty dollars in it. It hasn't been touched. Well, it wasn't robbery then, Sheriff. No. There's no sign of any other motive. But there's gotta be one, Jay. Yeah. The toughest motive of all, because it's the easiest hidden. Hate. The kind of hate the devil wouldn't hold. <laughs> through the rest of the house, but we didn't find anything that would help us until we got outside. It's cold tonight, Jace. Ground's frozen hard. Yeah. If we find a trace, it won't be much. Keep your flash close to the ground. All right. Why are you working back of the house here, away from the driveway? Because I think the killer came in from this direction, probably on foot. Why? Why, you said Mrs. Deneen told you she woke up when she heard somebody prowling around outside. Yeah. A horse or a car coming up the gravel road around front would have made even more noise. Woke her up sooner. Say, that's right. I heard your car coming from quite a ways off. That's why I was standing out in front to meet you when you drove hey, up. Wait a minute. What is it, Jace? Piece of bailing wire. Then in the shape of a key. Well, that must about be what he used to get in. Maybe. Or maybe that's what somebody wants us to think. Let's take another look at that door. Yeah. What makes you think the wire was planted there, Jason? I'll tell you better when we try it in the lock. It beats me why a killer'd leave something deliberately. That's what makes me think something's wrong. This wouldn't have been dropped so close to the house. And grab the door and hold it up high. I don't want to mess up any prints around the lock. You got it. Now, let's see how this wire fits. Yeah. Goes in perfect, Jace. Yeah. Watch when I turn it. Yeah. Hey, wire's just twisting. Yeah, it'll keep on twisting. This wire isn't strong enough to turn the tumbler in the lock. Then how did the killer get in, Jace? If you ask me, Sheriff, I think he had a regular key. <laughs> put in a call for a fingerprint crew and the sheriff called to have the bodies picked up for autopsy. Then we went outside and started trailing again. We found a few directional traces, but they petered out in the dark. Can't see anything at night on this ground, Jay. Try cutting back and forth a little further. Yeah, all right. The man we're following was weaving, trying to throw us off. It just makes it tougher to track. You've got to be headed for some place, some definite direction. You might as well establish which direction. Yeah. Guess there's nothing much we can do except this until we have some daylight. Save us an hour in the morning. Then we can track on horses without wasting time finding out which way to go. By sunup, we knew the killer's general direction had been west. The sheriff got his horse from town. I unloaded charcoal from the trailer and we rode. He kept heading west, all right. But there's nothing out this way for miles once he got into those hills up ahead. Any kind of a road between here and the hills? Yeah, old wagon road just beyond the scrub on the rise we're coming to. Does it connect with a state road? It does, but nobody uses it. Maybe somebody did. Is it in good enough condition for a car to run through? Mm, reckon it is. You figure he had a car waiting for him? Had to have a car or a horse staked out someplace. Come on, let's make right for the road. Uh, yeah, yeah, well, yeah. Wagon road lead to any other farm in the area? Used to lead to old Mullen place, but that's burned out. Nobody living there anymore, huh? No, but old folks dead. Young Ted Mullen moved away a couple of years ago. Oh, here's the road. Oh, 
Oh, oh charcoal. Huh? Headed pretty straight last tracks we saw. Must have reached the road right near here. Yeah, we'll find some mark if he crossed it and kept going. Well, he didn't keep going. Huh? Look. Oh. Tire track. Had a car staked out all right. Turned the car around here to head back for the highway. Could have been somebody else waiting in the car for him. Maybe, but I don't think so. Ah, look at the heel marks. Walked around to the driver's side of the car to get in. Yeah. And there's something else here, too. Uh. Dropped this cigarette butt and stepped on it. Yeah. Sure didn't smoke much of it. Didn't even burn down to the brand mark. Well, at least we know what brand he smokes. About all we do know, Jace. Won't be anything to follow at the main road. He sure won't leave a trail there. No. Mount up. Let's get back to the house. <laughs> back to Denise. As we came to the farm, we saw a couple of cars that hadn't been there when we left. Looks like company, Sheriff. The car next to mine belongs to our lab. The others must be the coroner's. Oh, coroner ought to have been and gone by now. Nope, no, that isn't the coroner's car, Jay. Blue sedan, that belongs to Walter Denise. The husband? Yeah, must have got back from Abilene. Yes, yeah, Denise, all right. There he is, sitting on the side porch. Walter Deneen sat with his face buried in his hands until we dismounted and walked up to him. The lab crew was in the house looking for latent prints. Howdy, Walter. Oh, howdy, sir. Walter, I can't tell you how... Don't say anything, please. Ask me anything you like, but I don't want anybody else telling me how sorry they are. Better let me talk to him, sir. Sure, Jason. Mr. Deneen, <laughs> it'd help us a lot to know one thing. You or your family have any enemies? Enemies? Could there be an enemy as bad as this? We know the house wasn't robbed. Have you ever had any trouble with anybody, uh, no matter how small it seemed? Now's the time to remember. If there was anybody, I wouldn't tell you. I'd take care of it myself. That's no way to be, Walter. Don't go telling me how to act, Sheriff. You didn't come home to your house ten minutes ago. You didn't find your wife and kids... <laughs> We have found my... Mr. Dean, why don't you try to get a little rest? We'll talk to you later. Yeah, okay. Anything I can do, Walter, just holler. Yeah. You've been able to think of anybody who might have had it in for him? Not a soul, Jace. Unless it was Ted Mullen. The one you told me about? Family that was burned out? Yeah. But, Jace, that was five years ago. Sometimes hate doesn't die with age. What happened? The old folks just got to brooding and died off after their house burned. Young Ted blamed Walter. Why? Windmill at the Mullen place was busted. They tried to borrow from Walter to get it fixed, but he turned them down. Ted said if the mill had been working, it would have pumped enough water for him to put the fire on. Uh, young Mullen the kind to hold a grudge? Well, after five years, Jace. And he moved out a long time ago. Where? Who knows? Come on. I'll call my headquarters by radio. Maybe they can get a line on Mullen. All right. They find out where he is and won't do any harm to check on where he was I last night. It won't hurt any. But I can't believe that a man after... Hey, hold it, Sheriff. Huh? Well, that's only Walter's car, Jace. What are you looking at? The design of the tire tread. Look at him. Well, that may be. That's the same design we saw on the dirt road where the killer picked up a car to make his getaway. But, Jace, that was hard ground. Could barely see the tread. And tires like that are standard on lots of cars. Yeah, I know. Just the same. I want to look this car over. Left his ignition keys in. You gonna start it? No. Just want to take a look at the dash. He said he got back from Abilene ten minutes ago, didn't he? That's what he said. Take a look at that temperature gauge. Oh, let me see. Register's cold. Yeah. Only it should be pretty warm if he finished the drive a couple of hundred miles just ten minutes ago. Could have dropped back, Jace. Not in ten minutes, Sheriff. It's a cold morning, but not that cold. Well... I want to talk to Deneen again. He... You see something else? I sure do. Look at this on the frame of the door. Service station lubrication sticker. Yeah. Dated December 2nd, day before yesterday. 18,412 miles. The mileage on the dash shows he's driven less than 200 miles since then. He couldn't have been in Abilene. Well, wait a minute, Jace. I admit that looks funny, but... 
The man we were chasing, he ground out a cigarette, remember? Well, what about him? I've known Walter since he was a boy, Jace. He don't smoke. Sheriff! Oh, Mary Lou Simmons, phone operator. Who let you in, Mary Lou? I told the deputy I put Mrs. Neen's call through to you last night. He thought you might want to talk to me. Ain't it just awful? You thought so. I, I was still on the line after you hung up, Sheriff. I heard it all, the shots and everything. You hear any voice beside Mrs. Deneen? No. No, I just heard her say, who are you, what do you want, and then the shots. That was all. You sure she said, who are you? Oh, cross my heart, I heard it as plain. Guess you don't want to talk to Walter now, do you, Jace? No. I guess not. You are listening to Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. And now we continue with tonight's case, Dead Giveaway, an authentic story from the files of the Texas Rangers. I didn't want to question Walter Deneen until I'd had a chance to check on his movements. The sheriff and I drove into town and called the Abilene police. The answer didn't fit. I don't think there's any doubt about who he was, Ranger. Okay, thanks. Thanks very much. Well, guess that does it, Sheriff. Dean was in Abilene, huh? Uh-huh. Checked into the Harris Hotel yesterday about noon. Checked out again at 2.10 this morning, right after the police notified him of the murder. Police could have spoken to anybody on the phone. And they didn't tell him by phone. Police sergeant went up and told him direct. Uh -huh. Description of Walter tallies, too. And yeah, there's something that doesn't tally, though. Mileage on that car. Could be something wrong with the speedometer cable. Happened in my car a few weeks back. Maybe. And I'll be back sometime tomorrow. Where you going, Jace? Abilene. As soon as I hit the highway, I put in a shortwave call to headquarters, station KTXA. Unit 10 to KTXA. KTXA, go ahead, Unit 10. This unit en route to Abilene. Request Abilene police secure names of all contacts made by subject Walter Deneen, registered Harris Hotel, there yesterday. Will do, Unit 10. Unit 10 sent piece of wire back to lab for examination. Any report yet? Not yet. Wire and fingerprints both under study. We'll keep you in call. 10-4, Unit 10, clear. KTXA, Austin. When I reached Abilene, I got a complete rundown on Walter Deneen's activities. It was too complete. Like he was making sure his time in the city would be accounted for. One of the people who'd seen him was his attorney. Why, uh, yes. Yes, Ranger, Mr. Deneen spent several hours with me yesterday afternoon. We had dinner together last night. Went to the theater. What did he come to see you about? Well, some... Investments. He's been doing a little speculating, Cotton. Good or bad? Well, it's client business, and I don't think I have the right to discuss it. I can find out by checking with the exchange. I'm just asking you to save time. All right. His losses have been rather heavy. More than he could afford? Much more. He carry much insurance on his wife and child? A normal amount, nothing large. All right, thanks. One more thing. Are you sure Deneen doesn't benefit financially by his wife's death? Well, Ranger, he couldn't have gotten back to Ashton by 1.30 last night after we'd been out. That isn't what I asked. Well, Mrs. Deneen had a good bit of money in her own right. In case of her death, though, she had it tied up in trust for the child. But the child is dead, too. What happens now? Well... In that case, the entire state will probably go to Mr. Deneen. I made one more stop before I headed back to Ashton. I paid a visit to the garage at the Hotel Harris. I keep the location of all guest cars on this index rack so we'll know which stores they're in when they want them. Was Walter Deneen's car in here yesterday? Deneen? That's, um, D-I-N, isn't it? Uh-huh. 
Oh, there was no record of it. Was he a guest at the hotel? Yes. Is there any parking lot around here he might have used? Not convenient to the hotel, and parking is free here for guests, so I don't think he'd use a lot. Neither do I. Thanks. Before I left Abilene, I called my headquarters. They had a report. No strange prints had been found in Deneen's house. The wire key looked like a plant. I hung up and made another call to Sheriff Ross. I'm beginning to wonder about Walter myself, Chase. Why? He's been kind of curious about where you are. I told him you went to Abilene, just to see if it'd draw him out. Good. How'd he react? Kind of nervous. Then he said something about flying up to Abilene and back. Of course, he never did say he drove it. No, but he gave the impression that he drove. Even so, he was there when the killing took place. Yeah, but the killer had the use of Deneen's car. Can you get your hands on the car? Well, it's over in back of the funeral parlor right now. That's where Deneen said he was going just a few minutes ago when he stopped by to ask about you. Well, grab that car and check it for fingerprints. I'll be there as fast as I can roll. <laughs> Howdy, Jay. Carl worked over, Sheriff? Yeah. Ought to have reports on the prints soon. Send them to Austin. Find any strangers? Quite a few of one set that weren't Deneen's. If they belong to a professional killer, there's a good chance he'll have a record. Where's Deneen? My deputies are out looking for him. Why? I thought he was at the funeral park. So did I, until I went in to look for him after we finished on the car. Undertaker said he'd left more than an hour ago by the front door. Must have spotted you working over the car. Come on, let's find him. Yeah. Not at the house, not any place in town. Where could he be if he hasn't run out? Trying to cover up for a couple of mistakes? He won't run, not yet. Why? Because his alibi is airtight. We can shake it, but unless we find the killer he hired, we can't shake it enough. He took a big gamble, and he's got too much at stake to run off. His wife's money? How'd you know about that? Just thinking back. A little late. Folks knew Mrs. Deneen's family left her well off. Walter married her not long after they passed on. A lot of people thought the money had something to do with it. I wish you'd remember that sooner. Well, Jace, they seem close. And then there's the baby. The baby was just something extra that got into Neen's way. Oh. Never gotten any of the money of... KTXA to Unit 10. Or maybe a report on the prince. Hmm. Unit 10. Go ahead, KTXA. Have a report on prince lifted from car at Ashton, Texas. One set identified as belonging to Joe Crofton. Joe Crofton? Any line on his whereabouts? Finished serving parole four months ago. Last address known to parole office was shack located west of the slope of Casket Mountain. 10-4, unit 10, clear. KDXA Austin. Crofton must be the killer then, Chase. I'll bet on it. How far to Casket Mountain? About 20 miles, then turn south another five. After that... Well, we'll need horses if he's far up. You should have brought your horse along the trailer with charcoal. I can borrow one. Crofton's going to be tough to take. You sound like you know him. I wrote the ticket for his last trip to Huntsville six years ago. That was murder, too, but he copped out with a manslaughter plea. Better not take any chances, Jason. If he starts shooting, we'll have to toss it back dead center. No. we got to take him alive. He'll talk to keep from burning once we get him. Yeah. Yeah, I see. If Walter Deneen paid him to do the job, he's the only one who can break Deneen's alibi. That's right. So no matter what happens, we got to take him alive. <laughs> Crofton's cabin was up all right. Way up. The sheriff borrowed a horse from the man who directed us. Quite a climb, Jase. Well, not so bad following this marsh, though. Suppose he isn't there. I got a hunch he will be. I don't think Deneen had enough money to pay for this killing. He was almost broke. You mean he planned to pay off out of his wife's money when he got it? Yeah. Uh, wonder how Walter arranged for him to get the car that night. Not much to arrange. Left it near the airport with the keys in it. Crofton brought it back and left it in the same spot. Probably left the house key for him, too. Glove compartment, maybe. Yeah. With the airport 40 miles from Ashton, nobody recognized the car or a strange driver. Come in at night, use an abandoned road. Yeah. Look. Huh? Hey, another horse left tracks in here, too. Yeah. And they're fresh. Ooh. Ooh. Oh, boy. 
It must be Crofton's horse. No. The rider was taking the rough way. Just cut into the wash here to find a better trail. Crofton lives up here. He'd know the best trail. Well, who else would be coming up here? Denis, to shut him up. Come on. Yeah, here, Mark. give off. Not too fast, Jason. We'll spill. You gotta risk it. Too slow, we'll be too late. <laughs> reached the shack and crept up on it. There was no horse around and no sign of life. Tried to draw fire by showing ourselves, but none came. We had to go in. All right. Hold your gun ready, Sheriff. And don't come in till I call you. Right, Jace. All right, Sheriff. Come in. Nobody here, huh? Oh, wait a... Oh... That Crawford? Yeah, that's him. Denine got here first. Jace, this fella looks like he shot himself. Guns in his own hand. Now, what's his paper beside him? Let's see. Jace, he did kill himself. This note says so. Confesses the murders, too. Sure it does. But Walter Denine wrote that. And that note's gonna hang him. How do you know? You ever seen Denine's writing? No, but I've seen Crofton's before. He signed his name with an X. Prison records show he's illiterate. Never could read or write. Come on, Sheriff. Gonna put out a pickup for Denine? We'll pick him up ourselves. He can't be far off. But if he'd headed back down the wash, we'd have passed him on our way up. He must be going across the top of the mountain to go down the other side. Come on. Yeah. We raked our horses as fast as they could move. We spotted a rider ahead of us as he topped the slope. He heard us because he looked back and whipped his mouth and disappeared. He knows we're on him. Got about 300 yards. We'll get him. Keep pounding leather. Yeah. We're coming to the top now. Keep low in the saddle. Watch out for an ambush. There he is. Don't go down too fast, Sheriff. Your horse will come to the down grade. The knee was pressing too hard, Jay. He fell. Look. Yeah, he scrambled behind the rocks. Whoa, whoa, charcoal. Come on, Sheriff. Whoa. Oh. Hit the dirt. <laughs> Let your mouth go. Go on, Charlie. Go on. He's down under that rock shelf. Perfect cover. Not too perfect. Bullets will ricochet back from that ledge behind him. See that dent in the ledge? Yeah. Draw your gun and we'll empty it on him. Hit right below the dent. Hi. All right. Let's hope for a billiard shot. Start firing. <laughs> And I was sorry for you, Walter, up until a few hours ago. You gotta get me to a doctor. You're not hurt badly. We'll get you to a doctor. All I want to know is how you met Crofton. Come on, Walter, talk up. I, I, I saw his picture on the paper when he got out of jail. I, I made a deal with him a couple of months ago. Yeah. A deal to wipe out your own wife and kid. Must be great to be as brave as you are. Get up, Deneen. You've got a long way to go. Walter Deneen confessed and made a plea for clemency. It was not granted. And on the 11th day of October 1947, he died in the electric chair at Huntsville. And now, here again is the star of our show, Joel McRae, with another interesting anecdote about the Texas Rangers. When the Allies invaded Normandy in World War II, they got an idea as to how far the fame of the Texas Rangers had spread. Both surrendering Nazis and liberated free French said they knew the war was as good as over because the Texas Rangers had landed. Of course, it was the heroic American Ranger troops who made the landings. 
But nothing could convince the Nazi war prisoners that these were not the terrible Texans they'd heard about in many American legends. Good night, folks. See you same time next week. Next week, Joel McRae in another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Joel McRae is currently seen starring in the Universal International Technicolor production, Saddle Tramp. Tonight's cast included Tony Barrett, Lorene Tuttle, Mike Barrett, Hal March, and Paul Freese. This story was transcribed and adapted by Joel Murcott, and the program was produced and directed by Stacy Keach. This is Hal Gibney speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for Edmund O'Brien as... Johnny Dollar. Oh, oh yes. Is this Inspector Saylor, Scotland Yard? Oh, yes, Inspector. Thanks for calling back. I understand you've been assigned to Scott Jewel theft investigation? Yes. Inspector Finley has been taken ill. I was given the case this morning. As a matter of fact, I just received the file with your request to telephone. Well, that puts us about abreast then, Inspector. I got in from the States last night. I'd like to get together with you so we could compare notes. Yes, plenty. Uh... Could you come to my office? At your convenience. Well, then, uh, why don't you come right over? But first, Mr. Dollar, tell me. Did the insurance company send you to London in the belief that the yard is no longer competent? What? We've been reminded, you know, that our reputation has fallen off badly since the stone of scorn has stolen. But perhaps you and I shall have better luck, huh? Edmund O'Brien in a transcribed adventure of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office Financial Surety Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Hatchet House theft matter. Expense account item one, $432.50, airfare and incidentals between Hartford and London, England. I arrived in the evening and learned by phone that the original inspector assigned to the case had been replaced. The next morning, I was in contact with his replacement, and at 10.30, I was directed to his office. Here we are, sir. Inspector Sailors? Yeah? Mr. Dollar, sir. Oh, yes. Come in, Mr. Dollar. Thanks very much. All right, you are, sir. Ah, pleasure, Mr. Dollar. How do you do, Inspector? Yeah. I, uh, speaking to an acquaintance of yours a few moments ago. Inspector Finch? Oh, yes. Yes, I worked on a case with him over here last year. How is he? Oh, quite well, thank you. He complimented you quite highly, sir. Well, that's very nice of him. But as I remember it, I think I was more of a burden than a help to him. Yeah, I doubt that. Well, I suppose we should face the situation at hand. Yeah. I uh, brought an accurate description of all the jewelry insured by Mrs. Scott. Ah, splendid. But the cable that reported the theft wasn't quite clear as to which pieces were missing. Mm -hmm. Inspector Finley's information on that score is quite accurate, I think. There we are. Oh, thank you. And he's covered the methods used in the commission of the crime quite thoroughly, I think. I'm going to spend the afternoon in crime index. I should probably be able to link the method with a few of our known criminals. Gentleman's investigation, huh? <laughs> I suppose so. Rather tedious, but quite often successful. I'd like to see Mrs. Scott myself, if it's all right with you. Of course. I shall arrange a car and a driver for you. Will uh, early afternoon be suitable? Well, thanks, but there's no reason to go to that bother, is there? Isn't she staying here in London? No, she left a place near Seven Oaks in Surrey. About 20 miles south of here. Quite an historic establishment, I'm told. It's called Hatchet House. Before I left London that afternoon, Inspector Sailors and I pulled the few facts we had. I was able to tell him that Mrs. Marcella Scott, reputedly a wealthy Texas widow, was actually slightly on her uppers as far as ready cash went. She had sold some jewelry the previous year for considerably less than its insured value. He gave me the news that Mrs. Scott frequently had been seen in the company of another American tourist named Norman King. 
And together, we figured the loss at slightly over $100,000. Hatchet House was a medium-sized pile of ivy-draped masonry just on the northern fringe of Seven Oaks. In addition to history, it boasted some seclusion being set back from the road in the middle of a walled garden. Mrs. Scott was in the village, but was expected back momentarily, and would I care to come in and wait? The library is quite comfortable, if you'd care to go in there. In a minute, thanks. Your name is Garrett? Yes, sir. You've been employed here during Mrs. Scott's old stay? Oh, yes, sir. She bought my services from the other side. I'm not without recommendations in Seven Oaks, sir. And you must know pretty well who's been in the house at parties and so on. I'd say so, sir. But they've all been genuine people. Class, you know. I wouldn't say that any of them would stoop to thievery. How many other servants are there? Two that live in. There's Millie Hanky, she's a maid. There's old Mr. Minns, he's the gardener. Uh, he's got a cottage out back. Mrs. Scott was entertaining night before last when the jewelry was stolen. Had she hired any extra servants? No, sir. Oh, uh, thanks, Karen. Oh, uh, there's Millie. Millie, come here, do. Here's an American gentleman to see you. How do you do, sir? You Miss Hanky? Yes, sir. He's come all the way from the other side, Millie, about Mrs. Scott's jewels being stolen. It's a scandal, that's what it is. But I don't suppose you'd say it's the only one. Watch your tongue, Millie. Watching it. I'll be in the pantry, sir, if I can be of any more service to you. Thanks, Garrett. I will want the names of the people who were here the other night. Right, sir. I'll write them on a paper. He's got a nerve telling me to watch my tongue. A scandal's a scandal. Genuine people are not, and he knows it. Just what did you mean, Millie? I suppose a servant's paid to keep her eyes open and her mouth closed. But I haven't been a servant long. I'm only a village girl from Penrith, but I know right from wrong. You don't approve of some of the things? No, I don't. And I'm going to leave when I get married. Maybe next month. Hmm. Congratulations. Thank you, sir. He's a good man. I'm sure of that. So big and strong. Lots of fun. We'll have an inn of our own someday. And I won't have to be a servant anymore. Oh, I wish you a lot of luck. Thank you, sir. I want you to know, Millie, that anything you say to me will be kept in strict confidence. Yes, sir. You look like the honest kind. Now, what things especially didn't you approve of? Something that's caught your eye could be important. I don't know, but one thing. Being a widow at her age, it's indecent, that's what. And I've seen them making jokes in front of the photo of her poor dead husband... He was older, you know. Yes, I knew that. I can't say she hastened his end. But I can't say she's sorry he's buried and gone, either. Who made jokes in front of his photograph? Mr. King. Norman King. He was here the night of the theft, wasn't he? The night of the theft. He's been here more than he's elsewhere. He's a filthy leech, if you ask me. I'm only a country girl, but there's a look in his eyes I didn't mistake. Not for a moment. He's slimy. I wish you'd think about the party night before last, Millie. You were here on the ground floor through most of it, weren't you? Yes, sir, the whole drunken time. Uh, I wish you'd try and remember if anybody went upstairs and stayed long enough to have gone into Mrs. Scott's room and forced open the drawer and stolen the jewelry. I'll try, sir. Don't mistake me. We aren't sure that's what happened. It could just as well have been an outsider who knew a party was going on and had a way of entry, or even somebody passing by who found the rear door unlocked. I'll try, sir. Thanks, Millie. I won't keep you from your work any longer. I'll just wait in the library for Mrs. Scott. I waited an hour until the butler Garrett notified me that Marcella Scott had phoned. She had met some friends in the village, had driven to London with them, and wouldn't return until the next morning. I could find her any time after nine that night at Claridge's Hotel. I spent another 20 minutes with the servants and left for London and Inspector Saylor's office. You to return before this, Mr. Dawson. I hope I didn't keep the car and driver too long. No, not at all. Especially if the time was well spent. Uh, most of it was wasted. While I waited for Mrs. Scott in Hatchet House, she was on her way to London. Oh? Huh? She's here now? Uh, Claridge's. She came in with friends. Well, doesn't seem to be upset over her loss, does she? Nor the loss of her husband either, I take it. Oh? Huh? I'm interested in the association between her and this Norman King. I see. Then you did have a talk with Miss... Mildred Hanky, the maid, hmm? Uh, yes, I did. Why? Did you? No. Inspector Finlay did. What did he say about it? 
Oh, she suffered from an insane hate or jealousy because of this, Mr. Keene. I didn't see it quite that way. That she berated the friendship shared by Mrs. Scott and him. This is uh, what he jotted down. Investigate possibility of collusion between Hanky Girl and King. Oh, well, as I said, I didn't see it that way, but maybe he hit something. Yep. King's from New York. I'm going to make a phone call, see what I can learn about his background. In the meantime, I hope to meet him. At least I think he's here with Mrs. Scott. You're going to see her, then? Her message was that I could any time after nine. I plan to be available about two minutes after. I shall be interested to hear. Yeah. Did you uh, get anything from your files? Nothing. Dreadfully and absolutely nothing. At five minutes before nine, I arrived at Mrs. Scott's hotel. On the stroke of nine, I phoned her suite, and at three minutes after, I met her. A striking honey blonde with tanned skin and an athletic figure that dressed her clothes nicely. I'm sorry I missed you in the country, Mr. Dollar. It's all right. I should have phoned. I suppose you're here to save what money you can for the insurance company in case my things aren't recovered. Insurance companies don't operate that way, Mrs. Scott. They can afford not to. Please sit down. Thank you. It's the expected thing, I guess. But I suspect one of the servants had something to do with it. Do you have any special reason for that suspicion? No, oh, they're strange people. I don't know anything about them. I've had them two months, and I've never been comfortable with them around me. Anything else? Well, the more I thought of it, the more it seems to make sense. The house was full of people to be suspected. One of them could have taken advantage of that. The men at Scotland Yard say that it took between 15 and 20 minutes to force that drawer open the way it was done. Did you miss either of your servants for that length of time? Not that I remember. It got a little confused by 11 or so. Mm. Do you suspect anybody else, any of your guests? Oh, good Lord, no. Most of them have a lot more than I do. Did you know Norman King in the States, or did you meet him here? Are you telling me suspect Norman? I asked when you met him. Why? I wondered if you knew him well enough to know he has a record as a forger. I don't believe it. Checks. He signed the name of another widow. A copy of the record is being mailed to me. I don't care. Doesn't make any difference. Norman didn't steal my jewelry. He wouldn't do that to me. I wonder how many times the other widow said that. You don't understand me. Norman and I are the same kind of people. You don't think I married a 70-year-old Texan for love, do you? Well, Norman's made up his mind what he wants out of life, too. He's talked about it. He doesn't care how he gets it, but he wouldn't take it from me. Sure. Well, I wanted to meet you, Mrs. Scott, and I have. Norman King checked into the Dorchester yesterday. He checked out today, and now Scotland Yard can't find him. If you hear from him, maybe you'd better let us know. Johnny Dollar. Inspector Sailor. Oh, hello. I'm sorry I took so long to answer. I just got up to my room. Yes, uh, well, I, I spoke to the clerk at the desk. He... Thought you might be going up now to the ring. You saw Mrs. Scott? Yes, I didn't learn much, but I don't think she's mixed up in it. No. Well, perhaps I have some news for you. What's that? I just received a report of a killing in Limehouse. The constable described a piece of jewelry found at the scene, and it uh, corresponds quite closely to the description of Mrs. Scott's emerald brooch. Oh? Who was killed? Uh, no identification yet. A man. I'm driving over. I wondered if you'd like me to pick you up. Yes, I would. I'll be waiting in front of my hotel. We will return you to the second act of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in just a moment. What is the secret of Dr. Walter? Sorry, we don't have the answer, but we know where it can be found... Tomorrow night over most of these same CBS stations with a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. The unique th theater of thrills called Suspense looks into the eerie matter of Dr. Walter's private life. Another thrilling CBS suspense drama tomorrow night. And now with our star, Edmund O'Brien, we return you to the second act of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Uh, 
By the time we got to the dismal cold water flat near the Thames, the inevitable crowd had gathered in the street. The body was one flight up in a grubby room that showed plenty of signs that a struggle had taken place. The man obviously had been killed by a blow on the back of the head. He'd been identified by the landlady as George Kenzie, the renter of the room. It was a boot black who discovered the body. Said this George Kenzie owed him some money and wouldn't pay. He came up here tonight and found him dead. I found the brooch myself just under the chair there, sir. Oh, yes. Thank you, Constable. All right, sir. I'll be outside. Here now, you people that don't belong here. Don't crowd the corridor. Move along now. Come along. Move along. Is there any really doubt in your mind, Mr. Dollar, that this is Mrs. Scott's brooch? None at all. Look, the jeweler's mark on the back. Well, then, we made some progress. I hardly think we'd be so fortunate as to find the four remaining pieces here. No. But offhand, it looks like there was trouble over dividing the loot, and the winner took the rest, don't you think? Quite possibly. Norman King? I'd feel better if he was found. Yeah, so would I. Matter of fact, I wish you'd keep your American criminals in America. We've quite enough to keep us busy without them. Hello. Oh, hello. I haven't done nothing. I've gone to Mr. Kinsey's with me out and free will, and I don't need no help from nobody. Not half you don't. Miss Glory Stokes, Inspector. She said she'd come to pay a visit to Mr. Kenzie, but she made off the other way when she heard the news. Well... Come in, Miss Stokes. I will not. Not with him lying there like that. Very well. Constable, ask Miss Stokes if she'll please accompany you to the yard. Mr. Dollar and I will see her there. I suppose it's understood that when you're with Scotland Yard, you do as Scotland Yard does. We didn't search the place, but we learned it was empty of any more jewelry after a crew of technical men collected every possible bit of physical evidence in the room and started it towards the yard's various laboratories. The results of their meticulous tests, comparisons, and examination fell into place later. We asked a few questions there without getting anything and then went back to the inspector's office where Glory Stokes waited for us. Well, I trust we haven't kept you waiting too long. Mr. Dollar, American investigator. How do you do? What would he be investigating that would concern me? We'll explain the whole thing to you, Miss Stokes. It's uh, it's Miss Stokes. Something tells me I'm going to wish it was. You're married? I am. That's why I was going to George Kinsey's. I haven't seen me, Abby, for three days. And I was going to ask George if he knew where the rotter was. What's your husband's name? Leonard Stokes. You haven't seen him in three days. That's right. Couldn't he give you any idea where he was going? No, why should he? I don't care where he goes, and he knows it. But you said you were looking for him. I was. If he's going to desert his poor wife, she's got a right to know, hasn't she? Yeah, I suppose she has. I take it he spent quite a lot of time with his George Kenzie. Yeah, too much, if you ask me. George was no good. He was a thief. I knew he'd end up dead like this. And if I told Leonard once, I told him a hundred. That he'd get into trouble if he chummed with him. He is in trouble. Ain't he in trouble? Uh, we aren't sure yet, Mrs. Stokes. What kind of trouble? Some jewelry was stolen from a woman in Seven Oaks. Jewels? Oh, uh. One of the pieces was found in George Kenzie's room. There's still almost $100,000 worth missing. More than 30,000 pounds, Mrs. Stokes. 30,000? George did that? Looks like it. There's a possibility that your husband was involved also. Don't make me laugh. He wouldn't have the brain. The next morning, armed with pictures of both Stokes and the dead man, Inspector Sailors and I drove back to Seven Oaks. He dropped me at Hatchet House and went on to cover the village himself. Mrs. Scott received me in the library. Good morning, Mr. Darling. Mrs. Scott, you must have left London early this morning. Yes, I did. Have you made any progress? Some, yes. Have you heard anything? I was very unhappy after you left last night. Why? Did you suddenly get lonesome for your jewels? I think you know why. I made a confession to you. I let you see what I really am. I never do that. You're all in confidence. Forget it. I've been trying to. I got a radiogram from Norman King. It arrived here late yesterday afternoon. Did you notify Scotland Yard? No. I know you asked me to, but I didn't think it was necessary. He's on his way back to New York. He wouldn't do that with stolen jewelry, would he? It would be stupid, but I'll want the name of the ship. I'll give it to you. 
He inferred that he knew his record would come to light because of the theft and that he'd feel better leaving England before he was asked to leave. He's a stupid, irresponsible dunce. Yeah. I have some photographs I want you to look at. Yeah, I'll spread them out on the table. Who are they? Uh, pictures of this man may not be quite lifelike because he was dead when they were taken. Uh, who is he? His name is George Kenzie. He was found beaten to death last night. Your emerald brooch was on the floor near him, so we're assuming he was killed because of your jewelry. You ever seen this man around here? No, not that I remember. I want you to remember one way or the other. It's possible that this man just received the stolen property from someone else, but if we can find somebody in the house or in the village who recognizes him, then we'll feel sure that he actually was the thief, or one of them anyway. I'm trying to be sure. What about the other one? I don't think I've seen either of them. And if you'll leave the room, I'd like to talk to your servants. You're going out of your way to be nasty. You thoroughly despise me, don't you? No. What I dislike is the fact that the physical part of you wasn't matched up with some mental apparatus that deserved it. Why? You asked me a personal question, Mrs. Gunn. Oh. <laughs> I want you to look at the photographs and think. It's important that we find out if you have ever seen either of these men in Seven Oaks. Which one is deceased, sir? This one. Hmm. How large was he? A little under six feet. Miss Hanky? I don't like looking at them, sir. I don't think I've seen either one of them, though. There's something about this one, sir. George Kenzie? Was he plump? No, I don't think you'd say plump. He was heavy, stocky. There's something about him, sir. Can't put my finger quite on it, but there's something. Could he have made deliveries here? Who brought the luggage, Millie, the day after Mrs. Scott arrived? Oh, I don't think it was him. Or this one either. They had their own lorry with a sign on it. Have you forgot? I'm sure of it, sir. There's something about this one, but I can't remember what. Well... Thanks very much, both of you. If you do remember something, please notify Scotland Yard. Huh? In the village, Inspector Sailors had found a few people who thought they recognized George Kenzie and two who were positive. None of them had recognized Leonard Stokes. So by the time we had left Seven Oaks, we were fairly sure that Kenzie had been actively involved. But since he was dead, being sure didn't mean any progress. Nothing further developed that day, although in London a stream of suspects was questioned. The next morning the situation hadn't changed, but I began to feel that in the face of the movement of Scotland Yard, a criminal would have to have more than brains and more than luck to escape. At two that afternoon a report was phoned in that a man, answering the description of Leonard Stokes, had been seen boarding a train in Waterloo Station and followed to his compartment. Another call delayed the train so that Inspector Sailors and I were able to get aboard. You don't mind, Stoller. It's your island, Inspector. Yes, thank you. Scotland Yard. What? Are you Leonard Stokes? Am I? Who? No, I'm not. Who are you then, sir? Well, I don't see how you've a right to you go. You must have identification. Let me see it, please. All right. I'm Leonard Stokes. Who's he? An American, Mr. Dollar. Sent here to recover Mrs. Scott's stolen property. You know where it is, Stokes? Answer him. It's all right. All right, I know when I'm beat. Yes, I know where it is. But I didn't kill George. How did you know he was dead, Mr. Stokes? Well, I tried to telephone him. That's how I found out. He was killed because of the jewelry, wasn't he, Stokes? I don't know. I don't know why he was killed. When was the last time you saw him, Mr. Stokes? Tuesday night. You went to Seven Oaks? I went to Seven Oaks, yes. Look, I'm willing to cooperate. Inspector, I'll, t I'll tell you my part of it. Well, that will make it a great deal less difficult for all of us. Yes, sir. Well, he asked me to go to Seven Oaks with him. I, I didn't know what he was up to. I, I thought we was just going for a little drive. Out of five pieces missing, Stokes, we found one in Kenzie's room. Now, if you know where the rest of them are, you must have known what he was up to. But if I had, I wouldn't have gone. That's the truth. Before I knew it, he stopped off at this Hatchet house and told me to wait in the motor. He must have explained why he stopped. Well, he said he had a friend to see, a gardener. 
Gardner at Hatchet House? That's what he told me. He came back in a while and then we drove off. And you still didn't know what was happening? No. When did you? When it was too late. On the road back to London, he told me. He told me whether I knew it or not, I'd just stolen some jewels. Well, I thought he was joking. And then he showed them to me and he says, Who's going to believe you, Len boy, when you say that you didn't know nothing about it? Oh, what could I do? What did you do? I drove back to London. Why was there only one piece of jewellery in Kenzie's room? Well, that's all he took. Said he wanted to give it to a chum. And you took care of the rest of it? Well, I was afraid to do anything else, sir. He kept telling me I was complicated in it. Stokes' innocence, as far as the robbery was concerned, became a little embarrassing even to him by the time we got him off the train and back to Scotland Yard. But his denial of any knowledge of Kenzie's murder was borne out, A, by an alibi that proved him innocent, and B, the result of one of the laboratory tests mentioned earlier. Traces of lip rouge found on the dead man's clothing pointed the way to the murderer. Mrs. Scott is resting in her room and left orders not to be disturbed. We won't disturb her, Garrett. Is this Hanky here? She's in the pantry, sir. Would you show us? This way, please. Thank you, Garrett. Oh, Mr. Dollar. This is Inspector Sailors from Scotland Yard, Miss Hanky. Miss Hanky. How do you do? You've come after me, haven't you? Yes, I think we have. I don't mind. I don't care about anything now. You did recognize the photographs of George Kenzie, didn't you? Recognize them? Yes, I suppose so. I remembered. I remembered the man I fell in love with. I told you I was going to marry, didn't I, Mr. Dollar? You met him in Seven Oaks? Yes. He told me he lived in London. And I felt like a child. I'd never gotten to know anyone who lived in London. When you're born in Penrith, you never do. He was so nice. He could talk so I could listen all night. <clears throat> Did he question you concerning Mrs. Scott? He took me... To London, and he told me he wanted to marry me, and I believed him. Millie, we're sorry. I wanted a husband the same as every girl, but he was lying. He knew I was a servant, and he found out about things. Then, inadvertently, you told him about the entertainment Tuesday night. The party? He said it was going to come. I left the rear door unlocked because I was going to give him some refreshments. I thought he hadn't come. But he had. He lied to me. That's why I killed him. You went to London last night? Yes. He told me to leave London. He told me to go back to Penrith. Then I knew that he'd lied to me. And that he'd stolen the jewelry. He called me a stupid country girl. And that's when I hit him. I... Hit him and hit him. Because it was true. That's all I am. A servant. And I'll never be anything else. Account item two, miscellaneous, $317.75. Item three, same as item one, transportation back to Hartford. Expense account total, $1,182.75. Remarks, the jewelry was recovered, but in spite of its value, that didn't seem too important. The importance, as I saw it, lay in the complete reversal of values. Mildred Hankey, who only wanted goodness, had found badness. And Marcella Scott? Ah. Marcella Scott left for Capri the following day. It was truly Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, stars Edmund O'Brien in the title role and is written by Gil Dodd with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Edmund O'Brien can soon be seen in the Paramount Pictures production, Warpath. Featured in tonight's cast were John McIntyre, Ben Wright, Tudor Owen, Jeanette Nolan, and Virginia Gregg. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. 
This is Dan Coverly inviting you to join us next week at this time when Edmund O'Brien returns as... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. The National Broadcasting Company presents... The Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. Sam Spade, Detective Agency. Buono, buono. I beg your pardon? Swanatti il campanello. Sam, what are you... Nothing at all, sweetheart. I just happen to have the tourist lists of handy Italian phrases before me. North Beach never did that to you before, Sam. North Beach never did anybody like it just did me, F. But I thought you said old Bartolomeo just wanted you to drop by for a friendly talk. And some garlic bread and red wine. But does that explain the knife gash on my coat? Your new tweed? My old tweed now, Cherub. You see, it was never meant to be swum in. The bay? Yes. Not again. What else? By now, your keen feminine instinct should tell you this is not the social call, Wonder Girl. As a matter of fact, I plan to drop by presto presto with words and enter a little something I call view of fisherman's wharf from the water or the crab Louis caper. <laughs> Transcribed for NBC, William Spear, radio's outstanding producer-director of mystery and crime drama, brings you the greatest private detective of them all in The Adventures of Sam Spade. Zing, 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 ding, 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 ding. Buon giorno, Sam. Well, buoning up, huh? Uh, let me see now. Oh, um... Anti Barrow, un collaboratore per la Calzella. Great, great. What's it mean? I found my secretary's list of most used Italian phrases, Sam. Mm. It means, um, I want a carburetor for my voiturette. I'll remember that. <laughs> so shall we proceed with the business at hand? Ready, Sam. They fill it in. To Bartolomeo Maggiore, copy to Lieutenant Rossi, North Beach Division, from Samuel Spade, license number 137596. Subject, the Crab Louie Caper. Dear Bartolomeo, Fisherman's Wharf, as you know, is as changeable as an Italian wench. All smiles and laughter of a Saturday night with the lights blazing in the Chapino Palazzas and the tourists three deep around the steaming cauldrons outside. But it's something else again of an early dawn. Dark and lonely and quiet, except for the mutter of engines as the crab boats nose out into the fog that hang over the gate. Last night was somewhere in between. The lights were blinking out as I left my cab and walked over to your place of business. A gaudily painted building at the foot of the wharf with a red, yellow, and blue sign reading Museo Maggiore. Curios, souvenirs, waxworks. Admission, ten cents. <laughs> Who is it? I'm Sam Spade. Bartolomeo called me. He isn't here. Plus, he's grotto at the end of the warp. Thanks. <laughs> Look, is there anything I can... Sorry. Except for Foskey's at the very end, the wharf was dark now. It seemed early, as if something had interfered with business as usual, and the late customers had been brushed off a couple hours ahead of time. I peeked through a hole in one of Foskey's window shades and saw why. It looked like the entire population of North Beach was inside. If everyone is ready... One momento. Who's it this? Me? Yes, you. What do you want? I'm Sam Spade. Bartolomeo Maggiore sent for me. Bartolomeo. Eh? Conoscete il signor Spade? Ah, si, si. Obrigate il giamo, Fasque. Ah, there, Mr. Spade. You are uh, wondering why we are here? Well, as a matter of fact, I am, Bartolomeo. I thought that... I know, I know. It, uh, it's about my son, Louis. My son, my only son. Oh, he's uh, inside? No, no, not inside. Out in the darkness somewhere. Cold and alone. You, uh, you mean he... See, six days now they have searched for his body. Oh, well, when did it happen? One week today. Crab boat? His boat, the San Felipe. Well, was he alone when it happened? You detectives... You strike the point. My Louis, always, always he fish alone. Until this time. Who went out with him? Dominic Torrio, his friend, Dominic. This gathering is assembled in Dominic's uh, honor, you see. 
You mean a uh, hearing or something? Something more than that. Come. Listen to that. Yeah. I'm a sick! In my belly, I'm a sick! This old prebuffo! Faster, you should tell him to take it! Keep your temper, Aldo. State facts. Facts! Facts, huh? All right, facts! Six years, Louis Fishy the crab alone. Each day, he's a layover close the break a line and string it apart. Each day, he's a bringing the San Felipe home, hockey dokey. That's right, everybody. That's right, that's right. Until one fine day, Dominic hit the go with Louis to help. Help. Although, although we must deal in facts. Dominic is suspended. Back in the truth. He's a kill Louis. Joe is a kill Louis. And you know why? Because he's a want Rosalia. That's why. See how it is. Who's Rosalia? You must have seen her at the museum. Crying? Yes, with reason. Next week, she and my Louis were to be married. Hmm. It's tough. You think this Dominic was in love with her, maybe? I think nothing, senor. Two men, friends, alone in a boat in a heavy fog. One of them dies. The other says it is an accident. It is not for us to think or make guesses. Say, what am I supposed to do? In the records of the police, senor... My Louis died in an accident. Mm -hmm. In the hearts of his friends, he was murdered. For my sake, for Dominic's, for the sake of us all, we must know the truth. Mm -hmm. For this, I prefer to employ one who is professional and impartial. Come. Yeah. We go in. Uh, I don't believe it, Senor. Believe me, before heaven, I mean it. Silencio. Once again, Dominic. How far was the boat from Seal Rocks? Oh, 100 yards, I think. I'm putting a tail on the floor. I heard the break. Oh, he's alive. Silencio. Silencio. Let Dominic tell the story. Go on now. You had dropped the last crab pot over the side. Then? Uh, something went wrong with the motor. Louis told me to look at it. I went below, then it happened. Louis was leaning over the gunnel. We untangled a float, and the sea took us by the stern. We broached. I saw him go over and plunge into the white water. I brought the boat about then. For two hours, I yelled, I circled around, I blew the whistle, everything. Then the Coast Guard came. Bosky, I swear it, that's all I know. I never saw you. Ah, Impossible! Silencio! Silencio! My brothers, it was your will that I sit here in judgment of Dominic Torrio. Before I go on, are there any more questions you have to ask him? Uh, 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 are there any among you who have evidence... To offer against him. So be it. You know as well as I, there is only one verdict here. The charge is dismissed. The court is adjourned. Everyone was still for a second, like a big tableau. Basque, white-haired and dignified on the platform, looking down at Dominic. And the rest of them all on their feet now, boring holes to him with their eyes. He was the first to move, turning slowly, walking out through the crowd toward the door, looking tentatively from face to face, knowing now he hadn't been acquitted at all, as one by one they turned their backs on him. I felt terribly sorry for Dominic, until he walked past me and I got a look at his face, at his eyes. In my racket, I see that look more often than the next guy. I never saw it any clearer than I did now. It was fear and hatred and guilt. So I left you talking to Fasque, Bartolomeo, and walked back down to the wharf to the museo. Rosalia! Rosa... I told you Bartolomeo is not here. I've seen Bartolomeo. I want to talk to you. Sit down. I don't want to... Sit down! Oh. That's a good girl. It was quite a place, the museo. A catch-all for everything nautical you'd run across in 60-odd years of living on the sea or next to it. From a ten-foot shark pickled in formaldehyde to a life-size figure of Captain Kidd, complete with drawn sword, lace cuffs, and treasure chest at his feet next to the door. I turned back to Rosalia, sitting on a rum keg under a flickering hurricane lamp, the only light in the room. What do you want of me? Bartolomeo wants the truth about what happened on the San Felipe. They're deciding that at the meeting. They already did. They did? You mean Dominic... How did they decide? Dismiss the charges. No evidence, no witnesses. It was the only thing Foskey could do. You feel better? It uh, doesn't bring back my Louis. No, it doesn't. 
Dominic's going free now from both the law and his people. No vengeance for Louis. Why were you crying when I came by tonight? Haven't I the right to cry with my Louis? Drop it. Huh? Why didn't you go to the meeting, afraid to give yourself away? I didn't feel like it, that's all. You're a Sicilian, Rosalia. Vengeance is pretty important to you. If you'd loved Louis, you'd have been in there screaming for Dominic's scalp. You shut your mouth. But no, you sat home crying, not for Louis, but for Dominic, right? How long had it been going on? Did you know Dominic was going to kill him when they put out in the San Felipe? Why would Dominic kill him? Well, that's a stupid question. He's in love with you. <laughs> in love with me. <laughs> in love with me. Drop it. Drop it, Rosalia. In love with me? Oh, I wish it were so. Huh? He killed for me. Is that what they say? <laughs> it's all very flattering, very. I love Dominic. I've always loved Dominic since I was a little girl. I threw myself at Dominic. And I begged him to marry me. That's not easy for a girl to do, Mr. Spade. I begged him and I promised to work for him, to be a slave. You know what he did? He laughed and he spit upon me. And you, you stand there and you tell me that he murdered for the love of me. He wouldn't walk across the street. All right, all right. Take it easy now. Come on, take it easy. So... So I do the silly woman thing. I, I promise myself to Louis. To crazy Louis. To a madman. Crazy? You don't believe that, huh? Louis the Great, you campione. A champion of the crab fisherman. Who dares to fish right on the breaker line. Catches more crab than anyone else. Louis the Fearless. Do you know why he's fearless? He's too crazy to be afraid. What do you mean? He mutters. He, he talks to himself of great riches. Of thousands of dollars. Of him and me. Louis the crab fisherman and me, living in the finest house in North Beach. When was this? Last week. He went up in Bartolomeo's attic one night and he came down with a big hunk of his raw wax from the waxworks. A tresor, he called it. A stupid lump of wax. And he held it up before me, so. And he says with a mad gleam in his eye, From this, Rosalia, from this I will carve for us the biggest, finest house you can dream of. Here, Look. What's Captain Kidd got to do? Uh, he puts it in the treasure chest. See? Mm -hmm. You will keep this a secret, Rosalia, he says, if you love me. And he laughs again like a madman. Me love Louis Majori? I hated him! It was too good to be phony. The triangle notion had to go. You could hardly blame Rosalia for thinking he was crazy. In the treasure chest was a hunk of tallow. Not a very fresh hunk at that. And Louis's routine with it must have hit her like the graveyard scene from Hamlet. Therefore, having no theory, nor evidence, nor witnesses, I also had no motive. As always in situations like this, I did the sensible thing. I went home and went to bed. Or I thought I went to bed. Hello? Spade? Yeah. I got a tip for you. Oh? Huh? Find yourself a nice dirty divorce case somewhere and stay out of North Beach. Well, this almost sounds like a threat. Call it advice. There's a hundred bucks in the mail for you. You'll get it this morning. Plus a bribe? A gift. Can I keep it if I don't play? If you don't play, you won't need it. Hmm. I uh, suppose it's useless to ask who this is. Louis Majori. Say that again? Louis Majori. Shall I spell it? You might explain it. You talk to Rosalia. Figure it out for yourself. Sure, sure. So she never loved you and you knew it. So you go over the side when the comber hits, swim ashore, then discover they think you're dead and decide to leave it that way rather than go through with a wedding. You got it. I got more. So life without Rosalia in North Beach is impossible. You can't face the shame and loose talk that goes with a busted wedding. So you're going over the hill and find a new life for yourself. Wait a minute, Spade. Oh, there's more, there's more. So you're tossing over a car, a bank account, a boat worth $7,000. Walking out on your old man to say nothing of three years apprenticeship and six years of hard work to get where you are. I understand perfectly. And you're being a little insulting. I make a lot of my dough with my big flat feet. But I do make some of it with my head. Now try again. You don't believe I'm Louis Majori? That is the general idea. And it might surprise you to know that five minutes ago I was ready to chuck the whole anti-pasto. Now I'm back in with both feet. What's with the music box? Nothing. Tell me, would you know Louis if you saw him? I've seen his picture. Fine. I guess I'll have to prove it to you. If I satisfy you I'm Louis Majori, will you stay home? Scott. Out's on her. Now where do we prove it? You know Castellani's grotto? Halfway out in the wharf, yeah. There's a ramp running around behind it. I'll see you there in a half hour. I know just what you're going to say, Bartolomeo, but I didn't go alone. 
Roscoe was right there with me, with his safety off. It was the kind of spog San Francisco puts on once a year for the tourists. Just to nail down its position as runner-up to London. I had to feel my way along the row of dark chowder houses to Catalani's. Except for the foghorn and the lapping of the water below, there wasn't a sound. The only cheerful thing in the picture was Roscoe, who was now out of my pocket at the ready. I eased up to the corner of Castellani's. There was an alley between it and the next building, leading around on the ramp over the water. Hey. I could see the glow of his cigarette first. Then I made him out in a slouch hat and overcoat. He was standing at the rail. Spade. Right here. Well, you satisfied now? I'll let you know. I moved out from the side of the building and walked toward him. He must have known about Roscoe because he didn't move. Just let me come right up next to him. I was stupid, sure. But it wouldn't have worked for him except for the fog. Two feet away, I saw what I thought was Louie was a booby trap. The hat and overcoat were slung over a piling with a burning cigarette on the rail next to one of the sleeves. I rolled to one side just in time. The knife slashed through the padding on my left shoulder and he was on me. Rasco went into the drink and I took on the arm with a knife with my two hands, 32 feet. Unhappily, overlooking a spare foot, he knew what to do with. I went through the railing like an asylum version of the sea wolf. Arriving thus in the limpid and soothing waters of San Francisco Bay. At the moment, I was not sorry. You are listening to the weekly adventure of radio's most famous detective, Sam Spade. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Sunday, Theater Guild on the Air presents one of the greatest dramatic undertakings in the history of radio. It's a full hour and a half adaptation of Shakespeare's masterpiece, Hamlet. The immortal lines and matchless beauty of Hamlet come to life Sunday with John Gielgud, Dorothy McGuire, and Pamela Brown in Theater Guild on the Air. And a reminder, this Sunday also means another gala broadcast of The Big Show. And now back to the Crab Louie caper. Tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. Wetting my finger and holding it up in the wind, I quickly determined where north was and just as quickly decided there was no percentage in swimming the Golden Gate. A bright blur on my starboard bow called to mind the old saying, where there's a light, there's light. So I headed there. Three strokes this side of exhaustion, I pulled up at what proved to be a landing with a Jacob's Ladder, at the top of which I found the rear entrance to Foskey's, or more accurately, Foskey's private office. The door was open. Huh? Oh. I'm Sam Spade. I've been swimming, if you're wondering. Bartolomeo told me about you. He didn't say you were crazy. Well, maybe he didn't know. You uh, wouldn't have a brandy lying around loose, would you? Sure, sit down. Thanks. I uh, think I saw Louis tonight. Louis? Impossible. Where? Behind Castellani's. Yeah. Bless you, Fosky. Ah. Oh, hit me again, will you? Yeah, but uh, what about Louis? Called me up, said he'd meet me there. Just tried to knife me. Oh, but, but it's impossible. Is it? Why would he play dead? And why would he try to kill you? Maybe he's crazy. Well, how do you mean? You've heard of the dear old lady who had the trunk full of pancakes, haven't you? Hmm? Louis saves old tallow. Captain Kidd's treasure chest at the museo is full of it. Who told you this? Rosalia showed it to me. Uh, May I? I help you, sir. Thanks. Might be a good idea to call another meeting and tell the people. Ah. <clears throat> Make it easier for Dominic. <laughs> Funny. Of the whole meeting here, I alone doubt it is guilty. Good thing they made you the judge or he might be six feet under by now. Got a cigarette? In the box there, next to the phone. Thanks. Yeah, I, uh, I went right along with him, too. Shows how wrong you can be when... When what? When you, uh, when you go by emotions and not by evidence. This is, uh, quite a cigarette box. <laughs> yes, it stops when you put it down. Hmm? Well. I, uh, suppose now you'll drop your assignment? Sure, sure. I'm a detective, not a psychiatrist. You've got a lunatic running around. That's your problem. Good night, Fosky, and thanks for the brandy. (laughs) 
If Roscoe had been along, I might have played it differently. But when you're sitting across a coffee table from a guy you suddenly realize has the wet cement already, you do what I did, make polite noises and concentrate on getting out on two feet. It was seven to three. Dominic was stashed in a handy closet listening to the whole thing, which was handy since the next obvious move was his room in a house on Jefferson Street. A rooming house owned and operated by a four corsage bosom type lady known as Mama Luca. Oh, senor, I don't know nothing. I don't know nothing. You're scared, Mama. Did Dominic threaten you? No, no, no don't ask me. Look, that. look, he killed Louis Majori. I gotta know why. I don't know why. I don't know nothing about it. Louis came here? Yes. Yes, Louis came here the night before it happened. Why? Oh, I don't know. He was all excited. A handful of wax. Wax? You know. What about it? He showed it to Dominique, and they go into his room and talk, and then he, he ran off to send a telegram. Telegraph office, huh? Well, since it's official business, I can let you read the office copy. Here, here. Yeah. This message just came in tonight. Dominic Torrio. Regarding your inquiry, analysis of samples sent here by Louis Majori, highly promising. If quality uniform and weight correct, would estimate value minimum $60,000. Hartley Associates, Vancouver, B.C. A lump of smelly stuff that looked like old tallow, picked out of the ocean and worth $60,000, was a strong enough clue for even stupid Sam to pick up. I left the telegraph office on the double and pulled up at the Museo Maggiore ten minutes later. He was too busy to notice me. I slid a marlin spike out of a rack next to the rum keg. Uh, locked. Must be locked. I hate to do this, Foskey. Uh, wait, wait a minute, mate. Wait a minute. The next voice you'll hear will be the nurse with a breakfast tray. Botolomeo. What have you... Look. What? What have you done? His honor was playing Pandora with Captain Kidd's treasury. Box of... yeah. But why? Who is it? Who? Husky. Surprised? Husky? Why would he, of all people? He likes a buck as well as the next one. Possibly even more. When there are 60,000 of them. 60,000 dollars? Yeah. Is he mad? Like a fox. Here, let me pry this cover off. There. What is this? Well, it may not look like much to you and me, but to a perfume manufacturer, it's prettier than the Venus de Milo. Tadlow? Ambergris. It's what happens when a whale gets a tummy ache. Louis must have run onto it ten days ago. I dream me of six thousand dollars. Yeah. That's the big why of it, Bartolomeo. What now? You think fast? He won't talk, neither will Dominic. They're next and they know it. Still two men alone in a fog in a boat. See, si. there were only a witness. There was a witness. Hmm? The eye of God was on Dominic when he did it. And the judgment of God is swift and is sure. Dominic knows it. You think so? I know Dominic. Why you ask? There's a way to find out. What time is it? Half past one. There's time. Where do you keep your razor? Razor? Yeah. I'm going to shave Captain Kidd. Which I did, finishing around 2 a.m. During the next three hours, I got wet, cold, and seasick in the order named but made it back to the museo in time for a couple of stiff horns of grappa before you and I hustled down to the wharf where Dominic was picking up bait for his crab nets. Dominic? Huh? Oh, the Palomeo. And the Senor Spade. I remember Mr. Spade. Yeah, last night in back of Castellani's. I don't know what, what you're, you're talking, talking about. about. Sure, Dominic. It's all a horrible mistake. Lay off me, will you? Herbert Foskey said, didn't you? They dropped the charges. I'm innocent. They cleared me. That's just why we're here. We, we want to make it up to you, my boy. What's in your mind? You did Louis a great favor, Dominic. When his 32 crab pots got too much for him to handle, you went along to help him. Today, we're going along to help you. Now, uh, when do we cast off? There's a float up ahead. What color? Yellow and red. Is that yours, Dominic? That's mine. Great, great. Pull up alongside. Well... What's this all about? I told you, Dominic. You're going... lying. What are you trying to do? Break me down? He, he's dead in an accident. You hurt with plastic. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Forget it, Dominic. Forget it. We love you like a brother. I, I told the truth. I told the truth. What are you trying to do? Torture me? Is that what you want? Revenge? No. The matter is in other hands now. What? You mean? There is always one witness. Isn't that, Dominic? Oh. <laughs> That's what you mean, huh? 
Is that why you came to tell me that? <laughs> That's a good one. Hold the wheel, Spade. I'll bake my neck. I'll spit in your eye one day, old man. One day when you get smart, you and a whole lousy we war. We both watched him hold the line. Oh, it's playing it on me. the deck, prattling to himself like a little kid whistling in the dark. He was a lousy actor, pale under his sunburn and drenched with I sweat. I won't let you forget Up it, pal. Coil by I got coil. To prove. Then it began to come slower. And make it stick. When I can prove it in court, I'll sue you till you bleed. I'll... Hey, now what's the matter here? What's pulling on this line? Maybe it's your conscience, Dominic. It's, it's heavy. It's... What? The it... Lord moves in strange ways. Hey, can't get it up. I... Let me help you. There we go. One. Two. Up. Lee! Get away from me! Let it go! Lee! No! I hauled Louie up onto the deck, and a grisly sight he was, too, with a knife still sticking in his back. I figured that that was where Dominic would put it, and I was right. Not that it mattered, because Dominic wasn't thinking logically from the moment he saw Louie's body tangled in his crab line. He sang us all 50 verses then and there and repeated them for the police stenographer later when we got him to headquarters. It looks like a first-degree rap for both him and Fosky, but I'm waiting till it happens before telling him the corpse was Captain Kidd, minus beard and ruffles. Period. End of report. Sam, again and again I rediscover you. And each time a new facet, a new thrill. You're just wonderful. It's true, true. But it pleases me to hear it from you, F. And so I propose to reward you in a fitting manner. First, Back salary? tut tut, a carburetor for your washerette. And second, Back salary? ten free tickets to the Museo Maggiore. Third, Back salary? an invitation to accompany me, your employer, to browse upon two bowls of Cipino tonight at Castellani's. And fourth, I give up. Back salary. Sam! Count it, girl, count it, and bless you. The watcherette complete with carburetor will call at your door in precisely one hour. Until then, then... Good night, Sam. Good night, sweetheart. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. You're invited to a one-hour concert tomorrow by the renowned NBC Symphony under the direction of noted conductor Wilfred Pelletier. Featured soloist on tomorrow's symphony performance is Helen Traubel. For the world's greatest music, hear the NBC Symphony tomorrow and every Saturday. Tonight's transcribed adventure of Sam Spade was produced, edited, and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade was played by Stephen Dunn. Lorene Tuttle is Effie. Script for tonight's adventure by Harold Swanton. Musical scoring by Lud Gluskin, conducted by Robert Armbruster. Join us again next week, same time, for another adventure with Sam Spade.